An Inquiry into the Animism and Folklore of the Guiana Indians By Walter E. Roth Preface When, some seven years ago, I took up the duties of stipendiary magistrate, medical officer, and protector of Indians in this mosquito-cursed district of the Pomeroon. I determined upon devoting all my spare time, and there has been plenty of it, to an ethnographical survey of the native tribes of British Guiana, somewhat on the lines I had already followed in the case of North Queensland. As the work progressed, I recognized that, for the proper comprehension of my subject, it was necessary to make inquiry concerning the Indians of Venezuela, Suriname, and Cayenne. With the result that the area to be reviewed comprised practically that portion of the South American continent bounded, roughly speaking, by the Atlantic seaboard, the Orinoco, and the northern limits of the watershed of the Rio Negro. And the lower Amazon. And it was not long before I realized that for the proper study of the Arawaks and the Caribs I had to include that of the now almost extinct Antillians. In the course of my ethnographical work, I collected sufficient material in the way of myth, legend, and fable to warrant the publication of a separate volume on animism and folklore, and so the following pages have come to be written. The legends collected have been drawn mainly from Arawak, Carib, and Warau sources, and are initialed, A, C, and, W, respectively. Walter E. Roth. Pomeroon River, British Guiana, June, 1913. How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Works of reference. Note. Dot, the following list of publications is not presented as a complete bibliography, but as indicating those authors to whom, directly or indirectly, I find myself indebted. The titles of works from which excerpts have been taken are initialed. As most of these publications are in foreign languages, the excerpts, here given in English, are necessarily translations, many of them being paraphrased to some extent in order that they may be best adjusted with the context. Throughout the memoir authorities are cited by the initials used below, respectively, in connection with these, Roman numerals indicate the volume numbers and Arabic figures the page numbers. W. E. R. A. C. A. C. U. A. Christopher. Relation of the Great River of Amazons in South America. London, 1698. A. Alexander, J. E. Transatlantic Sketches. Two Volumes London. 1833. Appen, C. F. Unter den Tropen. Jena, 1871. Ba, Bancroft, Edward. An Essay on the Natural History of Guiana. London, 1769. P. B. A. Barrere, Pierre. Nouvelle Relation de la France Equinoxial. Paris, 1743. H. W. B. Bates, Henry Walter. The Naturalist on the Amazon. London, 1892. Bechamel. C. Grillet. Bellin, Jacques Nicolas. Description Geographique de la Guyane. Paris, 1763. Benoit, P. J. Voyage à Suriname. Bruxelles, 1839. B. Bernal, J. H. Missionary Labours in British Guiana. London, 1847. Beat, A. Voyage de la France Equinoxial en l'Isle de Cayenne, N. L. N. E. 1652. Paris, 1664. B. W. Bottom Wetham, J. W. Roraima and British Guiana. London, 1879. Bowl, Bolingbroke, Henry. A Voyage to the Demerary. Norwich, 1807. B. B. R. Board, F. R. de L. A. History of the Origin, Customs, Religion, Wars, and Travels of the Caribs. Timeri, V. P. T. 2, Demerara. 1886. Translated from the French, and condensed, by G. J. A. Boschreitz. Boschreitz. 
C. Board. B. R. Brett, W. H. The Indian Tribes of Guiana. London, 1868. Bra, Mission Work Among the Indian Tribes, etc. London, N. D. B. R. B., Legends and Myths. London, N. D. Bree, Brinton, Daniel G. The American Race. New York, 1891. Bro, Brown, C.B. Canoe and Camp Life in British Guiana. 2D Ed. London, 1877. And Lidstone, W., 15,000 miles on the Amazon, etc. London, 1878. Lack, Casas, Bartolom de Las. An account of the first voyages and discoveries made by the Spaniards in America. London, 1699. Castelnau, Francis de. Expedition Don Les Parties Centrales de l'Amérique du Sud. Four Volumes Paris, 1850-57. CC, Catalogue of Contributions Transmitted from British Guiana to the London International Exhibition, 1862. Georgetown, 1862. G.C., Catlin, George. Life Among the Indians. London, N.D. Dak, Chanka, Diego Alvarez, The Letter of, dated 1494, relating to the second voyage of Columbus to America, by A. M. Fernandez de Ibarra. Smithsonian Miscellaneous, Col. No. 1698, pages 428 to 457. 1907. Coup, Cadreau, H., La France Equinoxial. Two Volumes Paris, 1887. C.R., C.R.V.U.X., J. Voyages Don l'Amérique du Sud. Paris, 1883. Dalton, Henry G. The History of British Guiana. Two Volumes London, 1855. De, Dance, Chaz, Daniel. Chapters from a Guianese Logbook. Demerara, 1881. Davies. The History of the Caribbean Islands. 1666, for the original work see Rochefort. F. D., Depons, F., Travels in Parts of South America, during the years 1801, 1802, 1803, 1804. London, 1806. In Phillips, Call of Modern Voyages, Volume 4, London, 1806. Dixon, G.O., G. Four Months of Travel in British Guiana. Geographical Journal, April, 1895. Drake. Sir Francis Drake Revised, etc. 1626. D.F., Duff, R.O.B.T. British Guiana. Glasgow, 1866. P. E. Ehrenreich, Paul. Die Mythen und die Legenden der Südamerikanischen Volker. Berlin, 1905. Fay, Fermin, Philippe. Description Générale, Historique, Géographique et Physique de la Colonie de Suriname. Two Volumes Amsterdam, 1769. W. F., Fuchs, J. Walter. An Antillian Statuette, with notes on West Indian religious beliefs. America Anther, N. S., 11, pages 348 to 358, 1909. G. F., Friederici, George. Scalping in America. Smithsonian Republic for 1906, pages 423 to 438, 1907. Galler Tarab. Nui Reis Kayan. Leipzig, 1799. Gilly, F. S. Sagio di Storia Americana. Go, D. E. Gudge, C. H. Beitrich zur Volkerkund von Suriname. Int Archiv für Ethnography, B. D., 19, Heft 1 2, pages 1 34, Leiden, 1908. G. B., Grillet, John, and Bechamel, Francis. A Journal of the Travels of, into Guiana. London, 1698. G. Gamilla, Joseph. Historia Natural. Del Rio Orinoco. 
2 Volumes Barcelona, 1791. Harcourt, Robert. A Relation of a Voyage to Guiana. London, 1613. H. A. Hartzink, J. J., Bescribing Van Guiana of the Wild Cust in Zuid America. Amsterdam, 1770. Herrera, Antonio de. Historia General de los Hechos de los Castellanos en las Islas, etc. Second Edition. Madrid, 1730. Hia, Hillhouse, William. Journal of a Voyage up the Massaroni in 1831. Jour, Roy. Geography, SOC, 4, pages 25-40, 1834. HIB, The Wero Land of British Guiana. Ibid, pages 321-333. Hick, Notices of the Indians Settled in the Interior of British Guiana. Ibid, 2, pages 227-249, 1832. A.V.H., Humboldt, Alexander Vaughan. Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America. Three Volumes London, 1852-53. I.T., I. M. Thurn, Everard F. Among the Indiana of Guiana. London, 1883. Y. Irving, Washington. Companions of Columbus. London, 1884. J. E., Genman, G. S. To Kaider, in 1881. Georgetown, 1907. W. J., Jost, W. Ethnographisches UND Verwandts AUS Guayano. Leiden, 1893. Juan Y. Santa Orge, and ULLOA, Antonio D. E. A Voyage to South America. 2 Volumes London, 1760. A. K. Kapler, A. Sex Jar in Suriname. Stuttgart, 1854. Kai, O. Kurtzer in Tour von New Nederland und Guajana. Leipzig, 1672. Key, Kirk, Henry. 25 Years in British Guiana. London, 1898. K. G., Koch Grunberg, Theodore. Zweijar unter den Indianern. Risen in Nordwest Brazilian, 1903-5. Two Volumes. Berlin, 1910. Kunijk, Hugo. Das Sogenannte Mannerkindbet. Zeitschrift für Ethnology, Heft 3-4, pages 546-563, 1911. Labat, J. B. Nouveau Voyage AUX Isles de l'Amérique. Six Volumes Paris, 1722. Voyage du Chevalier de Marche en Guinée, Isles Voisines, Etia Cayenne, N. 1725-27. Amsterdam, 1731. L. A. Condamine, Charles Marie de. Relation abrégé d'un voyage fait dans l'intérieur de l'Amérique Meridionale. Maastricht, 1778. Lafito. Moors de Sauvages Americains. Two Volumes Paris, 1724. Las Casas. C. Casas. Lidstone. C. Brown. Martius. C. S. P. X. Nor, N. R. D. N. S. K. I. O. L. D., Erland. Indian Erleben. L. Gran Chaco, Sud America. Leipzig, 1912. Patterson, J. D. British Guiana Local Guide 1843, from Notes of. Pinard, F. P. and A. P. de Menchitend and Bitters der Zonislang. Paramaribo, 1907. Neuhoff, J. Voyages and Travels into Brazil. 1707. P. N. K., Pinkard, George. Notes on the West Indians. Two volumes. London, 1816. Lap, Pitou, L. Voyage à Cayenne. Two Volumes Paris, 1807. Proust, K. T. H. die Opfer Blutschel der Alten Mexikaner erlautert nach den Engebender Korindianer. Zeitschrift für Ethnology, 
XLIII, pages 293 to 306, 1911. Quant, C. Nachricht von Suriname und die Seinen Einwohnern, etc. Gorlitz, 1807. R.O.P. Rochefort, C. D. E. and Poincy, L. D. E. Histoire naturelle et morale de Isles Antilles de l'Amérique. Rotterdam, 1665. A.R. Rojas, Aristides. Obras Escagidas. Paris, 1907. STC, St. Clair, T. Staunton. A Residence in the West Indies and America. Two Volumes London, 1834. SCO, Scomberg, O. Ryzen in Guiana und M. Orinoco. Leipzig, 1841. SCR, Scomberg, Richard. Ryzen in British Guiana. Two Volumes Leipzig, 1847-48. SCA, Scomberg, Robert Hermann. Diary of an Ascent of the River Burbis. Jour, Roy. Geography, SOC, 7, pages 302 to 350, 1837. SCB, Expedition to the Lower Parts of the Barima and Guiania Rivers. Ibid, 12, pages 169 to 178, 1842. SCBC, Excursion up the Barima and Cuyuni Rivers. Ibid, pages 178 to 196. SCC, Diary of an Ascent of the River Corentin. Ibid, 7, pages 285 to 301, 1837. SCD, A Description of British Guiana. London, 1840. SCE, Journey to the Sources of the Essequibo, etc. Jour, Roy. Geography, SOC, X, pages 159 to 190. 1841. SCF, Journey from Fort San Joaquim to Roraima. Ibid, pages 191 to 247. SCG, Report of an Expedition into the Interior of British Guiana. Ibid. 6, pages 224 to 284, 1836. SCH, Journey from Esmeralda to San Carlos. Ibid, X, Pages 248 to 267, 1841. SCT, Scomberg, Robert Hermann. Visit to the Sources of the Takutu. Ibid, 13, pages 18 to 75. London, 1843. On the religious traditions of the Makusi Indians who inhabit the Upper Mahu and a portion of the Makarima Mountains. Read before the Society of Antiquaries November 17, 1836. Thus far I have been unable to trace the publication of this address. W. E. R. As, Simpson, Alfred. Travels in the Wilds of Ecuador. London, 1886. S. M., S. P. A. X. and Martius. Rees in Brazilian. Three Volumes Munich. 1823-31. St. Stedman, J. G., Narrative of a Five Years' Expedition Against the Revolted Negroes of Suriname. Two Volumes. London, 1806. VDS, von den Steinen. Durch Central Brazilian. Leipzig, 1886. Unter dem Nadervolkern Central Brazilians. Berlin, 1893. Du Tertri, Jean Baptiste. Histoire générale de Antilles Habitis par de Francais. Four Volumes Paris, 1667 to 71. T. Timeri. Journal of the Royal Agricultural and Commercial Society of British Guiana. See various volumes cited. Aloha. C. Juan Y. Santacilia. A. R. W. Wallace, A. R. A Narrative of Travels on the Amazon and Rio Negro. London, New York, and Melbourne, 1889. W. Waterton, Chaz, Wanderings in South America. London, 1891. Wickham, H., Rough Note of a Journey from Trinidad to Para via the Orinoco and Rio Negro. 
London, 1872. Ibarra, Fernandez de. C. Chanka. 1. No evidence of belief in a supreme being. Originally, Indians had no terms expressive of the conception of a supreme being, such terms as they now possess have been framed to suit civilized, especially missionary, requirements. 1. One on the other hand, traditions of certain tribal heroes have been unconsciously assumed as indicative of the existence among the natives of the knowledge of a god, too. 1. Careful investigation forces one to the conclusion that, on the evidence, the native tribes of Guiana had no idea of a supreme being in the modern conception of the term. This contention is confirmed in a way by Gamilla, 2, 7, to one of the early missionary fathers on the Orinoco, who writes as follows. In three nations which will be mentioned directly they have a word indicative, after their fashion. Of God, we trust that time and labor will also reveal, in other tribes, a name which until now they have furnished no sign of recognizing either by word or expression. Even in the said nations no outward ceremony of divine worship or adoration has been observed. Nor are the terms which express God in the different languages so particularized and indubitable as to convince us of their sure and certain signification. The Caribs call God Quayumokan, i.e. Our Big Father, but it is not sufficiently clear whether they mean by this expression the first cause or the most ancient of their ancestors. The Salivas say that Puru made all that is good, that he lives in the expanse of the sky. The Beto yes, before their conversion, used to say that the sun was God, and in their language, they speak of both God and sun as Theos. The nations of the Upper Orinoco, the Atabapo, and the Anirida, as Humboldt records, have no worship other than that of the powers of nature, they call the good principle Kakamana. It is the Manito, the great spirit, that regulates the seasons and favors the harvests, Avich, 2, 362. In Cayenne there is the similar evidence of the Jesuits Grillet and Bechamel, 25, the Nuregs and the Akokwas, in matters of religion, are the same with the Galibis. They acknowledge there is a God, but do not worship Him. They say He dwells in heaven, without knowing whether He is a spirit or no, but rather seem to believe He has a body. The Nuregs and the Akokwas call Him Mayor, and never talk of Him but in fabulous stories. They have not even in their language any suitable term to express the divinity, still less the homage and respect due to him, PBA, 218. The present-day British Guiana Carib name for God is identical with that just given, Tomosi Kabatana, Old Man Sky, Kabut equals the sun, figuratively the Ancient of Heaven, or simply Tomosi, without particularizing. But this word is undoubtedly the same as Tomuchi, the Cayenne Carib term for the headman or chief of a tribe, it serves also to designate a grandfather, PBA, 218. The same remark perhaps may be applicable to Theos, the word given by Gamilla as the Betoya word for the divine person, recognizable in the terms Tuchau, CR, 372, and Teshua, HWB, 241, 244, the name given to the chief, headman. Of the tribe or nation, in the upper and lower Amazons, respectively. Koch Grunberg, 2, 82, talks of Tuscawa as being Lingoa Gerald. Wallace, 348, 2, says that the Indians of the Amazon appear to have no definite idea of a god. The Arawak terms for the Christian deity also show signs that they have been adapted to express a conception to which they could have been introduced only within modern times, a statement which is made advisedly. Because in none of the Arawak myths and legends relative to the creation, even in those published by clerics, is there a single reference to the Allmaker, Br. 58, under the term of Wachinachi, our father, Wamur Takuan, Na, Chi, our maker. Or even Ioman Kondi, dweller on high. It is very noteworthy that the same discrepancy as to the alleged word for God is at once apparent in almost all the creation myths of the other tribes that so far I have managed to unearth, for example, the Warao word, Scr. 2, 515, Quarasabarot. Really intended for Quaresa B.A. Arautu, meaning literally on top belonging to. The only exception perhaps would seem to be the Warao Kananatu, our maker, IT, 366, 
referred to by Brett in his Warau story of the origin of the Caribs, where its introduction is certainly suspicious. Some, of the Orinoco, tribes, Father Colin tells us, considered the sun as the supreme being in first cause, it was to him that they attributed the productions of the earth, scanty or copious rains, and all other temporal blessings. Others, on the contrary, believed that everything depended on the influence of the moon, and conceived, when she suffered an eclipse, that she was angry with them. FD, 51. It is known that the Chaimas, Kumanagotos, Tamanacs, and other original tribes of the Carib people, worshipped, Adoraban, the sun and moon, AR, 185. For perhaps the most extraordinary conception met with, however, concerning ideas of a supreme being, I would quote the reply given to Acuna, 97, by a cacique of one of the Amazon tribes, he told me himself was God, and begotten by the sun. Affirming that his soul went every night into heaven to give orders for the succeeding day, and to regulate the government of the universe. The Tupi language, at least, as taught by the old Jesuits, has a word, Tupana, signifying God, HWB, 259. And so it happened that the little China dolls which Koch Grunberg, 184, presented to the women and children on the Iri River, Rio Negro, were generally called Tupana, the people took them for figures of saints from missionary times. 2. Conversely. It is interesting to note how both travelers and missionaries have assumed almost unconsciously the Indian traditions of certain mythic heroes to be more or less indicative of the view no doubt a priori conscientiously held by the former that the native was not without the knowledge of a god. Thus, Hillhouse, Hick, 244, writing in 1832, makes the statement, blindly followed, strangely enough, by Scomberg, S.C.R., 2, 319, in 1848, that, the Indians acknowledged the existence of a superior divinity, the universal creator. And most tribes, also, believe in a subservient power, whose particular province is the protection of their nation. Amongst the Arawaks, Aluburai is the supreme being, and Kururumani the god or patron, Schutzgott, of the Arawak nation, etc. With regard to the former there is a very probable reference to him under the name of Hubiri, some three centuries previously, in the Archivos de Indias, Patronato, quoted by Rodway in Timeri for 1895, p. 9, where, in an account of the provinces and nations of the Arawakas, Arawaks, by Rodrigo de Navarrete, the latter says, from those whom I have frequently kept in my house. I have understood that their belief and object of adoration is the firmament or heavens, because they say that in the greater heaven there is a powerful lord and a great lady. When they die, their souls will go with Hubiri, as they call the great and powerful lord in heaven. This same Aluburai, or Hubiri, is still recognizable as Haburi, sect. 9. In the stories related by me, and as a boar, the Warau, father of inventions, in the legend told by Brett. In his Arawak vocabulary the name for God is given by Skomberg, SCR, 2, 515, as Kuramani, Brett, Br, 58, however, is more correct in saying that it is the Waraus who sometimes use the word Kororamana when speaking of God. But it is doubtful what ideas some of them attach to that name. As a matter of fact, both of these would-be deities, Aluburai, sect. 3 and Koromana, sect. 19, were Arawak and Warau tribal heroes, respectively. Similar remarks may be made of Makunema and Pia, sects, 29-41, and of Amalavaka, sect. 42, the name Amalavaka is spread over a region of more than 5,000 square leagues. He is found designated as, the father of mankind, or, our great-grandfather, as far as to the Caribbean nations. Amalavaka is not originally the great spirit, the agent of heaven, the invisible being, whose worship springs from that of the powers of nature, when nations rise insensibly to the consciousness of the unity of these powers. He is rather a personage of the heroic times, a man, who, coming from afar, lived in the land of the Tamanacs and the Caribs, sculptured symbolic figures upon the rocks, and disappeared by going back to the country he had previously inhabited beyond the ocean. Avich, 2, 474. 2, 
tribal heroes. Aluburai or Hubiri, Hariwali and the Wonderful Tree, 3-8, The Story of Haburi, 9-18. Kororomana, His Adventures, 19-28. Makunema and Pia. Or, The Sun, The Frog, and the Fire Sticks, Warau Version, 29-34, Carib Version, 35-38, Makusi Version, 39-41. Amalavaka, 42. 3. Some of the mythic heroes have a history peculiarly their own, of which it is now proposed to give a few particulars. I will begin with Aluburai, or Hubiri, for whom Hillhouse, as already stated, sect. 2. Found a place in the Arawak cosmogony, a view which Skomberg endorsed, with a reference to him, however, as one, who does not trouble himself about men. In Brett's time, however, and at the present day, Throughout the Pomeroon district the hero seemingly appears only under the name Haburi. The Pomeroon Warau now claim Haburi as their particular hero, in just the same way as Brett, BRB, 76, did for them under the name Abor. For my own part one suspect that the term Aluburai is but another form of the name Oropuri, the mythical Carib snake, sect. 235, which gave rise to all the hunting Binas, and that Haburi has some philological connection with Yapri Kuli, the hero, sect. 45, of the Susi branch of the Arawak stock. It is only for the reason that an old Arawak friend identified Hariwali, C.F. Arawanali, S.E.C. 185, with Haburi, an identity which I admittedly can neither confirm nor challenge, that I propose beginning with these mythic heroes by introducing the story of Hariwali and the Wonderful Tree, A. Hariwali was a clever, painstaking P.I. who spent most of his time in clearing the field for his two wives. These two women, their children, and his brother lived with him at his house. While felling the timber, the wives undertook, turn and turn about, to bring their husband some Kasiri daily. It happened now that while carrying the usual refreshment one of the wives was met by the brother-in-law, who was bringing in some Itaritai strands to weave baskets with. Hello, he said, where are you going? To which he received reply, I am taking Kasiri to my husband, the field dot, but I like you. Do you like me? No, I don't, he answered, and even if I did, my brother, being a medicine man, would find it out very soon. She tried him again, and tempted him sorely, and then she threw her arms round him. He was but mortal. She assured him that her husband would never find out what had happened, and both went their respective ways. Before she reached the field, however, she broke the calabash, then with a pointed stick she cut her knee, causing it to bleed. When Hariwali saw her coming slowly along with a limp carrying the broken calabash, he asked her what had happened. All she could do was to point to the scratch and blood on her lame knee, and tell him that she had had an accident, having fallen on a stump. He was a shrewd P.I., however, and knew exactly what had happened, and though he said nothing then, he determined not only upon getting rid of her, but of his other wife also, he just then, however, directed her to return home. 4. Next morning he bade both the women accompany him, as he intended fishing in the pond, and he merely wanted them to do the cooking and make the fire. When fire had been made, he brought them a turtle, which they put on the hot ashes without killing it, so it promptly crawled out, they pushed it on again, but with the same result. It was the omen betokening their death. The semi-shishi, medicine man, had bewitched them and they thought they had already killed the turtle. What they imagined was that the fire was not hot enough, and so the faithless spouse went to look for more dry wood. Now, as she was breaking up the timber she found it very hard work, and exclaimed Tata, Katayaba, lit. Hard, to break, but no sooner were the words out of her mouth, than she flew away as a hawk, the bull Tata, which can often be heard crying bull Tata Tata Tata. Of course it was her husband who had done this. The other wife said she felt hot and would bathe her skin, no sooner had she ducked into the pond, then her husband turned her into a porpoise, she was the very first porpoise that ever swam in these waters. 5. Hariwali thus punished his wives, and now pondered over what he should do with his brother. 
While returning home, he met the very man with bow and arrows starting out to hunt, but neither spoke. That same afternoon the brother, who had never missed a bird before, made a bad shot every time now, the arrow invariably flying absurdly wide of its mark. This was really all Harawali's doing. At last the brother did manage to hit a bird, but only just hard enough to knock a few feathers off, nothing more. Don't do that again, said the bird, and now look behind you. And when he did so, there was a large sheet of water, and he realized that he was upon an island. But how to escape? Round and round he wandered, until he finally found a path, no ordinary path, but a Yawahu's path leading to the spirit's house. Arrived at the house, the Yawahu caught him, and took all his bones out except those of his fingers, this was done only out of kindness, so that he could not escape, the Yawahu putting him into a hammock and paying him every care and attention. 3. The bones themselves were tied up in a bundle under the roof, as bundles are kept by many other Indian tribes. The Yawahu was quite a family man, with plenty of youngsters who were always practicing with their bows and arrows. When their arrows got blunted they had only to go up to the captive's hammock and sharpen them on his bony fingertips. All this time, Harawali's mother would cry regularly every night over her absent son, whose whereabouts and condition she was absolutely eager aunt of. So at last the P.I.'s heart became softened, and he determined on going to fetch his brother home again. It was all due to his medicine that his brother fell into the clutches of the spirits. He told the old woman to pack up everything, because when he returned with his brother they and all their family would have to leave the place forever. 6. The night previous to their departure, he played the shack shack, i.e. called up his spirit friends with the rattle, and next morning hosts of parrots were passing overhead. His children called his attention to them. So he went out and asked the birds to throw down a seed of a certain tree the bark of which he used medicinally. This they did, and though the youngeters saw the seed falling, directly it touched ground the father put his foot on it, and look as much as they could, the children could not find it. As he did not want them to know what he was doing, he told them that nothing had fallen, that they must be mistaken, and that they must run away now. Young folk are not allowed to see what the old medicine men practice. When left alone, Hariwali planted the identical seed just where it had fallen, and that same evening repeated the performance with the rattle, by next morning a stately tree had grown from that one seed. He told his mother to tie all the things which she had packed up, on the branches of this tree, sect. 286, and to await his and his brother's return. 7. It was not long before he reached the Yawahu's place, where, the family being away, he had no difficulty in releasing the captive, untying the bones from the roof, and making good his escape. Unfortunately the spirit returned earlier than was expected, and seeing the empty hammock and no parcel of bones, was not long in concluding what had happened. He recognized the fresh tracks, and put his dogs on the scent. Poor Hariwali and his brother. They heard the barking of the dogs and the whistling of the spirit, and barely had time to crawl into an armadillo hole. They just managed to get out of sight when Yawahu came up, threatening that if they did not come out, he would drive a stick into them, the fugitives laid low, and said nothing. Yawahu then shoved a stick in, but Hariwali touched it with his hand, and changed it into a bushmaster snake. This is why, even to the present day, a bushmaster snake is always found in an armadillo hole. At any rate, Yawahu on seeing the serpent thought he must have been mistaken in following the tracks and retraced his steps. Having put the bones back into his brother's skin, and waiting till the coast was clear, Hariwali led the way home. 8. And how glad their mother was to see them. She had everything packed away in and among the branches of the big tree, and she herself, her daughter, and the grandchildren were all prepared for a long journey. As night fell, they all, big and little, climbed up into the lower branches, finding shelter among the leaves while Hariwali made his way up to the very summit and began again the shakshak -shak performance. This continued till quite into the middle of the night, when all of a sudden, the family below felt the tree shaking, and heard rumbling noises, followed by a quivering, and experienced a sensation of the trunk being rooted out of the sand. And starting to fly up into the air. 
Now, it was just about the moment when they were off on their proposed journey that the old woman's daughter, the P.I.'s sister, felt a bit chilly, and casting her eyes downward, remembered that she had left her apron behind in the house. All she could do was to shout out to her brother above, the Kyodaiba, lit. My apron back, I have forgotten my apron, and he told her to slip down quickly and fetch it. But by the time she had reached the old home, she was changed into a wasisai duck, Honus autumnalis, which even yet can always be heard saying to Kyodaiba, but as it only whistles these two words. They do not sound so distinctly as if they were spoken slowly. As to the rest of the family, well, we know that the wonderful tree flew away somewhere, but we have never heard anything more about the people who were on it. The Story of Haburi, W. 9. Long ago, there were two sisters minding themselves. They had no man to look after them. One day they cut down an ite tree, Mauritia, from which they commenced to manufacture flour. It was now late, so they left their work and went home. Next morning when they went back, the starch was lying there already prepared, and they were much puzzled to know how this came to be so. Next day, the same thing happened, all the ite starch was found ready, and this happened again, and often. So one night they watched, and about the middle of the night they saw one of the leaves of the neighboring manacle tree, Euterpe sp. Bend gradually over and over until it touched the cut which they had made in the trunk of the ite palm lying beneath. As soon as the leaf actually touched, both sisters rushed up and caught hold of it, begging it earnestly to turn into a man. It refused at first, but as they begged so earnestly it did so. His name was Mayarakoto. The big, elder, Sister was now happy and by and by she had a beautiful baby boy, called Haburi. 10. The two women had their hunting ground near two ponds. One of these ponds belonged to Tiger, but the other one was their own, in which they therefore used to fish. And they told Mayarakoto not to go to Tiger's pond. The man, however, said, Our pond has very few fish in it, but Tiger's has plenty. I am going to fish in his. He did so, but Tiger came along and caught and killed him for stealing his fish. Tiger then took Mayarakoto's shape and form, and returned to the spot where the two women were camped. It was very late when he came and quite dark. With him he brought not only Mayarakoto's wayari, a temporary openwork basket made of palm leaf, but in it the fish the latter had stolen before being killed. Tiger put down the wayari, as is customary, before coming into the house, and after telling them good night, lit. I am come, said he had brought some fish. Both women were astonished at the coarse, rough voice. He then said he was much tired, and would lie down in his hammock, telling them that he would nurse Haburi, who was accordingly brought to him. He told them also that he was going to sleep, and that they must bring up the fish and cook it, but not to mind him. The women cooked the fish. When cooked, and while the women were eating it, the man fell asleep and began to snore very curiously and loudly, indeed, so loud that you could have heard him on the other side of the river. And while snoring, he called the father's name, Mayarakoto. The two women looked at each other, and they listened. They said, our husband never snored like that, he never called his own name before. They therefore stopped eating at once, and told each other that this man could not possibly be their husband. And they pondered as to how they were going to get Haburi out of the man's arms where he was resting. Making a bundle of a particular kind of bark, they slipped it under the child and so got him away, then they quickly made off with him while the man was still snoring. With them they also took a wax light and a bundle of firewood. 11. While going along, they heard Wauyuda singing. Wauyuda was a woman in those days, indeed she was a P.I. woman, and she was just then singing with her shack shack, rattle. The two women went on and on, quickly too, for they knew that once they arrived at Wau Yuta's place they would be safe. In the meantime, the tiger man woke up and found the bark bundle in his arms instead of little Haburi, and both the sisters gone. So he got angry, he changed back into his animal shape, and hurried after them. The women heard him coming and hurried still more. They called out, Wau Yuta. Open the door. Who is there, said Wauyuda, 
To which she received reply, It is we. The two sisters. But while Yuda would not open the door. So the mother pinched little Haburi's ears and made him cry. Directly while Yuda heard it she shouted out, What child is that? Is it a girl or a boy? It is my Haburi, a boy, was the mother's reply, upon which while Yuda opened the door immediately and said, Come in. Come in. Just after they had all got in, Tiger arrived and, calling out to Wao Yuda, asked her where the two women and the baby had gone. But Wao Yuda lied, telling that she had not seen them, that she had seen no one. Tiger, however, could tell by the scent that they were there, so he waited outside, and refused to go away. This vexed Wao Yuda, who became very angry, and told him that he might just put his head in, and have a look round, and if he saw them, he could eat them if he liked. But the door was covered with pimplers, thorns, and as soon as silly tiger put his head in, the old woman closed it, and so killed him. The two sisters remained there, and cried much, they grieved for their husband. They cried so much indeed that while Yuda told them to go into the field, gather some cassava, and make a big drink. They accordingly got ready to go, and were about to take Haburi with them, but while Yuda said, no. I am quite able to look after the child in your absence. So they did as they were told and went away to the field. 12. In the meantime while Yuda made the child grow all at once into a youth, and gave him the hairy hairy to blow and the arrows to shoot. As the mother and aunt were returning with the cassava, they heard the music playing and said to themselves, There was no man or boy there when we left the house, who can it be? It must be a man playing. And though ashamed they went in and saw the youth blowing the hairy hairy. As soon as they had taken the quakes, baskets, from off their backs and placed them on the ground, they asked after Haburi, but while Yuda said that as soon as they had left for the field, the child had run after them. And she had thought it was still with them. Of course all this was a lie. Old while Yuda was desirous of making Haburi grow quickly, with the intention of making him ultimately her lover. She still further deceived the two sisters by pretending to assist in the search which was then undertaken in the surrounding bush, but she took good care to get back to her house first, and told Haburi to say she, Wao Yuda, was his mother. And gave him full directions as to how he must treat her. 13. Haburi was a splendid shot, no bird could escape his arrow, and Wao Yuda directed him to give to her all the big birds that he killed, and to his mother and aunt all the little ones, which he had to pollute first by fouling them. The object of this was to make the two sisters so vexed and angry that they would leave the place, but this they would not do, they continued searching the neighborhood for their little child. This sort of thing went on for many days, big birds and dirted little birds being presented by Haburi to Wao Yuda and the two women, respectively. Haburi, however, did one day miss a bird for the first time, his arrow sticking into a branch overhanging a creek where his uncles, the water dogs, used to come and feed. It was a nice cleared space, and here Haburi eased himself, covering the dung with leaves. He next climbed the tree to dislodge the arrow, but just then the water dogs arrived, and, scenting the air, exclaimed, What smell is this? That worthless nephew of ours, Haburi, must be somewhere about. So they looked around, and down, and up, and finally discovering him on the tree branch, ordered him to come down. They then sat him on a bench, and told him he was leading a bad life, that the old woman was not his mother, but that the two younger ones were his mother and aunt, respectively. They furthermore impressed upon him that it was very wicked of him to divide the bird so unfairly, and that in future he must do exactly the opposite, giving his real mother, the bigger of the two sisters, the larger birds. They told him also to let his real mother know that the way he had hitherto treated her was due entirely to ignorance on his part, and that he was sorry. 14. So when Haburi got home that day, he carried out the instructions given him by the water dogs, handing the dirted little birds to Wao Yuda, and making a clean breast of it to his mother. She, poor thing, felt very strange that day, and could not bring herself to speak to him as, my son, all at once, but when he explained that it was only Wao Yuda who had made him a man quite suddenly, she believed him, and became quite comforted. Old Wao Yuda, on hearing all this, 
worked herself into a great passion, and, seizing Haburi by the neck, blew into his face, sect. 85, and told him he must be mad, so angered and upset was she that she could eat nothing at all. She spent all that day and night in nagging him, and telling him he had left his senses. Haburi went away next morning as usual, returning late in the afternoon, when he again gave the big birds which he had shot to his real mother and the dirted little ones to Wauyuta. The latter, as might have been expected, gave him no peace. 15. Haburi, therefore, made up his mind to get out. So telling his mother that they must all three arrange to get away together, he made a little coriel, a dugout canoe, of beeswax, and when completed, he left it at the waterside. But, by next morning a black duck had taken it away. He therefore made another little clay coriel, but this was stolen by another kind of duck. In the meantime he cut a large field, and cleared it so quickly that the women with their planting could never keep up with him. They required plenty of cassava for their proposed journey. At any rate, while the women planted, Haburi would often slip away and make a boat, always of a different kind of wood and of varying shape, and just as regularly would a different species of duck come and steal it. At last he happened to make one out of the silk cotton tree and this particular one was not stolen. It was thus Haburi who first made a boat and taught the ducks to float on the surface of the water because it was with his boats that they managed to do it, indeed, we Warau say that each duck has its own particular kind of boat. 16. But what was more curious, the last boat to be manufactured was found next morning to be very much bigger than it was the night before. Haburi told his mother and her sister to collect all the provisions and put them aboard in anticipation of their long journey. He himself returned to the field, bringing the cassava cuttings for old Wauyuta to plant in their respective holes, and so they both continued working hard. By and by, he slipped away, went back to the house, took his arrows and axe, and proceeded down to the waterside. But before he left the house, he told the posts not to talk, for in those days the posts of a house could speak, sect. 169, and if the owner were absent a visitor could thus find out his whereabouts. There was a parrot, however, in the house, and Haburi quite forgot to warn him to keep silent. So when the old woman after a time found herself alone, she went back to the house, and seeing no Haburi, asked the posts whither he had gone, they remained silent. The parrot, however, could not help talking, and told her. 17. While Yuda thereupon rushed down to the landing, arriving there just in time to see Haburi stepping into the boat to join his mother and aunt. She seized hold of the craft, screaming, My son! My son! You must not leave me so! I am your mother, and though they all repeatedly struck her fingers with their paddles, and almost smashed them to pieces on the gunwale, she would not let go her hold. So poor Haburi had perforce to land again and with old Wauyuta proceeded to a large hollow tree wherein the bees had built their nest. Cutting down the tree, Haburi made a small hole in the trunk, and told the old lady to get in and suck the honey. She was very fond of honey, and though crying very hard all the time at the thought of losing Haburi, crawled through the little opening which he immediately closed in upon her. And there she is to be found to the present day, the Wauyuta frog which is heard only in hollow trees. And if you look carefully, you will see how swollen her fingers are from the way in which they were bashed by the paddles when she tried to hold on to the gunwale. If you listen, you can also hear her lamenting for her lost lover. She still cries Wang. 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 18. The tree frog above referred to is probably the Kono, Bo, Aru, or Rain Frog, the name given to the old woman in the Carib version of the story, sect. 35. The croaking of this creature, Hyla Venulosa Dud, is an absolutely sure sign of rain. This frog lives only in the trunk of the Bodelschwingia macrophylla klotsch, a tree found on the Pulmaroon in Barama, SCR, 2, 419. Though the Waraus are believed to have been the first of the Guiana Indians to use boats, the invention of the sail has been credited to the Caribs. A modern addition to the above version of the story is that Haburi sailed away, found new lands, and taught the white people all their arts and manufactures, all about guns and ships.
and for many years used to send his old Warau friends certain presents annually, but they never come now, an unscrupulous government detains them in Georgetown. 19. With regard to Koroyamana, or Kuramani, the same remarks concerning his tribal origin apply as in the case of Haburi. Hillhouse and Skomberg, SCR, 2, 319, seemingly would have him an Arawak, but Brett undoubtedly makes him a Warau, the view which is held by the present-day Waraus and Arawaks on the Pomeroon. He is said to be the creator of the male portion of mankind, another spirit, Kalimina, for being responsible for the female. Yuri Kato Nemeshi are his two wives, one name signifying darkness people, a worker in darkness, and the other a large red ant that burrows in the earth. Together, they are typical of the creation of all things out of the earth in the dark, Hic, 244. Kororomana would seem to have experienced a remarkable number and variety of adventures some of which are given here. The Adventures of Kororomana, W. Kororomana went out hunting and shot a baboon, my seats, but as it was already late in the afternoon, in trying to make his way home he lost his way in the darkness. And there he had to make his banab, and to lie down, with the baboon beside him. But where he lay was a habu road. You can always distinguish a spirit road from any other pathway in the forest because the hebas occupying the trees that lie alongside it are always, especially at night, striking the branches and trunks. And so producing short sharp crackling noises, sect. 104. It was not pleasant for poor Koromana, especially as the baboon's body was now beginning to swell with all the noxious humors inside. Lest the hebas should steal it from him, he was obliged to keep the carcass alongside and watch over it with a stick. At last he fell asleep, but in the middle of the night the hebus, what with the knocking on the trees, aroused him from his slumbers. Now that he was awake, he mimicked the spirits, blow for blow, and as they struck the limb of a tree, Kororomana would strike the belly of the baboon. But what with the air inside, each time he struck the animal, there came a resonant boom. Boom! Just like the beating of a drum.5 the Habu leader heard the curious sound, and became a bit frightened, what can it be? When before I knocked a tree, it never made a noise like that. To make sure, however, he struck the tree hard again, and boom! Came once more from the carcass. Habu was really frightened now, and began to search all around to find out where the extraordinary noise could possibly come from, at last he recognized the little manic old banup, and saw Kororomana laughing. Indeed, the latter could not help laughing, considering that it was the first time he had heard such a funny sound come out of any animal. 20. Habu then said to him, Who are you? Show me your hand, to which Kororomana replied, I am Warau, and here is my hand, but instead of putting out his own, he shoved forward one of the baboons, and then held forward the animal's other hand, and finally both feet. Habu was much puzzled and said he had never seen before a warau with so black a hand, and would not be satisfied until he saw the face. Kororomana accordingly deceived him again and held out the monkeys, which caused Habu to make the same remark about his face as he had done about his hands and feet. 21. The spirit became more frightened than ever, but his curiosity exceeded his fear, because he next wanted to know where all that boom. Boom! Sound had come from. And when he learned its source of origin, breaking wind, he regretted that he had not been made like ordinary mortals, he and all his family having no proper posteriors, but just a red spot, sect. 99. He thereupon begged Kororomana to make for him a posterior which would allow of his producing a similar sound. So with his bow Kororomana split the spirit's hind quarters, and completed the task by impaling him, but so rough was he in his methods, that the weapon transfixed the whole body even piercing the unfortunate Habu's head. The Habu cursed Kororomana for having killed him, and threatened that the other spirits would avenge his death, he then disappeared. 22. Our hero, becoming a bit anxious on his own account, and, recognizing by the gradually increasing hullabaloo in the trees that swarms of hebus were approaching the scene of the outrage, now climbed the manacle tree sheltering his banab, leaving the baboon's corpse inside. The spirits then entered the banab, and believing the dead animal to be Kororomana, began hitting it with their sticks, and with each blow, 
there came boom. Our friend up the tree, whence he could watch their every movement, and their surprise at the acoustic results of the flogging, could not refrain from cracking a smile, which soon gave way to a hearty laugh. The spirits, unfortunately for him, heard it, and looking at the dead baboon, said, This cannot be the person who is laughing at us. They looked all around, but could see nothing, until one of them stood on his head, and peeped up into the tree. Six and there, sure enough, he saw Koromana laughing at them. All the others then put themselves in the same posture around the tree, and had a good look at him. The question they next had to decide was how to catch him. This they concluded could most easily be managed by hewing down the tree. They accordingly started with their axes on the trunk, but since the implements were but water turtle shells, it was not long before they broke. Seven they then sent for their knives, but as these were merely the seed pods of the Bwari tree, they also soon broke point eight the Hebus then sent for a rope, but what they called a rope was really a snake. At any rate, as the serpent made its way farther and farther up the tree, and finally came within reach, Koromana cut its head off, the animal fell to the ground again, and the Hebus cried, Our rope has burst. Another consultation was held, and it was decided that one of their number should climb the tree, seize the man, and throw him down, and that those below might be ready to receive him when dislodged, the Habu was to shout out. When throwing him down, the following signal, Turabuna se Maharakeo Nakai. Nine the biggest of the spirits being chosen to carry the project into execution, he started on his climb, but head downward of course, so as to be able to see where he was going. Kororomana, however, was on the alert, and, waiting for him, killed him in the same peculiar manner as that in which he had dispatched the other spirit just a little while before. More than this, having heard them fix upon the preconcerted signal, he hurled the dead spirit's body down with the cry of Turabuna se Maharakeo Nakai. The Hebus below were quite prepared, and as soon as the body fell to the ground, clubbed it to pieces. Koromana then slipped down and helped in the dissolution. Wait a bit, he said to the spirits. I am just going in the bush, but will soon return. It was not very long, however, before the spirits saw that they had been tricked, and yelled with rage on finding that they had really destroyed one of themselves. They hunted high and low for their man, but with approaching daylight were reluctantly compelled to give up the chase. 23. In the meantime, Koromana had no sooner got out of their sight than he started running at topmost speed, and finally found shelter in a hollow tree. Here he discovered a woman, she was not old either, so he told her that he would remain with her till, the day cleaned, i.e., till dawn broke. But she said, No. No. My man is snake and he will be back before the dawn. If he were to find you here, he would certainly kill you. But her visitor was not to be frightened, and he stayed where he was. True enough, before dawn, Snake came wending his way home, and as he crawled into the tree, he was heard to exclaim, Hello. I can smell someone. Koromana was indeed frightened now, and was at his wit's end to know what to do. Just then dawn broke, and they heard a hummingbird. That is my uncle, said our hero. They then heard the Doraquara, that also is an uncle of mine, he added. Ten he purposely told Snake all this to make him believe that, if he killed and swallowed his visitor, all the other hummingbirds and Doraquaras would come and avenge his death. But Snake said, I am not afraid of either of your uncles, but will gobble them up. Just then, a chicken hawk, Eurabidinga, flew along, which made Snake ask whether that also was an uncle of his. To be sure, was the reply, and when I am dead, he also will come and search for me. It was now Snake's turn to be frightened, because Chicken Hawk used always to get the better of him. So he let Koromana go in peace, who ran out of that hollow tree pretty quick. 24. It was full daylight now, but this made little odds, because he had still lost his way, and knew not how to find the road home. After wandering on and on, he at last came across a track, recognizable by the footprints in it, Following this up, he came upon a hollow tree that had fallen across the path, and inside the trunk he saw a baby. This being a Habu's child, he slaughtered it, but he had no sooner done so than he heard approaching footsteps, 
which caused him promptly to climb a neighboring tree and await developments. These were not long in coming, for the mother soon put in her appearance, as soon as she recognized her dead infant, she was much angered, and, looking around, carefully examined the fresh tracks, and said, this is the man who has killed my child. Her next move was to dig up a bit of the soil marked by one of the fresh footprints, wrap it up in a leaf tied with bush rope, and hang it on a branch while she went for firewood. Directly her back was turned, Koromana slid down from his hiding place, undid the bundle, and threw away the contents, substituting a footprint of the spirit woman. Then, tying up the parcel as before, he hung it where it had been left, and hid himself once more. When the woman returned with the firewood, she made a big fire, and threw the bundle into the flames, saying as she did so, Curse the person whose footprint I now burn. May the owner fall into this fire also. She thought that if she burnt the footmark so would the person's shadow be drawn to the fire. But no one came, and she felt that her own shadow was being impelled. Oh! It seems that I am hurting myself. The fire is drawing me near, she exclaimed. Twice was she thus dragged toward it against her will, and yet she succeeded in resisting. But on the third occasion she could not draw back, she fell in, and was burnt to ashes. She roasted herself dead. 11. 25. Koromana was again free to travel, but which direction to follow was the puzzle, he had still lost his way home. All he could do was to walk more or less aimlessly on, passing creek after creek and back into the bush again, until he emerged on a beautiful, clean roadway. But no sooner had he put his foot on it, then it stuck there, just like a fish caught in a spring trap. And this is exactly what the trap really was, save that it had been set by the hebus. He pulled and he tugged and he twisted, but try as he might, he could not get away. He fouled himself over completely, and then lay quite still, pretending to be dead. The flies gathered on him and these were followed by the worms, but he continued to lie quite still. By and by two of the spirits came along, and one of them said, Hello. I have luck today. My spring trap has caught a fish at last, but when he got closer, he added, Oh. I have left it too long. It stinks. However, they let loose their fish, as they thought it was, and carried it down to the riverside to wash and clean it. After they had washed it, one of the hebas said, Let us slit its belly now, and remove the entrails, but the other one remarked, No, let us make a wayeri, basket, first, to put the flesh in. This was very fortunate for Koromana, who, seizing the opportunity while they went collecting strands to plate with, rolled down the river bank into the water and so made good his escape. But when he succeeded in landing on the other side, he was, in a sense, just as badly off as before, not knowing how to get home. 26. Koromana next came across a man's skull lying on the ground, and what must he do but go and jerk his arrow into its eyeball? Now this skull, Kwamohu, was a habu, who thereupon called out, You must not do that. But now that you have injured me, you will have to carry me. So Koromana had to get a strip of bark, the same kind which our women employ for fastening on their field quakes, and carry the skull wherever he went, and feed it too. If he shot bird or beast, he always had to give a bit to Kwamohu, with the result that the latter soon became gradually and inconveniently heavier, until one day he became so great a dead weight as to break the bark strip support. The accident occurred not very far from a creek, and Koromana told Kwamohu to stay still while he went to look for a stronger strip of bark. Of course this was only an excuse, because directly he had put the skull on the ground, he ran as fast as he could toward the creek, overtaking on the way a deer that was running in exactly the same direction, swam across. And rested himself on the opposite side. In the meantime Kwamohu, suspecting that he was about to be forsaken, ran after Koromana, and seeing but the deer in front of him, mistook it for his man and killed it just as it reached the water. On examining the carcass, the habu exclaimed, when he got to its toes, sect. 126, well, that is indeed very strange. You have only two fingers. And though he reckoned again and again, he could make no more, but the man I am after had five fingers, and a long nose. 
you must be somebody else. 12 Now Kororomana, who was squatting just over on the opposite bank, heard all this, and burst out laughing. This enraged Kwamohu, who left the deer, and made a move as if to leap across the creek, but, having no legs, he could not jump properly, and hence fell into the water and was drowned. All the ants then came out of his skull. Point 13. 27. Poor Kororomana was still as badly off as before, he was unable to find his way home. But he bravely kept on his way and at last came upon an old man bailing water out of a pond. The latter was really a habu, whose name was Hudakurakura, Red Back, Sect. 99. Hudakurakura, being anxious to get the fish, was bailing away at the water side as hard as he could go, but having no calabash had to make use of his purse, scrotum, which was very large. And while thus bending down, he was so preoccupied that he did not hear the footfall of Kororomana coming up behind. The latter, not knowing what sort of a creature it was, stuck him twice in the back with an arrow, but Hudakurakura, thinking it to be a cowfly, Tabanis, just slapped the spot where he felt it. When, however, he found himself stuck a third time, he turned round and, seeing who it was, became so enraged that he seized the wanderer and hurled him into a piece of wood with such force that only his eye projected from out the timber. Anxious to be freed from his unenviable position Kororomana offered everything he could think of, crystals, rattles, piwari, women, etc. But the spirit wanted none of them, as a last chance, he offered tobacco, and this the habu eagerly accepted, the result being that they fast became good friends. They then both emptied the pond and collected a heap of fish, much too large for Kororomana to carry home. So the spirit in some peculiar way bound them all up into quite a small bundle, small enough for Kororomana to carry in his hand. 28. Kororomana now soon managed to find the right path home, because each and every animal that he met gave him news of his mother. One after the other, he met a rat with a potato, an akuri with cassava root, a laba with a yam, a deer with a cassava leaf, a kushiant with a similar leaf on its head, and a bush cow, taper, eating a pineapple. And as he asked each in turn whence it had come, the animal said, I have been to your mother, and have begged potato, cassava, yam, and other things from her. When at length he reached home, and his wife and mother asked what he had brought, he told them a lot of fish, and they laughed right heartily at what they thought was his little joke. So he bade them open the parcel, and as they opened it, sure enough out came fish after fish, small and large, fish of all kinds, so many in fact that the house speedily became filled, and the occupants had to shift outside. CF Sect. 303. 28a. Note. In a Carib version of the story the hero's name is given as Kirkirk Miuo, and he finds his way back home to his mother's place through the help of a butterfly. When I happened to mention to the narrator that this was the first time I had ever heard a Nancy story about this insect, he told me that the butterfly was always a good friend of the Caribs. Does it not, he added, come and drink of the washings from the Kasiri jar, and remain stuck in the mess? I.e., does it not come and join in our feasts, and get so drunk that it cannot fly away? W.E.R. 29. Makunema, or Makunema, the alleged god, SCR, 2, 225, 515, or Supreme Being, IT, 365, of the Akaways, the maker of heaven and earth, SCR, 2, 319, of the Makusis. Was one of the twin children of the sun, in this particular all the traditions concerning him are in agreement. He and his brother Pia may be regarded as both Akawai and Makusi heroes. The name itself, Makunema, signifies, one that works in the dark, Hik, 244, the being working in opposition to him, according to Makusi beliefs, is Epple, SCR, Lok Sit. I am fortunately able to give three versions of the tradition of these heroes, from Warao, Carib, and Makusi sources, respectively. The sun, the frog, and the fire sticks, W. Nahakaboni, lit. The one who eats plenty, was an old man who, never having had a daughter, was beginning to feel anxious about his declining years, for, unlike the other old people around, he of course had no son-in-law to care for him. 
He therefore carved a daughter for himself out of a plum tree, and being a medicine man, so skillfully did he cut and carve the timber that by the time the task was completed there was indeed a woman lovely to gaze upon. Her name was Usidio, lit. Seed tree, and her physical charms were almost, but, as we shall presently see, not quite, perfect. So attractive was she that all the animals, bird and beast, came from far to court her, but the old man liked none of them, and when they asked him for her as wife he gave them a curt refusal. The old man had a very poor opinion of the abilities of these prospective sons-in-law. But when Yar, the son himself, stopped on his journey, and paid the old man a visit, it was quite clear what his purpose was, and proof was not long in coming that his advances would meet with encouragement. 30. Nahakaboni thought he would try Yar's metal, and see what stuff he was made of. He told Yar to feed him, and made him fetch along all the barbecued meat that he had brought with him on his journey, and had left at the edge of the bush. He ate very heartily, as might have been expected from the name given him, leaving only a quarter of the meat for his visitor. He next told Yar to give him drink, the latter emptied a big jugful down his throat. His next order to Yar was to bring him water to bathe with, and for this purpose gave him a quake.14 but when the poor fellow put the quake into the waterhole, and pulled it out again, the water of course all escaped. He tried many times, but it continued to escape. Just then he heard a rushing sound proceeding from the bush, and there appeared a habu, when the latter learned what he was trying to do, he offered his assistance, and made the water remain in the quake. The would-be bridegroom carried it to his prospective father-in-law, and bathed him. The old man then told Yar to shoot some fish for him. That he would find the coriel at the waterside, a bench for it under the roots of a particular tree, and an arrow lying in the shade of another. It is true the coriel was at the waterside. It was really lying under water and was a very heavy one, but the young man managed to haul it up at last, and then bail it out. Proceeding to the particular tree indicated, and looking in and among the roots he was surprised and frightened at seeing an alligator there, he held on to its neck, and it changed into a bench which fitted the boat. Fifteen in the shade of the other tree he was similarly taken aback when a big snake came into view, he seized its neck, however, and it changed into a fish arrow. The old man now joined him, they got into the coriel and paddled down the stream. I want some Kwabaihi sixteen fish, said the old man, but you must not look into the water. Shoot up into the air. His companion did as he was told, and so skillful was he with the bow that the arrow pierced the fish and killed it. So big was the fish that when hauled in it almost sunk the coriel, they managed to get it home, however. 31. The old man was now thoroughly satisfied with Yar's worth, and gave him his plum tree daughter, Eusidiu. Next morning the young couple went out hunting in the bush. Seventeen when they returned late in the afternoon, father and daughter had a long and earnest conversation of a private and somewhat delicate nature. The outcome of which was that the old man learnt for the first time that the masterpiece upon which he had expended so much time, skill, and cunning, was not quite perfect. Her husband had found fault with her. Hunting was resumed the following day, a private conversation was again held in the late afternoon, the result of which showed clearly that the fault complained of still remained. The distracted father could only assure her that he could do nothing further to render her acceptable to his son-in-law. When the latter heard this, he consulted a Biunia bird, a Pistocomus, whom he brought back with him next day. While being nursed and fed in the girl's lap, the wretched bird forcibly took a very mean advantage of her innocence, and then flew away. This outrage having been brought to the knowledge of the father, he determined upon giving his daughter one more trial, with the result that he succeeded in removing a snake ex part questa personae ius. The difficulty was now remedied and the young woman went once more to join her husband. The following afternoon, on their return from the usual hunt, father and daughter met again in private conversation. Happy girl. Her husband was quite satisfied with her, having no complaint whatever to make. 32. Now although the old man purposely evinced no signs of ill-will, he was greatly displeased with his son-in-law, not only for expressing discontent with the piece of sculpture when it first came into his possession. 
but also for having allowed the bunya bird to tinker with it. He bided his time, waiting for his revenge to come when the young man should complete the customary marriage tasks, the cutting of a field, and the building of a house for him. It was not long before Yer commenced cutting the field, he worked at it early, he worked at it late, and at last told his wife to let her father know that it was ready for his inspection. The old man went to have a look and on his return home told his daughter that he found fault with it. The young couple then went off to inspect the field on their own account. They were much surprised to see all the trees and bushes standing there, just as luxuriant as before, little dreaming that Nahakaboni by means of his medicine had caused this rapid growth to take place only the night before. Yar had therefore to cut another and a bigger field, and just the same thing happened as before, the old father again expressing himself in terms of strong disapproval. How is this, said Yar to his wife. I have cut a field twice, and yet the old man is not satisfied with it. She thereupon advised him to cut a third field, but on this occasion suggested, in addition, his pulling out all the stumps by their roots. Having cut the third field, he started pulling up the stumps, it is true that he started on many, but he did not succeed in pulling out one. He fell down exhausted. By and by, his old friend the Habu put in an appearance, and seeing his distress, offered to do the job for him, advising him to return home at once and to tell his wife that the field was now thoroughly cleared. Nahakaboni went next morning to inspect, and planted the field with cassava, plantains, and all other useful plants he returned in the evening, but spake never a word. This made Yer suspicious, so getting up early the following day, he was much surprised to find in place of an empty field, a beautiful crop of ripe cassava, plantains, and all the other good things that his belly might yearn for. But anger still rankled in the old man's breast, so that when his son-in-law started on and completed his other marriage task, the building of a house, the old man again found fault, pulled it down, and said he wanted it built stronger. Yar accordingly rebuilt it with Purple Heart, the hardest timber he could find. Nahakaboni, pleased at last, took charge of the house, and lived there. 33. Yar, the son, was now free to look after his own domestic affairs, and being well satisfied with his wife, they lived very, very happily together. One day he told her he proposed taking a journey to the westward, but that as she was now pregnant, she had better travel at her leisure she would not be able to keep pace with him. He would start first, and she must follow his tracks. She must always take the right-hand track, he would scatter feathers on the left so that she could make no mistake. Accordingly, next morning when she commenced her journey, there was no difficulty in finding her way, by avoiding the feathers, but by and by she arrived at a spot where the wind had blown them away, and then the trouble began. 18 What was the poor woman to do now that she had lost her way? Her very motherhood proved her salvation, because her unborn babe began talking, and told her which path to follow. And as she wandered on and ever on, her child told her to pluck the pretty flowers whose little heads bobbed here and there over the roadway. She had picked some of the red and yellow ones, when a marabunta, wasp, happened to sting her below the waist, in trying to kill it she missed the insect and struck herself. The unborn baby, however, misinterpreted her action, and thinking that it was being smacked, became vexed and refused any longer to show its mother which direction to pursue. The result was that the poor woman got hopelessly astray, and at last more dead than alive found herself in front of a very large house whose only occupant was Nanyabo, lit. A big kind of frog, a very old and very big woman. Saying, how day, to each other, the visitor was asked her business. She was trying to find her husband the son, but she had lost the road, and she was so very weary. Nanyabo, the frog, therefore bade the woman welcome, and giving her to eat and drink and telling her to be seated, squatted on the ground close, and asked her to clean her host's head, but mind, continued the old woman. Don't put the insects into your mouth, because they will poison you. Our wanderer, however, overcome with fatigue and anxiety, forgot all about the injunction, and picking out a louse, placed it, as is customary with the Indians, between her teeth. But no sooner had she done so, than she fell dead. Point nineteen. Thirty-four. Old Nanyabo thereupon slashed open the mother, and extracted not one child, 
but two, a pair of beautiful boys, Makinema and Pia. Nanyabo proved a dear, kind foster mother and minded them well. As the babies grew larger, they commenced shooting birds, when still bigger they went to the waterside and shot fish and game. On each occasion when they shot fish, the old woman would say, you must dry your fish in the sun, and never over a fire. But what was curious was that she would invariably send them to fetch firewood, and by the time that they had returned with it, there would be the fish all nicely cooked and ready for them. As a matter of fact, she would vomit fire out of her mouth, do her cooking, and lick the fire up again before the lads return, she apparently never had a fire burning for them to see. 20 The repetition of this sort of thing day after day made the boys suspicious, they could not understand how the old lady made her fire, and accordingly determined to find out. On the next occasion that they were dispatched to bring firewood, one of them, when at a safe distance from the house, changed himself into a lizard, and turning back, ran up into the roof whence he could get a good view of everything that was going on. What did he see? He not only saw the old woman vomit out fire, use it, and lick it up again, but he watched her scratch her neck, whence flowed something like balada, Mimiasop's balada, milk, out of which she prepared starch. Sufficiently satisfied with what he had witnessed, he came down, and ran after his brother. They discussed the matter carefully, the result of their deliberations being summarized in the somewhat terse expression, what old woman do, no good. Kill old woman. This sentiment was carried into execution. Clearing a large field, they left in its very center a fine tree, to which they tied her, then, surrounding her on all sides with stacks of timber, the boys set them on fire. As the old woman gradually became consumed, the fire which used to be within her passed into the surrounding faggots. These faggots happened to be Himaharu wood, and whenever we rub together two sticks of this same timber we can get fire. 35. The Carib version of the tradition is noteworthy mainly in that the hero ultimately finds a place among the stars. The sun, the frog, and the fire sticks, see. A long time ago. There was a woman who had become pregnant by the sun, with twin children, Pia and Makunema. One day the as yet unborn Pia said to his mother, Let us go and see our father. We will show you the way, and as you travel along pick for us any pretty flowers that you may come across. She accordingly went westward to meet her husband, and plucking flowers here and there on the pathway, accidentally stumbled, fell down, and hurt herself, she blamed her two unborn children as the cause. Twenty-one they became vexed at this, and when she next asked them which road she was to follow, they refused to tell her, and thus it was that she took the wrong direction, and finally arrived, footsore and weary, at a curious house. This belonged to Tiger's mother, Kono, Bo, Haru, the rain frog, and when the exhausted traveller discovered where she was, she told the old woman she was very sorry she had come, because she had often heard how cruel her son was. But the housemistress took pity on her, and telling her not to be afraid, hit her in the big kasiri jar, and popped on the cover. When Tiger got home that night, he sniffed up and down, and said, Mother, I can smell somebody. Whom have you here? And though she denied having anybody on the premises, Tiger was not satisfied, but had a good look round on his own account, and peeping into the Kasiri jar, discovered the frightened creature. 36. On killing the poor woman, Tiger found the two as yet unborn children, and showed them to his mother, who said that he must now mind and cherish them. So he put them in a bundle of cotton to keep them warm, and noticed next morning that they had already begun to creep. The next day, they had grown much bigger, and with this daily increase in about a month's time they had reached man's size. Tiger's mother told them that they were now fit to use the bow and arrow, with which they must go and shoot the poes, cracks, because it was this bird which had killed their own mother. Pia and Makinema therefore went next day and shot poes, and these birds they continued shooting day after day. When they were about to let fly the arrow at the last bird, the poes told them that it was none of his tribe who had killed their mother, but Tiger himself, giving them both full particulars as to how he had encompassed her death. The two boys were very angry on hearing this, spared the bird, and coming home empty-handed, informed the old woman that the poes had taken their arrows away from them. 
Of course this was not true, but only an excuse. They had themselves hidden their arrows in the bush, and wanted the chance of making new and stronger weapons. These completed, they built a staging up against a tree, and when Tiger passed below, they shot and killed him. And when they reached home, they slaughtered his mother also. 37. The two lads now proceeded on their way and arrived at last at a clump of cotton trees in the center of which was a house occupied by a very old woman, really a frog, and with her they took up their quarters. They went out hunting each day, and on their return invariably found some cassava that their hostess had baked. That's very strange, remarked Pia to his brother, there is no field anywhere about, and yet look at the quantity of cassava which the old woman gives us. We must watch her. So next morning, instead of going into the forest to hunt, they went only a little distance away, and hid themselves behind a tree whence they could see everything that took place at the house. They noticed that the old frog had a white spot on her shoulders, they saw her bend down and pick at this spot, and observed the cassava starch fall. On their return home they refused to eat the usual cake, having now discovered its source. Next morning they picked a quantity of cotton from the neighboring trees, and teased it out on the floor. When the old woman asked what they were doing, they told her that they were making something nice and soft for her to lie upon. Much pleased at this, she promptly sat upon it, but no sooner had she done so than the two lads set fire to it, thereupon her skin was scorched so dreadfully as to give it the wrinkled and rough appearance which it now bears. 38. Pia and Makyanema next continued their travels to meet their father, and soon arrived at the house of a Maipuri, Taper, where they spent three days. On the third evening Maipuri returned, looking very sleek and fat. Wanting to know what she had been feeding on, the boys followed her tracks, which they traced to a plum tree, this they shook and shook so violently as to make all the fruit, both ripe and unripe, fall to the ground, where it remained scattered. When Maipuri next morning went to feed, she was disgusted to see all her food thus wasted, and in a very angry mood quickly returned home, beat both boys, and cleared out into the bush. The boys started in pursuit, tracked her for many a long day, and at last caught up with her. Pia now told Makyanema to wheel round in front and drive the creature back to him, and as she passed, let fly a harpoon arrow into her. The rope, however, got in the way of Makyanema as he was passing in front, and cut his leg off. On a clear night you can still see them up among the clouds, there is Maipuri, Hyades, there Makyanema, Pleiades, and below is his severed leg, Orion's belt. CF Sect. 211. 39. In the story as told by Amakusi, the, 339, there are but a few main variations from the particulars given by the Waraus, sect. 29. These variations are as follows. The sun, finding his fish ponds too frequently robbed, set Yamuru, the water lizard, to watch them. Yamuru, not being sufficiently vigilant in deprivations continuing, Alligator was appointed watchman. Alligator, the depredator, continued his old trade while employed as a watchman, and at last was detected by the sun, who slashed him with a cutlass within an inch of his life, every cut forming a scale, sect. 141. Alligator begged piteously for his life, and to propitiate the sun offered him his beautiful daughter in marriage. But he had no daughter. He therefore sculptured the form of a woman from a wild plum tree. He then exposed her to the sun's influence, and fearing ultimate detection of the fraud, hid himself in the water, peering at the sun, and this habit alligator has continued to the present time. The woman was imperfectly formed, but a woodpecker, in quest of food, pecked at her body at genitalia preparavit. The sun left her and she, grieving for his desertion, said that she would seek him. Then follows the incident of her advent at Old Mother Toad's house, the sickness caused by eating the poisonous head lice, the death of the woman, as in the Carib version, caused by Tiger, and the discovery of the two unborn children, who subsequently became the two heroes. 40. Pia's first work was to slay Tiger and take out of his carcass the parts owed to the body of his mother, who became whole and alive. Next comes a repetition of the Warao legend concerning the old toad guarding her fire-making secret. 
but Makinema had an appetite for fire-eating, and invariably devoured the live coals. The toad remonstrated, and Makinema in anger prepared to leave and to travel throughout the land. To attain his purpose he dug a large canal, into which flowed water, and having made a coriel, the first of its kind, he persuaded his mother and Pia to go with him. It was from Crane that the brothers learned the art of fire-making when he struck his bill against a flint and the friction produced fire. The brothers placed huge rocks in all the rivers to detain the fishes, the rocks thus placed caused the great waterfalls. Crane was at first accustomed to catch his own fish, but finding Pia and Makyanema more successful fishermen after the rivers had been dammed, kept near to them and took away their fish. Pia consequently quarreled with Crane, who, becoming angry, took up Makyanema, who had taken part with him against his brother, and flew away with him to Spanish Guiana. 41. Pia and his mother, thus deserted, continued their daily employment of traveling together, fishing, and seeking fruits. But at last one day the mother complained of weariness and Pia conveyed her to the heights of Roraima, these to be her abiding place of rest. Then came a change of occupation for Pia. He abandoned the hunt as the sole or principal occupation of his life, and traveled from place to place, teaching the Indians many useful and good things. By him and his teachings we have the P.I. men. Thus did Pia pursue his course of benevolence until he disappeared finally from men and remained a while with his mother on Roraima. And when his time of departure from her had arrived, he told her that whatever of good she desired she would obtain if she would bow her head and cover her face with her hands, sect. 256, while she expressed her wish. This she does in her need to the present hour. Whenever the mother of these two heroes of our race is sorrowful, there arises a storm on the mountain, and it is her tears that run down in streams from the heights of Roraima, the 342. Mount Zabong, the Olympus of the Makusis, is the dwelling their great spirit Makinema, SCR, 2, 188. 42, Amalavaka, Sect. 2, venerated by the Caribs and more especially by the Tamanaks, is said to have arrived in a bark, during the subsidence of the great waters. And carved the sculptures now seen high on the perpendicular faces of the rocks which border the great rivers. He has a brother Vochi, together, they created the world. While making the Orinoco they had a long consultation about causing the stream to flow up and down at one and the same time, so as to ease the paddlers as much as possible. Amalavaka had daughters who were very fond of gaddying about, so he broke their legs to render them sedentary, and forced them to people the land of the Tamanaks. He also did many other things. He made the earth sufficiently level for people to dwell on. He seems to have known music. His house, consisting of some blocks of stone piled one on another, forming a sort of cavern, may still be seen on the plains of Maida, and near it is a large stone which the Indians say was an instrument of music, the drum of Amalavaka, AVH, 2. 473. Strange to say, I can obtain no information firsthand from the Pulmaroon district Caribs concerning this Amalavaka, even the name appears to be now unknown here. 3. Traces of spirit, idol, and fetish cult. Evidence very scarce, but recognizable in familiar spirits, and in the kickshaws of the medicine man, 43, dancing with noisy instruments in front of idols, 44, the sacred trumpets or flutes, 45. Frogs and toads as divinities, 46, snakes, 47. On the Amazons, idols, 48, other objects, of obscure signification, recorded from within, 49, and without, 50, the Guianas, can hardly be regarded as idols or fetishes. 43. It must be admitted that the positive evidence of idol or fetish worship among the Guiana Indians is very scarce, even Skomberg recording, SCR, 2, 321, that he never found the slightest trace of idolatry or of supplication to a fetish. And yet, in view of the historical records that the people living to the north, the west, and the south of them, did certainly have something akin to an idol or fetish cult leads one to the belief that the Guiana natives at some not very remote period of their history, may possibly have pursued similar practices. 
Their northern neighbors, living on the islands, apparently worshipped semi, or so-called familiar spirits, a cult still traceable, as I propose showing, sect. 93, in certain kickshaws of the mainland medicine man. 44. Among their western tribesmen a religious rite performed by some of the Orinoco tribes, was that of dancing to the sound of very noisy instruments, before two small idols, to which they paid reverence by chanting extemporaneous couplets, F.D., 52. 45. This reference to noisy instruments suggests the sacred trumpet, or batuto, which was an object of veneration on the upper reaches of the Orinoco, the Atabapo, and the Anirida. It was sounded under the palm trees that they might bear abundance of fruit. Humboldt says that, to be initiated into the mysteries of the Batuto, it is requisite to be of pure morals and to have lived single. The initiated are subjected to flagellations, fastings, and other painful exercises. There is but a small number of these sacred trumpets. The most anciently celebrated is that upon a hill near the confluence of the Tomo and the Guainia. Father Ceriso assured us, continues the celebrated traveler, that the Indians speak of the Batuto of Tomo as an object of worship common to many surrounding tribes. Fruit and intoxicating liquor are placed beside the sacred trumpet. Sometimes the great spirit himself makes the Batuto resound, sometimes he is content to manifest his will through him to whom the keeping of the instrument is entrusted. Women are not permitted to see this marvelous instrument, and are excluded from all the ceremonies of this worship, A.V.H. 2, 363, at the risk of life. Wallace, 348, also refers to similar instruments among the Wapes River Indians, Upper Rio Negro, which are used at their festivals to produce the Jurupuri, or forest spirit, music. He says that These instruments, however, are with them such a mystery that no woman must ever see them, on pain of death. They are always kept in some igaripe, water chanel, at a distance from the malacca, whence they are brought on particular occasions, when the sound of them is heard approaching, every woman retires into the woods, or into some adjoining shed which they generally have near, and remains invisible till after the ceremony is over, when the instruments are taken away to their hiding place, and the women come out of their concealment. Should any female be supposed to have seen them, either by accident or design, she is invariably executed, generally by poison, and a father will not hesitate to sacrifice his daughter, or a husband his wife, on such an occasion. Coke Grunberg, I, 186-187, speaks of these, devil, flutes on the Iri River, Rio Negro, among the Susi, an Arawak tribe. He says that these are sounded in honor of Koei, the son of Yapri Kuli, their tribal hero. That the festival at which they are used is held at the time of ripening of the fruit of the manacle, Euterpiola ratia, and Turu, Enocarpus bacaba, that on the same occasion there is mutual flagellation with whips. The flutes have to be carefully guarded from the gaze of women, and when not in use are hidden under water, etc. They take their name from that of the spirit in whose honor they are sounded. Elsewhere, K.G., I. 314 to 316, he speaks of the dance as having magic powers, it can dispel sickness and even heal big wounds. Granted that the whipping is part and parcel of the festival, and the object of the festival is to ensure abundance of fruit. The following extract from Gamilla is worth consideration, when the time arrives for clearing the open plains with a view to sowing their corn, yucca, plantains, etc. They, the salivas, place the young men, some separated from the others, in lines, and a certain number of old men provide themselves with whips and rough thongs made of twisted agave, pita. As soon as intimation is given that it is time to commence work, the whipping of these young men takes place, and notwithstanding the cuts and marks which their bodies receive, neither groan nor complaint escapes them, g. i. 188. It is true that the missionary was told that they received the whipping to cure them of their laziness, but I am strongly inclined to the view, corroborated as it is by the examples already given. That flagellation is a propitiation for favors already received or expected, that the object of the whole festival in fact is comparable with that met with in connection with the cassava plant, sex. 165, 166. The flagellations inflicted at the burial ceremonies, sect. 
75, would seem to have a different origin. 46. Some other tribes of Indians, who likewise dwelt upon the banks of the river Orinoca, paid to toads the honors due to the divinity, sect. 342. Far from injuring these animals, they carefully kept them under pots, in order to obtain rain or fine weather, and so fully persuaded were they of their power in this respect, that they scourged them as often as their petitions were not answered. FD, 52. It is known that for the Chaimas, Kumanagotos, Tamanaks, and other original tribes of the Caribs, the frog was the god of the waters, cf sect. 18 Ruiz Blanco, Conversion de Piritu, says that the Kumanagotos never killed a frog, but kept one like a domestic animal, beating it when the rain did not fall, AR, 185. There is an intimate connection between frogs, toads, and certain other animals, and success in the chase, sect. 349. 47. Beyond the mention of certain snake dances, I can find nothing akin to actual worship and similar ceremonies in connection with these creatures, notwithstanding the very deep-rooted belief in the relationship of the serpent to sexual matters, sect. 347. At Maroa, River Guinea, Upper Rio Negro, Humboldt, 2, 386, talks of, that ancient dance of serpents, the Cady, in which these wily animals are represented as issuing from the forests, and coming to drink with the men in order to deceive them. And carry off the women. So also Wallace, 204, records in connection with a snake dance among the Yups River Indians, participated in by men and boys, two huge artificial snakes of twigs and bushes bound together with sepos, from thirty to forty feet long. And about a foot in diameter. They divided themselves into two parties of twelve or fifteen each, and lifting the snakes on their shoulders, began dancing. 48. South of the Guianas, there is the evidence of Acuna, 92, from the Amazons, in 1639. The religion of these barbarous people is much alike, they all worship idols which they make with their own hands. To one of them they ascribe the authority of governing the waters, and put a fish in his hand in token of his power, they choose others to preside over their seed time, and others to inspire them with courage in their battles. They say these gods came down from heaven on purpose to dwell with them and to show them kindness. They do not signify their adoration of these idols by any outward ceremonies, but on the contrary seem to have forgotten them as soon as they have made them, and putting them in a case let them lie. Without taking any notice of them so long as they imagine they have no occasion for their help. But when they are ready to march out to war, they set up the idol in which they have placed the hopes of their victories, at the prow of their canoes, cf sect. 84 So, when they go a-fishing, they take that idol with them to which they attribute the government of the waters. 49. On the other hand, there are a few accounts of the existence of various cult objects, the actual signification of which has so far not been satisfactorily explained. Lest these should ever be claimed as examples of a fetish cult, it would be well to mention them here. In the catalogue of contributions transmitted from British Guiana to the London International Exhibition of 1862 there is a record, p. 52, of figures of clay, made by an Indian of the Caribezi tribe, and representing human beings and an armadillo. From Masaruni River. Contributed by H. C. Whitlock and Geo Dennis. These are the only specimens of Indian plastic art ever seen by the contributors. I myself have obtained children's whistles in the shape of frogs and turtles made of clay by the Maruka River Caribs. Among the Caribs of the Peru River, French Guiana, Cravo, 262, speaks of meeting with a young woman who was modeling a taper in black wax. From the Upper Eyrie, Rio Negro, Coke Grunberg, 125, figures several wax objects modeled by little boys, and wooden fishes employed in the death ceremonies, KG, 2, 154. In our own colony, Skomberg states, SCR, 2, 471, that at a Mayopidian settlement under the cone-shaped shelter raised on top of the giant huts, were several flat pieces of wood, cut into all kinds of figures, which swayed to and fro with the wind. 
Among the Manicos and Socoricos, branches of the Carib race inhabiting the districts on both sides of the Katinga, a very marked feature in all their houses, says J. J. Quelch, T. 1895, pp. 144-5, are the rude imitations birds, chiefly of the herons, the negrocop, micteria, the muscovy duck, and the swallow-tailed hawk, which are made from cotton thread, corn cobs and sticks, and are suspended high up under the roofs of the houses. In the positions occupied during flight. These are probably identical with the targets met with on the Iri River, Rio Negro. Targets of artificial birds, made of maize cobs and their coverings, hang as decorations from the cross beams of the houses, the boys blow at them with non-poisoned arrows, KG, I, 102, 2, 244. 50. Outside of the Guianas to the westward, among the Carijonas of the upper Yapura, Cravo, 361, speaks of a bench with rough carvings representing a bird of prey, also of the wooden figure of a man with legs wide apart. To the southward, Acuna, 142, makes mention of the Capunas and Zurinas on the south side of the Amazon. Near its junction with the Rio Negro. They will cut a raised figure so much to the life and so exactly upon any coarse piece of wood that many of our carvers might take pattern by them. It is not only to gratify their own fancies, and for their own use that they make these pieces of work, but also for the profit it brings them, for they hereby maintain a trade with their neighbors. And truck their work with them for any necessaries to serve their occasion. 4. Creation of man, plants, and animals. Man was either brought here from cloudland, etc., 51, or was created here, 52, in the latter case, from animals, as tigers, 53, snakes, 54 to 56, from plants, 57, or from rocks and stones, 58. Certain plants were derived from human beings or bush spirits, 59, or grew upon a wonderful tree, 60 to 61. Some animals arose from the spirits of mortal men, 62. 51. Certain tribes believe that man, already made, reached this world from elsewhere, while others claim that he developed here, where he either merely grew into being or was indebted to some master spirit for coming into existence at all. His presence on the planet, however, would not seem to give rise on his part to claims superior to those of various animals, including birds. In those cases where man, already created, reached this veil of tears, from elsewhere, his place of origin appears to have been cloudland, the skies, and countries beyond them, according to views held by Caribs, Arawaks, and Warows. The first mentioned hold that mankind descended from on high, unfortunately, the clouds which had brought them down receded and so left them behind. Being hungry, they were forced to eat earth, which they baked into cakes, and followed the beasts and birds to see what wild fruits they were accustomed to devour, and so learned to help themselves. According to the island Caribs, Luquo was the first man in a Carib. He was not made of any other body, he descended from the sky and lived a long time on earth, in fact it was he who made it. He had a large nostril from which, as also from an incision in his thighs, he produced the first men, BBR, 226-7. Bolingbroke talks of Longwo as being the first man, in the Indian belief of the central parts of Guiana, certain vapors, or spirits, to which the savages ascribe thunders and fevers, are the objects of their fear and propitiatory worship. They do not ascribe a human form to these divinities, but conceive them to have brought hither the first man, whom they call Longwo, Bol, 371. The Korobohana, one of the many group divisions of the Arawaks. Believe that they originally came from above the clouds. The weight of a heavy woman broke the rope by which they were descending, and communication was thus cut off between those who had reached the ground and those remaining above. The great spirit, pitying the latter, supplied them with wings and plumage, and they came down to colonize the trees above the heads of their brethren, still privileged to live near, and to converse with them, though changed into Kuriaka parrots. The Warao version of their own origin is very similar. Oconorot one day went hunting for a rare bird, in those times the Waraos lived up above the sky and the only creatures they knew of were birds, and it was many a long day before he succeeded in locating it, 
though he did so at last. Letting fly an arrow he transfixed it, but on rushing up to the place where it had fallen, there was nothing visible but a big hole in the ground through which he could see the deer, peccary, and other animals disporting themselves on the green plains below. With the help of a cotton rope he descended to earth, and saw jaguars, snakes, and wild beasts devouring their prey. He shot a young deer, cooked the flesh, and finding how sweet it tasted, took some of the flesh back with him on his ascent up the rope, home again. Needless to say, all the warows were only too eager to accompany him when he repeated his descent, which they did in safety, one after the other until the very last, and this happened to be a woman who got wedged in the aperture. And could neither get up nor down. The hole being thus filled up, the warows have never been able to reach their old home again. The name of this woman who thus stuck halfway is Okonakura, the warows still recognizing her as the morning star. Certain of the salivas did not hesitate to proclaim themselves children of the sun, g. i. 113. 52. In those cases where man, as such, put in his first appearance on this world stage, i. e. As in many other places was created on the earth, there is no evidence available pointing to the existence of any belief that his creation took place out of nothing, either spontaneously or at the instance of some master spirit, or some person. Or thing. Indeed, the two or three examples which might be claimed in support of the existence of such evidence are very dubious. Skomberg notes an Arawak tradition, which I cannot find elsewhere, that man was created by Kuramani, and woman by Kalimina, sect. 19. He mentions also that the former was subservient to Alubari, the Supreme Spirit, SCR, 2, 319. Among the Mapures of the Orinoco, however, it was the supreme being Puranaminary who created man, but the traveler just cited admits that the above tradition, among others reported by Gilly, shows a seemingly evident admixture of Christian ideas, SCR, 2, 320. So also does the alleged Akawai legend that Makinema, admittedly the supreme being, put his son, the first man, in charge of all the other animals that he had just made. On the other hand, the Indian seemingly can conceive of man's origin only from something already existing in the world of nature immediately surrounding him. And so, in considering the reputed origins of the various tribes, the belief becomes more and more prominent that mankind, and by mankind each Indian means the original ancestors of his own people, was originally derived. With or without the assistance of pre-existing agencies, from various animals and plants, from rocks, stones, and rivers. 53. Among various animal forms, tigers, jaguars, and snakes constitute the commonest sources from which peoples claiming an animal pedigree have been derived. Carib history furnishes excellent examples in this respect, because we have records not only of what they themselves thought about their own origin, but of what other peoples also believed concerning it. Thus the Achagua maintain that the Caribs are legitimate descendants of tigers, Havi in their language signifies a tiger, whence they deduce Shavanavi, arising from a tiger, which is their term for a Carib. Other branches of the Achagua explain the term more satisfactorily thus, Havi in their language is a tiger, and Chavina is the spear, lance, pike, pole, and from these two words, tiger, and pike, they derive the word Shavanavi. As being the children of tigers with pikes, g. i. 112. 54. The saliva say that the son of Puruk conquered and put to death a horrible snake that had been destroying and devouring the nations of the Orinoco. But that as soon as the monster began to putrefy, certain large worms began to develop in her entrails, and that from each worm there finally arose a Carib Indian and his woman. And that in the same way that the snake was so bloody an enemy of all those nations, so her children were savage, inhuman, and cruel, g. i. 111. 55. The Warau version, like that recorded by Brett in his legend of Corabona refers to a special water snake. And the account which I now give is almost word for word as related to me. The Origin of the Caribs, W. A Warau man warned his sister not to bathe in a certain neighboring pond at those regular periods when she happened to be unwell, sect. 188. For a long time she obeyed his instructions, but after a time, 
forgetting all about them, she went to bathe at the forbidden spot in time, and was caught by a large snake, the water Kamuriwama. By and by she became pregnant. Now it was during the bullet tree, Mimyasop's Bellata, season, when the Indians used to cut down the trees to secure the seed, which are excellent eating, and it was noticed that this same woman, although she took no axe away with her in the morning, invariably returned with a large quantity of the delicious seed in the afternoon. The brother, thereupon becoming suspicious, watched her. Unobserved himself, he followed her next day, saw her approach a huge bullet tree, and saw the Wama snake, sect. 244, Exuntum ex corpore femini, coil around the tree, and make his way up into the topmost branches. There the snake changed into a man, who shook the boughs for the woman, thus causing the seeds to fall to the ground, where she gathered them. Having done this, the Wama, reverting to his original form, descended the tree, and iterum corpus femini intravit. Thereupon the brother said, There is something wrong here, this will not do, Sora may a probabiliter serpentem in corpore sua habit. So told his friends who, in company with him, watched his sister the next day, when the same thing took place, Wama exian sub corpore femini, climbing the tree, changing into human form, shaking the seeds down, and then becoming a snake again. But just as Wama was about to reach the ground, the watchers rushed up and cut him into thousands of pieces. The woman grieved sorely, but collected all the fragments under a heap of mold and leaves, each piece of which by and by grew into a carob. Many years passed, the caribs growing strong and numerous, became a nation. They lived in harmony with the Waraus, so much so that when one tribe caught some game or other dainty, they would send a child with a piece of it over to the Waraus. The latter would then return the compliment and send a child of theirs with food to the caribs. This lasted a long time, until one day the original mother of the caribs, a very old woman now, told them to kill the child which the Waraus had sent to them, this was in revenge for the way the Waraus had slain her snake lover years before. As might have been expected, the Waraus on the next occasion slaughtered the carib child, and thus a blood feud arose between the two nations, the caribs finally overwhelming the Waraus. 56. The Carib version of the story was told me on the upper Pomeroon, by probably one of the oldest local survivors of the tribe, who spoke somewhat as follows. The water Kamudi had an Indian woman for a sweetheart. During the day he took the form of a snake, at night, he was, a people, like myself. The couple used to meet at the water side, and hence the girl's parents knew nothing about their being so fond of each other. After she became pregnant, a baby Kamudi was born. The little one used to appear when she reached the river bank, swim about, and after a time return to its nesting place. Now, as she stayed so long each time at the water side, the old father said to his two sons, What is the matter with your sister? Why does she take so long to bathe? Accordingly, the brothers, watching her go down to the stream, vidit serpentem parvum exire ac serpentem magnam intrare. They saw also the huge Kamudi bring his infant son something to eat and saw the baby take the father's place when the latter left. When they reached home, the sons complained to the old man about what they had seen, he told them to kill both the snakes. So on the next occasion they killed the huge Kamudi, and seizing the baby serpent, carried it far away back into the bush, where they chopped it up into many small pieces. Some months afterward when hunting in the neighborhood, the brothers heard a great noise and the sound of voices coming from the very same direction, and going to ascertain the cause. Found four houses in the identical spot where they had cut up the baby Kamudi, all occupied by Indians who had grown out of the fragments of the snake. In the first hut the housemaster said he was glad to welcome his two uncles, but in the other three the occupants wanted to kill them for having destroyed their sister's child from which they had all sprung. But the first housemaster said, No, don't do that, because these two visitors are uncles to all of you, and you must not have a bad mind toward them. And thus it happened that the two brothers got away without further molestation, and on arrival at home told their old father how the snake fragments had grown into people. And when he expressed a wish to see his grandchildren, his two sons led the way into the bush, and he was right glad to see his numerous progeny, with whom he made good friends, and they all drank piwari. 
and thus the Carib nation arrays from a water commodity. 57. The vegetable world takes a share of the responsibility for the derivation of man. There is either a story of some fabulous tree of life, or reference to certain well-known plants, as the silk cotton tree, bombax, or ite palm, Mauritia. The Akawai and Makusi idea of creation is that, coeval with Makinema, there was a large tree, and that, having mounted this tree, with a stone axe he cut pieces of wood which, having been thrown into the river, became animated beings, Hic, 244. SCR, 2, 319. The Arawaks hold that from his seat on the silk cotton tree, the mighty one scattered twigs and bark in the air, on the land, and in the water, and that from these pieces arose the birds, beasts, reptiles, fish, and also men and women. The sire of the Arawaks was Wadalai. Some of the salivas affirmed that certain trees used to bear men and women for fruit, and that these people were their ancestors, g. i. 113. The Maypures and, according to Humboldt similarly the Tamanacs, say that in early days the whole earth was submerged in water, only two people, a man and a woman, saving themselves on the top of the high mountain Tamanaku. That as they wandered around the mountain in deep distress over the loss of their friends, they heard a voice which told them to throw the fruits of the Mauritia behind them over their shoulders, and that as they did so, the fruit which the man threw became men, and that which the woman threw, women, SCR, 2, 320. Certain of the Achagua Indians pretend that they are the children of tree trunks and from this illusion call themselves Acubavaranes, g. i. 114. Locadea is the mythic Indian tree, growing out of a grave, which is said by some Indians to have been the root from which they sprang. When it was cut down, it was transformed into a rapid, whence the name of one of the Demerara River Rapids, the, 195. According to the idea current among the trios, people were originally like wood, stone, etc., and had no faces, go, 12. The manufacture of a woman out of a plum tree, sect. 29, and the tree changing into a man, sect. 9, should also be noted here. 58, not a few legends, sect. 158, connected with the origin of the tribes contained curious examples of animism relative to earth, rocks, and stones, sect. 171, the Mapoyas, the Salivas, and the Otomacs, all three of them Orinoco tribes, had beliefs of this nature, g. i. 113. The last mentioned used to say that a stone made up of three parts, arranged in the form of a pyramid upon the summit of a rock called Baraguan, was their earliest ancestress. And that another monstrous rock, which served as the summit of another pinnacle, two leagues distant, was their first ancestor. Being consistent, they believed that all the rocks and stones of which the said Baraguan, a high promontory of large rocks, bearing hardly a particle of earth, was formed, were each of them one of their predecessors. Although these Otomacs buried their dead, they dug up the skulls at the end of a year, and placed them in and among the crevices and holes between the rocks and stones constituting the promontory mentioned. Where they expected them in their turn to change into stone. The Mapoyas would call such a stone as that serving for the summit of the pinnacle just mentioned, Uruana, describing it as the source of their tribe, and would be delighted at any one speaking of them as Uruanes in allusion to this fact. These tombs, caverns filled with bones, in the Strait of Baraguan, are again referred to by Humboldt, 2, 487. Some of the salivas would declare that they were children of the soil, and that in former times the earth used to breed men and women in the same way that it now produces thorns and hidden rocks, g. i. 113. According to the Makusi tradition, Makunema sent great waters, only one man escaped, this one man who survived the flood threw stones behind him, and thus peopled the earth anew, scr. 2, 320. Those of the Achaguas who believed in their origin from rivers distinguished themselves from the the tree trunk ones, sect. 57, by the name Univeranes, g. i. 114. 59. The Yauna Indians of the Apoporis River have a belief in certain palm trees having been derived from the ashes of a human being, sect. 163a, 
the Arawaks and Caribs hold similar views as to the origin of certain cultivated plants. In an Arawak story it is one of the bush spirits which supplies man with the first fruit plants, whereas the Carib version gives a wonderful tree itself as the source, sect. 60. The following is the Arawak story. The first fruit trees, a. There were three sisters alone in the house, preparing drink, the menfolk were away at a party. Early in the afternoon a young man came along, bringing a poes with him. He was not what he appeared to be, a friend, but an adekuhuha, tree spirit. Sect. 96. The girls, however, did not know this. They asked him inside and offered him pepper pot and kasiri. He refused the former, saying it did not agree with him, and putting to his mouth the calabash which contained the latter, he broke the vessel. This made the girl who handed it to him laugh. Sect. 125. She was the youngest of the three. He told her on taking his departure that he would pay her another visit later in the evening. The afternoon wore on, and night fell, when, sure enough, the young man appeared again, as arranged. The elder sister took a good look at him, and recognized that, though bearing a great resemblance, he was not identical with the person who had visited them in the afternoon. She went into the adjoining room and conveyed her suspicions to the second sister. They both kept watch. He proceeded to get into the hammock where the youngest sister was lying, and began caressing her, whereupon she said she was displeased with his actions. But as he continued troubling her, she said, What do you want with me? With this, he slipped his arm round her neck, and broke her neck bone, thus killing her. He then began eating her body and finished all except the head, by early dawn. He belched and said, Yes. I am indeed satisfied. My mother told me to bring her the head, so I must spare it for her. Holding up the head by its beautiful long hair, he carried it away. Now, the sisters who had been keeping their eyes on him all night, watched well where he carried it. They saw him bear it far away into the bush, where he disappeared with it in a hollow tree, of which they, following him, took note. When they got back home again, their menfolk had returned from the party, and among them was a P.I. They told these people exactly what had happened to their young sister, how she had laughed at the Tukuyuha, and how she had been killed, sect. 125, and eaten by him. The P.I. told them to collect plenty of firewood, and to bring it to the hollow tree, which the sisters were able to show them. This wood they piled up in plenty around the tree, and then started to fire it. It burned right merrily, and in amidst the din of the cracking timber, enveloped in smoke and flame, you could hear the whole Takuyuha family screaming, and the old grandmother reviling her wicked grandson for having brought so much trouble on them. It did not take very long for the hollow tree and the whole family of spirits to be reduced to ashes. From the ashes grew the first fruit trees of our forefathers, the plantain, the pineapple, and the coconut, with all the others. But the P.I. had to taste the fruit before the others were allowed to touch it. 60. The statement has been already made, on Carib authority, sect. 51. That mankind learned from the beasts and birds what wild fruits to devour. But it was the bunya bird which taught the Carib folk all about the cultivated plants, which originally grew upon a certain wonderful tree, and it happened in this way. Time was when the Indians had no cassava to eat, they all starved. Animals and birds also had nothing to eat, they likewise starved. It was the Maipuri alone who, going out regularly every morning and returning home of an evening, always appeared sleek and fat. The others, noticing his droppings, banana skins, cane strips, etc., talked to one another after this manner, Maipuri must have found a good place to get food. Let us watch him. So next morning they sent the bush rat to dog his footsteps, and find out how he managed to keep in such good condition. The bush rat did what he was told and followed Maipuri a long, long way into the bush, when he saw him pause under the shade of an immense tree and gather the fruit that had fallen. This tree was the Alapantipo, and very wonderful, in that everything you could wish for grew upon its branches, plantains, cassava, yams, plume, pines, and all the other fruits that caribs love. 
As soon as my Puri had had his fill the bushrat climbed the tree, and picked upon the corn to satisfy his hunger, when he could eat no more, he came down and brought with him a grain in order to show the others what he had succeeded in finding. The Indians thereupon followed the rat who led the way back to the tree, and by the time they reached it, many plantains, pines, and other things had fallen on the ground. After they had cleaned up everything, they tried to climb the tree to get more, but it was too big and smooth, so they all agreed to cut it down. They made a staging around the trunk, and began hacking with their stone axes, and they cut away there for ten days, but it would not fall, so big was Alapantipo. They cut away for another ten days and still it would not fall. By this time their work had made them thirsty, so the Indians gave calabas to all the animals except the Maipuri, to go fetch water, to the Maipuri they gave a sifter. When they all reached the waterside, they of course drank out of their vessels. Except Maipuri out of whose sifter the water poured as fast as it was poured in, this was part of his punishment for being so greedy in keeping the secret of the bountiful tree all to himself. At the expiration of another ten days, cutting continuously, the tree at last fell. The Indians took away as their share all the cassava, cane, yams, plantains, potatoes, bananas, pumpkins, and watermelons, while the akuri, desipwata, laba, coelogenes, and other creatures crept in among the branches to pick out all they wanted. By the time the Maipuri had got back to the tree from the waterside only the plums were left for him, and with these he has had to remain content even to the present day. What the Indians took they brought home with them and planted in their provision fields. But it was the bunya bird who spoke to them and explained how each was to be propagated and cooked, and how some, like the bitter cassava juice, had to be boiled before drinking, while others could be eaten raw. 61. The above is the tradition, almost word for word as it was told to me by an old carib, but no explanation was forthcoming as to the origin of the tree itself. Brett however ascribes it to Tomosi in the same way that he gives Makyanema credit for the similarly wonderful Akawai tree. In the latter case the immediately preceding sentence, however, shows an undoubted bias due to Christian influences, Makyanema made all the beasts and birds, all of one speech, bade them live in unity, and put his son, the first man, in charge of them. The same author gives also an addition to the story as above narrated, by the mention of a fountain or swelling waters in the stump, or under the roots, of this wonderful tree. The overflowing of which is temporarily checked by means of a rugged rock, carib, or an inverted basket, akawai. Owing to the reputed wickedness of the people in the one case, and the mischief of a howling monkey in the other, the waters are let loose, and a flood occurs, which overwhelms nearly everything, most of the people being destroyed. Some try to escape by climbing a high cocorite palm whose top reached the heavens, but a poor woman not in a condition to climb led the way. And halfway up was turned into stone by terror and exhaustion, none could help her and none could pass over her, and all who tried to do so became rocks likewise. A few survivors then climbed a kamul palm and so saved themselves. 62. Among the mainland Indians, I can find no explanations current concerning the origin of the first birds and beasts. Brett's statement that Makyanema made them appears to lack confirmation. The island Caribs had a tradition that Luquo, their first man, sect. 51. Made fishes out of scrapings and fragments of cassava, which he threw into the water. Many an animal has been derived from the spirit, sects, 69, 161, of mortal men. 5. The body and its associated spirits. The body, originally considered immortal, 63, renovated by change of skin, 64, or by fountain of youth, 65, its immortality put to the test, 66, and assured by its transformation into stone, 67. The spirits, several in each body, shadow spirits. Head, heart, and pulse beat, blood, spittle, footprint, and bone spirits, possessed by both men, 68 to 69, and animals, 70 become associated with dream, familiar, forest, mountain, sky, and water, spirits, 71. Stages in conception of spirit immortality shown in disposal and treatment of corpse, attitude in which buried, etc., 72, flattery and adulation, 
festivals and feasts, 73-74, furnishing dead with means of capturing assailant, 75. Supplying dead with dogs, women, ornaments, hunting and fighting weapons, and food, 76, eating his flesh and bones, 77, exhuming his remains for witchcraft and prophecy, 78, abandonment of place of sepulture, etc., 79. Doubtful animistic indications of other burial customs, 80. Where spirits take on anthropomorphic forms, they reach their final destination direct, 81, or only after certain trials and ordeals, 82, but the idea of a future existence dependent on present conduct is very probably a borrowed one, 83. Spirits are good or bad according as they help or harm the Indian, and not according to the bodies whence they have been derived, the latter conception is an error into which many missionaries and travelers have fallen, e.g., the Maboya spirit, 84. Individuals can be relieved of the presence of undesirable spirits by use of rattle, by blowing, 85. 63. As with many another savage people, there are traces among the Guiana Indians of an idea of perpetual existence of both body and its contained spirits. On the upper Yeri River, Cayenne, when a Rokoyen P.I. is buried, the flesh, matier, and spirit remain in the grave, to be visited by medicine men and others, as well as by beasts, for the purpose of being consulted, C.R. 298. The following is a curious case from Suriname reported by de Guj, 22, an Ojana woman asked me, when I came again, to bring her a teramopule atop which literally means, die never implement for. So that her little son might be blessed with everlasting life. When I told her there was no such thing, and that everybody had to die, I met with the same extraordinary unbelief that von den Steinen records in his Unter den Nadervolkern, page 348. So also on the upper Rio Negro Kochgrunberg, I, 197, was applied to for a panacea, universal smittal, against death. 64. Other phases of this idea of an immortal body are met within the myths relative to changed skins, the Indian belief is that those creatures which undergo ectasis live forever. After Amalavaka had lived a long while with the Tamanakas, he took his coriol to reach the other side of the salt water whence he had come. Just as he was taking his departure he sang out to them, You will change your skins, i.e. You will always be young, like snakes, etc., but one doubting old dame called out, Oh, which annoyed Amalavaka so much that he now said, You shall die. SCR 2, 320 When Kuramani, Kororomana, came to earth to see what the Arawaks were doing, he found them so bad that he wished to destroy them. On which account he took away their everlasting life and bestowed it on those creatures who cast their skins, snakes, lizard and cockroaches, SCR, 2, 319. 64a, there are several examples of this taking off and putting on of skins and consequent continuous existence, to be met with in the Guiana folklore, e.g., sex. 64b, 137, 162, Therefore I can only conclude that all of these are stages in the conception of the same idea of living forever. The man WLTH a bad temper, W. A man and woman once caught a girl monkey and minded her, she became quite tame, and when the old people would have to go away for a while, they would often leave the monkey in charge. One day when they had thus gone away on a visit to some friends, the monkey took off her skin, threw it over one of the house beams, and replaced it with the apron belt and other ornaments that the household had left behind. She then started with the cassava, which she cooked and ate, finally she put on her skin again. When the housefolk returned, they looked for the cassava, but could find none, and though they were puzzled a good deal, they never suspected the monkey. On the next occasion that they had to leave the place, a young man remained behind, though hidden, to watch lest any one should steal the cassava a second time. After a while the monkey took off her skin, dressed herself as before, and commenced baking the cassava, the young man rushed up and seized her, and a hard struggle took place. No, said the girl, I am not fit to be your wife. But I want you badly, was the rejoinder. That's all very well, added the girl, but you will ill-treat me and knock me about. And when he assured her that he would never ill-treat her, she at last consented, 
and so soon as she agreed to yield to his desires, he pulled the monkey skin down from the beam and threw it into the fire. They remained together a long time. By and by she bore him a little boy. And now her troubles indeed again commenced, because, getting tired of her, he began lashing her and kept calling her monkey, and annoying her in every way he could. Suffering so much, at last she said to herself, I can bear this treatment no longer, I will return to my people. Taking a calabash and some ite starch, she told her husband that she was going to bathe in the pond, but instead of doing so, she really went far away into the bush. Her husband waited long, long, for her to return, and finally followed in search. By this time she was limping along with the help of a stick, she was trying to get back into her original style of walking on four legs, and was just contriving to resume her old habit of jumping from tree to tree. Her little boy also was beginning to imitate her movements. And when the husband reached the spot where she had been, there he saw her with the baby jumping from the top of one tree to the top of another. Come back home. He kept on shouting, but his wife took no heed, only his child, who felt sorry for his father, threw down the spiders and insects for him to eat. Now, though monkeys eat such things, men cannot eat them, and so he had to proceed hungry. Come back home, he again called out to her, as he tried to follow her through the bushes below, but looking down upon him, she said, No. I have had quite enough punishment from you already. And thus they proceeded on and on, the father running along on the ground below, the mother and child jumping from the topmost branches of tree to tree. At last they came to a wide river, and here the monkey cried out to her people Katani Torai, I. E. Come and fetch us. And they made the wind to blow so strongly that it caused the opposite shore to come close over to the tree where the monkey was, so close that the trees on both sides of the stream touched, by this means the mother and her child jumped across. And once across, the opposite shore with its bushes drew back to their original position. As the separation took place, the monkey called out to the man, you must swim after us if you want us, and the little boy, who was really fond of his father shouted, Goodbye, I am going. But the mother would say nothing further. The man was thus left on the nearer shore, and got home again much vexed. He destroyed everything that had belonged to the woman, he cut up her hammock, broke her calabash. And smashed her goblets. What a bad temper he must have had. 64b Another example is to be met in the story which I am adapting here from Brett. The Sorcerer's Daughter the daughter of a P.I. fell in love with a brave young hunter, who did not seemingly pay her any too much attention. She begged her father to make her like one of the young man's dogs so that she might always be with him. He put a magic skin over her shoulders and she became a dog. Thus it came about that each time the youth went out hunting with his four dogs, one always ran back home and would never join in the fray. More than this, he found that whenever he got home in the afternoon, there was the fire bumming, the cassava ready, and all neat and clean. He thought this was due to some of his neighbors, and went to thank them, but they denied all knowledge. On the next occasion, therefore, as soon as he missed one of his dogs, he tied the three up to a tree, and returned home without making the slightest sound. Taking an advantageous position, he saw a lovely maiden there making casaeva, and doing other things, while at one side there hung the charmed skin. He swiftly rushed in, seized the skin, and threw it on the already lighted fire. He then claimed the girl from her father for his wife. 65. It was owing to a myth relative to the fountain of perennial youth that Florida came to be discovered just four centuries ago. Some old island Indians, presumably of the Arawak stock, assured Ponce de Leon that. Far to the north there existed a land abounding in gold and in all manner of delights. But above all, possessing a river of such wonderful virtue that whoever bathed in it would be restored to youth. They added, that in times past, before the arrival of the Spaniards, a large party of the natives of Cuba had departed northward in search of this happy land and this river of life, and, having never returned. It was concluded that they were flourishing in renovated youth, detained by the pleasure of that enchanting country. Why, 788. 66. 
Another interesting example of the existence of this idea of immortality is connected with the Arawak stock in Puerto Rico. Many of the most hardy and daring, of the Indians, proposed a general insurrection, and a massacre of their oppressors. The great mass, however, were deterred by the belief that the Spaniards were supernatural beings and could not be killed. A shrewd and skeptical cacique, named Breowen, determined to put their immortality to the test. Hearing that a young Spaniard named Salzedo was passing through his lands, he sent a party of his subjects to escort him, giving them secret instructions how they were to act. On coming to a river, they took Salzedo on their shoulders to carry him across, but, when in the midst of the stream, they let him fall and throwing themselves upon him, pressed him under water until he was drowned. Then dragging his body to the shore, and still doubting his being dead, they wept and howled over him, making a thousand apologies for having fallen upon him, and kept him so long below the surface. The cacique Brayan came to examine the body and pronounced it lifeless. But the Indians still fearing it might possess lurking immortality and ultimately revive, kept watch over it for three days, until it showed incontestable signs of putrefaction. Being now convinced that the strangers were mortal men like themselves, they readily entered into a general conspiracy to destroy them. Why, 779. 67. Certain of the Indians, e.g. Odomax, seemingly held the view that, after death, the body or skeleton itself turned into stone, reverted to the very material from which some of them believed it to have originally sprung, sect. 58. The Aderace regard certain enormous blocks of granite as some of their local warriors who, after death, have been changed into stone, Ku, 2, 346. Hence we must not be surprised to find cases where boulders, sect. 171 e seek, and bones, sex. 26, 91, possess a more or less independent animate existence of their own. The transformation of people into rocks and stones by way of punishment, or for other reasons, may be a development of the same belief. Thus, a long time ago, the Caribs came up to the Kiranampo rocks, Upper Rupununi, in order to surprise the Makusi and destroy them from off the face of the earth. But the good spirit who in those days lived among the Makusis took pity on them, and changed their enemies into these stones, SCR, I, 375. 68. Having reached a higher stage of belief, and realized that the material body does indeed undergo dissolution at death, the Indians are convinced of a spirit or something, one or more, being set free at the time of its occurrence. I purposely say, one or more, because it would seem that originally, not only the shadow, but also the heart, the head, and the more perceptible of all the parts of the body where there is a pulsation of arteries, as well as perhaps the blood, sect. 240a, the spittle, sect. 112, the footprint, sect. 24, and the bone, sect. 69, were each regarded in the light of a spirit or something that was part and parcel of the body, and took its departure at the material death. The Arawak present-day conception of this something is connected with the person's shadow, sect. 253, their terms for a dead person's spirit and a person's shadow are, H, Ayaloko and, H, Aya, respectively. With these same people according as this spirit helps or harms them, they may qualify the designation by Sutta Dash, H, Ayaloko when doing good, or Wakayata Dash, H, Ayaloko when doing evil. The Hayaloko, strange to say, does not appear any further in the folklore collected by me unless indeed it is identical with Ayayamai and so with Hyorakan, Yolak, etc., the word for a bush spirit, a term which, as I propose showing, sect. 94, is met with throughout the extent of the Guianas, from the Orinoco to the Amazon. 69, the mainland Caribs term a person's shadow A.I. Akaru, and the spirit resident in his head, his dream spirit, a.k.a. Orakari, sect. 86. But after the latter leaves the body for the forest permanently, it is known as a.k.a. Tamba. The Warao expression for the shadow is a miho keoi, wily kobi is their word for heart or for the heart spirit which, leaving the body at death, becomes their habu, or bush spirit, sect. 99. 
the island Caribs applied the word Akambu, cf. Mainland Carib Akatamba, to the spirit of a person whatever it might be like, the women speaking of it as a poem, Arup, for 71, unfortunately no information is given as to the particular part of the body, head, heart, pulse, etc. Whence it was supposed to have emanated. It was these same islanders, however, who held strong beliefs in a connection between spirits and an individual's heart and pulse beats, they talked of the latter as the spirit of the hand, ROP 452. They spoke of the spirit something near the heart as Gonani or Lani Chi, BBR, 237. This one at the heart was the principal one, which after death went to the sky in company with its Akairi, or Chemin, sect. 89, to live there with other familiar spirits, ROP, 484, and change into a young and new body, BBR, 237. They do not regard the spirit as being so immaterial as it is invisible. As to their other spirits which have nothing to do with the heart, they believe that some go after death to make their home on the seashore, and that it is they who make the boats tack, these are known as umku. They believe that others go and live in the woods and forests, these they term maboyas, rop, for 84, or they become changed into beasts. All these spirits are of different sexes and multiply, bbr, 237. Koch Grunberg, 2. 153, makes the interesting suggestion that certain procedures connected with some of the death festivals point to a belief in the bones constituting the real and final resting place of the spirit after the dismemberment, zersetsum, of the body. 70. The possession of a body spirit, or spirits, was not, however, the prerogative solely of man, but, as will be subsequently shown, there was a widespread belief in the association of spirits with animal life. Survivals of this cult, in part or in its entirety, are still recognizable in the folk stories, in certain omens and tokens, charms or talismans, in the observance of certain taboos with regard to food, in blood atonement and the treatment of disease, and perhaps in the application of family group names. So also, there are similarly many traces of a corresponding association of spirits with plant life, Chapter 10. 71 the general mainland belief in a something, singular or plural, emanating, disintegrating, separating, etc. From the dead body of an individual, or an animal, and either remaining in the immediate neighborhood or pursuing various courses, hence becomes quite intelligible. Thus it may associate itself with some other person, to become his spirit friend and advisor as it were, or else may become intimately connected with the bush, forest, fields, and trees, sometimes with stones, rocks, mountains, underground caverns. And occasionally with stars, clouds, lightning, with rain, river, or sea. Thus, associated with spirits already there, we can speak collectively of dream, sect. 86, familiar, sect. 89, forest, sect. 94, Mountain, Sect. 171, Water, Sect. 178, And Sky, Sect. 195, Spirits. I have met with no example of a freed spirit associating itself with a person's shadow, and hence purposely omit the term shadow spirits, Sect. 68, From this category. The important thing to remember is that two or more different kinds of spirits may have been derived from one and the same body. The old Spanish fathers used the word demonio as a generic term for these beings, in the same way that some of the present-day creoles employ the name devil. There are, however, too many diverse opinions held concerning the abstract and concrete nature of the latter to permit of the term being profitably employed for comparative purposes. Others of the Creoles as well as the civilized Indians often employ the word mother, or mama, e.g., the mother of Poes, the water mama. I propose using the term spirit throughout the following pages. Another matter to be borne in mind, however, before proceeding further, is that these spirits of the forest, waters, etc., did not all have a human or an animal origin. Unfortunately the evidence at present available is insufficient to demonstrate with certainty how, or along what lines, many of them thus closely associated with the chief physical characteristics of nature, came to have an existence at all. 
certain of them, e.g., mountain spirits, would seem to have been derived on a principle somewhat analogous to that of choosing a picture to suit the frame. In other cases, they may perhaps have been due to foreign introduction, while I doubt not that a few, like Topsy, growed on their own account. 72. The extent or degree of the spirit's immortality, if such an expression may be used, varies from the primitive idea of its hovering around the place of sepulture to the advanced view of its translation. With or without apparent zoomorphic or anthropomorphic reincarnation, to less defined realms of happiness and bliss. There is nothing to prevent the several spirits of the one body pursuing different courses. Indications of some of these primitive ideas are to be found in certain of the procedures followed with the corpse, namely, the position in which it is laid to rest, its propitiation and address, the objects buried with it, the eating of the flesh, the abandonment of the place of death, and other customs. McClintock says that the Akawoyo races like to bury their dead in a standing position, assigning this reason, although my brother be in appearance dead, he, i.e., his soul, is still alive. Therefore, to maintain an outward sign this belief in immortality, some of them bury their dead erect, which they say represents life, whereas lying down represents death. Others bury their dead in a sitting posture, assigning the same reason, br. 356. Certainly on the Pomeroon, with the Arawaks, if a person should step over another lying down, the latter would be mortally offended, and would say, you can cross me only when I am dead. I am not dead yet. This is of interest in connection with the procedure described by Scomberg, SCR, for 21, at the burial of a Makusi woman, all the relatives next surrounded the grave, and each one jumped over it in the direction whence he had come. Even the barely twelve-week-old orphan was taken in the arms and made to jump over it. So also at the anniversary of the death of a captain among the Guahiba of the Vichada River, Orinoco, the pyre is jumped over by the P.I., the men, and women, at the same time that they blow with full force, sect. 85. In the direction of the country occupied by the Piaroa, their terrible neighbors who make them die through throwing spells over them, CR, 548. 73. However beloved or despised during life, the spirit of the dead is always an object of dread, and is to be propitiated by kind and flattering expressions, by festivals and feasts. At York Hill, near Tinadu Creek, Demerara, says Dance, 256, an Indian child had taken to the habit of eating sand, which contributed to its early death. While the dead body of the child lay in the open coffin, which his father had procured from a Creole carpenter in the neighborhood, and just before the interment, the grandmother of the child stood over it and in wailing tones said, My child! I always told you not to eat sand. I never gave you any, for I knew it was not good for you, you always sought it yourself. I told you that it was bad. Now, see, it has killed you. Don't trouble me, for it was your own doing, some evil thing put it into your head, mind, to eat it. Look, I put your arrow and bow by your side that you may amuse yourself. I was always kind to you, be good and don't trouble me. Then the mother came up crying, and said as in a chant. My child, I brought you into the world to see and enjoy all the good things. This breast, and she exposed it, or rather held it up, for it was already exposed, nourished you as long as you were willing to take it. I made your laps and pretty shirts. I took care of you and fed you, and played with you, and never beat you. You must be good and not bring evil upon me. The father of the dead child likewise approached and said. My boy, when I told you that the sand would kill you, you would not listen to me, and now see, you are dead. I went out and got a beautiful coffin for you. I shall have to work to pay for it. I made your grave in a pleasant spot where you love to play. I shall place you comfortably, and put some sand for you to eat, for now it cannot harm you, and I know that you like it. You must not bring bad luck to me, but look for him who made you eat the sand. This was a family of Christian Arawaks, but the roots of inbred traditional beliefs could not at once be eradicated. 74. At the burial of a Makusi woman at Napi, Upper Essequibo, surrounding the hammock in which the corpse lay, 
in and between the wailing, the women were chanting eulogiums upon the deceased, one had lost her best friend. Another praised the fine cotton thread that she had woven, another, the various objects that she had possessed. When the last article had passed out of the door, in came the P.I., he proceeded to the head of the corpse, bent down to the left ear, and shouted several words into it, when he retired. The P.I. came back with a bundle of hair, and bending down, exposed the corpse's face from beneath the laths, spat on it, then plugged the hair into the ears and mouth, while he continued spitting. Then, addressing it in a harsh tone, he retired, S.C.R., 421. So again, at the death of a Makusi female from the effects of a snake bite, all the women of the village gathered in the hut and shouted unintelligible words into the corpse's ears, S.C.R., 2, 269. 22. On the Maruka River, the Wara women sit in a circle round the grave, and break out ever anew with their song of mourning, which is approximately as follows, Why have you left your wife, children, and friends who loved you so dearly? Why have you left your home and field, where yams and cassava were thriving so well? Who will catch a goody, monkey, fish, and turtle for us now? SCR, 2, 446. Why are you dead? Were you tired of life? Did you not have cassava enough? Are among the expressions addressed by the island Carib women to the corpse, BBR, 252. So with their fellow tribeswomen in Kayan where, on a death, the men, women, friends, and children assemble and weep, or rather sing. The singing is done mostly by the nearest female relatives who, sitting on their heels, slowly pass both hands over the corpse from head to foot, while reproaching him for having let himself die. Is it because you were not happy with us, say some? What have we done for you to leave us like this, say others? They add, you were such a good hunter, too. You caught fish and crabs so well. You knew how to make a proper provision field, etc., PBA, 228. On the Orinoco the saliva mourners, on finally eulogizing the deceased would say, what an excellent fisherman we have lost. What a clever archer has died, he never missed his mark. G. I. 197. Among the special feasts and festivals in honor, or rather in propitiation, of the dead, I would mention the Arawak Makwari, Morakuhua, sect. 75, and Hayari dances for deceased males and females, respectively. In the far western Guianas, the object of the masked dances is to propitiate the spirit of the dead, so that he will not come back again to fetch one of the survivors, KG, 138. 75. When the death of any member of that tribe, Akawai, is supposed to have been brought about by unfair means, the knife of the deceased is buried with him, that he may have the means of avenging himself in the world of spirits. The Waraus, in similar circumstances, place a bow and arrows by the side of the dead man, that he may by means of those weapons keep off malignant spirits in his passage to the other world. Br. 356. At the burial of a male Makusi at Parari, not only the dead man's knife but several thongs were buried with him. The thongs were put into the grave for the purpose of enabling him to tie to a tree the Kanaima who had caused his death, SCR, 468. Such thongs are to be seen also at some of the funeral dances of other tribes. Thus, among the Rukoyen of Kayan, at the Pono, or first of the two festivals in honor of the dead, one man alone stands up, holding in his hand a whip eight meters long. With a swirling motion he cracks it with a report like that of a pistol. Each one in turn gets up and cracks the whip, CR, 258. At their corresponding festival the Arawaks use whips upon each other, often inflicting terrible wounds. To receive their flagellation, the performers put their legs forward as does the white crane or stork, Mcteria sp. The wooden effigy of which the masters of ceremony carry, this particular dance as well as the whips being thus named, after the bird, Morakuyaha, this Arawak word, corrupted now into Makwari, Makwari, etc. Is seemingly of Tupi origin, the creature being known on the lower Amazon as Magoari, HWB, 146, 316. 76. 
future provision may be made for the deceased by burying with him his dog, his women, or his slaves, some food, his hunting and fighting implements, and his ornaments. Examples of these procedures are plentiful in the old records. His faithful hunting dog was killed and placed with him, and the grave closed in, Warhouse, SCR, 2, 446. His dog is also buried to guard him, and watch those that caused him in die. If the deceased owned a negro, the latter is killed in order to serve his master in the other world. Island Caribs, BBR, 252. They imagine that the spirit lives the same life as the man lives below. And this is why they still kill the slaves when they can catch those who were in the service of the deceased, so as to serve him in the other world, Island Caribs, ROP, 484. There are buried. On one side of the deceased is bow, arrows, club, and shield, on the other they place one of his wives to look after and accompany him, Orinoco Caribs, G, I, 201. On the upper Amazon, when a mother dies, her young infant may be buried alive with her, sect. 284. Little bits of bone, fruits, bread, etc., were strewn on the corpse in the grave, Makusi, SCR, 421, fruits, bones. And a flask filled with water and a drinking cup, Makusi, Ibid, 468, bread, fruit, and dried fish, Warhouse, Ibid, 2, 446, at the side we find a vessel which contained the curia to stimulate the deceased on his travels in the other world, cassava, bananas, pieroas, of the Orinoco, CR, 544-548. It is almost universal amongst these Orinoco nations either to bury with deceased his arms and ornaments, or to burn them, g. i. 207. Buried in a sitting attitude and all his implements of war and hunting by his side, st. i. 399. They place at its side a blowpipe and a quiver full of arrows dipped in Karari, Pieroas, cr. 548. The dead are almost always buried in the houses with their bracelets, tobacco bag, and other trinkets upon them, yups, Rio Negro, arw. 346. The deceased is clothed in his finest ornaments, a crown of bright colored feathers on his head, to his neck are attached his collars, his wooden comb, and his deer bone flutes. The arms and legs are covered with bracelets, Roko Yen Cremation, Yeri River, Kayan, CR, 120. Many of the Indian tribes, but chiefly the Caribs, Makusi, and Akawai have the custom of burying their dead either in the hut where they lived, or, if a case of death should happen during a journey. A shed covered with palm leaves is built over the grave to prevent the weather from incommoding the person who rests beneath, SCG, 271. For the alleged reason of making doubly sure of giving the spirit or spirits no cause for wishing to come out of the grave, certain of the present-day Pomeroon Arawaks are said either to plant cassava, or to place a cassava squeezer. Upon the top of it. 77. The eating of the corpse's flesh or the drinking of a preparation made therefrom, except in those cases in which cannibalism was indulged in rather by reason of vengeance with the object of inspiring terror in their enemies, PBA, 171. Was but the expression of another link in the chain of ideas which culminated in a belief in spirit immortality. There yet remained in the flesh and bones of the deceased certain qualities, somethings, spirits, etc., which could be detached, separated, and transferred to the living by means of ingestion. There is abundant evidence among these Guiana Indians of a belief in the transference of individual, animal or human, peculiarities through this agency, sex, 250, 280. Thus in order to strengthen their own courage and contempt for death, the Caribs of the upper Pomeroon would cut out the heart of the person slain, dry it over the fire, powder it, and then mix the powder in their drink, SCR, 2, 430. The Terianas and Tucanos, of the Yups River, and some other tribes, about a month after the funeral, disinter the corpse which is then much decomposed, and put it in a great pan, or oven, over the fire. Till all the volatile parts are driven off with a most horrible odor, leaving only a black carbonaceous mass, which is pounded into a fine powder. And mixed in several large couches, vats made of hollow trees, of caxari, 
this is drunk by the assembled company till all is finished. They believe that thus the virtues of the deceased will be transmitted to the drinkers. ARW, 346. The salivas on the Orinoco also pursued the practice of digging up the bones, burning them, and then collecting the ashes to mix with their drinking water, Bree, 267. On the other hand, in the lands back, of Cayenne, there are nations who disinter the bones when they consider the body is putrid enough, and after calcining them, drink the ashes which they mix with their vicu. Believing that by this means they are giving the defunct a more honorable burial than by leaving them a prey to worms and corruption, PBA, 231. 23. 78. Surely it is not unreasonable to suppose, granted certain spirits and other agencies were believed to be contained in the corpses, that the bones of the deceased distributed among friends and acquaintances, or slung up in their houses, must have served a purpose other than that of an everyday gift or ordinary ornament. The island Caribs certainly used the bones of their friends for purposes of witchcraft and prophecy, sect. 91. The practice of exhuming the remains after longer or shorter intervals, although not direct evidence, may nevertheless indicate the existence in former times of a similar use for the bones among the mainland Caribs and other tribes. Thus, at the expiration of the year, the decomposed body is dug up and the bones are distributed to all the friends and acquaintances, st. i. 399. The bones, having been cleaned by the fish, are packed according to size in a basket already provided, worked with glass beads of various colors, care is taken that the skull of the deceased forms the lid of the basket. The basket is then hung up to the roof of their houses, among the warhouse of the Orinoco, along with the many other baskets containing the bones of their forefathers, g. i. 199. The women, among the Caribs of the upper Pomeroon, who prepare the bones are considered unclean for several months, scr. 2, 431-2. 79. With regard to the abandonment by the Indians of the locality where death has taken place, nothing can conquer their fear lest the deceased spirit, located somewhere in the immediate neighborhood, should do them harm. On the Orinoco the practice of rooting up the fields which deceased has planted, so soon as his widow or widows have buried him, is also almost universal, they said they do it to destroy all memory of the deceased, g. i. 207. 24 With the Anabali and other tribes of this same river, when anyone dies they bury him in the place where he had his hearth and, covering the grave with many mats, they forsake the village and all their fields. And build and sow at twelve or fifteen leagues distance. They say that when death has once entered their village they cannot live in security. But when these people subsequently advanced to a settled life, as soon as the sick person died they broke up his home and burnt everything which the deceased possessed, Ibid, 206. One of the chief's wives had died. And in consequence, although the settlement was quite new, the houses most comfortable, the cassava still in the field, every man had abandoned it, and left this poor Indian to look after the crops, Rupununi River, SCG, 238. In an Ojana village, Tuolis, on the Tapanahoni, Suriname, three people died in 1907, Tuolis' adult son Poliku, and two others. One house of Tuoli and one of Poliku were burned. A month later, the village was deserted, the survivors had established themselves in another one, Go, 15. Among the Rukuyens on the upper Peru, Cayenne, the common laity must not make the slightest noise, or approach anywhere near the grave of a P.I., for fear of meeting his fellow colleague, the tiger medicine man who guards the corpse. But the spirits of the distinguished dead may be visited by doctors, by the common crowd, and by animals for the special purpose of consultation, CR, 298. 80. Of other obscure burial customs, obscure in the sense that their real signification has been only approximately, if at all, determined, may be mentioned that of the island Caribs, BBR, 252, who place two weights on the eyes of the deceased. So that he may not see his parents and thus make them ill, sect. 253, most extraordinary of all, however, would seem to be the procedure followed by the warhouse at the mouth of the Orinoco. On the death of a woman, the husband lies down in front of her. 
He remains there a few minutes, weeping and singing, and then makes way for each and all who have ever had connection with the deceased. As no Indian will willingly act contrary to the established usages of his tribe. Such a custom seems calculated to prove a check upon persons who are not desirous of having their actions exposed to public notoriety. CR, 612. 81. While certain of the Indians appear to hold advanced views respecting the immortality of that particular spirit which, on its departure from the body, takes on an anthropomorphic form, they are not in agreement as to the place of translation. This may be identical for the spirits of good and of bad people, as is the belief of the Waraus and the Makusi, or at all events the places may not be very far apart, e.g., the Caribs of the Yeri River, Cayenne. According to the views of these people, the spirits of the good and bad, within certain limitations to be immediately discussed in this and succeeding paragraphs, rise after death toward the skies, which they call Kapoun. 25 The former travel high, very high, above the clouds where they find pretty women, they dance every night, they drink kasiri, and do not work in the clearings, provision fields. The wicked remain below the clouds where they are always roaming without any hope of getting higher. If the body is burned immediately after death, this is done in order that the spirit may ascend with the smoke, CR, 298. There are interesting records left to us concerning the island Caribs, eh? some hold that the most valiant of their nation are carried after death to the fortunate isles, where they have everything they can wish for. And that the Arawaks are their slaves. That they swim without being tired, in the wide and large rivers and live delightfully and pass the time happily in dances, games, and feasts, in a country which produces all kinds of good fruits without being cultivated. b. On the contrary those who have been cowardly and timid in going to war against their enemies, have, after death, to serve the Arawaks, who inhabit desert and sterile countries which are beyond the mountains. c. But others, the most brutal, do not trouble about what takes place after death, they neither dream not talk about it, ROP, 484-485. The Arawaks maintain that the spirits of evil people wander continually around an uninhabited desolate, barren place, while those of the good occupy the air above their former huts and settlements. But the conceptions of these Indians as to good and bad are not identical with modern European views. For instance, if an Arawak by any action of his proves himself a coward or faint-hearted, or succumbs too frequently to excesses in drink, he is called Makoburokwa, one who forgets, a man without sense. While one who shows a blameless disposition and has remained a stranger to continual intoxication, is named a Kakaburokwa, or brave man, SCR, 2, 497 The spirits of two such people will be separated on the lines just indicated. It must not be forgotten, however, that these Arawaks, of all the Guiana Indians, have been longest in contact with civilizing influences, and that this idea of a future existence dependent on present conduct may be but a borrowed one. Speaking generally, the trend of opinion among the so-called unsophisticated Indians is that certain of the spirits of people departed hasten to a place where they will have all they want, and meet their friends who have gone before. The prevalent neglect of the South American natives of the sick and the want of love in dealing with them can become intelligible, in Skomberg's opinion, SCR, 2, 318. Only on the assumption of their belief in some such religious tradition as this. 82. Certain Venezuelan Indians believe that the spirit retires to certain lakes and is swallowed by monstrous serpents, which transport it to a paradise where its time is occupied in constant dancing and drinking, FD, 52. The Otomacs declare that people's souls all speed toward the west to a place where without trouble or toil they live at ease, but before they reach it, they are met by a big bird called Tiktadig, which seizes upon and swallows them. Unless they valorously fight it, SCR, 2, 318. Humboldt, 2, 249, speaks of this fabulous bird as Tiki Tiki and makes it responsible for the deformities of newborn children, sect. 279. In the province of Curoana are several lofty mountains, the highest of which is Tumurquiri. In this mountain is situated the cavern of Guachero, which is so celebrated among the Indians. 
It is very extensive, and serves as a habitation to an immense number of nocturnal birds, especially a new species of the Caprimulgus, Lin. From the fat of which is procured the oil of Guachero. Its situation is commanding, and ornamented by the most luxuriant vegetation. From this cavern issues a river of considerable size, and in the interior is heard the doleful cry of the birds which the Indians attribute to the souls of the deceased, which according to them, must of necessity pass through this place in order to enter the other world. This privilege they immediately obtain when their conduct has been irreproachable throughout life. In the contrary case they are confined for a longer or shorter time in the cavern, according to the magnitude of their offenses. It is this dark and dreary abode that forces from them those groans and lamentations which are heard without. The Indians are so fully persuaded of the truth of this tradition. That immediately on the death of any of their relations or friends, they repair to the mouth of the cavern, in order to ascertain whether their souls have encountered any obstacles, or been allowed to pass. Whatever the fate of the defunct soul they give themselves up to the same excesses, drink, making no difference but in the nature of the dance. FD, 129-130 The superstitions connected with this cavern are recorded also by Humboldt, 258. 83, it has been mentioned, sect. 81, that in the case of a spirit taking on an anthropomorphic form there were indications showing that its future state may sometimes depend on the character of the individual whence it had been derived but mainly for the reason that the more complex ideas on this subject, as will have been recognized from even the few illustrations already given, are to be met with among those of the tribes which have been longest in contact with European influences. I am inclined to the opinion that the belief in a future condition directly dependent on present conduct is not only of comparatively late introduction, but is a borrowed one. The purgatorial nature of the ordeals to be successfully undergone by the spirits, sect. 82, certainly savors strongly of Roman Catholic influences. In a sense this opinion is strengthened by a study of the Orinoco Indians, whose original beliefs have been preserved through the careful investigations of Father Gamilla, one of the very first of the missionaries to labor among them. I have searched his writings in vain for any reference to the doctrine of conditional future reward or punishment, or to that of a purgatory. In the same manner, on the Irie, Rio Negro, the Susi Indians, an Arawak group which has been but little in contact with civilizing influences, apparently make no distinction between good and bad spirits. All the members of the tribes after death finding their way to a forest upon high mountains on the upper Ikana, K.G., I, 166. 84. So again there does not appear to be sufficient warrant for many of the old travelers and missionaries making that arbitrary distinction of good and bad spirits, according to the bodies whence they have been derived, which has led to so many disastrous misconceptions. The Indian's idea of these comparative virtues is, as might have been expected, simplicity itself, in that a spirit is good or bad according as it is for or against him, that is, inclined to help or to harm him. It is only from this point of view that he concerns himself with the spirit at all. A spirit may be good as judged by its source of origin, e.g., a brave man, but bad as regards the evil which it happens to inflict upon the person concerned. Thus it was among the Carib Islanders, that the good familiar spirits, the Chemin or Ikairi, sect. 67 were sent by their human associates as messengers to carry sickness and evil to their enemies, R.O.P., 472. As a matter of fact, the above-mentioned misconception of the Indian's point of view affords an excellent illustration of the error into which certain authors have fallen in failing to recognize the very wide distinction existing between the evil spirit, or Maboya, of the Carib Islanders, and their good spirit, or Chemin, when pursuing evil courses. It will be convenient to rectify this error, as far as possible, here. Maboya, or Maboya, was undoubtedly of human origin. Thus, of the several spirits which the body possesses, sect. 69, some, remain on earth changed into beasts or into Maboya, BBR, 237 they go and live in the woods and forests, and are called Maboyas, ROP, 484. That is to say, 
in the same way that others of the body's spirits attach themselves to the waters, mountains, skies, etc., and remain there, so the Maboya attaches itself to the bush and forest. Indeed, there can be no doubt that the Maboya of the Antillians corresponds in every sense with the mainland spirit of the forest, that is, the Yawahu, Habu, Yurikan, etc., sect. 94. The mainland Caribs of Kayan actually used the identical term Maboya, PBA, 206. The people never invoke Maboya, as some imagine, ROP, 472 notwithstanding the extent to which he or it may be feared, and in spite of the brutality of the treatment received at his hands, the folk do not honor him with offerings, prayers, adoration, or sacrifice, Ibid. 476. When the proverbial, pain and anguish wring the brow, Indians believe that these are due to the familiar spirits of some of their enemies by whom they have been sent, Ibid, 473. When a person is sick, the offerings, Anakri, sect. 89, laid on the little table, Matutu, are not for the Maboya, as, incorrectly, stated in one passage by Rockefort and Poincy, Ibid. 563, but for that familiar spirit which had been instructed to convey the sickness, or for that familiar spirit which had played an important part in effecting the cure, as, correctly, mentioned by the same authors in another passage, Ibid, 472. It is known also that the island, as well as the mainland, Caribs painted or carved a hideous figure of this spirit in front of their canoes, not only to frighten their enemies. But in order that the spirit's contemplation of its own likeness might divert its attention into other channels. This figure was said to be Maboya, e.g. BBR, 236, but as it would be ridiculous to assume the existence of bush or forest spirits upon the bosom of the waters, I am forced to the conclusion that it represented a chemin, or familiar spirit. Capable of course of committing good or evil according to its, master's, instructions, cf. Sect. 48. 85. Individuals can be relieved of the presence of undesirable spirits by means of the P.I. Rattle, Sect. 289, as well as by so-called kissing and blowing. It is this latter method that I propose discussing here. While one writer talks of kissing being unknown among Indians, it. 193, another speaks of these people expressing tenderness by kissing, not on the lips, but on all parts of the body, cr. 175. If osculation is to be regarded as a sign of amativeness, the former is an error, because certainly among Caribs, Akawai, Waraus, and Arawaks, this is expressed by man or woman. In the protrusion of the tip of the tongue between the loosely closed lips. What can also be considered a form of kissing is the custom of one individual blowing upon another under particular circumstances. The object of this blowing is explained by Scomberg, SCR, 2, 254, on the principle that both by the Indians, and the Orientals, the breath is regarded as an emanation of the most inward spiritual and mental vigor. A far more satisfactory explanation, however, would seem to lie in the fact that the blowing is intended to drive away an attached evil spirit, etc., as is indeed the belief among the Galibi P.I., sect. 310, and elsewhere, sects. 14, 59, 72, 246, 319, a view which is only strengthened by the particular circumstances, above referred to, under which it is practiced, namely, in sickness, or in absence of adequate protecting influences. On the way to Roraima, the Serkong women brought us several of their sick children for us to breathe upon their faces, and so restore them to health, SCR, 2, 253. At Kurosawaka Streamlet, a pretty-looking Makusi mother insisted upon my blowing in the face of her sickly infant, which she believed would act as a charm, and restore her child to health, SCE, 177. Before we left, she, the old Indian woman, made the entire party, on our way to Roraima, blow three times on her back for good luck, but whether the luck was for her or for us we never found out, B.W., 217. At Taipong village, Upper Potaro, when on the point of leaving, a woman stepped forward to an old Indian in one of our canoes, and held up her head. 
he tapped her forehead with his fingers, muttered a few words, and then blew on her temple. This was done to charm away a pain in the head, the old fellow being a piaman, and capable of effecting such cures. On our arrival at villages I have sometimes seen a woman carry her infant round to one after another of the Indians of my party, each man as she passed stooping down and blowing gently on the face of the child. Bro, 202. Among the Arawak and the Warau, when the child cries, or when father or mother leave it to set out on the chase, to work in the field, etc., they will blow either on the child's face or hand, but they do nothing of the sort on their return. It is a Makusi custom for the infant to be blown upon, angeblason, by the relatives, before its parents take to their hammocks, scr, 2, 3, 14, to keep the kavad. With the same tribe, the P.I. will blow upon the girl after the menstruation ceremony with the object of disenchanting her, sect. 267. 6. Dreams, Idiocy. Head spirits are the causes of dreams, 86, the unreality and reality of dream life, 87. Idiocy, 88. 86, from mainland Caribs, those on the Pomeroon and Maruka rivers, I have learned that the aka, or Akari, spirit, sect. 69, resides in the head. Urakan, their bush spirit, sect. 94, comes along when the person is asleep, seizes the Akari, and takes it with him into the forest. This causes people to dream, but sometimes Urakan forgets, and does not bring it back, with the consequence that the individual dies. In dreaming, the Indians say that the spirit is paying a visit to the world to come, kg, i, 167, or has gone for a walk, etc., Ibid, 2, 151. 87. While Kudro, 2, 198, seems emphatic in his remark concerning the Yups River Indians, that they have the correct idea of a dream, and do not take for reality the visions of sleep. Imthern would seem to have an equally positive opinion to the contrary. The latter, 344 to 345, tells us how. One morning when it was important for me to get away. I found that one of the invalids, a young Macusi, though better in health, was so enraged against me that he refused to stir, for he declared that, with great want of consideration for his weak health. I had taken him out during the night and had made him haul the canoe up a series of difficult cataracts. Nothing could persuade him that this was but a dream, and it was some time before he was so far pacified as to throw himself sulkily into the bottom of the canoe. More than once, the men declared in the morning that some absent man, whom they named, had come during the night, and had beaten or otherwise maltreated them, and they insisted upon much rubbing of the bruised parts of their bodies. Laborde records similar exponences from the island Caribs, at night, I have heard them, sometimes two at once, complain, cry, wake with a start, and tell me that the devil wanted to beat them. They went on screaming when quite awake, etc. BBR, 236. Rockefort and Poincy confirm this for the same people, the Caribs are also subject to other ills which they say come from Maboya, and often complain that he is hitting them, especially during sleep, ROP, 474. The medicine men appear generally to have enjoyed a great reputation as dreamers, sex, 264, 300. More than this, dreams were sometimes interpreted as omens and auguries. Thus, in token of the missionary coming to visit them, and a sign of his approach, a certain cacique told Gamilla that he had dreamed that his land sown with seed were very dry, and that the rain had fallen just in the nick of time, g. i. 311. 88. In connection with the idea of at least one of the individual spirits being located in his head. It is of interest to record Skomberg's observations among the Wapaziana on the Takuta River with regard to idiocy, imbeciles are regarded with awe by the Indians, for according to their traditions, these are in close intimacy with good spirits. And hence their words and actions are regarded as signs of divinity, SCR, 2, 54. Their doings and sayings are considered oracular, SCT, 44. True it is also that imbeciles are regarded as uncanny, and that they will often carry out with impunity and success many a deed which people in their right senses would not even attempt. 
Here is a case in point, from the Warhouse. The idiot who wanted to fly, W. A man was blessed with a sister and mother, but unfortunately was without good sense, and for this reason he was known as Wabasi, lit, a sickly person. His sister had a dog called Warabizi, lit, a wasp. One day Wabasi went down to the seashore to catch big Bunari crabs, and just as he was about to step out of the boat, an immense tiger approached. Thinking it was his sister's dog, he exclaimed, Warabizi. Warabizi. Come on. What are you doing here? And as the creature trotted up quite close, he seized it round the waist, and tried to pull it into the boat. Of course the tiger growled, but all Wabasi said was, Don't bite me, Warabizi, and as the animal was too heavy and clumsy to be dragged in, he lost his temper and said, Stupid Warabizi. Stay where you are, then, and may tiger come and eat you. When Wabasi got home, he told his sister that he had seen her dog. She said, No, you did not. You cannot be in your right senses. Warabizi has been here with me all the time. On another occasion Wabasi joined some friends and relatives on a hunting expedition, they came across a herd of bush hog, and Wabasi shot one. By and by, his friends collected into one big heap all the hogs that they had shot, and Wabasi came to have a look at their spoil, leaving his own quarry behind. Oh, said he, my bush hog is different from these. Mine has a mark on his head, and a flat nose. So the other hunters told him to go and fetch it and let them have a look. When they saw it, they were much surprised to recognize a tiger, and still more so to learn that his captor had not even met with a scratch. Next day after they reached home. Wabasi dressed himself like a bird, with a feather, representing the tail, stuck into his belt behind, he climbed a high tree and jumped from limb to limb three times. On the fourth occasion he alighted on a dry limb, which broke, and he fell to earth. How splendidly I can fly, he remarked, when he picked himself up. 88a. The picking up, or handling of, certain birds' feathers conduces to loss of memory and to insanity, sect. 223. 7. Familiar spirits. The cult of familiar spirits reached a high development among the island Carib folk, 89. Though presented with offerings and other things, these spirits could be invoked only by the medicine man, 90, and, being more or less intimately associated with human bones, were often called into requisition for purposes of witchcraft and prophecy, 91. The island Arawak people also had similar familiar spirits, 92, the belief in whose existence is even yet traceable on the Guiana mainland, 93. Familiar spirits and Kavad, 93a. 89. The cult of the familiar spirit would appear to have reached a high stage of development among the island tribes, at any rate, it is from these people that comparatively complete records of its existence have come down to us. Thus with the Carib Islanders, the good spirits which are their gods are more particularly expressed as a kairi, by men, and chemin, by women they believe that these good spirits, or these gods, are in great numbers. And in this plurality each person believes he has a special one for himself, his own particular spirit, his own familiar, they say that these gods reside in the sky, but do not know what they do there. And they themselves show no signs of recognizing them as the creators of the world and of things that are, ROP, 471. The precise source or origin of these familiar spirits is unfortunately nowhere given, beyond the statement that they leave the human body at death in company with the particular spirit connected with the deceased's heart, Ibid, 484. Again, the island Caribs dedicated no temples or altars to their divinities, these Akairi or Chemin, they made them no sacrifices. They simply made them offerings of cassava, and their first fruits. Above all, when they believed that they had been cured by them of some illness, they had a feast in their honor and offered them cassava and noiko. All these offerings are known as anacri, alacri, they place these at one end of the hut in vessels, according to the nature of the thing, on one or several matutis, or small tables plated of rushes and palm leaves. Each one in the hut can make these offerings to his, familiar, spirit, 
but such offerings are not accompanied by any adoration or prayer, and consist only of the actual presentation of the gifts, Ibid, 472. 90. To invoke them, however, requires the boy, medicine man, together with incantations and tobacco smoke. This is the case chiefly on four occasions, a, to be revenged on someone who has done them harm, and so draw punishment on him. b, to get cured of some illness and learn the results of it, c, to consult them on the issues of their wars, d, and to hunt away the evil spirit, maboya, walk sit. When the boy has made his familiar spirit appear, sect. 314, the latter is heard to reply clearly to the questions put to him, he is heard to click his jaws as if eating and drinking the anacre. But next morning they find that he has not touched it. These temporal viands which have been soiled by these unfortunate spirits are deemed so sacred by the magician and the people whom they have abused that it is only the old men and the most illustrious among them who are free to partake of them. And even then they dare not taste them unless they have a certain cleanliness of person, ROP, 473. They have asked me, says Father de la Borde, sometimes to drink of it, and I have done so just to try and change their superstitious ideas. One of which is to drink of this oiko before eating, otherwise you die, and purposely I ate first before drinking, another is to keep the cup straight so as not to spill the contents. Otherwise the eyes would run water everlastingly. I purposely spilt some, and held the cup crooked, BBR, 235. 91. These familiar spirits, Ikairi or Chemin, often nestle themselves inside bones taken from a grave, which are wrapped up with cotton into grotesque figures, and so give oracles, they say it is the spirit of the dead that talks, ROP, 473, 479. They sometimes put the hairs, or some bones, of their deceased parents into a calabash. They keep these in their huts, and use them for some sorcery. They say that the spirit of the dead one speaks through these, and forewarns them of the designs of their enemies. More than this, bones prepared with cotton, as above mentioned, are used for bewitching their enemies, and for this purpose the sorcerers wrap them up with something that belongs to their enemy, ROP, 473. These familiar spirits also enter into the bodies of females and speak through them, lock sit. In order to turn aside the vials of their wrath and to divert the anger of these spirits, tobacco leaves are smoked in their honor through the agency of the boys, their hideous likenesses are painted on the canoes. Or the Indians carry slung around their necks a small embossed effigy representing one of these cursed spirits in the ugliest position in which it had ever put in an appearance, ROP, 479. 92. The island Arawak also had a belief in certain supernatural beings or spirits, and possessed effigies of them, both the spirit and its effigy were known to these folk as Semi or Zimi. Thus, in his account of the Aborigines of Haiti, Santo Domingo, Columbus says. But also in all the other islands and on the mainland, Cuba. Each has a house apart from the village in which there is nothing except some wooden images carved in relief which are called semis. Nor is there anything done in such a house for any other object or service except for these semis, by means of a kind of ceremony and prayer which they go to make in it as we go to churches. In this house they have a finely wrought table, round like a wooden disc, in which is some powder which is placed by them on the heads of these semis in performing a certain ceremony. Then with a cane that has two branches which they place in their nostrils they snuff up this dust. The words that they say none of our people understand. WF, 352. In early writings, Zenis are repeatedly called messengers, and were in fact subordinates of the great gods, being possessed like them of magic power to make the yucca grow, to facilitate childbirth, and to cure the sick, Ibid, 356. 93. These semi of the island Arawaks were identical with the chemin of the island Caraboned women who, for very intelligible reasons, spoke an Arawak dialect. Still more interesting is the fact that, on the Guiana mainland, the Arawak designation both of the P.I. and of the various kickshaws and apparatus employed in the pursuit of his craft is semi-chihi, or semi-sihi. Indeed, it is in the cult of the P.I. where traces of this belief in familiar spirits must be sought among the mainland tribes, and it is here where I have been fortunate enough to find some.
Thus, the effigy of the familiar spirit of the islanders has its representative in the so-called Dal, sect. 290, and Necornament, sect. 292, of the mainland Arawak and Warao medicine man, as well as in the devil figure of the Galibi P.I., sect. 311, and possibly in the maize straw figure described by Craveau, sect. 311. The spirit itself is met with in the beings invoked by the mainland Carib doctor when called upon to treat a patient, sect. 309 It is indeed not so very improbable that the actual island Carib term Ikairi, sect. 89 May be identical with the mainland Carib word Iakai A used today on the Pomeroon. 93 A While frankly admitting that I have no actual proof from the literature or from my own field work, as to any relationship of the familiar spirit with the little baby spirit, on whose account the various forms of kavod are practiced, sex. 281-283, I am nevertheless very much inclined to believe in their identity. I look on the familiar spirit as an early stage in the idea of the conscious self, the gigo. 8. The Spirits of the Bush, Natural History. Various names applied, 94, the Yawahu. To Kuyuha, Dai Dai, etc., general appearance, 95, and special association with the silk cotton tree, 96, Akekuli in Mansonskiri, 97. An unusual form of bush spirit, 98, the Habu, 99, the Imawari, 100, the Yurikon, etc., 101. But bush spirits may be zoomorphic, able to change into animals, as tigers, goat suckers, 102, 103. They can be recognized by sound, 104, or by smell, 105. They are very shrewd, can bring the dead to life, and render themselves invisible, 106. May occasionally do kindnesses to people, 107, but generally prefer mischief, though this may be due to the Indian's own fault, 108. They cause all the mishaps and accidents of daily life, 109, damage crops, raise disputes, bring death and sickness, produce transformations, 110 to 115, they are excellent hunters, 116. They are fond of women, human flesh, and children at the breast, 117 to 120, and of tobacco, 121 to 122, are usually of abnormally large size, 123, shrink from exposure of all descriptions as to daylight, or in connection with name or origin, 124. Cannot endure being mimicked or chaffed, 125. It is best to leave these bush spirits strictly to themselves, as they bring only harm in the long run, 126 to 128. If circumstances force one into their company, measures can be taken to rid the house and neighborhood of them, 129, also the road when one is traveling, 130. 94. Those spirits which, emanating from the human corpse, ultimately find a resting place in the tree, field, forest, or bush, are known collectively as forest spirits or bush spirits. But let us not forget that certain of the bush spirits may arise from the dead bodies of animals and birds, and may even develop spontaneously. The generic term applied to them varies with the tribes, thus, in Cayenne there is Hyorikan, Galibi, or Hyruka, Lap, 2, 223, Amigneo and Anaan, Barua, Maboya, Carib, PBA, 206, and Yolak, Carib. In British Guiana, Yawahu, Arawak, Hebo, or Habu, Warao, Yurikan, Carib, and Imawari, Akawai, on the Upper Orinoco, the Atabapo, Inirida, and Guinea, i.e., Upper Rio Negro, it is Ayalakiamo, AVH, 2, 362. 385. On the Iri River, Iyam, Susi, KG, I, 113, on the Orinoco, Tanisimi, Pachagua, Memelu, Beto Yes, Jararas, and Duati, Guajivas, G, 2, 24, on the Amazons, Kapor, HWB, 279, Kurupuri, Ibid, 36, and Jurupuri, Ibid. 381, but this word is said to be Lingoa Gerald, KG, I, 113. It will be noticed how the term Uricon, in the form of Hyorikon, 
Hiruka, Yolak, Ayalakiamo, Ayayamai, is spread throughout the extent of the Guianas, while in the form of Juluka, sect. 2.16, it is met with on the islands, as the personification of the rainbow. I have also shown the probability of its identity with the shadow spirit, sect. 68. Equally striking is its resemblance to the word Huracan, the name given by the Aztecs to the autumnal equinox. Cordonazzo de San Francisco. Huracan means the spirit, Corazon, of the sea, the spirit of heaven and earth, the Nawas were unable to conceive of the author of the universe except in a cataclysm. Cyclone, Hurricane, or Cordonazzo de San Francisco are names of the same phenomenon. Huracan of the Quiche myths is the Kukulkan of the Maya, the Quetzalcoatl, Morning Star, of Mexican mythology. Yawahu, the Arawak generic term, includes the Tukuhuha, the Akekuli, or Manahau, and the Mansanskiri spirits, the Tukuhuha being subdivided into Kanoko Dash, Tu, Kuhuha and Ada Dash, Tu, Kuhuha. According as they are more specially associated with the bush and forest, or trees, respectively. 95. Each tribe seems to exhibit variations in the ideas held as to the form, shape, and peculiarities assumed by its respective bush spirits. Of some of these I am able to furnish the following particulars, starting with the Arawak Yawahos, there are the Takuyuhas, the Kanoko variety of which are spoken of by the Akawai as a Rai Dai or Dai Dai, and by the Creoles of the colony as bush devils. An Arawak woman told me that such spirits are hairy people having so much hair that one cannot see their faces. They live underground in the forest, they may be men or women. They are met with suddenly, but may often give a premonitory sign or token of their coming. The token varies greatly, and even when taken note of is usually recognized only after the event of which it has given warning has taken place, sect. 220 Eid Seek Having no bows and arrows, these spirits are accustomed to fight only with their limbs, so that when an Indian has been attacked and returns home, where he is sure to die shortly after. No marks will be found on his body. Sometimes the Kanoko Dash, too, Kuhuha will not even allow the victim to return alive, but will eat him. Causing him to disappear totally, the friends and relatives never see any further signs of him. The attack may be made at any time, day or night. Now, because these beings, sect. 331, have no bows, or rather what bows they have are broken. The old-time Arawak people used to call them Shimarabu Akradani, lit, bows broken, and when returning home from some hunting or trading expedition, would sing out that name before reaching their houses. With the view of preventing these undesirable spirits making an entry, sect. 129. 96. The Ada variety of Takuyuha spirits, particularly associated with trees, are sometimes in the shape of birds, among such notable trees are the silk cotton, Bombax sp, and the Kofa, Klusha grandiflora. In Cayenne it would seem that the Hiruka, Uricon, was specially attached to a tree known as Panacoco, Lap, 2, 223, which thus far I have not been able to identify. The Indian guide breaks his arrow and asks pardon from the spirit for his European visitor having touched the timber with unclean victims, a fish and an agouti.26. 97. When perceptible to human eyes, the Akekuli or Manahau have the appearance of black people, Negroes they are of a savage nature, killing Indians, and abducting children. If anywhere in the neighboring caves and gullies and their names be loudly called in the forest, they will materialize. The Mansanskiri, Arawak, or Mihisakiri, Warau, is a particular Yawahu wandering about the bush, and in and among the trees, of which the native women, subsequent to certain regular occasions, have to be especially careful. Such spirits can assume the identical material appearance of their real husbands or lovers, but woe betide those poor women who yield to their solicitations, for they will surely die in a few days. On the other hand, provided the woman is shrewd enough, she can invariably tell whether she is dealing with the real man or not, she has only to look at the left foot, in the case of a spirit wooer, this is always minus the big toe. During February, 1910, an Indian came and gave me particulars of his wife's death, with details as to name, 
place, and surrounding circumstances. The wife had been out getting firewood in the bush, and had unexpectedly met what she had believed to be her husband. When she got home there was her husband lying in his hammock. She expressed surprise at seeing him, still more so when he assured her that he had not been away from the house that day. Like a good wife, she told him what had happened to her. Within the week the woman died. 97a. The Mahisakiri changes the woman into a bush spirit, w. A man went out hunting, leaving his wife behind by herself. It was then that a Mahisakiri appeared, and believing it to be her husband, the woman allowed him to act like one, but he went away shortly before the time for her real husband to arrive. The same thing happened on a second and a third occasion, but on the last visit, knowing that her husband had gone to a distant locality, she expressed her doubts by asking my Hisakiri, how can you be my husband? He is gone far away. It was only then that he admitted who he really was, a bush spirit in her husband's likeness, and he told her to come away with him. When the real husband returned, the house was empty, and no wife visible, but he could hear her laughing in the distance, and approaching the spot found her prostrate, still laughing. She was laughing because the Mahisakiri was sporting with her, her husband of course could not see the spirit for the reason that he was invisible to the male sex. Now, when he seized his wife's arm to drag her home, it was all soft, with no bones in it, and then feeling her all over realized that she had not a single bone in her body, which was all soft. Returning home, he waited a while, and then returned a second time to fetch her, but she was still all flesh and skin, and so he left her severely alone. All she could say to him was, I do not really want to leave you, husband, but the Mahisakiri is too strong for me, I am now a bush spirit. And though you must not be sorry for me, I am indeed sorry for you, for you will have to die before you can become one. 98. An unusual form of Arawak bush spirit is that of the scrub turkey, Tinamus sp. A woman's leg, there are several references, however, to a leg in the folklore, sex, 38, 208, 362. The connection between this astral limb and the bird under consideration is that when the leg is above the horizon just before daybreak, then will the scrub turkeys call be heard. 27. The man who always hunted scrub turkey, a. There was a man celebrated for his skill in hunting, ma'am, Tinamus sp. He would regularly bring home four or five of these scrub turkeys, and people warned him that if he continued in this way he would get into trouble with the ma'am's mother, i.e., spirit. For killing so many or her brood, sect. 242, but he did not care, and went on destroying the birds in the same wasteful manner. On one occasion he stayed out later than usual, waiting to see on which particular trees the mams were going to roost. He could hear their peculiar call in all directions around, indeed, the birds were so plentiful about, that he was somewhat at a loss to know which particular one to follow. However, he proceeded to track one, but the farther he went, the farther off sounded the note, until at last he found himself deep in the forest. As night was beginning to fall, he had to hurry home, not daring to remain out in the dark for fear of the Yawahu, spirit of the bush, catching him. The same thing happened next day, he heard many birds calling, and, following one, again found himself deep in the forest. But this time he succeeded finally in coming up with the quarry. Locating the tree, he peered in among the branches to see where the bird was, hollow, ing. But could see only a woman's leg. Recognizing this to be the arch spirit of the man's sect. 210, he took careful aim, and shot an arrow right into the center of the foot. The leg fell down, and directly it touched ground. Changed into an extraordinarily big scrub turkey, which he immediately killed and carried home. There his friends knew it at once to be the man's mother, spirit, and advised him to cook and eat the whole of it himself and not give away even the smallest particle of it. He did what was advised, and in subsequently hunting for ma'am he was invariably even more successful than before. And now that he had destroyed the ma'am spirit, he was not afraid of killing as many birds as he liked. 99. 
The Hebus are more or less hairy beings, recognizable in a near view by the absence of buttocks, their place being taken by a fire hearth, with glowing embers, giving rise to the name Hudakurakura, red back. Which is often applied to these folk, sex. 21, 27. Another peculiarity they possess is the extraordinary prominence of the eyebrows, supraorbital region, which prevents them having a look at the skies except when standing on their heads, sect. 22. Perhaps this conception is a survival of the custom of artificial head compression which certainly used to be practiced in the Guianas. As is the case with the Uricons, Hebus may sometimes appear in the form of skulls or skeletons, sect. 26. Like all other forest spirits they have strong patriarchal tendencies. They seem to be specially distinguished by the size of their purses, scrotums. The shrewd little boy and the H-E-B-U, W. A woman, having to go to make starch out of the ite, Mauritia, tree, left her little children, two girls, behind the house. While she was away Kaunasa, a bush spirit came along, disguised as their old grandmother, and said, Come along, my little girls. I will take you to your mother. But instead of doing that, the Habu led them away far into the bush, till they reached a creek where the old woman sat down and made a basket. When it was completed, she told the youngsters to get inside. Once they were in, she closed the top, and threw it into the water, where the children were soon drowned. Kaunasa then went to another house, where a little boy and girl had been left in charge during their parents' absence and, similarly disguised as their grandmother, repeated her story. She led the children as before to the creek, where she proposed making another basket, and they started playing around her. You children, she said, must not play behind my back. Play in front of me where I can see you. Now the very fact of being told not to go behind her made the boy all the more anxious to do what had been forbidden. So while playing in front with his sister, he made an excuse to slip away behind, and then he saw the lower part of the old woman's back, which was all aglow with the fire that she carried there. He now knew that she was a habu, and getting back to his little sister, carried her home but before going he called out, Kaunasa. Kaunasa. So angered and dismayed was the spirit at being discovered and hearing her name called, Sect. 124, that she burst into wind and flame and flew away. 100. Of the Imawari I cannot get much information, there being few reliable old Akawai in my district, on the authority of Warhouse, however, these spirits have two immense teeth protruding from their stomachs. Had elephants roamed the country within recent geological periods, one could perhaps have obtained an insight into the origin of so extraordinary a belief, on the other hand it is possible that it may be an idea borrowed from the African, sect. 113. 101, so also with the Uricons. All I can glean is that, in common with the other forest spirits, the face, body, and limbs are covered with a luxuriant growth of hair. As to the Kapor, a kind of sylvan deity similar to the Kurupra. The belief in this being seems to be common to all the tribes of the Tupi stock, according to the figure they dressed up at E.G.A., Upper Amazon, he is a bulky misshapen monster with red skin and long shaggy red hair hanging halfway down his back, R.W.B. 279. The Kurupuri, Jurupuri, or Demon, is a mysterious being whose attributes are uncertain, for they vary according to locality, sometimes he is described as a kind of orangutan, covered with long shaggy hair and living in trees. At others he is said to have cloven feet and a bright red face. He sometimes comes down to the Rokas to steal the Mandioca, HWB, 36, on the upper Iri River, Rio Negro, the bad forest demon is a bearded dwarf, he jeers the hunters and drives away the quarry from right under their very noses. At times, he kills people with his poisoned arrows, KG, I, 137. 102, but the spirits of the forest need not necessarily be anthropomorphic. They may take the likeness of animals, e.g. Tigers, birds, an especially favored feathered form being the goat sucker, Capromulgus. These physical attributes of some particular creature or other they may permanently retain, or on occasion discard, as when playing the role of a Kanaima, or Blood Avenger. 
At the head of the Arapa River near Roraima, in traversing the country between Waitapu and Ipilamauta, we were startled by a most singular prolonged cry. The Indians said that the sound must have proceeded from some Arikuna who, having killed one of his own people, had been turned into a wild animal, bro, 123. Among the trios of Suriname certain of these spirits are Akalamano, the carrion vulture, Sarcaramphus, Sony, a kind of vulture or falcon, etc. As with animals, so in the case of birds, those of them which are bush spirits bent on inflicting punishment, in the way of blood revenge or otherwise, upon poor mortal man, may be killed by him with impunity. One small bird which in the early morning and in the evening flits, with a peculiar and shrill whistle, over the savannas and sometimes approaches the Indian settlements, is looked upon with a special distrust. When one of these is shot, the Indians suppose that they have one enemy less, and they burn it, taking great care that not even a single feather escapes to be blown about by the wind. On a windy day on the savannas I have seen upwards of a dozen men and women eagerly chasing single floating feathers of these birds, it. 332. On the other hand, there are certain birds, owls, goat suckers, and others, undoubtedly bush spirits in the sense that they have been derived from human beings, which must not be killed under any pretense whatever. Such birds do not wish to injure, we Indians, but they often come to give us a warning or token. You will never persuade the Negro to destroy these birds, goat suckers, or get the Indian to let fly his arrow at them. They are receptacles for departed souls, who come back again to earth, unable to rest for crimes done in their days of nature. Or they are expressly sent by Jumbo, or Yabahu, Yawahu, to haunt cruel and hard-hearted masters, and retaliate injuries received from them. If it be heard close to the Negroes or Indians' hut, from that night misfortune sits brooding over it, and they await the event in terrible suspense, W. 177. Reference has already been made to the souls of people departed being changed into goat suckers in the cavern of Guachero, sect. 82. 103. The following legend, current among both Caribs and Arawaks is of special interest in that the bird in question is derived from the head of the spirit itself. The spirit's brain and the goat sucker, a. A man went out hunting for land crab. And was waiting for the rain to fall, because it is only under this condition that the animal creeps out of its hole into the swamps. Now, when the rain fell, it wet his hair, to protect himself, the huntsman, using his calabash like a cap, pressed it firmly down upon his head, so that but a little of the hair projected from beneath its circumference. Just then a Kanoko Kuhuha put in an appearance, and seeing the man in this guise, and not knowing what it was, could not help exclaiming, what a fine smooth head you have. How did you manage to get it? 28 The man told him that he had just taken a knife and cut his head all the way round, and that if he wished he would gladly do the same for him. The spirit was delighted, and allowed the skin all round his head to be cut, and peppers to be rubbed over the raw surface to make it heal the quicker. The latter process, however, caused him to groan in pain, but by this time the huntsman had quietly slipped out of sight. 29 A long time afterward, many years in fact, the same man, going out into the bush close to the neighborhood where the above event had occurred, met the same Kanoko Kuhuha, whom he recognized by the peppers on his head which had grown into big bushes. The recognition was mutual, and the spirit reproached him after this manner, You are the man who peeled off my head. I will kill you. But the man replied, No. You are mistaken. The person who really did it has been dead a long time. Come with me and I will show you his bones. And he led him to a place where there was a stack of deer bones. These the spirit took up and threw one by one into his wayeri. He then said to the man, Let us dance, and make his bones rattle. Whereupon they both started dancing, and while dancing they sang, the song of the spirit was, Basana. Basana. Lit. Meaning unknown. It was you that peeled my head. It was you that punished me. How do you like to hear your own bones rattling for music? After a time, the man remarked, This is not a good place to dance. Come over there where I can see a fine flat baking stone that will suit better. 
so they shifted their quarters, and the spirit recommenced dancing on the flat stone. Bend your head lower, said the man, you are not doing the figure properly. So the spirit bent his head lower, but his companion told him that even this was not low enough, so he tried again, and directly he had bent his head quite close to the stone upon which he was dancing, the man suddenly crushed it thereon. The spirit's brains thus were scattered, and from each piece there grew a wokarayu, goat sucker. This is why we Indians always dread these birds, and leave them severely alone. They come from the spirits of the bush, and give us warning of evil, a token that we may expect trouble of various sorts. Point 30. 104. Speaking generally, the spirits of the forest can be recognized, even when invisible, by means of the whistling sound which they make. The first night after leaving Pima, Mazaruni River, we heard a long, loud, and most melancholy whistle, proceeding from the direction of the depths of the forest, at which some of the men exclaimed, in an odd tone of voice. The Didi, Dai Dai. Two or three times the whistle was repeated, sounding like that made by a human being, beginning in a high key, and dying slowly and gradually away in a low one inch, bro, 87. But instead of a whistle, sect. 118, they may indicate their presence by a noise somewhat like the neighing of a horse, in places where horses are known not to exist. They are then described as Cuejo Cujuja, evidently so called from the corrupted Spanish form Caballo, and with anthropophagous tastes have unconquerable attraction toward infant at the breast and women ancients, de, 183. The hebus, after dark, makes sudden sharp noises like the sounds caused by the breaking of branches, as stated elsewhere, sect. 19. You can always distinguish a spirit's road from any other pathway in the forest, because the hebus occupying the trees that lie alongside it are always, especially at night, striking the branches and trunks. And so producing sharp crackling noises. Of course, in the case of bush spirits that are zoomorphic the sounds they make depend on the nature of the particular animal whose form they have assumed. The caribs in the pomeroon plant a certain species of caladium in the neighborhood of their settlement, to give warning of the approach of a uricon at night, the plant gives a double signal, a soft yet high-pitched whistling sound. And at the same time somehow contrives to shake the hammock with force sufficient to wake the sleeper and warn him of the coming danger. The following extract is from Bates, with reference to the lower Amazon, at one time I had a Mameluco youth in my service. He always went with me in the forest, in fact I could not get him to go alone, and whenever he heard any of the strange noises mentioned above, due to the curupra, he used to tremble with fear, HWB, 36. Dance, 262, writes on this same subject of what the duties of a traveler are, and how the influences of evil bush spirits may be avoided, sect. 128. 105. Bush spirits may also be recognized through the sense of smell. When the island caribs smell something offensive in a place, they will say, the evil spirit, Maboya, is here, let us therefore go away. They also give the name of Maboya to certain plants, to toadstools, of a bad odor, and to iry thing that is capable of imparting dread to them, ROP, 464. The Pomeroon Arawaks have the same idea. 106. Bush spirits are certainly very clever people, nothing comes amiss to them, and they can even bring the dead to life. They may render themselves invisible, sect. 119. The mutilated husband is made whole, w. There being nothing to do in the field, a man told his wife one day that he was going to another village to do some work for the headman. She said she would accompany him, but he explained that this was impossible as there were only men there. However, she was so importunate, that although it was quite contrary to his own wishes, he yielded to her entreaties, and took her. But he insisted on her traveling in male attire. She therefore cut her hair short, hid her breasts by means of numerous cotton and hog tooth neck chains, and covered her nakedness with a strip of bark. When they reached the settlement, they started work in company with all the other men, and as soon as the day's work was done, they all went down to the riverside to bathe. The woman was at a loss to know what to do, she was alarmed at the prospect of exposure and yet did not want to draw too much attention to herself. 
all she could do was to wait until the others had finished and then bathe alone. This went on for some days, until the others remarked upon it, wondering why the newcomer would never go into the water with them, but always waited until they had finished bathing. Two of them accordingly set watch, and as a result discovered that it was a woman who had come among them. They thereupon determined on killing the husband so as to secure possession of the wife. They tried twice, but on each occasion something went wrong with their plans. The third time, they tied him in a coriel and let it drift out to sea, but the sea cast it back on shore, where a tiger, scenting him, gnawed through the ropes, and set him free. Tiger did not, however, go to all this trouble for the sake of kindness, but for pure selfishness, telling his captive that he now intended punishing him. Don't do that, pleaded the man, haven't I been punished enough in losing my wife? This was but reasonable, and Tiger let him go. The man then walked along the shore a good distance, until he came to a house, which he was afraid to enter. But the house master bade him welcome, provided him with a stool to sit on, and with food to eat. Having been asked what he was doing, and whither he was going, the wanderer related how he had been robbed of his wife, what he had suffered on her account, and that he intended seeking her. Now, the housemaster was really a spirit, and knew perfectly that what had been narrated was the truth. He told the man to shut his eyes, and when he opened them again, a third person, another spirit, was present. Go with this friend, said the housemaster, and you will find your wife. So they went, and travelled far, and eventually came to a house, where they slung their hammocks and rested. In the meantime, the wife had been taken possession of by a keeper, and was living in the near neighborhood. The guilty couple used to pass regularly the very house where the husband was resting, and when the wife saw him she exclaimed, Look! There is my husband, but the keeper said that it could not be, because he had been tied inside a coriel and allowed to drift out to sea. However, to make sure, they went in, and when they recognized the husband, they chopped him up with an axe. But the spirit friend restored him to life, and when the wicked people passed again next day, the wife exclaimed as before, Look! There is my husband. So they killed him a second time, but the spirit again made him whole. And the couple passed the house a third time, and just the same thing happened, except that the keeper burned the body, and scattered the ashes. This, however, made no difference, because the spirit collected the ashes together in a palm leaf, and made them into a living person again. The resurrected husband, acting under advice, then went and destroyed his faithless wife as well as her paramour, their friends and relatives tried to piece the bits together and make them alive, but this they could not do. It is only spirits who can do such things. 107. Certain of the forest spirits have come from the bodies of old-time medicine men, the present-day celebrant invokes them with his rattle, sect. 309. Such spirits may be considered beneficent in the sense of assisting the P.I. by giving him information concerning the source of the illness from which his patient is suffering, and in other ways. Evidently others have been kindly disposed occasionally in that they have conferred blessings and other gifts upon mankind. Thus, Arawak legends point to the spirits of the forest as the introducers among them of the flute made from the femoral bone of animals, and according to Akawai tales, of the Suhekaru. Or lace work of hard nutshells tied on the legs to give proper time to the movements in dancing, the 184. Sometimes these spirits do positive good, as in the Jurupuri festival, whereby sicknesses can be dispelled, and large wounds healed, kg, i, 320. 108. Sufficient has already been said to indicate that the spirits of the forest may have their good points as well as bad, they may indeed have in their nature more of the imp than the rogue. They have not always borne bad reputations, but the very large majority of them certainly do so now. The Caribs, however, admit that they themselves are responsible for this, and concurrently for the introduction of pain, misery, and death. How pain, misery, and death came into the world, c. 31. In the olden times, there was no contention, all were happy, and no one became sick or died. It was then that the Uricons used to come and live among us as our friends and associates. They were short people like ourselves. 
One Yurikan in particular used to come and drink Pewari with my people, whom he would visit for the purpose regularly once a month. The last time he came, he appeared as a woman with a baby at the breast. The Caribs gave her of the pepper pot, into which she dipped the cassava, which she then sucked and ate. The pepper pot was so hot, however, that it burned the inside of her mouth and heart, and this made her ask for water, but her hostess told her that she had none. Yurikan therefore asked for a calabash, and leaving her baby up at the house, she went down to the waterside, where she quenched her thirst. On her return, she looked for her little child, but it was nowhere to be seen, she searched high and low, but all in vain, because during her absence some worthless woman among the company had thrown it into the boiling kasiri pot. By and by Yurikan went to stir the kasiri with the usual paddle spoon, and, while she stirred, the body of her baby rose to the surface. She wept, and then, turning on the people, upbraided them, Why have you punished me in this way? I have never had a bad mind against any of you, but now I will make you pay me. In future your children shall all die, and this will make you weep as I am weeping. And when children are born to you, you shall suffer pain and trouble at their birth. Furthermore, with regard to you men, continued Yurikan, as she addressed the male members of the company, I will give you great trouble when you go out to catch fish. And so she did, because in those days we Caribs only had to go to the waterside, bale the water out with our calabashes, and picking up the fish that were left exposed at the bottom of the stream. Just put the water back again to breed fish once more. Yurikan altered all this, and made us go to the trouble, annoyance, and inconvenience of poisoning the pools with various roots. What is more, Yurikan killed the worthless Indian who had thrown her boy into the Kasiri, and then asked her children what had become of their mother. She has gone to the field, they said. No, she has not. She is hunting after genitalia unius personi tribus me, was the insulting rejoinder, a reply which she purposely gave in order to provoke them into a rage. She asked them the same question a second time, and they told her she had gone to bake cassava. No, she has not, replied Yurikan, she has bored her way into my ear, an answer supposed to be even more offensive. And she asked them the same question a third time, but on this occasion they told her that she had gone to dig sweet potatoes. As soon as they mentioned the word, potatoes, Yurikan disappeared. Point 32. 109. The general tendency of these spirits, however, is to do bad, the degree of wickedness of which they can be guilty varying with circumstances and locality. Such a spirit for instance may, be believed in simply as a mischievous imp, who is at the bottom of all those mishaps of their daily life, the causes of which are not very immediate or obvious to their dull understandings, HWB, 381. When in the manufacture of their native drinks anything goes wrong with the fermentation, the Indians ascribe it to spirit machinations. The following Warau story is illustrative of this belief. Why the drink turned sour. A man went one day to visit some neighbors, but, when he arrived there, found they were all out, as it was already too late in the afternoon to allow of his getting home again before nightfall. He made arrangements to sleep there and return the following morning. He drew himself up on the manacle rafters and turned in. But before I go any further I must tell you that in this house there was a big jar in which drink was being prepared in anticipation of next day's festivities when the house master, his family, and relatives would have returned. Our friend had not been long on the manacle flooring before he saw a lot of hebus enter the place, and have a look round. He heard them say, Hello. Here is some drink. Let us bathe first, and then come and taste it. It were a pity to let it spoil. So they all went and washed their skins, and then returned for a good carousal. But when they started drinking, they felt the want of some music, and so they arranged with a laba to play for them. All the tune it could play was its usual grunt, but they were quite satisfied with it, and really enjoyed their dance. Our friend watched them until daybreak, when they took their departure, the little laba tree sneaking away behind a plantain tree. Later on, the household returned, and said, just as the spirits did, let us bathe first and then drink. It were a pity to let it spoil. But the watcher warned them not to touch the liquor because he had kept awake during the night, 
and had seen the Hebus sipping it. They therefore threw all the drink away. Now, among the household was a widow, who exclaimed, Yes. I knew that the Hebus were going to spoil our drink. And when asked how she knew, she told them that she had received a sign, or token, because when she was weeping for her late husband, he suddenly appeared before her and told her to cease to cry. If an Indian loses his way in the forest, the spirit is the cause. The Caribs, however, know how to circumvent the latter, by making a string puzzle, which is left on the pathway, the object of this puzzle consists in removing, without cutting or breaking. An endless string from off two sticks upon which it has been placed. The spirit coming along sees the puzzle, starts examining it, and tries to get the string off, indeed, so engrossed with it does he become, that he forgets all about the wanderer, who is now free to find the road again. In this connection, it is interesting to note that Bate speaks of his Indian boy, on the lower Amazon, making a charm to protect them from the Kurupuri, for this purpose he took a young palm leaf, plaited it, and formed it into a ring which he hung to a branch on our track, HWB, 35. 33. 110. On the Orinoco, the Mapoyes blamed the spirits of the forest for damage to their fields, the Guayquiris held them responsible for all their strifes and disputes, the Guamos ascribed sickness to their occult powers. While the Beto Yes regarded them as the cause of the deaths of all their children whose necks they broke so silently as not to be felt, g. 2, 23-26. This belief in their being the cause of sickness and death is universal throughout the Guianas. Among the Arawaks it is the Yawahushimara, or spirit's arrow, which has the property of inflicting pains or ills, the visible causes of which are not discoverable. The Arawaks, however, are not alone in this conception, it is apparently shared by the Caribs, from whom I learned the following. Why children become sick and cry, see. An Indian went into the forest to hunt small deer. And for this purpose built a scaffold upon the trunk of a locust tree, Hymenea. When completed he sat on top of it, bow and arrow in hand, waiting for the animals to come and eat the seeds that had fallen around. By and by, a Uricon woman came along with a baby slung over her breasts, and a quake over her forehead. She also was fond of locust seed, and when she saw the fine fruit all scattered about, she put her baby down on the ground right below the spot where the native was seated, and started going round the tree, picking up the seeds. And gathering them into her basket. But while thus engaged, the Indian shot the child, making it cry. The mother rushed back, to find her infant screaming for no apparent cause, she felt it all over, but could discover no arrow. So she took it to the P.I. of her tribe who soon discovered what was the matter, and extracted the weapon, which he showed her, he sucked it out of the child. Very well, exclaimed the mother. Just as that Indian shot my boy, so will my husband shoot his people's children, and make them cry without any one knowing the reason. 111. In Cayenne, it is Hyorican, the bush spirit, who strangles some, corrupts the blood of others, covers this one with ulcers, and that one inflicts with jaundice. The same Indians believe also in a spirit called Chinay, thus far not identified by me, who is a real cannibal and sucks their blood, which accounts for their being so thin when sick, PBA, 206. This belief, in the work of the spirits, explains a peculiar trait of Indian character which would otherwise be inexplicable. Believing that a child who has just fallen into the river or has gotten beyond its depth is being drowned by the will or agency of a spirit, the Indian who passes by and sees the struggling child is afraid to incur the wrath of that spirit. By any interference on his part to save the child. He thinks he will have done his utmost duty as a neighbor by informing the parents of the fate of their child, D.A., 290. So again, because sickness is regarded chiefly as due to spirits, the method of cure is therefore mainly directed to driving them out by means of presence, through the agency of the P.I., etc. 34. 112. Death, sickness, and other calamities may be inflicted by the spirits upon mankind, not only out of pure malevolence, but also by way of punishment for transgressions committed against the recognized rules of law and order as understood in Indian society. 
The other calamities just referred to include, inter alia, transformation into various beasts and birds, and spontaneous disappearance. The following five legends from the Waraus and Arawaks illustrate these points pretty clearly. The woman killed by her husband's spirit, W. A party of Arawaks, all of them married men, once went to Morawini, on the way to the Burbis, where they were murdered, their wives whom they had left behind here, in the Pomeroon, took other men. All except one, who was very sorry at losing her husband, and would not take another one. She found consolation in her two little children. Later on, it happened that the whole settlement went off to a drink party, but this same woman preferred to remain behind alone. When night came on, she heard the Harry Harry, flute, playing in the river, and the sound gradually coming nearer and nearer. Recognizing it as her husband's, she turned to her child and said, that tune is like what your father used to play. Perhaps he alone was saved when all the others were killed. As a matter of fact, it was indeed the man's spirit trying to come back home again. On reaching the landing, he tied up his choriel and came up to the house, when she recognized him. After saying, how day, he asked her if she were well, and then inquired after the two children. He next told her to sling up his hammock, for he was come back sick. When rested in his hammock, he began to relate all that had happened, and how he and his party had all been killed. By and by he said, go and fetch a light, there must be a lot of dog fleas about, they are biting my back terribly. But instead of dog fleas it was worms that were gnawing into him, and when she brought the fire stick, his wife could see them all crawling in and out, and said, no, no. There are no dog fleas there. Now, from seeing all the worms she knew that it must be her husband's spirit, and not his body, that had returned, and it was a token of something that was to happen. Again, and still a third time, he asked her to pick off the dog fleas, but she persisted in her, no, no. There are no dog fleas there. At the same time she began to consider how she could best save herself. She began to spit, and continued spitting in the same spot until there was quite a pool of spittle, when she quietly slipped away from the house in the direction of a neighboring settlement. Now, when the spirit again asked her to come pick off the dog fleas, it was the spittle that answered, no, no. There are no dog fleas there. And so the same question and answer were repeated. But when the spittle was finally all dried up, it could not speak any more, and as soon as no reply came, the spirit got out of his hammock and followed his wife's tracks. Now, although the fire that she was carrying had gone out, she still went on in the darkness, the spirit hollow ing behind. As he was closing in upon her, she remembered an old armadillo hole, in which she hid herself, while the spirit, rushing along, passed on. He, however, soon saw that he had been tricked, and returned to the place where she had so suddenly disappeared. Here he stopped and pondered a while, and she heard him to say to himself, I am dead. But though dead, I am looking for her, and I shall soon make her dead also, and with this she lost sight of him in the darkness. Emerging from her hiding place, she reached the next settlement, and told her friends exactly what had happened. And what the spirit had said was quite true, she soon became sick, and died. 112a, the result of stealing other people's property, w. Twenty men started out to hunt Bushhog, taking with them their hammocks, as they expected to be out some days. They soon picked up tracks and followed them until nightfall, when they camped. Next morning they continued on the tracks until about midday, when they noticed plenty of victuals all stacked ready for consumption, there were drink and meat, plenty of everything that an Indian can desire. They asked one another, are you going to eat of this? Some said, of course I am. Why not? Isn't it already prepared for us? But others said, no. It is not ours. We will not eat what does not belong to us. The wishes of the majority prevailed, however, and all except two of the party partook of the fine food. When all was eaten, they resumed the trail until nightfall, and they again camped. The two, however, who had declined to eat, erected their banab at a distance apart from the others. And all, except these two, fell fast asleep. During the night the habu came along with a light in his hand, and approached the spot where the eighteen were sleeping. 
When he got close to the first man, he extinguished the light, and, sucking the air through his half-closed hand, extracted his victim's eyes, just as we suck the flesh out of one end of a crab claw. He did the same thing in turn to each of the other seventeen, and then withdrew. The two who were camped in the banab apart from the others, kept awake, and watched everything that happened. Next morning early, as each of the eighteen woke, he exclaimed, Me, I out. Me, I out. The poor fellows who had thus been blinded called out to the other two who had not eaten of the food in question, and asked whether they had also lost their eyes. The latter said, Yes, at first, but being pressed again and again to tell the truth, were finally forced to admit that nothing evil had happened to them. Now, some of these blind people felt their trouble very keenly. Some of them had big women at home, and some had little girls there, little girls to whom they had looked forward to making their wives some day. Indeed, those of them who possessed such little girls grieved sorely, and said, We have little girls at home, and as yet we have never had anything to do with them. Alas! Alas! If we had only made women of them before this trouble fell on us. 35 So as to get home again, the blind ones told their uninjured mates to loosen the strings from all their bows and tie their ends together so as to make one long string of them. The eighteen held on to this string, and the two led the way, and so they proceeded on their journey homeward. But the two uninjured ones led the way, not homeward, as they had been told to do, but toward a big pond that contained a large number of pyri, sarasalmo, fish. Reaching there, the two made the blind ones surround a sheet of water in the form of a circle, telling them that they were about to cross a river, and that when they heard a splash they must immediately rush in straight ahead. The two leaders then stepping behind, threw over the heads of their blind companions some heavy pieces of timber, as soon as these fell into the water, there was of course a splash. And all the eighteen blind ones rushed ahead only to knock up against one another in the middle of the pond, where the voracious fish mutilated and destroyed them. They were thus punished for taking food which did not belong to them. One thirteen. The man changed into a beast, W. Two brothers set out in their choriel to shoot Morikot, Miletes, fish, after telling their old father where they were going. The younger, who was steering, started singing. Don't do that, said his brother, if you make that noise, we shall get no fish and father will be disappointed. But he would not heed, and went on making a disturbance, so the elder one said, this won't do. I will leave you on shore. The latter evidently had no objection, and with an, all right. Leave me here, stayed on the bank where his brother left him, still continuing his singing, which, if anything, he now raised to an even higher pitch. The elder brother then recognized that it was a token of something that was about to happen, and paddled on by himself to shoot. He shot one morikot, then a second, and then a third, now that there was no noise about. Having shot enough, he went to pick up his brother at the river bank where he had left him, but found him singing even more high than ever before, indeed, so deafening was the noise, such a rolling and a roaring, that, becoming frightened. He went home without him. The father asked him where his brother was, and when he was told that he was screaming loud and that there was something wrong with him, he would not believe it, but said he would go to see for himself. So the two returned to the spot where the younger brother had been left, the old man heard the awful noise in the distance and followed the tracks from the waterside. The tracks were very prominent and the leaves on each side were much crushed and damaged, showing that a big carcass must have passed that way. At last the father came upon his son, and said, Come. Come. But all the reply he received was a terrible roar, which frightened him so much that he turned back, his son following. The latter had now been changed by the habu into an evil beast, which was ready to kill anybody and anything. On reaching the waterside again, the father told his elder boy his experiences with the younger one, that he was on the road behind, and that they must both be prepared to shoot as soon as he put in an appearance. At last the latter came out into the clearing and they shot him. It was lucky they did so, because he was already changed into a beast from the neck downward, with two big teeth on his belly, sect. 100. Had he kept quiet when his brother warned him, all this trouble would not have happened. 114. 
The Man Who Dined After Dark, A. Note. It would appear that in the olden times, it was strictly taboo for anyone to take a meal after nightfall, though the true reasons for such a restriction are seemingly not now obtainable. Sect. 246. The certain punishment for infringement of this taboo was the transformation of the offender into some bird or beast. The following legend bears on this belief. There were once two fishers. I do not know their names, but they were friends. They went out together one day to a neighboring creek, and started building a shed, as they intended setting their hooks in the course of the afternoon, remaining there all night, and visiting their lines next daybreak. The shed built, and the hooks all set, they came back late to the banup, and while resting there, they happened to notice near by a cocorite, Maximiliana, palm with a splendid bunch of ripe nuts. These they cut down and began eating after breaking them on the stones. They were delicious, and they continued eating, until one of them noticed that the sun was about sinking on the horizon, when he warned his friend to stop, advising him to follow his example and turn into his hammock. But the warning was unheeded, he said they were so sweet that he couldn't stop, and he continued breaking and chewing the nuts until long after dark. Then, all of a sudden, instead of breaking the nuts with a stone, his friend in the hammock heard him breaking them in his teeth, and knowing well that no Indian could do this, the friend felt convinced that something had happened. He lit his wax torch, and instead of a man, he saw a tiger crunching the seeds. He slipped out of his hammock, wandered about till dawn, picked up his hooks and hurried home. When his mate's mother asked him why her son had not accompanied him, he told her that he had persisted in eating after dark, and that he was now a Yawahu tiger. But the old woman would not believe him. He therefore advised her to come with him so that she could see for herself. He took her to the banab, and told her that her son was in the bush, so she went out and halakuba. I.e., how are you? And a deep rough voice answered, That's your son, but again me would not believe. Wanting to see for herself, she went alone into the bush in the direction of the sound, although she was strongly warned not to do so. She went on and on, and at last met the tiger, who sprang upon and killed her. The mother was punished because me would not trust the man when he told her that the tiger really was her son. 115. How the Haimara came to have such fine big eyes, A. Eh? Returning on his way home from the bush one afternoon, a hunter met a Kanoko Kuhuha making a basket, but though he did not actually recognize it as the spirit of the bush. He certainly recognized the uncanny appearance it presented on account of its having the entire face, body, and limbs covered with thick hair. He asked the spirit what it was doing, but the only word it deigned to answer was Bako, the shortened form of Bakoku. Thirty-six at any rate, when he reached home, he related his experiences to his family and friends, and advised them strongly not to go to sleep that night, because it, whatever it was, might pay them a surprise visit after nightfall. All he could tell them was that it was covered with hair, and that it was making an eye socket basket. But they all laughed at him, and turning into their hammocks as usual, told one another stories, and soon fell off to sleep. The man who had warned them alone kept awake, and, recognizing the low whistle in the distance, tried to arouse his friends by shaking their hammocks. But it was all in vain, and he had only just time enough to clamber up into the roof, when it, which he now recognized to be a Kanoko Kuhuha, entered the house. Once in, the hunter was able to watch its movements without being himself seen. He saw the spirit stealthily approach each hammock and remove both eyes of the snoring occupant without waking him. These eyes it carefully placed in the now completed basket, and then it left the house. Next morning, when all the people awoke, they discovered that they could see nothing, and they wondered what had happened, but he who had previously warned them told them I everything. They said they were not now fit to live on the land, and that he must take them to some waterside. He thereupon tied them one to the other, and when they reached the stream he tied the last one to a tree, they could not lose their way now, and they knew where they were. He accordingly left them, as he thought, in perfect safety, promising to visit them shortly. After a time he redeemed his word, but he found that all of them had in the meanwhile been underwater, 
and had changed into fish, the one exception being the individual tied to the tree who, being able to get into the water only up to his middle, had turned but halfway into a fish. So the man went away, promising to come again. He was a long time returning, so long, in fact, that the spirit took pity on the last man, and completed his transformation, giving him back his own two eyes, which are all very fine and large, so to speak. Especially for a Haimara fish, Hoplias Malabaricus, which was what the spirit changed him into. And when their old friend did return at last, he cut the rope from the tree, thus allowing the Haimara and other fish to play about with perfect freedom in the water, where they have since remained. They were punished for their unbelief. 116. Bush spirits are excellent hunters, and some of them even know how to employ the rattle, just like a medicine man. The wrong rattle, the bush hog, and the baby, W. A man with his wife and two sons went one day to a neighboring settlement to join a drink party. In the house they left their two girls, who were busy making kasiri, and this is what happened to them. Going to fetch some more water from the creek, they heard, as they strolled along, a peculiar sort of cry. It was really Siwara, the habu, bush spirit, intentionally misleading them by imitating the call of the Oto, a bird bigger than the Baridi hawk. So they challenged it in the usual way, sect. 130, shouting, don't cry, but show yourself, or kill something for us. They saw nothing, and they heard nothing further. However, after reaching home, and resting a while, a young man approached the house, and greeting them with, good day, cousins, he entered point 37, where are your parents? was the next inquiry of the stranger, who of course was no other than Siwara, he having put in an appearance in obedience to the challenge to show himself. And the girls, telling him that they were all away at a paiwari, offered him cassava and drink. When he had partaken of this, Siwara told them to go and fetch in the poas which he had brought for them, this done, he asked them to bring in his hammock, as he proposed staying overnight. They fetched the hammock and slung it at that end of the house farthest removed from their sleeping quarters. Don't be afraid. I am not going to trouble you. And he spoke true, because the girls slept right through the night without being troubled by him. Next morning early Siwara returned to the bush, but before taking his departure warned them not to tell their parents that he had paid them a visit. Not long after, the father and mother came home, and seeing the dried poas, exclaimed, Hello! How did you manage to get that? The girls lied, saying, We came upon an Odo hawk who had caught it, and we took it away from him. By and by, the poas was cooked and eaten, and as the old father was chewing the portion he had just picked out of the pot, he came across a piece of arrow in it, a cocorite one. Thirty-eight turning to his daughters, he inquired of them, If an Odo killed the bird, how did this cocorite arrow get in? and they had to admit that the poas had been brought to them by their uncle, 39, then why did you not tell me so at first? He rejoined. Why did you not let me know that he had visited you while your mother and I were away? Go straight away now, and call him in. So they went outside and shouted, Daku! Daku! And who should immediately answer the summons but Siwara himself? As he entered, the housemaster welcomed him, and he sat himself down on the chair bench that was offered him. Thanks. Thanks, he exclaimed. I was here yesterday, and kept the girls company. Now the old father, who had been to the drinking party, was still fairly bemuddled and hardly knew what he was doing. At the same time, although he had not the slightest idea who Siwara was, he certainly offered his elder daughter to him, provided he liked her. It so happened that Siwara liked her very much, and he therefore turned to her mother and asked her whether she would care to have him for son-in-law. She said, yes, very much. And thus it came to pass that the Habu obtained his wife, and arranged to take up his abode with her at her father's place. Siwara, however, proved himself a very good husband and son-in-law, and always returned from his hunting expeditions well loaded with game. He also took the trouble to teach his wife's brothers how to shoot bushhog. Formerly, whenever these two fellows went out and brought back a bird, they would say they had brought back bushhog. You see, they did not know what a bushhog really was. 
So he took them out one day, and when they reached a suitable spot, he shook his maraca, rattle, and bush hogs came rushing up in obedience to the summons. This is hog. Shoot, said Siwara, but the two brothers, who had never seen one before, were frightened and climbed up a tree, so he had to kill three or four by himself, and these they subsequently took home. Time passed, and, his wife having presented him with a baby, Siwara became a recognized heir of her family's possessions, and removed his own property, which he had hitherto kept in the bush, into his father-in-law's house. Which henceforth became his own hearth and home. Forty among the property which he brought with him to his new home were four rattles used for bush hog only. There are two kinds of hog, the timid, eburi, and the very savage, eburi oriasi, and there were a pair of maracas for each kind, one rattle to call the beast, the other to drive it away, sect. 298. So after he had hung them up Siwara warned his wife's people that on no account must they touch these maracas during his absence, because trouble would be certain to ensue. Siwara soon afterward went away to cut a field. During his absence one of the brothers-in-law came home, and, seeing the prettily feathered rattles all in a row, could not resist the temptation of taking one down and scrutinizing it closely. While absorbed in its contemplation, he forgot all about the injunction, and started shaking it. Good Lord! It was the wrong rattle, the one for the wild bush hog. And now these savage beasts came trooping in from near and far, leaving the poor mother, her two brothers, and the old people barely time to escape with their lives up the nearest trees. In the hurry and excitement, however, the mother had forgotten her baby, which the hogs tore in pieces and devoured. On seeing all this happening below, the fugitives yelled and screamed for Siwara to come quickly and get rid of all these beasts, so that they might descend in safety. Siwara came and, shaking the proper rattle, drove the brutes away. When they had all dispersed, and his relatives had joined him, he looked for his baby, but of course did not find it. He blamed them for disobeying his orders, and was so angered that he left them. It is very hard for them to get food now. 117. The spirits of the forest are blessed, or cursed, with strong patriarchal tendencies, are very fond of women, and of human flesh generally. They have an unconquerable attraction towards suckling babes and pregnant women, the 183, a statement which appears to be confirmed in the accompanying legends. I do not know the reason of their supposed relationship to children, but certain it is that among the Pomeroon Arawaks, it was the Yawahos who were asked by the PAs to bring babies to those women who wanted them, sect. 302. On the upper Orinoco it was the bush spirit Ayalakiamo who, together with the Tiki Tiki bird, was considered responsible for the deformities of newborn children, AVH, 2, 249. The Killing of the Bush Spirit and His Wife, A. This is another story about a man who went out hunting one day and took his wife with him. But when he left her as usual one morning at the Banab, he did not know anything about a bush spirit in the neighborhood and hence could give her no warning as to how she should behave herself. At any rate, it was not long after her husband had taken his departure that a Kakono Kuhuha came to the house and asked her how she fared and where her man had gone. She told him that he had gone out hunting and that she did not expect him until late in the afternoon. The spirit went away but not before mentioning that she might see him again in the course of the evening, you see, he was greedy and thought it would be less trouble to kill and eat them both at one and the same time. Now, when the husband did return, she told him that a something had been to see her, and that it intended coming again that very night. You are not speaking the truth, was all the thanks she got for the warning which she gave him, and after eating his meal, he turned into his hammock where he soon fell asleep and snored heavily. By and by the Kanoko Kuhuha came along, giving warning of his approach in the usual way we Indians always signal when we approach a dwelling, that is, by striking a few times on the buttresses of the trees. The wife heard the noise, and recognizing what it was, tried to wake her husband, but was unsuccessful, he slept too soundly. She quickly hid herself. Once in the banab, the bush spirit approached the sleeping man's hammock, and tried to wake him, failing in this, he broke his neck, drank his blood, and left him dead. 
The spirit then wandered all over the place looking for the wife, but could not find her. She, however, could hear him saying, if I had known that she intended giving me the slip, I would have finished her off this morning. She saw him leave the banab and go back into the bush, but she remained in her hiding place until the dawn, when, after burying the body, she ran back home and told her brother all that had taken place, and that she was now a widow. The brother was exceedingly angry, and determined upon killing the spirit. Next day, he went with his sister to the same banab where the late tragedy had taken place, and the following morning left her by herself there, just as his poor brother-in-law had done, but instructed her to fool the Kanoko Kuhuha, should he come. By telling him that her husband was still alive and that he would be glad to see him in the evening. The spirit did appear again, and was certainly surprised to see her there, he asked her as before, how she fared, and where her man had gone. She told him that he had gone out hunting, that she did not expect him until late in the afternoon, and, if he liked to pay them a visit in the evening, that her husband would be very pleased indeed to see him. The spirit was only too glad to have the opportunity, and promised to come, in his mind, he said that if he broke the man's neck bone this time, he would make sure of killing him, and then deal with the wife. As had been previously arranged, the brother returned to the banab soon after midday, and made a special arrow while his sister did the cooking. After partaking of the food, he instructed her how to tempt the spirit into having a dance with her, and at the same time showed her how to hold his hands, and not to embrace him too closely, so that when he let fly this special arrow it might not, by any chance, strike her. He then went and hid himself. By and by, just as the darkness began to fall, the Kanoko Kuhuha walked up, and asked her where her husband was. After telling him that he had not yet returned, she obtruded the glory of all her charms and asked him to dance with her. The spirit, yielding to her temptations, only too readily agreed. They began to caper, and holding him as she had been warned, she circled him round and round, closer and closer to where her brother lay ambushed. It was not long before the latter was able to take good aim, and, letting fly the special arrow, sent it right through the wicked spirit who fell mortally wounded. Before dying, however, Kanoko Kuhuha looked reproachfully at the woman and said, I did nothing to you, to make you wish to kill me, but when her reply came, no, indeed, but you wanted to, he closed his eyes. How glad the brother and sister were. And the brother said, we had better tarry a while, because Kanoko Kuhuha's wife will come and look for him. Sure enough, they soon heard the moaning of the spirit's wife as she came along crying, and saying, I must get payment for my husband, I. E, her husband's death must be avenged. So they both hid themselves, and as the spirit woman passed along, the brother shot her also, and cut up the bodies. When they both got home, they told their friends and relatives about all that had happened, and everybody was delighted. 117a. The woman kills the HEBU, W. When going to a party it is customary among us Indians for the man to start early in the morning, leaving his wife to follow in the course of the afternoon. Well now, on one such occasion, after the housemaster had left for the drink feast, another man came and paid the spouse a visit, telling her that she must come with him to his place. She said, No. You are not my husband, so I cannot do that. But when he threatened to kill her if she refused, she agreed to accompany him, although her little child told her not to go. This man was really a habu, and when he arrived with her and the child at his house, he told her she could have whatever she wanted, pointing at the same time to all the dried meat, game, fish, bird, and human flesh, that was hanging around. Picking what she required, she placed it in the pot and this she put on the fire. All the time she was thinking how she could fool the habu, so that when he called her to come into his hammock, her plans were quite prepared. She joined him in his hammock, but refused to lie down in it, and when he told her to kiss and coddle him, she said she couldn't do so because he was covered over so much with hair. He told her where to find a bamboo knife, and she commenced shaving his face, while holding up his chin, she stuck the knife into his throat and killed him. Rushing off now with her child, the woman joined her husband at the drink party, telling him exactly what had happened, how the habu had made her come to his house, where she had killed him. 
And when the sport was finished next morning she took her husband to the scene of the tragedy. As soon as he saw the dead Habu's body lying in the hammock, he was satisfied that she had told him the truth. 118. The Bush Spirit and the Pregnant Woman, A. There was a man with his wife living in a house. One afternoon, the husband went to watch for an akuri. By and by she heard a whistling sound, and a man came and paid her a visit, tis true he was like a man, but yet different, because there was hair growing all over him. He was really a Kanoko Kuhuha, but she did not know this at the time. Where has your husband gone? he inquired, and when she told him he was out hunting the Akuri, the stranger asked her whether he was very far away, and she replied, not very far. To make sure that the husband might not suddenly return and frustrate his wicked designs, the spirit made the wife shout out three times, and as no answer came, he knew he would be safe. He told her to dance for him, and then came very close to her. This she thought somewhat strange, because she was heavily ancient, but she did what she was told. At last he took his departure, and as he went along he knocked the tree buttresses with a stick, to make the woman think that it was her husband coming. So the wife was content in her mind. However, it was a long wait for her until her husband did finally come, he had wandered far, and found no Akuri. Like a good wife, she made a clean breast of all that happened in his absence, describing minutely how she had been visited by one who was like a man, but yet different, because there was hair growing all over him, and that he had been close to her. The husband laughed, and said, Nonsense, wife. It must have been some old sweetheart of yours. She replied, Nothing of the sort, but he reiterated, Yes, it must have been so. It being now already late in the evening, they turned into their respective hammocks, and the husband soon fell into a deep slumber. His spouse, however, could not sleep. She heard the spirit's warning approach, a low whistling noise, and got up to wake her man, but, tug and push as much as she would, she could not rouse him, he slept too soundly. She drew to one side just in time to see the spirit enter. She saw him kill her husband and then eat him, and when he had finished, she heard him say, that was good. But the sweetest morsel has gone, the woman with a baby. She ran away as quickly and as far as her legs would carry her. 119. The Contented and Happy Son-in-Law, W. Once upon a time there was a good old man who, possessed of a young wife and a field well planted, lived happily and contented. When off to his field one morning, he met a young man coming in the direction of his house, and noticed that, during the greeting which they gave each other, the stranger kept his eyes fixed hard on his wife in the dim distance. On his return home in the afternoon, he met the stranger again in just about the same place, where his movement seemed very suspicious, he rightly concluded that he was dealing with a habu and went on home. Arrived there, he told his wife he was going to hunt a little, and took his bow and arrow with him, but what he really did was to hide in the immediate vicinity. And from his hiding place he saw the habu steal into the house and wrestle with his wife, who was just about grating the cassava, he heard her say, No. No. Oh, if only my man were not so far away. So taking aim, and waiting for a chance not to hurt his wife, he let fly and shot the spirit. Both spirit and wife simultaneously disappeared. Point 41 It would seem that the habu had dragged his victim to the water's edge and thence thrown her in. Fortunately she had caught hold of the bushes alongside the river bank, and came up to the surfuse. On meeting her husband, she told him she thought she had been dead and never expected to see him more. She told him also how the habu had threatened to visit their place again. They therefore went over to her mother's home, and stayed there a long while. At last the old man thought it was time to look over his cassava and plantains, and with his wife and brother-in-law returned to the scene of the outrage. The brother, who was a powerful medicine man, led the way. As he went along he was accosted by a beautiful girl, staring into his eyes, rushed up ready to put her arms around his neck, and then drew back. Now, except at a drinking feast and when she is drunk, no Indian woman would behave in this bold manner, and it was thus that they recognized her to be the habu. The medicine man just looked at her in silence, and she fell dead. The wife also met her death shortly after, 
and they then remembered having noticed the token, she had omitted to bathe after a meal some days before. But the parents of the deceased girl were very fond of their good old son-in-law, and gave him the younger of their two remaining daughters as a helpmate. Forty-two but the elder one becoming jealous, went over to the husband's place and picked a quarrel with her younger sister, this made the latter go and tell the old man that she was afraid to remain with him any longer. But he said, No. I don't want your sister. She is much too passionate for an old man like me, whereas you and I get along very well together. The parents then gave a drinking party, at which the old man got so drunk that he fell into his hammock. Whereupon the elder sister got in also. He was not so drunk, however, as not to be able to turn her out, which he did. She then said that they would have to kill her before she would let him alone. And so the brother killed her. On seeing all the trouble that had arisen, and recognizing how he had been the cause of it, the old man offered to go away, but the brother said he would kill him before he would let him go. And so the old man stayed with his wife's parents in the customary way, and continued to live long, happy, and contented. 120. The bush spirit tricked while hunting frogs, A. Eh? A family received an invitation to go to a drink party, and they all accepted except the daughter, who, in spite of her parents' wishes, refused to go. And so she was left at home, all alone. By and by, late in the afternoon, there came to see her a young woman friend whom she had not seen for a very long time, at least she thought it was her old friend Diadala, lit. My knife, but in reality her visitor was Yawahu, who had taken on the real friend's shape and appearance, the better to carry out his evil designs. Forty-three being such supposedly good friends, the Yawahu addressed the girl as Diadala, and asked what she was doing at home all by herself. Point forty-four. When the girl had told her that she had refused to go to the drink party, the Yawahu said, Oh, very well. I will stay tonight and keep you company, and so she did. In the evening when darkness was coming on, a lot of frogs were to be heard croaking, which made the girl ask her friend whether she ate those creatures, and finding that she was really very fond of that dish. They agreed to go straightway and catch some. They went out together into the darkness, each in opposite directions, and after a time they began to call out, the one asking the other what she had caught. The Yawahu answered, plenty, but I am eating them as fast as I can gather them. Now, this peculiar reply, eating the creatures raw, frightened the girl, who thereupon recognized for the first time the real nature of her fictitious friend. And when the Yawahu called out, Diadala. How many have you got? The girl responded, plenty, but I am putting them into my calabash. The latter was thinking hard all the time how to escape from her companion to a place of safety. She knew only too well that, notwithstanding the darkness, the Yawahu could tell her whereabouts by the sound of her voice. So when Yawahu called out to her once more, the girl shouted back, Hush! Don't speak, or make such noise. The frogs are getting frightened, and I shall not be able to catch any more. When silence reigned again, the girl stealthily retraced her steps to the house, crept gently in, and without the slightest sound turned all the pots upside down. This done, she threw all the frogs away, and climbed up on the roof to await developments. These were not long in coming, nor was the Yawahu, for, waiting a while, and receiving no response to his call, he recognized that he had been tricked and hurried back to the house. Here he groped about in the darkness, and turned up pot after pot, but his prey was nowhere underneath. Ah! He exclaimed loud enough for his intended victim to hear, I would have eaten her at the same time as the frogs if I had thought she was going to get away from me. And so he searched unsuccessfully, there were many many pots, until dawn, when he had to leave. The girl then descended from the roof and waited for her people to return, and on their arrival she told them how the Yawahu had visited her in the disguise of her friend. The father said, next time we tell you to come with us, you will obey. 121, since spirits are supposed to have a peculiar fondness for tobacco, sect. 27, and to be continually inhaling its fumes, the smoke of the fragrant weed is largely used in their invocation, sect. 308. 
Among the Caribs, the first two spirits that are called on by the medicine man with his rattle are Mawari, sect. 309, and Makayabani. The latter puts in an appearance with the tobacco smoke, in which he is enveloped, otherwise he remains in the rattle, maraca, coming out only when this is shaken. The former's weakness for tobacco constitutes the subject of the Carib legend here given. 122. Mawari and Tobacco Smoke, C. There was once an Indian who was extremely fond of smoking, morning, noon, and night he would bring out his little bit of cotton, strike the stones together, make fire, and then light his tobacco. Even when walking out in the bush he would continue smoking. While thus trudging through the forest one day and puffing out clouds of smoke, Mawari, one of the Yurikans, or bush spirits, smelt the tobacco, and, taking such a fancy to it, sent his daughter to fetch the man in. She was a pretty woman and, approaching the Indian, asked him whither he was going. He told her he was searching for game, but she advised him to come with her to her father's place. In fact she warned him that as the old bush spirit had really sent for him, it would be wiser on his part not to refuse. And perhaps because she was indeed so pretty, he did not hesitate to accompany her. When he reached her home, Mawari asked him a lot of questions about the tobacco, and begged him to teach him how to smoke. Having learned the art and taken a violent fancy to it, Mawari next insisted upon the Indian remaining and preparing the tobacco leaves as they might be required. And so it came to pass that the latter took up his abode with the bush spirits as the son-in-law of a Yurikon. When he was given the alligator stool to sit upon, he felt a bit scared, but his wife told him not to be afraid, because the creature would not bite him. 45 He remained a long time with these spirits, so long indeed that a luxuriant growth of hair began to cover his face, body, and limbs. His marital relations prospered, Mawari's daughter in the meanwhile having borne him three children. One day his wife advised him to go visit his mother, so, making ready for the journey, he started off. On reaching his old home, his mother was very glad to see him, but noticing how he was covered all over with hair, remarked, Where have you been all this while? You have turned into a Yurikon, I think. Although her surmises were not very far from the truth, her son denied all knowledge of those people, and thought it prudent not to remain too long in case he should be asked some more equally awkward questions. And when he took his departure, he carried away with him the cassava which his mother had baked, but neither he nor his wife ate of it, he having become so accustomed now to the various bush friats and she never touching that kind of food. The Indian never returned home again to his mother, being ever busy preparing the tobacco for his father-in-law. 123. Whenever my Indian friends wish to impress me with the power and importance of any of their legendary beings, they invariably ascribe to it great size, thus, a black tiger as big as a house meant a very dangerous brute. A bat as big as a tree indicated the vampire, that sucks people's blood at night with fatal results. I learned that for similar reasons these forest spirits are always associated with unusually big things, sex, 27, 147. Both Arawaks and Warows have a story of this nature, I attach the former version. The Bush Spirit with Big Ideas, A. A Kanoko Kuyuka, meeting a man one day far out in the bush, asked him what he was doing there. Learning that he had come to hunt, he told him to go and catch some acra, a species of black land crab. After a while he returned to the banna bringing some with him, but when the spirit saw them, he said those were not the kind he required. Come with me. I will show you what I want. With this, he led the huntsman to a big hole in the ground, put his right arm in, and pulled out two armadillos. This is the sort of acra that I need. What you brought me were only spiders. They returned to the banab, when the spirit told him to go and fetch some cassava. Proceeding to the nearest house, the man soon returned with a few cassava cakes, but these were not what the spirit wanted. They went to a neighboring tree, where, pointing to an immense toadstool, the Kanoko Kuhuha changed it into a cassava cake, explaining that this was what he meant. 46 The spirit then sent him for a cooking pot, telling him that he would find one lying among the roots of a certain tree, which he described to him. The man went as directed, but could see only a bushmaster snake. 
When he came back, and reported what he had seen, the spirit said, Didn't you notice that the snake was coiled up like a pot? Why didn't you bring it as you were told? So the man again went on his way, and when he reached the spot, lo, and behold! There was a real cooking pot painted in all the colors of the snake. When he had brought it to the banab, the spirit told him to bring firewood next. This he did, but when the spirit saw it, he said, that is not what I asked you for. So he took the man with him to a big dead tree, shook it a little, and made it fall, and then carried it to where they were camped. That is what I call firewood, he said, what you brought me was only birds' nests. At any rate, they both soon had the fire lighted, and the armadillos cooked. The spirit ate all his up in a few mouthfuls, but the man could eat only a portion of his. Why haven't you finished yours, remarked the former. No wonder you Indians are so thin. Look at me. I am big and fat and strong because I have swallowed the whole of my armadillo. Forty-seven having rested in their hammocks, they started hunting again, and by evening time returned with a large quantity of game. When their bellies were satisfied, they stacked and smoked the remainder of the meat on the babbercoat. After they had retired for the night, the spirit said that he expected a tiger would come to steal the meat, and therefore instructed the man to keep good watch. By and by, the tiger came, and the man accordingly woke the Kanoko Kuhuha. Raising himself from his hammock to get a better look at the creature, the spirit said, That is no tiger. That is what I call a Yawari, a possum, Didalfi's SP, and turned round to resume his slumbers. The man pondered over all this for a long time, and remarked, Well, if by my kind of tiger he means a Yawari, what sort of a thing does he mean by his kind of tiger? He thus became much frightened, and cleared out, leaving Renoko Kuhuha in the hammock. 124. To conclude this natural history, so to speak, of the spirits of the forest, it may be mentioned that, with very rare exceptions, as the Mansonskiri, sect. 97. They shrink from exposure to sunlight or firelight, from hearing their names called, or particulars of their origin talked about. This idea explains why an Indian will almost invariably refuse to tell these spirit legends in the daytime, when he might be heard by the particular spirit spoken about and subsequently be mysteriously punished. 48 There are certainly many examples in the Indian folklore illustrative of the dire results consequent on mentioning either the spirit's name or his particular origin, sex, 99, 133, 135, 176. 125. To mimic the sounds of their voices is of course as bad as laughing at spirits, sect. 59, or mentioning their names. The woman who mimicked the bush spirit, a. A man went out hunting one day, taking his wife with him. 49 leaving her one morning at the Banab, he warned her that a Yawahu would be passing, and that he would be whistling like a bird, but that she must not imitate the sound in any way because if she did each of her feet immediately would be turned into a sharp piece of stone. She had been by herself some time when she heard a bird whistling, and feeling somewhat lonely without any company, thought she would, call it. No sooner had she imitated the sound than the Yawahu, which it really was, became extremely angry, and changed her feet into two sharp pointed stones, cf sect. 126 more than this, the spirit changed her heart into stone also, thus making her, wild, toward her husband. The result was, that when her husband joined her in the afternoon, she tried to kill him, but he, recognizing at a glance what had happened, turned on his heels and ran as fast as possible down to the creek, into which he ducked and dived across. Coming up on the Apoate bank, he rested himself a while. It was not long before she reached the creek, and failing to see her husband, concluded that he must be in hiding somewhere among the rushes and mud, which she trampled in all directions with her stony spikes. Stamping here and there, she gave vent to her wrath every now and again, saying, You brute! Wait till I catch you! I know what I'll do with you! She little knew that her husband was listening, and smiling at her all the while. And so she continued stamping and swearing until she at last stuck one of her feet into an alligator that was lying there, and hauled it up on the bank, sticking it again and again, in the full belief that it was her husband. 
Thoroughly satisfied with her work, she now returned to the Banab, her man making tracks for home. But when he got there, his brothers-in-law inquired of their sister, and would not believe what her husband aid about her having mimicked the Yawahu, and her feet being changed into stone. Finally they tried to kill him. Seeing that they were threatening him, he offered to show them the actual place where it all happened. This being agreed to, they took up their bows and arrows to follow him, and finally reached the Banab. No wife was there. So the husband imitated the Yawahu's whistle, now that the spirit was nowhere in the neighborhood and well out of hearing, no harm could follow, and who should come running up but his stone-footed wife, storming with rage. Ready to destroy not only her man but her brothers also. The latter, however, being forewarned, put an arrow into her, and she fell dead, they knew now that the man had spoken the truth. 126. And so, when all is said and done, it is just as well that we should be circumspect in our conduct and not incur the enmity, with all its attendant consequences, of these denizens of the forest. Indeed, it is far better to keep out of the clutches of these spirits altogether, and give them a wide berth. Just consider, for instance, what happened to the Warao who would insist on associating with them. The danger of associating with spirits, W. There were two brothers living together, both of whom used to go hunting. During the course of the day, when deep in the heart of the forest, they heard the sounds and revelry of a drinking party, and this made the elder one say, Come, let us go sport with those people. But the younger one replied, No. It cannot be a real party out here in the bush away from everybody, it cannot possibly be proper people who are sporting, they must be spirits of some sort. Now the big brother insisted, and, proceeding in the direction whence the sounds came, they reached a house where apparently real people were much enjoying themselves. The visitors were made to sit down and drinks were handed to them. The elder one indulged and was happy, the younger refused because he was afraid of what might happen to him. As a matter of fact, the latter's suspicions were correct, because the people at the house who were sporting were really not people after all but the spirits of the Wareki, or large rain frogs, who had taken on human shapes. Fifty after a while, both the men came away, and as night was fast approaching they made themselves a banab, and the elder sent the younger to fetch firewood, he did so. When the banab had been built and the fire lighted, they slung their hammocks. By and by, the elder brother told the younger to put some more wood on the fire, and when he had done so, told him that it was not enough, again he told him the same thing, and still once more the same. So that with all the extra fuel there was an immense fire blazing away now. After some time the younger man smelt a very peculiar strong odor, and looking around, saw his brother's legs hanging from out his hammock close over the fire. Look out! Your legs are getting scorched. But all his brother did was to say, Aka. Aka, 51 and draw his feet into the hammock. And it was not long before he again put his feet into danger, a fact which, considering that he had not been drunk at the party, led the vigilant brother to know that it was a token of some evil about to befall them. At any rate, the latter, seeing that his warning was disregarded, bothered no more about the matter, but let his brother's feet continue burning. After a while, their owner realized for himself that his lower limbs were pretty well charred, and, looking down, saw that both feet were entirely gone, and most of the flesh around the shin bones destroyed. All he did was to clean the flesh off in its entirety, and then, with his knife, scrape both shin bones down to sharp points, cf sect. 125, there he lay helpless in his hammock. He could not hunt any more, though it is true that now and again when a bird flew past, or any little animal ran along, he would cock out a leg and spear it with the pointed tip, a trick in which he soon got very expert. Point fifty two. One hundred and twenty seven. His younger brother would sometimes carry him carefully to the shade of some bullet tree, and then climb the trunk and shake the branches, so as to enable him to pick the fruit as it fell to the ground. At other times he would shoot little birds for him, so much that feathered game soon got to be very scarce in the immediate neighborhood, and herein began the trouble. The sick man never liked his brother to be out of sight and would always be calling him back, even before he had an opportunity of letting fly his arrow. 
At last the latter became exasperated at being continually called back before even taking a shot. And yet was afraid of running away because his brother had threatened to kill him should he ever dare to go out of his sight, he only waited his chance and it was not long in coming. One day he said, Brother. Don't shout out for me just now, because my arrow has stuck up in a tree which I must go climb. It will be some time before I can possibly return. All this however was a lie, an excuse under cover of which he considered he could get away in safety. The sick man waited and waited in his hammock and at last hollowed, but no brother came. Again and again he hollowed, he shouted, and he screamed. Still no brother came. He slipped out of his hammock and started in pursuit, to his astonishment he found that with his bone points he could travel a great deal faster than he could before on his feet. Thus walking and running, running and walking, along his brother's tracks, he started a deer. Mistaking the trail of the latter for that of his brother, he followed the creature and, soon getting within reach, threw himself upon it and pinned it with his bone points to the ground. And as he stuck it here and there, he excused himself by saying, I am sorry, brother, to have killed you, but it is your own fault, you tried to run away and leave me. On turning over the carcass, he noticed the animal's black mouth. Ah! That has got stained from the bullet tree fruit. But on looking at the four legs he noticed something strange. Eh! Let me count the fingers, one, two, three. Now, how many have I, one, two, three, four? Five. Let me look at the foot now. It has toes. One, two, three. I'll count mine now. One, two, three, four. Five. And thus he pondered and finally concluded that the creature he had just slain could not possibly be his brother, Sect. 26. He thereupon returned to his banab, where he laid himself in his hammock. 128. In the meantime the fugitive reached home and told the others, something has happened to my brother. We cannot be friends with him any more. We must kill him. So, leading the way, the others followed him into the bush where they surrounded the banab under which the elder brother was resting. They were afraid to attack him where he was, because of the skillful way he could use his bone points as spears, their idea was to tempt him out into the open, where he would have to use these bones of his as feet so they would be enabled to attack him with impunity. Thus, by sending a swift flying bird to hover around his hammock, he would be sure to try to pin it in his customary fashion, and of course missing his aim, would jump out of his hammock in pursuit. With this design in view, they sent him a little huku huku, hummingbird, which flew here, there, and in all directions around his hammock, but it was not swift enough, and after many trials he succeeded in spearing it. So they sent him Hura, Sayurus Estuans, the little squirrel, Arawak, Shimo Okori, which is much swifter in its movements than the Hukuhuku. He had a good many chances, but every time it passed and repassed his hammock, the bone point missed its mark, and thus the little creature decoyed him out onto the open, closer and closer to the ring of people around. And when he got quite near, they fell upon and destroyed him. 129. Should unforeseen circumstances, however, force one into close quarters with bush spirits, various procedures may be adopted to get rid of them. Warows and Makusis took measures to exorcise evil spirits from the dancing ground. Skomberg describes how this was effected by the former tribe, proceeding slowly to the spot chosen, with clanging Thavisha seeds, the Hohohit, or master of the ceremonies, etc. Blew upon a small flute, in imitation of a monkey's voice, which regulated the movement. Reaching there, the others made a circle round him, when a second signal on the flute warned them all to lay their instruments on the ground, and bend themselves down, until he had murmured some unintelligible words. At a third signal they picked up their instruments, straightened themselves, and were now allowed to pipe away, SCR, 153. With the Makusis, a deafening universal shout, like dogs howling, constitutes on every occasion the introduction and finale of their combined games and dances wherewith to expel the evil spirits from the neighborhood, SCR, 2, 194. A somewhat similar course was followed on the Orinoco at the wedding festivities of the Guayquiris and Mapojis. 
As soon as day breaks, there comes from the bush close at hand a dancing party with flutes and kettledrums, which circuits backward and forward round the houses of the brides, whence presently there emerges an old woman with a plate of food, which she presents to one of the dancers. They then all return at top speed to the bush, where, scattering the plate and food, one of them will shout, Here! You devil of a dog, Pero Demonio! Take this food, and don't come and upset our fun. G. I. 160. To prevent the bush spirits coming into the house, a hunter, on his return from the chase, will shout out the name Shimarabu Akradani, sect. 95. Before entering, sect. 124. Other methods may be adopted for withstanding the vengeance of the spirits of those animals which the hunter has just returned from slaughtering, sect. 243. An alligator skull stuck up in a carib house will prevent the uricon entering it, sect. 251. 130. So also, when traveling in the bush, forest, and other places, where all these spirits are lurking, one should never be without a companion, and it is always advisable to satisfy oneself as to the cause and origin of any unusual sound. The Indian always prefers to travel in large numbers, his dread of evil spirits is so great, that he will subject himself to great inconvenience rather than travel alone, SCG, 262. It is a duty to oneself to turn and look about when a stick falls from a tree, or when a crackling of twigs is heard, for there walk together always a bad and a good spirit, sect. 84. The one wishing to injure, the other to protect living people. At sight of any one in the forest or on the river, the evil spirit is ready to harm, but the good spirit says, Stay. He may be a friend of mine. Let us see if he will show his face when I call. He then breaks a twig or a branch. The person is saved from harm if he looks around, but is in danger of being hurt if he will not look. Duh, 262. Whenever Indians, Warows and others, traveling in the bush hear any unusual cry or uncanny noise, they will sing out, show who you are, or else bring something to eat, or some similar expression, sex, 116, 130. If a spirit is met on the road, the caribs know how to divert its attention, sect. 109, with a string puzzle. The rain frog wife, W. A party of hunters were walking along the pathway in the bush, one behind the other, the hindermost being a long way apart from the others. He heard the smaller rain frog, hohaare, croaking, so he shouted, Don't make such a noise, hohaare, but come out and show yourself and Hohara came up from behind in the shape of a woman. Who calls me? You. Yes, I called you. You are a nice wench, too, and had better come home with me. She being agreeable, went home, and lived with him a long time. But his people were continually nagging at her. You see, being really a frog, she had no waist, her hips were narrow and her foot was long, and accordingly her step-parents would always be calling her names, as, Froggy, where's your waist? Small hip, lanky foot. Her life, once full of joy, was now replete with misery, so she determined upon returning to her own people. She went into the bush, and her man, following the trail, got almost in touch with her. But just then she jumped into a little puddle and disappeared. He put his hand in, and felt all the way round, but no further trace of her could he find. You can always hear her, however, at the commencement of the rainy season. 9. The Spirits of the Bush, Animals as Sentient Human Beings Preliminary, 130a Fables, Tales, and Legends, 131-162d 130a it is proposed to devote this chapter to a collection of legends dealing with the many beasts and birds met with in the forest, interesting in that they are all represented as thinking, talking, and acting as do sentient human beings. They are also believed to possess spirits just like those of human folk. At the same time we must not be surprised to learn that the events and occurrences now about to be recorded are supposed to have taken place a long while ago. But in those days, so the Akaways say, Makunema made man and animal all of one speech, advising them to live in unity, 
and judging by the legends here narrated the injunction seems to have been fairly well obeyed. To put the matter shortly, these creatures with human ideas were born so, they, growed. True it is that now and again the fact of the human actor having an animal form, or the animal an anthropomorphic one, is explained as being due to reasons already stated, i.e. by way of punishment or pure devilment at the instigation of the spirit of some person departed. It is also a firm article of faith that the medicine man, to whom nothing is impossible, can effect transformation of himself or others, similar to those produced by the spirits. In addition, there is a widespread Indian belief that at every eclipse of the moon animals are metamorphosed, a taper may change into a snake, a man into a beast, and vice versa. And so even in the telling of these stories, the Indian expects his hearers to take quite as a matter of course, just in the same way as he is firmly convinced himself, that animals and birds associate with man. That they are all of one and the same breed, that they may equally live, eat, and drink, love, hate, and die. It is small wonder then that the Indian folklore is so largely crammed with this same idea of man and animal, used in its widest sense, being so intimately interchangeable. 131. The Honey Bee Son-in-Law, W. A man made up a little family party to accompany him on a hunting expedition, taking with him his two sons and a daughter, he left his wife and the other two girls at home. He took the party far out into the bush, where they constructed a banab and rested themselves. Next day the girl told her father that she was not feeling well, in other words, that it was not permissible for her to build the babricoat, to do the cooking, or even to touch the utensils, sect. 274. Never mind, replied the father, just rest yourself. We are not going very far, and we can manage for ourselves. That afternoon they returned from the hunt with nothing, the same result happening on the succeeding afternoon. Was the young woman the unfortunate cause of their bad luck? Next morning, the huntsman went into the bush as usual, and, not long after they had gone, the girl, who was lying in her hammock, was somewhat startled at seeing a young man approach the banab and stride up to where she was resting. She became very angry when he jumped in. She fought and wrestled with him, informed him of her condition, and tried to get out, threatening what her father would do when he returned. But he held her firmly, assured her that he had not the slightest intention of troubling her, that he had come only to rest himself, and promised to ask the old man for possession of her in the proper manner. So they both lay there quietly in the hammock, discussing their respective prospects and affairs. She learned from him that he had been long in love with her, and that he was a Simoahawara, lit. B. Tribe. This information calmed her greatly, because it seems that at his first appearance, she took him for a bush spirit or habu. 53 Now, just as Simo had anticipated, when the father returned in the afternoon, he was not at all vexed at seeing the stranger in his daughter's hammock, in fact, he made not the slightest reference to her even having company. And when on the following morning Simo asked the old man for her, the latter told him he could have her if he desired, and the girl consenting, he was received as a son-in-law. Being now one of the family, so to speak, he told all three men to remain in their hammocks, as he would make himself responsible for supplying them with their evening meal. Carrying his bow with two arrows, he accordingly took himself off to the bush, and returning very shortly, instructed the girl to tell her father go fetch in the game which he had killed. Fifty-four the father went off to fetch the wayeri in which Simo had packed the meat, but could not lift it, much less carry it, on account of its great weight, though comparatively small a bundle. He came back for his two sons to help him, but all three together could not raise it from the ground. When they returned to the banab, the old man told his daughter what had occurred and asked her to get Simo to bring up the bundle, the latter accordingly went, but not before telling his father-in-law, through his wife, to get the babbercoat ready. As soon as Simo brought in the bundle, one of his brothers-in-law loosened the vine rope and, opening the bundle, brought out of it one of every kind of bird and beast imaginable. They had plenty there to last them for months, and it took all three men a long time to clean and cut up the flesh and get it properly smoked. And when all the meat was dried, they started on the homeward journey, Simo arranging for the old man and the brothers-in-law to carry all they could, he following later on with the remainder. 
which as a matter of fact was five times greater than all their loads put together. You see what a strong man he must have been. And although he gave them a good start he speedily caught up with them on the road, and they all went home together, Simo taking up his residence as is customary, at his father-in-law's place. About a year later Simo found himself the proud father of a beautiful baby boy, in the meantime he had been busy clearing his field. Now it was just about this time that his two sisters-in-law were beginning to give trouble, they had fallen in love with him and were always jumping into his hammock, but as fast as they got in, he would turn them out. He neither liked nor wanted them, and complained to his wife about their conduct. Of course there was nothing wrong in what her sisters were trying to do, because with us Indians, so long as the women are single, it is no sin for a man to live with his sisters-in-law as well as with his wife. Fifty-five but in spite of his objections, the two sisters-in-law persisted in following him about, and while they would be bathing with his wife at the waterside, with him minding the baby on the river bank, they would try to dash spray over him. Fifty-six this was very wicked of them, still more so because Simo had warned them that if water should ever touch him, it would act like fire, that is, first weaken, and then destroy him. Fifty-seven as a matter of fact, none of the three women had ever seen him bathe, whenever he wanted to perform his ablutions, he would wash himself in honey just as the little bees do. His wife alone was well aware of this, because he had told her that he was Simo Ahawara when they had first met under the shade of the banab. As he was sitting one day on the bank with the baby in his arms, while the three women were washing themselves, the two sisters-in-law succeeded in dashing water over him. The result was that he screamed out, I burn. I burn. And flying away, like other bees, into a tree, melted into honey, and his child changed into Wauyuta, the tree frog, sex, 17, 18. 131a. The man who was changed into a poes, W. A husband, his wife, and her two brothers lived together in a house. One day, when the sky was overclouded, and they all heard the noise of the approaching rain, the husband turned to his wife and told her that the rain always made him sleep soundly. When he turned into his hammock that night, and it happened to rain, the good woman accordingly said to her brothers, I must tie up my man out in the rain and they helped her tie him up and carry him outside into the rain where he remained all night. Waking up at early dawn, his first remark was, I have had a good sleep. You may loose me. And they loosened him. Now although he was in a great passion, he did not show it, but he determined to punish his wife. He bade her get ready to accompany him, as he proposed going a hunting, and when they reached a suitable spot far out in the bush, he told her to make a babricoat and get firewood. Because he intended killing the alligator which frequented the neighboring waterhole. But he was only fooling her with the alligator yarn, because as soon as she had completed everything, he killed her, and removing the head, cut up the rest of her body and put it on the babricoat to dry. When the flesh was cured, he packed it in a wayeri, which he had plaited in the meantime, and carried it toward his house, leaving it, as is usual, at some distance from the dwelling. Upon the top of a stick fixed in the ground over the wayeri he attached his poor wife's head in such a way that her face looked in the direction of her late home. The face carried a silver nose ornament. He took back with him only her dried liver, and his brothers-in-law welcomed him when they saw the meat. He then gave them to eat of the liver, and they ate it. At last he said, You must go help your sister. She is weary of carrying such a load of meat. They accordingly proceeded down the path, and it was not long before they saw the head staring at them from above the wayeri, they recognized it as their sisters and rushed home. In the meantime the husband had left the house in another direction, saying that he was going to bathe at the waterside. But he was again fooling, for on reaching the river bank, he shoved all the corials from their moorings, and getting into one, made his way down the stream. The murdered woman's brothers had got home by now, and telling their old mother what they had seen, asked her what had become of the culprit. As soon as they learned that he had gone to bathe, they hastened down to the landing, and finding no corial there, one of them swam across the stream to get one, and both getting in, they gave chase. They pulled hard and soon caught up with their man, but as they drew near, he jumped on shore and climbed a tree, shouting, Your little sister is there where I left her. 
They tried to strike him, but he was now changed into a Yakahatata, a sort of poes which thus is always crying out, Sister Little There, that is, Ijikeo I Sanuka Tataha. Of which Yakahatata is the nearest approach in bird language to which he can attain. 132. The Stolen Child, W. A man went out hunting, leaving at home his wife and little baby girl, a child that was just beginning to walk. Night was falling and the mother was preparing food for her husband's return. While thus occupied the child started crying, and just at that moment the old grandmother came from over the way to fetch it. The mother was only too pleased to be temporarily relieved of her responsibilities, and when the old woman asked her to hand the child over, she willingly did so, and was thus enabled to get all the cooking done without further interruption. When this was completed, she went to fetch her baby, and said, Give me my child. But when the old woman said, What child? I know nothing about any child, the poor mother knew that she had been tricked. As a matter of fact, it was really a tiger who had assumed the exact form of the old woman, and so had deceived the mother. When the husband at last returned, the distracted woman told him what had happened, and they both started out to search, but found nothing. Next morning they renewed their search, but were again unsuccessful, and at last gave up their quest. Thus they gradually lost touch with their little daughter, and after a time she was forgotten. A few years passed, and the parents began to lose things about the house. First of all, the beads on their necklaces disappeared one night. On another occasion their cotton garters could not be found, one evening all the eight, Mauritia, starch vanished, one morning the wood skin, i.e. bark, apron belt was nowhere to be seen. Not long afterward the buckpots began to disappear one after the other, and so things continued unaccountably to be lost. Though the parents had not the slightest idea that such was the case, it was the tiger who came every now and then after nightfall to steal all these things for the little girl to use. She was getting of course to be a young maiden now, and tiger was minding her as his own kith and kin. The young maiden soon became a woman, nourished with all the meat that tiger provided. Quandacumc menstruavit sanguinum lambavit. He was still a tiger and, continuing to do what tigers and dogs do, in sepit femimalfasir. Moreover, his two brothers, being similarly affected, followed his example. The girl felt very strange at these periods and could not understand the actions toward her of Tiger and his two brothers. So she made up her mind to escape, and asked Tiger one day how far their place was from the spot where her parents lived. He was somewhat suspicious and wanted to know first of all why she asked the question. So she told him something like this, You are an old man and will die soon. I am young. What will then happen to me? If I knew where they were, I could then go to my parents. Recognizing the force of her argument, he told her that they lived in such and such a direction, that it was not far, and that immediately upon his decease she must hurry to them, lest his two brothers should meet her and tear her up. Contented for the present with this information, the woman bided her time to seize a favorable opportunity of escape, an opportunity which was not long in coming. She planned what to do, she was getting tired of always being alone in the depths of the forest. So, taking the biggest of the buckpots, she put all kinds of food into it, and placed it on the fire. When the contents were boiled, she went to take it off, but pretended she could not stand the heat, and turning to Tiger, said, No. It is too heavy. I want you to help me. So without more ado, Tiger stooped down, put his paws one on each side of the projecting rim of the pot, and so lifted it off the fire. While thus occupied, she smartly tapped the pot from below up, dashing the boiling contents over the creature's face, a procedure which made him fall, yell with pain, and die. His two brothers heard the roaring and said, Oh! The old man must be sporting with his girl, but this was not the case, he never having had intimate relations with her. In the meantime, the woman went to the place where she had been told her people lived, and called out, I am the little girl that was lost many a long day ago. Where are my parents? The latter showed themselves and said, You are our daughter, and would have liked a long chat over what had happened during her absence, but the woman warned them that there was no time for this. 
that they must all escape because Tiger's two brothers would come and kill them for payment, I. E. In revenge. So they loosened their hammock ropes and hurried themselves to leave. While they were doing so, a young man, a cousin, said, Well. I cannot leave this grindstone here, I shall want it for sharpening. 58 So saying, he placed it in his hammock, folded the ladder, and, in the hurry of the moment, not thinking of what he was doing, slung it in the usual manner over his shoulder. The unprepared for weight, however, broke his back and he fell down dead, and there the others left him. Point fifty nine. One thirty three. The tiger changed into a woman. A. There was a man justly noted for his skill in hunting bush hog. Though his friends might be more than a match for him in hunting other game, with bush hog he had hardly an equal, certainly no superior. He would always succeed in killing five or six, when the tiger who invariably followed on the heels of the pack would catch only one or two. The tiger could not help noticing his success, and on the next occasion that our friend went into the bush changed himself into a woman, and spoke to him. She asked him how he managed to kill so many bush hog, but all he could tell her was that he had been trained to it ever since the days of his early boyhood. She next expressed her desire to have him for a husband, but he, knowing her origin, was not too anxious to give a decided answer. She overcame his scruples, however, by convincing him that if they lived together, they could kill ever so many more bush hog than it was possible to do singly. And then he agreed. He lived with her for a long, long time, and she turned out to be an exceedingly good wife, for besides looking after the cooking and the barbecuing, she made an excellent huntress. One day she asked him whether he had father or mother, and learning that his parents and other relatives were still alive, inquired whether he would not like to pay them a visit. Because she felt sure that from not having seen him for so long the old people would think him dead. And when he said, All right. I would like to go home, she offered to show him the road and to accompany him, but only on the condition that he never told his folk from what nation she was sprung. Before they started, she said they must go hunting for a few days, so as to be able to take plenty of bush hog with them. This they did, finally arriving at the house of his parents, who were indeed glad to welcome him after so many years. The first question his old mother asked him was, Where did you get that beautiful woman? He told her that he had found her when out hunting one day in the bush, at the same time taking care to omit all mention of the fact that she was really a tiger. While at his old home, the couple went out hunting again and again, invariably returning with an extraordinarily large bag. This, unfortunately, proved to be their undoing. All his friends and family became suspicious of his luck, and made up their minds to discover to what nation his beautiful wife belonged. He was often asked, but always refused to divulge the secret. His mother, however, became so worried and upset that he at last did make a clean breast of it to her, strictly warning her not to tell anyone else, as his wife might leave him altogether. And now trouble soon came. One day the husband's people made plenty of kasiri, to get the old woman drunk, but when asked about her daughter-in-law she wouldn't tell, they gave her more drink and still she held her tongue, alas they gave her so much drink. That out came the secret and all the friends now knew that the beautiful creature whom they had so envied was after all only a tiger. The woman, however, who had heard her mother-in-law exposing her origin, felt so ashamed that she fled into the bush growling, and that was the last that was ever seen or heard of her. Her husband, of course, upbraided his mother roundly for betraying him but she said she really could not help herself, they had made her so drunk. And the poor husband would often go into the bush and call his wife, but there never never came a reply. 134. The Woman in Love with a Sloth, A. A woman had a sloth, Colopus didactylus, for a sweetheart. Every time that she went into the field or into the bush she used to carry food and drink for him. She would call how. How. And the sloth would clamber down the tree, and they caressed each other just like lovers. Other people began to talk, and wondered what she did with the food and drink that she was continually taking out of the house. Among these was a young man who watched her next day, and saw her call her sloth lover and caress him. But instead of reciprocating her caresses, the sloth scratched her, and pulled down her hair, 
conduct which made her remark, Are you jealous of me, or vexed? As a matter of fact, the sloth was very much vexed as well as jealous, because he could see the young man watching all their movements from behind a tree. The woman did not know this, and turned her steps homeward. As soon as she was gone, the man came from where he was hiding, and killed the sloth. And when the woman returned next day, and saw the animal lying dead, she fell into a great grief and wept bitter tears, saying, What has killed you, my sweetheart? But the young man, who had been following her, came up close behind, and consoled her. Don't be so foolish, he remarked. A fast fellow is preferable to a slow sloth. Take me for a sweetheart. And she did point sixty. One hundred and thirty-five. Why honey is so scarce now, eh? In the olden times bees' nests and honey were very plentiful in the bush, and there was one man in particular who earned quite a reputation for discovering their whereabouts. He would find a nest where no one else could. One day, while chopping into a hollow tree where he had located some honey, he suddenly heard a voice from the inside calling, Take care. You are cutting me. On opening the tree very carefully, he discovered a beautiful woman, who told him she was Maba, lit. Honey, the honey mother, that is, the spirit of the honey. As she was quite nude, he collected some cotton, which she made into a cloth, and he asked her to be his wife. She consented on condition that he never mention her name, and they lived very happily together for many years. And just in the same way that he became universally acknowledged as the best man for finding bees' nests, so she made a name for herself in the way of brewing excellent kasiri and paiwari. She had to make only one jugful, and it would prove quite sufficient, no matter the number of visitors, more than this, the one jugful would make them all drunk. She thus proved herself to be a splendid wife. One day, however, when the drink was finished, he went round as housemaster, in the usual manner, to his many guests and expressed regret that even the last dregs of the liquor had been now drained. He promised them, however, that the next time they came, there would be provided by Maba, yes, he made a mistake and thus spoke of his wife. And no sooner had he mentioned the name, than she flew away to her bee's nest. He put up his hands to stop her, but she was already flown. And with her, his luck flew, and since that time honey has always been more or less scarce. Point sixty one. One hundred and thirty six. The man who claimed the tiger's meal, c. One day an Indian went out hunting and came across a freshly killed Maipuri. He could see that a tiger must have slaughtered it only the night before, but as he was greedy, he intended claiming the meat for himself. With this object in view, he turned back to fetch his wife in order to lend assistance in smoke drying it. Now, when his wife saw the carcass, she knew at once by the signs on it that her husband had never killed the beast and had no right to it, but of course did not tell him so, she realized the token that something unusual was about to happen. And took measures accordingly. Hence, when her husband had cut up the meat, she built two babbercoats, one close to the ground, and another high up on top. 62 The husband, having completed his share of the business, tied his hammock near the fire, turned in, and soon fell fast asleep. The wife, however, went on drying the flesh, and continued doing so until late into the night, when she heard a tiger growling in the distance. She immediately called out, Tiger! Tiger! and shook the man's hammock, but he would not wake. She then threw a calabashful of water over him, but this did not rouse him, so she took a blazing fire stick and placed it close beneath him, but even that did not make him stir. By this time Tiger was close at hand, so climbing up on the top babbercoat she sat there very quiet. With the light of the fire, she saw the brute jump upon her husband, kill him, and eat one arm. The next night it came again and ate the other arm and a leg, and so for four nights it came, until there was no more man. The poor woman had to remain all this time up on the babbercoat, but she knew why her husband had been punished. 136a. The woman who battled with two tigers, W. 63. A man, having tired of his old wife, went off to another settlement to fetch a young one, and brought her home with him. But the two women could not agree, and the new one was always getting worsted, so much so, 
that the husband, finally obliged to take pity on her, was forced to send her to the home from which he had taken her. In order that she should have protection on the road, he gave her a large sharp knife. Starting in the early morning, the road led her along the bush, and she traveled on until night overtook her, when she selected a young ite palm up which she climbed. But before climbing she cut down a lot of pimpler palms, Bactris sp. Which she stacked all round the base of the trunk, so as to prevent anyone following her. Well, she got up the tree, which had six bunches of fruit hanging from it, and nicked the stalks of every bunch, so that with the least knock or cut they would break off and fall, this done, she coiled herself up in the young palm shoot. And fell asleep. She slept until about midnight, when she heard the roaring of a tiger who, scenting her from a distance, rushed up to the very palm on which she was resting. Jumping on the trunk above the pimplers, he crawled up it, and thence onto one of the fruit bunches. No sooner had he done so than the young woman above made a cut at the knick, with the result that down went both tiger and fruit. Sixty-four the tiger had another chance and jumped on another bunch, but with the same result. He made a third attempt, and on this occasion fell down on the pimplers, upon which he was impaled, what with the weight of the bunch of fruit on top of him. Everything was soon quiet, and early next morning when the young woman looked to see what had happened, she saw the tiger stretched out below. Now she suspected that tiger might be only shamming, and so she was afraid to come down at first, but when she saw his tongue hanging out, she knew that everything was all right and that he was really dead. She therefore came down and resumed her journey. After a time she heard the sounds of a tree being cut, and then made to fall, thinking that it was her people felling trees, she hurried on in the direction indicated. But what was her surprise to see another tiger playing an old trick of his, to make the traveller believe that timber was being cut in the near distance. This trick consisted of his hanging from the branch with his front paws and whipping the trunk with his tail, so as to imitate the sound of the axe chopping. To pretend that the cut trunk was then fallen, he would next pull a big bunch of twigs and leaves and throw them with full force on the ground below. Now, fortunately for the young woman, she came upon this tiger from behind, just as he was hanging from the branch, and without more ado said to herself, Well, dead or alive, this is my only chance. I must cut off his tail. Suiting the action to the word, she crept forward very cautiously, and with one swish of the knife cut off the creature's tail. Tiger was so ashamed at his own appearance now, that he went off howling with rage and pain, afraid of anyone seeing him, and thus left the woman free to resume her journey. She again heard the sound of timber being cut, but on this occasion made sure before getting too close that the sound proceeded from people and not from tigers. To her great joy it was her own people. They were all glad to see her, but asked how she had managed to get through that long stretch of bush in safety. She proceeded to tell them that she had killed one tiger outright, that she had cut off the tail from another, that, but her brothers stopped her before she could get any further, no woman can do that, they interrupted. So she took both of them back on the road and showed them the severed tail, and farther back the tiger's carcass. They would not approach too close to the latter, fearing that it might still be alive, but at any rate they now believed what their sister had told them. 137. The Man with a Vulture Wife, W. 65. There were once three brothers. The middle one was a very good hunter, and this story is all about him and his bird wife. While out in the bush one day he came across a large house wherein people were sporting. These people were very fair, much like white persons, a thing not to be wondered at, because they were really vultures, Sarcaranthus papa, who had taken off their feathers just for the occasion to hang about the place and decorate it. They were dancing and singing the Macquarie tune, sect. 75 on all sorts of musical instruments, from the hairy hairy flute to the rattle. The whole place looked very pretty because it was decorated with their red necklaces, white dresses, and black wing tips point sixty six all around, hung up by cords to the beams, were the Dao Yu Hura. These were long pieces of wood, shaped somewhat like your, i.e. European, Indian clubs, bigger below than above, all beautifully painted and tasseled. Sixty-seven our friend stood there watching and continued watching, so enchanted was he with the sight that, before he was aware, 
darkness fell, which compelled him to remain there all night. His mother was wondering what had become of him, and was still more surprised to see him return empty-handed next morning. He straightway went into his hammock, without saying a word, his mind was too full of what he had seen. By and by, he took up his Harry Harry and began to play on it, but he told no one of his adventures or why he had not brought back home any game. Next day he quietly slipped away before dawn, and wended his way to the beautiful house he had gazed upon two nights before. It was still there and so were all the people, hosts and guests, fair people as I have said, all singing and dancing. The girls looked so pretty that he set his mind on getting one of them. Now there was lemongrass about a yard high growing thick all around the house, and at a little distance from it and under cover of this he gradually crept closer and closer, on all fours. Up to just about the spot where the girls during the progress of their marimari dance would retreat backward in their steps. 68 As they thus made a move a little farther back than usual, he caught hold of the girl he had taken a fancy to, but no sooner had he seized her than all the other people, house, decorations, and music suddenly disappeared. And everything became the same old humdrum trees and bushes again. He had the girl, however, and although she struggled bravely, he never relaxed his hold. Exhausted in her efforts to secure her freedom, at last she panted, Loose me. Loose me. I want to go home, but this appeal was of no avail, for the only reply she got was, No. I want you for my wife. If you will only behave and not refuse me, you shall have everything you like. She yielded and she followed him, only insisting on the stipulation that he must not thrash her. He promised her that he never would do that, and thus he brought his bride home. They lived together a long time contentedly, he always giving way to her insistence of never using the meat on the same day that he brought it home from the chase, she would never eat it fresh. Preferring to keep it a day or two until it became tainted. 69. Now, one day it happened that her husband returned from the hunt extremely hungry, and he told her that she must cook at once the game that he had brought her, and that he would not wait for it until the morrow. She refused point blank, and forgetting his promise, he gave her a thrashing. Another time the same thing happened, he wanting the meat cooked immediately, but she objecting, he thrashed her again. And he beat her a third time. She bore this brutal triadnant meekly and never upbraided him. She merely told him that she proposed taking him to see her father. Seventy so he went a hunting, and brought back much meat as a present for her family, and when ready to start she gave him vulture feathers for a covering, he could not visit her people without this garb. After they had traveled a good distance into the bush, they came to land that was, like steps, so that the farther they went the higher they got, until at last they reached a very high spot, the very spot indeed where the carrion crow governors, I. E. The vultures, lived point seventy one, you must not be afraid of saying good day to my father, she was careful enough to admonish him, although he is a very celebrated man. When therefore the couple reach her father's place, he went up and shook the old man's hand. Point seventy two. His father in law bade him sit down, and after the usual routine of questions had been asked and answered, told him, All right. You can stay with me today and return tomorrow. I will come and pay you a visit later on, or I will send some of my people to call on you. The old man was well informed as to how badly he had been treating his daughter, and felt too little affection to warrant his asking him to prolong his stay. He knew also that the time would not be far distant when he would have to inflict summary chastisement. Thus it was that the couple returned next day to the mundane home of the husband, who felt sore at the treatment he had received from his father-in-law. Manlike, he vented his spleen on his unfortunate wife, whom he thrashed twice. So badly did he knock her about that even his mother took her part. Addressing her son, the mother said, You are doing wrong, in beating the girl, especially since she is so far away from all her family. 73 I am sure some evil will happen if you continue such conduct. The dame was a wise old woman, because her motherly instincts told her that her daughter-in-law was not a real person, but had something weird and eerie about her. Did not the girl wear a strange nose ornament for instance, 74 her son, however, refused to hear and commenced beating his wife again. 
75 on this occasion however, she picked up the feather covering, the very one that she had lent him when they went to visit her father's place, and putting it on, started to fly homeward. He jumped out of his hammock and tried to catch her, but the bird was already flown. As day after day passed and cheerless night closed in, he became more and more wretched, his misery turning at last into heartfelt sorrow, yes, truth to tell, he wept now because he was so unhappy. But it was too late, the mischief had been done. Every day he went into the bush where the beautiful house once stood, but there was nothing there, he went along the same paths they used to tread together, and cried and called for her. But there never came the voice that he once upon a time loved so well, and now longed so much to hear. And where was she? She too was weeping, but for a very different reason, pain and anguish, not selfishness, were the cause of her tears. Her old father comforted her, saying, Do not cry. I told your husband that I would come and visit him, or else my people would. And thus it came to pass that he sent the carrion crows, Cathartes Borovianus, to visit his late son-in-law. These met him at the very spot where once stood the beautiful house whence he captured his wife, and there, in that very spot, they killed him. They went and told the old man Vulture what they had done, and afterward returned to devour the carcass. 76. 138. The Man with a Baboon Wife, A. He had been far out into the bush in search of game, and it almost seemed as if he were to find no use for his bow and arrows. I am talking about an Arawak hunter who lived a long while ago. Late in the afternoon, however, he shot a baboon, as you Creoles call it, my seats, which proved to be a female. It was too late to bring it home, so he built himself a banab with a view to making himself comfortable for the night. This done, he cut off the animal's tail, roasted and ate it, putting the remainder of the carcass on the babbercoat to get smoke dried during the night. Next morning he was up early, entered the bush again, was very successful, and returned in the evening laden with game. As he approached the banab, you can imagine his surprise on seeing a woman lying in his hammock, and no baboon on the babbercoat. Not understanding whence she could have come, he asked her what she was doing there, and she told him that, on account of his loneliness, she had come to help look after the meat and keep him company. After further questioning, she assured him that there was no baboon on the babbercoat when she had arrived. He had his suspicions as to her origin aroused on noticing that her fingers were naturally clenched, and that with the one hand she was continually trying to keep extended the fingers of the other. 77 He accordingly asked her straight whether she herself was not the baboon that had so mysteriously disappeared, but she denied it. She was a good-looking wench, however, and he took her as wife, with the result that they lived happily together, so happily that they kept no secrets from each other. One day her husband asked her again about the baboon, and what had become of it. She now admitted that she was the baboon transformed into her present shape, but that he must not speak about it to anyone. A few days later they took their departure from the banab, and made their way to the husband's house, bringing plenty of game with them. And here they lived a very long time, still quite happily together. It is true that he would frequently be asked by his relatives as to what tribe his wife belonged, but he never told them. One morning early, hearing the baboons, calling, she informed her husband that her uncles were drinking kasiri, and suggested that they should both go and join the party. The uncle baboon was howling on the topmost branches of an immense cashew tree, the trunk of which was so big that it allowed of a proper footpath being made up it. The couple made their way to the tree, and followed the track. Up and up they went, until they found themselves in the real baboon country, and arrived at the threshold of a big house. And what a lot of drink there was! And so many baboons to drink it! Everyone got drunk and then each began to chatter, the one asking all kinds of questions from the other. Our friend was again asked what nation his wife came from and, being now in his cups, let out the secret, and told them she was really a baboon. But no sooner had he uttered the forbidden word, than everything, his wife, drinks, house, and baboons, all suddenly vanished, and he found himself desolate and alone on the top of the cashew tree. But how to get down was the puzzle, he was at too great a height to jump to the ground, and the trunk was too huge for him to encircle and scale. 
he knew not what to do, and he felt very miserable. After a time a bunya bird came along, and asked him what he was doing all alone up there. And when the bird learned how the poor fellow had lost his wife just for having said that she belonged to the baboon nation, he offered to help him out of his difficulties and get him safe to the ground. The man was perplexed, and asked how this was to be managed, but the bird told him to follow the same procedure as he, the bird, did in the making of the aerial roots of the Kofa tree, sect. 168. Obeying instructions, the hanging vine roots soon reached the earth, and clinging to these, the man got down in safety. So far, so good. But even yet he did not know exactly where he was, and he had no means of finding in which direction his house lay. A little hummingbird commenced flying about, and then settled on a neighboring bush, it offered to show the man home, and told him to follow its flight. But it flew far too swiftly, and the man could not keep up with it, so it came back and made a second start, this time following the course of a straight line before it disappeared. The man followed the line, and came to a path, where the bird met him again and said, follow the path. The man did so, and got home. 139. The disobedient son killed by a tiger, W. Two boys were playing around the house, their father became vexed at seeing them idling, and said, it would be much better if you went hunting and fishing or did something useful for yourselves. The boys got angry at being spoken to in this manner and went to another house far away in the swamps. They were obliged to hunt now, whether they liked it or not, there was no mother to bake cassava, no father to bring them meat. They used to eat the grubs of a certain beetle, the high bomo of the warhouse, that grows in the ite palm, after killing them by nicking them against the trunk. It happened that, while eating one, the elder brother heard it whistle. He knew this to be the sign or token that he was going to die. When they got back to the house, and were resting on the manacle flooring, a flooring which all our houses built in the swamps used to have, both brothers saw a habu enter, pick up his hairy hairy, and saying, this is my plaything. Warm himself at the fire, and then go out again. Both brothers knew that this spirit had come from some grave and that its presence was another sure token of impending doom. After the habu had left, a tiger came along, and both boys clambered into the roof. Poor we tonight, exclaimed the elder. Our father is angered, and this is what he has sent to punish us. We must be content, even if we are killed. Tiger made a few springs, and finally succeeded in pulling down the elder brother. He dragged the dead body into the bush, where it was devoured. Returning to the house, Tiger put out his tongue to lick off all the blood oozing from his mouth, and then sought the other brother. The latter, however, was so well concealed by the roof that he escaped detection, and the more Tiger peered into every chink and cranny, the more disguised was the place of hiding. This alternate seeking and hiding went on all through the night until dawn, when the Tiger slunk off into the bush. The boy finally mustered up courage to come down, and what with the fright, fell in a faint directly he reached the floor. Recovering consciousness, he broke his arrow and beat himself with the two fragments. Point seventy eight. He then ran away to a good distance, and listened, no tiger. He went farther and listened again, still no tiger. And yet farther did he go, and listened once more, yes, he could just hear the brute growling. Still faster did he run, and what with the extra strength which he had obtained from the broken arrow, just managed to reach his old home in safety. Here he tumbled into his hammock, too upset and excited to talk to his parents. Next morning, however, he told them the whole story, and how the tiger had devoured his brother. Now, staying in the house there happened to be a champion tiger killer, so the father turned to him and asked him to slay the creature, but he replied, no. As you are the cause of the two boys being vexed, and one of them being killed, it is your duty to do it. The father thereupon gave him a kind of greenish stone as a present, and said he would accompany him, the champion thereupon agreed to destroy the animal. 79 The pair then turned to the men in the company and asked them to join in, but they were all too frightened. The champion thereupon twit them on their cowardice, saying, Now is an opportunity for trying your mettle. I know how well you can thrash your wives. Let me see how well you can thrash a tiger. 
This shamed them, and a large number agreed to go, but in direct proportion as they got nearer and nearer to the tiger's lair, the larger and larger became the number of deserters. And, indeed, when they reached the spot, the father and the champion were again alone. The tiger was lying down, so the champion called out, Hello. A small thing like you. Call yourself a tiger. Let us just see if you can hurt me. Of course, all this vexed the animal, which then raised itself up and showed fight, a poor fight, though, because the champion easily slew him. And when dead, they opened the belly, from which they removed the dead boy's flesh and placed it in a grave. Point eighty. but they cut up the tiger carcass, fine, fine, fine. The champion then turned to the father and consoled him thus, grieve no more over your son. His death has been paid for, i.e. revenged, by that of tiger. 140. Don't count your chickens before they are hatched, see. An Indian went hunting one day far away from his hut, so far indeed that when he thought of returning night overtook him. Losing his path in the darkness, he lay down to sleep under an overhanging wood ant's nest. These insects asked him by and by if he were asleep, and he told them, not yet. After a while they repeated their question and received the same answer, and so the game went on all night until early dawn, when they asked him for about the tenth time whether he were asleep, and as before they were told, not yet. The Inyects, who were really only waiting their opportunity for eating him, could restrain themselves no longer, but let themselves, together with their nest, fall right on top of him. Fortunately, the man had Betaken himself to a safe distance before the scattered wood ants had time to secure him and as they were running hither and thither to learn what road he had taken, a hummingbird kept chirping out, Give me the head. Give me the head. This was somewhat annoying to the little insects who had missed their intended victim, and as the bird continued repeating its request, they shouted, What is the use of asking for the head when we haven't got even the body? 140a, the biter bit, c. Tawarawari was a Carib Indian who one day caught a young eagle, which he took home with him. It became quite tame, and Tawarawari had to go out regularly and shoot baboons to feed it with. But the baboons did not like this, so they held a meeting among themselves and agreed that if the man were to kill any more of them, they would catch him and tie him up to a tree. Tawarawari did kill another baboon however, very shortly afterward. So these animals, having surrounded and caught him, collected vine ropes with which they tied him to a tree trunk, where, after fouling him all over, they left him. Before taking their departure, they said, that's all right now, the eagles will come and eat him. This was partly true, because soon a big eagle, Thrasiidas Harpaya, scenting the man from afar, swooped down close upon him, and asked him why he was tied up in that way. Only because I shot baboons, was the reply. When the eagle asked him what he shot them for, he said it was for the purpose of feeding the young eagle that he was minding at home. When the bird heard this, he loosened the vine ropes, giving Tawarawari his liberty, and supplied him with two more baboons for the baby eagle to eat. 141. How Alligator Came to Have His Present Shape 81. Adeli, Hadali, is the son, but when long ago he came to earth in the shape of a man, he was called Arawidi. Once, after fishing in a favorite stream, he built a dam, with the object of retaining both the water and the fish, for use on subsequent visits. But the otters destroyed it, so he appointed the woodpecker to act as watchman. The latter warned him with a loud tapping of the proximity of an alligator, he hurried along and clubbed the reptile so unmercifully that it offered him a girl for wife if he would only stop, Arawidi accepted these terms. But to this day the alligator shows the marks of the thrashing on its battered head, and in the notches along its tail. 82. 142, How the Birds Obtained Their Distinctive Markings An Arawak hunter captures a vulture, daughter of Anuanima. 83 She lays aside her feathers, appears before him as a beautiful girl, becomes his wife, bears him above the clouds, and after much trouble persuades her father and family to receive him. All then goes well until he expresses a wish to visit his aged mother, when they discard him and set him on the top of a very high tree, the trunk of which is covered with formidable prickles. He appeals to all the living creatures around. 
Then spiders spin cords to help him and fluttering birds ease his descent, so that at last he reaches the ground in sadity. Then follow his efforts, extending over several years, to regain his wife. At length the birds espouse his cause, assemble their forces and bear him as their commander above the sky. At last he is slain by a valiant young warrior, resembling him in person and feature, it is his own son. The legend ends with the conflagration of the house of the royal vultures. The Kiskadi, Lunius Sulfuratus, though a valiant little bird, disliked the war, and bandaged his head with white cotton, pretending to be sick, but being detected, was sentenced to wear it continually. He is noted for his hostility to hawks and other large birds which he attacks incessantly when on the wing.84. The Warakaba, or trumpeter bird, Sophia crepitans, 85 and another, the Sakasakali, a kingfisher, quarreled over the spoil and knocked each other over in the ashes. The former arose with patches of grey, while the other became grey all over. The owl discovered among the spoil a package done up with care, which he found to contain darkness only, he has never been able since to endure the light of day. 143. The Deer and the Turtle, A. The deer met the turtle one day, while cleaning his hoofs, for in those days turtle wore hoofs and the deer had claws, and said, My friend, you have nice sandals.86 let me have a trial of them. The turtle, who was very proud of them, said, Certainly. Why not, and handed them over, receiving in exchange the deer's nails. When the deer now put on the hoofs, he found that he could walk ever so much quicker than before, and trotted off. The poor turtle, however, found his progress impeded, and stood still, waiting every minute for the deer to return, but he never did so. 87. 144, Black Tiger, W A U U T A, and the Broken Arrow, W. There was once a man who had two brothers in law. While he was one of the unluckiest of mortals, they invariably returned home of an afternoon with plenty of game. They said, As he has no luck, we will lose him away i.e. get rid of him. So one day they took him into the bush, all three went in together, but soon they told him to go in one direction while they went in another, arranging to meet at a certain place. The route which the two wicked brothers instructed him to follow led to the lair of Tobhoroana 88 but the intended victim did not know this. He went on and on and came to a big path, which caused him to exclaim, Where am I going now? While thus talking to himself, he heard a great rushing noise approaching, and wondered what it was. He had not long to wonder, because he saw the Tobhoroana coming. He ran as fast as he could toward an immense tree, with Black Tiger after him. Running round and round the trunk, the one after the other, the man just managed to reach the animal's hindquarters and cut off both its heels. Tiger then sat down, for it could not walk at all now. Next the man shot it through the neck with his arrow, and after finishing the job with a knife went back home. Now his two brothers-in-law, knowing well how poor a hunter he was and whither they had sent him, never for one moment doubted that they had seen the last of him. Hence, on his arrival at the house, they were greatly surprised, and made excuses to hide their guilty intentions, saying, We went to the place where we told you, but you were not there. We shouted for you, but we received no answer. So we thought you were dead, and came away. But we were just coming to look for you again, and more of similar tenor. Of course all this was a lie. And when the man told them that he had actually killed the Tobhoroana, the two brothers-in-law, as well as their old father, could hardly believe him, but insisted upon his taking them to the place. They all went together, and when at a distance they saw a black tiger on the ground all except him who had killed it were afraid to go near. He told them again that it was, all dead, dead, but they were still afraid, so, to show them that he spoke true, he boldly went up and trampled on the carcass. It was only now that the old man would approach. His two sons continued to be afraid, and then the whole party returned home. Upon arrival there, the old father-in-law gave him another daughter, so that he had two wives now, the brothers-in-law built him a bigger house, and he was henceforth recognized as Aijimo, i.e. chief, headman, of the settlement.
But our friend was very anxious to have a reputation for being clever in hunting all other animals, in addition to the glory he had earned in ridding the country of Tobhoroana. Whom could he consult better than Wau Yuta, the tree frog? 89 So he went along until he found the tree wherein she resided, and stepping underneath, he commenced calling upon her to help him, and he continued calling until the day began to darken. But there came no answer. Yet he went on calling and begging her to show him all the things that he was so anxious to learn, and now that night came on, he started crying. He knew full well that if he cried long enough she would come down, just as a woman does when, after refusing a man once, she finally takes pity when she hears him weeping. Ninety as he stood wailing underneath the tree, what should come trooping up but a whole string of birds, all arranged in regular order, according to size, from the smallest to the largest. The little Doraquara, Odontophorus, came first, and pecked his feet with its bill, to make him clever in hunting it, and so on in turn with all the other birds, up to the very largest. While Yuta, you see, was now beginning to take pity on him, but of course he did not know that. When all the birds had finished with him, all the rats came in the order of their size, to be followed by the Akuri, Laba, Deer, Bushhog, and so on up to the Naba, Taper. As they passed, each one put out its tongue, licked his feet, and went on, so as to give him luck in hunting its kind. In a similar manner, next came the tigers, from the smallest to the largest, all going through the same performance and passing on. Last of all, the snakes put in an appearance, did the same thing, and crept past. Of course, time was required for this performance and it was not until daybreak that it was brought to a completion, when the man finally ceased his weeping. With the daylight he saw a stranger approach. This was Wau Yuta, who was carrying a curious-looking arrow. So it was you making all that noise last night and keeping me awake, was it? Yes, replied the man, it was. Well, said Wau Yuta, look down your arm from your shoulder to your hand. He looked accordingly, and saw it was covered with fungus, he looked at his other arm, which was just the same. It was this same fungus that had always given him bad luck, so he promptly scraped it all off. 91 Wau Yuta's arrow was very curious looking, as said before. It had been broken into three or four pieces, which had been subsequently spliced. Wau Yuta now gave it to the man in exchange for her own, and bidding him put it to his bow, told him to shoot at a thin vine rope 92 hanging a long way off, the arrow hit the mark. Replacing the arrow on the bowstring, while Yuta instructed him to shoot into the air, and in whatever direction he sent his arrow, so soon as it came to earth it stuck into something, first of all a Doraquara. And so on in the same rotation of birds that had pecked his feet, right up to the poas. Every time a different bird, and yet he himself could see nothing when he started the arrow on its flight. As he went on shooting into the air in all directions, he found that he had hit a rat, an akuri, etc until there fell to his arrow a beautiful taper. Continuing to shoot as directed, he knocked over the tigers and snakes according to their proper order. When all this was finished, while Yuta told him he might keep this broken arrow, for which she would accept his in exchange, but on condition that he must never divulge to anyone that it was she who had taught him to be so good a marksman. They then said goodbye and parted company. Our friend returned home to his two wives, and soon gained as great a reputation for stocking his babbercoat as he already bore for his bravery in killing the Tobhoroana. All did their level best to discover the secret of his success, they asked him repeatedly, but he refused to tell. So they bided their time, and induced him to attend a big Paiwari feast. The same old story, drink proved his undoing. He let loose his tongue, and divulged what had happened. Next morning, after regaining consciousness he went to fetch his arrow, the one that Wau Yuta had given him, but he found it replaced by his own that he had given in exchange. From that time he lost all his luck. 145, The Story of Adaba, A. There were once three brothers who went out to hunt, taking their sister with them. Far out in the bush they built a banab, where the sister was left all alone, while they wandered about in search of game. Every day the three brothers went hunting in all directions, but never brought back any meat except a poas. This happened for many days. Now there was an adaba, 
Tree Frog, Living in a Hollow Tree, Sect. 144, which contained a little water, close to the Banup, and one afternoon he was singing his song, Wang. 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 When the girl heard him. What are you hollowing for, she said, it would be much better if you stopped that noise and brought me some game to eat, sect. 130. So the Adaba stopped hollowing, changed himself into a man, went away into the bush, and returned in about two hours with some meat for her. Cook this, he told her, before your brothers come back, as usual they will return with nothing. Adaba spoke truly, for soon after the three brothers came back empty-handed. You can imagine their surprise when they saw their sister barbecuing plenty of meat and a strange man lying in one of their hammocks. Yes, he was a strange man indeed, he had stripes all the way down his thin legs, and he wore a lap cloth, otherwise he was quite naked. They spoke to him, and they said, how day, to one another. After Adaba had asked them whether they had been hunting, and was informed that they had shot nothing, he told them he would like to see the arrows they were using. When they showed him these, he burst into a hearty laugh, and pointing to the fungus that was growing everywhere on them, said that so long as they did not remove this stuff their arrows would never shoot straight, sect. 144. He also cleaned their arrows for them. Adaba then told their sister to spin a fishing line which, when completed, he tied between two trees. He next told the brothers to take aim at the fishing line, with the cleaned arrows, and shoot. They did so, and each brother's arrow stuck into the very center of the fishing line. Adaba also had a curious trick in shooting with his arrow, because instead of taking aim at an animal direct, he would point the arrow up into the sky, so that in its descent it would stick into the creature's back. The brothers began to learn this method, and soon became such adepts at it that they never missed anything. Indeed the brothers became so proud of themselves and of Adaba that they took him home with them, and made him their brother-in-law. And Adaba lived a long, long time very happily with their sister. But one day, the woman said to him, Husband, let us go and have a bath in the pond. They went away together, and when they reached there, the wife got in first and called upon Adaba to come in also. But he said, No, I never bathe in places like this, in ponds. My bathing place is in the water holes inside the hollow trees. So she dashed some of the water over him, and after doing so three times, she jumped out of the pond and rushed to seize him, but directly she put her hands on him, he turned himself into a frog again, and hopped away into the hollow tree. Where he still is. When the sister came back home again, her brothers asked her where their brother-in-law was and all she would tell them was that he had gone away. But they happened to know how and why he had gone away, and so they beat their sister unmercifully. This, however, did not mend matters, because Adaba never came out of the hollow tree again to bring them luck. The three brothers often went out hunting after that, but they never brought back of an evening anything like the quantity of game that they used to get when Adaba was present. 146. Why the Indians Killed Black Tiger, W. A man went to fish. He went far into the bush to the upper creeks, and while fishing heard a noise like thunder, but did not pay much attention to it. By and by he heard the noise again, this made him exclaim, well. What can that be? When he came to think over the matter, he recognized that the sound came, not from the clouds, but from some spot on the earth. The horrible sound approached closer, and he now knew it was the voice of Tobhoroana, the black-skinned tiger. I must get away from here, he said, and with this he fell into the water and hid under tree root alongside the creek bank. Tiger now reached the spot, sniffed away, and felt right round the root. As he crept along one side the man shifted his position to the other. It was time now for the man to say, I shall die if I stay here, I must get away. Suiting his actions to the words, he dived from under the tree root deep into the water. After a while he put just his nose above the surface to catch his breath and then went down again. He repeated this performance a second time, and again a third time, when he landed on shore. Here he started running as hard as he could go. By and by he stopped to listen whether anything was coming up behind, but he heard nothing. 
Nevertheless he rushed on again, and after a while stopped to listen as before, when he distinctly heard the tiger following him. Running as fast now as possible, he managed to reach home in safety, and told his wife and the other people in the settlement to clear out at once, as Tobhoroana was coming along. He and his family accordingly got into their corial and paddled away down the creek, but all the other occupants of the settlement paid no heed to the warning, they said the man was lying. The corial went gaily along the stream and after two days paddling the man said, I wonder what has happened to my friends at the settlement, and thereupon returned to find out. When he got back, there was not a single person to be seen, he saw only blood all over the place as well as scattered beads from necklaces, bracelets, and garters, but no bodies anywhere. He then said, I must see where this Tobhoroana has gone. I will collect the remnants of my people and kill him in payment for my friends. So he travelled far and wide and gathered together the remnants of his people. Having made plenty of arrows and lances, they all proceeded to where Tobhoroana had his lair, and at last reached a large open space in front of which was an immense tree. Up this they clambered and then one of them blew his shell. Tiger heard the noise and, replying with a terrible roar, advanced toward the tree, where he was met with a volley of lances and arrows, but these had no effect on him. Tiger drew nearer, and, as he reached the spot exactly below the hiding place of the people, they all jumped upon the immense brute's back. This contained a large cavity, so they were able to work with their axes from the inside, and soon Tobhoroana fell dead. After they had thus killed and cut him up, they blew their shell again, but getting no answer, knew that there were no more tigers about. They then said, let us go see where Tobhoroana lived, and after a while they discovered the spot, it was a rocky cavern as big as this house. Looking carefully around, they found a number of human heads at the cave mouth, and searching further they came across Tiger's baby. Although this creature was as big as a Maipuri, it could not walk yet. Nevertheless all helped to kill it, and when they had beaten the carcass out of shape, they returned home. 147. Bravery rewarded with a wife, W. 93. Some men were out hunting, when they came across a dead mora tree that had a Daiha creeper 94 growing over it. So soon as they reached home they told their wives, who were very glad to hear of the find, and arranged among themselves to go next day to gather the bark. They took a little boy with them for company, and, having reached the spot indicated, started removing the bark. Each pounded a piece to make it pliable, and while they were thus engaged, the child amused himself by climbing into a manacle tree. The noise made by their wooden staves drowned the roar of an immense tiger, which, before they were aware of its presence, suddenly appeared among them, and without giving them a chance of escape killed every one, all except the little boy, who, like a watchman, could see everything that took place. He saw the tiger eat a piece out of this body and a bit out of that, finally dragging the bodies into the bush. As soon as the coast was clear, the child slid down the tree, ran fast down to the landing, jumped into the corial, and loosening it from its moorings shoved off. He was only just in time, because Tiger was after him, but unable to catch up with him, on account of being gorged with human flesh. The boy reached home all in a tremble, and could not speak, but next morning told the men about everything that had taken place, and how all their women had been killed. The men then went off to kill the tiger, but when they reached the spot they saw only blood, they went farther, and one of them, Tobakuba, recognized the body of his wife. Whose breasts had been eaten away, still farther on they found another body, also mutilated, and so on, one after the other. At last they came across the tiger, but what with the ghastly scenes that they had just witnessed, all except two of the search party turned cowards, and climbed for safety up the neighboring trees. The two exceptions were Tobakuba and Sikawaka, lit. Jigger plenty, the latter being half lame owing to the number of jiggers that infested his feet. These two men alone fought that tiger and ultimately managed to destroy it. When he was stone dead, Tobakuba called on the remainder of the search party to come down from under cover of the trees which they had climbed during the progress of the fight. He then taunted them, You have no jiggers in your feet as this man has, and yet none of you dared come help me as he did. 
After leaving all their dogs behind to eat tiger's carcass, they returned home, where Tobakoba picked out the jiggers from Sikawaka's feet and then gave him his daughter to wife. When ten days were finished, they went to fetch their dogs, but the latter had not yet devoured all the flesh and did not want to return. So they went for them again after another ten days had passed, by which time all tiger's flesh had been consumed. You can easily learn from this what a big brute he must have been. 148. Why Black Tiger Killed the Indians, W. One day Tobhoroana caught a young man out in the bush and, dragging him home, put him inside the pot, saying, You must not be frightened. I do not intend killing, cooking, and eating you. You are going to live. When Black Tiger's brother and sister came home they said, We have heard that you caught a young man. Where is he? In the pot, replied Tobhoroana. Have you fed him? Was their next inquiry, and upon receiving a negative reply, they said, Well, give him a bush hog, and if he does not finish the whole of it, we shall have to finish him. The man was indeed frightened to hear his captors talking like this, and when they gave him the hog, did his best to eat it, but by the time he had stowed away the two hind legs his belly could hold no more. Tobhoroana then handed him a calabashful of kasiri, telling him to drink it all, but the poor fellow insisted that his belly was full, and that he could not possibly do so. However, as they all three insisted on his drinking, he swallowed the kasiri, but he was forced almost immediately to vomit it all. Eh! What are you doing? said Black Tiger who, thinking there must be something wrong in the man's mouth, got his brother to help hold him, and keep his jaws open while he should pour more kasiri down. But their sister told them to let the man alone, as she had taken a liking to him, and wanted to live with him. Therefore they loosened him, but told him to go into the bush and hunt, so as to show them that he could support a wife. When he returned next time from the forest, he brought back with him ten dried bush hogs, which made Tobhoroana say, All right. I am satisfied. You can have my sister. Thus the man came to live a long time there with his tiger wife, who ultimately bore him twin sons. As the children became older, and could manage to crawl and creep, the father was minding them while his wife went out to the field, all of a sudden they howled and made a noise just like Naharani thunder. This frightened him somewhat, but when their mother returned she told him that such a noise really meant nothing, that it was but the same row which the Black Tiger Nation always made when they travelled in the bush. Soon after this he began to feel homesick, and told his wife that he proposed visiting his mother and sister, and he went. How happy indeed was the welcome he met at his old home, where they had long given him up for lost. His mother asked him whether he had a wife, and when she learned that he had not only a wife, but also two boys, who could make peculiar noises, she begged him to bring the family with him when next he paid her a visit. This he did very shortly, but when they reached his mother's place all there were drinking and the old woman's tongue was well stimulated. She upbraided him for bringing home to her such a daughter-in-law. Could he not see that she was not a proper people, but a Tigis, who would fall upon and destroy him some day? Was he not ashamed to bring such an one home to her? And so on. And in her drunken fury she and her daughter killed him, his wife did her best to defend him, but they slew her also. His two boys would have shared the same fate had they remained, but they managed to make good their escape, and reached home in safety. Uncle Tobhoroana asked them, Where is your father? Dead, they replied. Where is your mother? Dead also, they answered. When he learned from them what had happened, he became very angry, changed himself into a black tiger again, trotted off to the place where they were all drinking, and killed everyone, mother, daughter, and all the guests. 149, BAMU, BAMU, and the Frog. To account for the division of mankind into races, the following little story is given by Brett, 95 It is not Arawak. BAMU came to visit some friends who were about to go frog hunting, hunting for none of your small-sized frogs but for frogs as large as bush hogs. They told BAMU to take a cudgel and come with them, but he, being a braggart, said that he did not want any weapons, but would jump on the back of the first frog he met and twist its neck around. The chief of the frogs heard him boast, 
and purposely squatted close to the river just in front of the path along which Bamu was coming. Bamu made a jump and so did the frog, right into the water, the latter taking him over to the opposite bank, where he jerked him off. When his friends first saw Bamu on the frog's back in the water, they started laughing, and when they saw him on the other side, they continued chaffing, telling him to twist the frog's neck and bring the dead animal over to them. Having finished their frog hunt, his friends again called on him to come over and join them, but he was too much ashamed to swim back and be laughed at again. So it came to pass that Bamu remained on that side, begot children, and became separated from us. 150. How the man fooled the tiger, see. An Indian went to a somewhat distant settlement to drink piwari, and on arriving there in the early afternoon, commenced imbibing. By midnight, the drinks being finished, he started on the return journey, although the house master warned him not to leave then but to wait for daybreak, because an immense tiger was known to be prowling about. Our friend would not be persuaded, however, to postpone his departure, but only said, Oh! Never mind! I am not afraid, and if I meet him I will kill him. So saying, he hung his potto, stone club, ninety-six over his arm, and went out into the darkness. Being more or less drunk, he staggered along, and soon fell dead asleep on the road just about the very spot where the tiger, of which he had been warned, used to cross. Tiger found him lying there motionless in the early morning, felt and sniffed him all over to see whether he was dead or alive, and finally sat down on him. This sobered the Indian, and Tiger, seeing that he was alive, started pulling down the bushes so as to clear a pathway along which he could drag the body to his lair. Having thus cleared a few yards, the animal returned and slung the man over his back so that the head and arms hung over one flank and the legs over the other. This gave the man his opportunity, for as the animal carried him along he caught hold of the bushes with his teeth and hands and so impeded Tiger's progress. The tiger thought that the pathway which he had cleared was still too narrow, and accordingly replaced the burden on the ground and pulled down more bushes. The Indian thus fooled his captor some three or four times and, having now collected his wits, watched for the tiger to sling him once more on his back. No sooner had tiger done so, than he struck the animal's head just above the ear with his stone-tipped club, and thus killed him. Making sure that tiger was quite dead, he returned to the place where he had been drinking the night before, and told the housemaster what had happened. The latter would not believe that any drunken Indian could have killed so big a tiger, but when he went and saw with his own eyes, he had to admit that his late guest had spoken truly. 151. Among the Arawak's tradition has it that the old stone axes, or Wakilinabero, lit. Ancients their axe, came from a far distant country, from a place so far away that it took years for those who went in search of them to get back home again. Many a bizarre exploit is told in connection with the search for these stone implements, in the same way that many a superstition is attached to the weapon itself among several nations, both civilized and savage, elsewhere. The very length of the supposititious journey to be accomplished has given opportunity for fictions to be introduced with regard to the rivers and seas that had to be crossed, and the animal and plant life met with on the way. But beyond all the exaggeration consequent on the well-known desire of the foreign-traveled narrator to tell his stay-at-home friends so much more than his real experiences. And after making allowances for all the personal additions and embellishments that, in the absence of any written records, must necessarily and pardonably have crept into the telling of the story from one to another, there still flows through most of these extraordinary adventures a sort of ethical undercurrent conveying the lesson that disobedience to one's elders never remains unpunished. At the same time, I am not prepared to say whether the introduction of this ethical element is purposeful or accidental on the part of the old people, who usually relate these legends. The following exploits and occurrences, as well as others which I cannot detail here, are all comprised in a story which I propose naming. The search for the stone axe, a. Eh? There was a coriel full of people, with a very old man, a medicine man. In charge. They were about to search for some stone axes, but as they had a long, long way to go, their wives whom they were leaving at home had made a plentiful supply of cassava for them. In the boat they took also cassava sticks, 
so that when they reached the spot where the axes were found, they might plant them, and after reaping obtain cassava for their home journey. It might be years before they would be able to see their wives and children again. Down the river they paddled, out into a sea which had blue water in it, and with so many submerged rocks that there was a great risk of the vessel being smashed to pieces if they went farther. The old man told the crew to shoot arrows into this blue water, where an arrow sank, there did danger lurk, where one floated, there the coriol was enabled to pass. The sea was ultimately crossed in safety by this means. CF Sect. 330. The Huri Fish Nation. 152, they visited many nations. One day, as they were traveling along, the old man told them that they were approaching the Huri, Macrodon SP. Fish Nation, Sect. 178, and that, when they reached the landing place, they would see large numbers fish lying in the sand, but they were neither to shoot them with their arrows nor chop them with their knives, because they were really men and women. What the old man said actually happened when they landed that night. But when all the others slept, one of the crew stealthily arose, and went down to the water side to have another look at these fish. He drew his bow, shot one of the fish, roasted it without making any noise, ate it all by himself, and returned to his hammock without anyone else apparently being the wiser. Next morning at early dawn a large body of Indians came trooping down to the encampment, and asked for the head the boat's crew. The old man arose, and said he was the head of the crew. The Indians said, One of our men is lost, we suppose some of your party have killed him. Turning to his crew, the old man made inquiry as to whether anyone had been killed while he had been sleeping, but of course received a negative reply. So the Indians took the old man with his whole party away out back to their own camp. Arrived there, they put water into a large pot over the fire. When boiled, they gave to each of the visitors, beginning with the old man, a calabashful of the hot water to drink, so as to make each one vomit. The individual who had killed and roasted the fish remained to the last, when he was called, he did not want go, so the Indians took him by force and compelled him to have a drink. And as soon as he had drunk, he vomited all the bits of the forbidden fish. They said, You are the one that killed our brother. Whereupon they threw him into the boiling pot, in the presence of all his comrades. The old man and his crew were now free to resume their journey. How the Aenteater fooled the man. 153, they went on again and, reaching another country, woke up one morning very hungry. The old man sent all his crew out a hunting, and told them that no matter what animal they saw, they were to shoot with their arrows, or club it, as the circumstances warranted. With one exception, they all did as they were told and brought back late in the afternoon plenty of game. The disobedient one was tired, and went to sleep in his hammock the greater part of the day. He went out into the bush only as the sun was already in the west. He took only his knife with him. He had not walked very far when he came on a large anteater lying fast asleep in the shade. So soundly was it sleeping that it allowed the man to come quite close. Then he touched it with his big toe, and said, Hello. I wonder what has killed you, but as you are yet quite fresh, I will take you home. He accordingly went in search of a piece of strong bark strip wherewith to tie up the animal and carry it. He was very slow, and sauntered about carelessly, and when he had secured the strip, he even then dallied in returning where the carcass lay. But when he did get back to the spot, lo, and behold, the anteater was gone. He looked up, and he looked down, and he looked all about. This is the very spot, he said, where I saw it lying dead. Someone must have taken it away. When finally he returned empty-handed to the camping place, he told the rest of the crew what had happened. The old man said, You are a fool. The anteater was not dead, but only sleeping. Didn't you see it blowing? I.e., breathing. They all laughed heartily at him, and he recognized only too late that if he had obeyed orders, he would have had something good to eat. How the Indians learned to paddle. 154. Another country which they visited in the course of their peregrinations was peculiar in that its inhabitants could travel in their corials only with the tide. As a matter of fact, 
They had paddles, but did not know how to use them in the proper way, they held the paddle edgeways instead of broadside to the water. Furthermore, this method of progression entailed always having to travel with a very long pole. When the tide turned against them, they would drive this pole into the bottom of the stream, and make fast their coriole in it until the tide turned again. The old leader, who, as has already been stated, was a medicine man, changed himself into a bunya, and yelled out its note Tarbaran. Tarbaran. 97 Now, when some of the people who were paddling in this curious fashion heard what the bird said, they were annoyed, and remarked, Nonsense. If we were to take the broadsides of our paddles and hit you on the head with them, how would you like it? But the bird still continued shrieking, Tarbaran. Tarbaran. And would not stop. So each paddler at last turned his paddle round, and pulled it broadside with the water, and found he could travel three times as fast as before. And then all the others and their friends tried the new method that the bunya had shown them, and found that by this means they could go up and down the stream quite independent of the current. They never used their paddles edgewise again. 98. The Big Bats. 155. The search party continued their journey, and at nightfall reached a landing. Now this was in the country of the Bat tribe, and the old man warned his crew that it was very dangerous for them in sling their hammocks on the trees, as Indians usually do in the dry season, because the bats here were as large as cranes. He therefore called on them to build an enclosed camp, that is, a banab with covered sides. One young man, however, was slothful, and very backward in assisting the others in build the shelter. He said he did not believe that the bats, however big they were, would hurt him before the morning. In spite of the old man's entreaties, he refused and come into the enclosure, but, fixing his hammock between two trees, rested outside. The others did as they were told, slinging their hammocks inside the banab. Late in the night, when it was quite dark, they heard the man outside entreating and be allowed to come in. But they said, No. We cannot open the door now. You must bear what comes on you, i.e. you must take the consequences. And when they opened the door in the morning, all that was left of the individual was some bones. The bats had sucked him dry indeed. The Magic Boat 156 On and on the party went, and in the afternoon they came to a landing where there was a beautiful canoe with a paddle inside it. But the old man warned them to leave it strictly alone. Don't, he said, any of you get into that boat, because if you do, even without touching the paddle, you will be carried off immediately, and we shall never see you again. They all took heed, except one man, and went to sleep. This one man kept awake and could not sleep, the more he thought of the boat, the greater was his desire to go and have another look at it. He quickly slipped out of his hammock, and gazing at its graceful lines, began wishing that he had so beautiful a canoe for himself. He approached nearer and nearer, admiring it more and more, until he finally jumped in. No sooner had he done so, than the vessel went off with him and neither boat nor occupant was seen again. Point ninety nine. The Amazons. 157, again they all started away, and after a time arrived at a landing place whence an Indian house could be seen. With the old man leading his crew Indian file up the pathway, they soon reached the house, where they asked for lodging that night. An old woman came out and said, We are all females living in this settlement. This was quite true. There were several houses in the settlement, but all full of women, not a boy nor a man to be seen anywhere. All those who pass this way have to remain at least a year with us before we allow them to proceed on their journey. We will do our best to make you happy while you stay. Both you, old man, and every one of your companions must take two or three of our women to wife. At the end of the year, those of you who become fathers of girls are free to go your way, but those to whom boys are born must stay with us from year to year until you beget girls. You now know what is expected of you. The boat's crew, recognizing that there was no help for it, made up their minds to stay. Now the woman in charge was indeed a sly old dame. To every hammock she attached a rattle, and then kept awake all night. 
If she heard the rattle sounding frequently, she knew that everything was as it should be. But when the rattle remained silent, she would proceed to that particular hammock, at commonut marum ut melageret officium sum. The men had only to give good cause for the rattles shaking all night. Of a morning the females went hunting with the bows and arrows, or else they went fishing, just reversing the usual order of things, and leaving the men in the hammocks to rest. It was naturally many years before the crew finally got away from this settlement. Point 100. The country of the stone adzes. 158. At last they arrived at the country of the stone adzes, where all the people were really stones, 101 and some of these they brought away with them, the party finally reached home again. And the old man warned them, ut abstinerent de copulation cum uxoribus sui per tantas nocts. One of the men, however, disobeying the instructions, was punished in a very peculiar fashion by being immovably fixed in, position copulationis. 159. How Turtle Fooled the Yawari, W. C. It was a time of scarcity and drought, and the bush rat, Yawari, in the course of his search for food came upon Turtle, also on the lookout for a bite. After saying, How day! to each other and inquiring after their respective business, whence they had come, and whither they were going, they began to discuss the hardness of the times, and thus from one thing to another. The question finally arose as to which of them in case of necessity could fast the longer. Each one's assurance of his own superiority in this respect led them to arrange a competition, it being agreed that the one party should choose any tree, and the other party abstain from food until this tree should bear fruit. Yawari accordingly chose a plum tree and, fencing it all round, put Turtle inside the enclosure. Every month did Yawari visit his willing captive and ask whether he were still alive. Still alive? Why not? No harm can befall me, was the reply he received. This conversation was repeated once a month for six months, at the end of which time, the plum tree buds had opened, the flowers had bloomed, and the ripe fruit had fallen. So the fence was broken down and the turtle let out. It was now Yawari's turn to show what he could do, so turtle built him a fence around a wild cashew tree, shut him in, and went away. At the end of a month turtle came up to the fence and shouted out to Yawari, asking him if he were still alive. Yes. Alive, was the answer. After the lapse of another month turtle visited him again with the same question, yes. Alive. But a bit exhausted, was the reply on this occasion. On completion of the third month, Turtle came again, but this time he received no reply at all. Yawari was no longer alive, only the flies on his dead body were alive. Yawari did not know that the wild cashew bears fruit only once in every three or four years. 160. How the Turtle Tricked the Tiger, W. Tiger really wanted to eat the turtle but was a bit of a coward and none too sure whether his intended victim was the stronger or not. Wishing therefore to find out, he approached the turtle and pretended to make friends. The latter, however, was no fool, and knowing quite well what reliance could be placed on such a pretended friendship, saw that he must exercise every craft and cunning to save himself. Tiger began telling him what a big strong man he was, that he ate only meat, with such and such results, thinking thereby to impress Turtle with his physical superiority. But nothing daunted, Turtle said he could do the same, and suggested that their respective statements be put to the proof. This was agreed on, Turtle stipulating only that during the test they should both keep their eyes shut, an arrangement to which Tiger agreed. Point 102, now, didn't I tell you, said Turtle, that I could do exactly the same as you and even go one better. Tiger was loath to admit this, and therefore maintained, well, even if you are stronger than I, I am faster than you, I can run more quickly. Let us have a race, and prove it. They accordingly arranged to run to a certain spot, along a certain path, and whichever got there first would be admitted to be the faster, Turtle stipulating only that he must be allowed a little time in which to get ready. Tiger again agreed. Turtle spent the interim in visiting his many friends, telling them what had happened, and arranging for them to place themselves at stated intervals along the course of the pathway where the race was to be run. The two then started, and Tiger, 
taking a spring ahead, was soon out of sight. Turtle utilized the opportunity by slipping into the bush, taking a short cut, and reaching the spot agreed on, where he awaited his opponent. Tiger, racing along, called out, hello, on seeing just in front of him a turtle, whom he believed to be his friend. He raced on, finds another turtle ahead of him, thinks the same thing, and so meeting turtle after turtle finally reaches the goal, where his original friend had certainly arrived first. 103 Tiger therefore had to admit, yes, man, you have beaten me, turtle adding, so you are not after all either the stronger or the faster. Come, let us see who is now the cleverer. I will put marks on you and you put marks on me, that will be a good test. The tiger again agreed. They then started painting each other. As to the tiger's handiwork, just look at a turtle's shell, and you will see how roughly and slovenly the marking was done. Of course Tiger was planning to get the better of his opponent if he could, but the latter well knew this and so had to be very smart in pleasing the Tiger. Look at the beautiful spots and stripes that Turtle put on him, and of course Tiger was delighted at seeing how handsome he looked, and had to admit that Turtle was cleverer than he. Now all the time that they had been talking, racing, and painting, they had had nothing to eat, and hence Tiger suggested their going into the depths of the bush and finding some game but Turtle, who had good reasons for not trusting his companion, refused. No, he said, you can go and raise the deer and I will catch and kill it for you. So Tiger went and raised a deer, and drove it down the pathway. In the meantime Turtle climbed up a dead log that was lying across the road, and waited, as the deer raced underneath he dropped off the log and, falling straight on the animal's neck, broke it. Turtle then sucked the dead deer's blood and smeared it all over his mouth, so as to make Tiger, who just then came up breathless, believe that he had caught and destroyed the animal. I have killed the deer and eaten my share. You can come and eat yours now. After having gorged himself, Tiger said, let us have a nap now, and curling himself up, soon fell asleep. Turtle, who kept awake, saw what a pretty necklace his companion was wearing what we Indians call a tiger bead, and became envious of it. 104 Turtle watched very carefully and, assured that he was in a deep slumber, quietly and softly removed the necklace, which he handed to one of his friends in the neighborhood, telling the latter to make off with it. When Tiger at length woke, he missed his necklace and asked Turtle where it was, but the latter of course said he did not know. Tiger however, accused him of being the thief, and said that whether he had stolen it or not he would eat him unless he replaced it. Turtle, however, protested that necklaces were of no use to the like of him, he had no neck to put one on, all he had was a back. Tiger, however, insisted on killing him if he didn't return it, but Turtle, who was now on his mettle, let him know that he could not kill him if he tried. Had he not already proved to him that he was the stronger, the quicker, and the cleverer? On the other hand, there was much more reason for believing that he, the little turtle, could easily kill him, the big tiger, if he only wanted to. And thus they continued, contending, and finally they arranged to fight it out to a finish, the turtle only insisting that each be allowed a little time to get ready for the fray. The conditions were that they should go in opposite directions, and return within a short interval to the same spot, when the fight must be fought to a finish and no quarter shown. Tiger went his way, and on a given signal returned to the trysting place. But there was no turtle to be seen. Of course not. Hadn't he crawled into a hole in a log for safety? And there he still is, and their tiger is continually on the watch for him to emerge. 161, Tiger and Anteater, C, 105. One day Tiger met the Tamanoa, Great Anteater, in the forest, and chaffed him about his funny mouth and his clumsy toes. Never mind, said Tamanoa, even if my mouth is small and my feet are clumsy, I can eat at all events meat quite as well as you, and I am certainly as strong as you. Oh, no, indeed you are not, replied Tiger. Thus they went on arguing. At last, Tamanoa said he would like to have a peep into his rival's mouth, and when Tiger opened his jaws wide and showed him his fangs, told him he did not think much of them. This annoyed Tiger, who then wanted to look inside Tamanoa's mouth, and having done so, 
exclaimed, What? Do you mean to tell me that you can eat meat? I don't believe you have ever tasted it in your life. You lie. Replied Tamanoa, because it was only this very morning that I finished the deer carcass that you had left behind. See Sturkis Miam observes, you can see that I ate even more of the meat than you did, it was agreed, therefore, ut ambo defecrant instanter, Tamanoa stipulating that while thus engaged both should keep their eyes tightly closed. This also was agreed to, but while occupied in carrying out the conditions of the wager, Tamanoa surreptitiously opened his eyes and silently exchanged, Sturkisum, for that of his adversary, open eyes. Shouted Anteater, whereupon both turned around to see what had happened. Felis Tigris animadvertivit Sturcus sum, and was much puzzled, but, when he went to examine Tamanoas, he had to admit at once that his opponent had indeed eaten meat, and a goodly quantity of it, that very morning. Tiger was still puzzled over, Sturcor Sua, and said that a similar thing had never happened before, very likely he must be sick. Sick indeed you are, and weak too, retorted Tamanoa. For though my feet are so clumsy from walking always on their outsides, I am more than a match for you. Tiger was much angered at this last remark, and the result was that they commenced fighting. Tiger made a spring forward at the same time that Tamanoa ducked his head, the latter, seizing Tiger by the ribs, once his hold was secure, easily crushed him, and Tiger, soon dead, 106. 162. How birds got their present plumage 107. Once upon a time there was a water serpent, a huge creature with a most brilliant skin of red, yellow, green, black, and white in extraordinary patterns. He became such a terror to all other living creatures that the men and birds, who were friends in those days, combined forces to destroy him, and the creature's skin was promised to the first one who made him come out of the pool. But all were afraid to tackle him except Cormorant 108 who, darting down into the water, drove an arrow through his neck, an arrow fastened by a string to a tree on the bank, by means of which he was finally drawn to land, where he was skinned. Cormorant claimed the skin, and the warriors, never thinking he would be able to carry it away, told him he could have it. He nodded to the other birds, who, each seizing part of the edge, managed to lift it off the ground and bear it to a secluded spot, where Cormorant told them they could divide it among themselves each to take the part that he had just helped to carry. Each bird carried his load home on his back, and ever since has been marked by the hues of the section of the serpent's skin that he carried happened to bear, parrots green, macaws scarlet and gold, and so on. But Cormorant as his share got only the snake's head with its somber tints, however, he remained content with this. 162a. Hunting is no part of woman's work, w. While going to her field one morning an old woman found a deer fast asleep on his back in the pathway. Returning to the house, she got a piece of an old knife and began sharpening it. All the grandchildren were making remarks at her, as, e.g., look. What is the old woman sharpening the knife for? She's going hunting. What do you say? She sneeringly retorted, yes. I am going hunting. You are all too lazy to go but I am not. You are not fit even to hunt, but I am. I found some dead meat this morning, all spoiling, and I intend bringing it home. So saying, she went about her business, taking a little granddaughter to keep her company and give help. When they arrived at the spot where the deer was still lying on his back, she approached the beast and commenced jagging her knife under his chin straight down his neck, and so right in the middle line of his body. The knife was blunt, however, and the old woman's arm weak, with the result that at first she did hardly more than scratch the skin. But when she tried to make an incision lower down, vidit pulchrum veterum capram esse, catitilatus in tanta delicata part corporis ius, awoke with a surprised start, kicked the old woman to one side, and sprang off into the bush. Damn you! She cried, as she threw the blunt knife after him. When they got home, the little girl told her parents exactly what had happened to her grandmother, and how they did laugh at her. It was her first and last attempt to go hunting and do man's work. 162b How the Taper Punished the Indian, W. While traveling through the forest one day an Indian came across a party of men seated, eating something that smelt very savory. 
Now, instead of waiting to be asked to partake of the cheer, our traveler roughly inquired of them what it was that they were smacking their lips over. They told him that it was bush cow, taper, liver, and that if he wanted some he would have to hunt it himself. On further questioning, they told him exactly where he would find a bush cow sleeping, and advised him that the best and quickest way to get the liver was, manum cum cultural in anno inserer ac exindra, and the silly old fool believed them. Proceeding to the spot indicated and finding the beast asleep, inserut cultrum in anno, but, with the taper now wide awake, he found it impossible to release his arm. On rushed the animal through thicket, bush, and forest, dragging the miserable hunter behind him. So they traveled night and day, only to be released when they found themselves on a sheet of water. Here the taper relieved himself, thus freeing his would-be captor. By the time the man reached home all the skin had peeled off his arm, and when folk asked him what had caused the trouble, he told them, and they laughed at him. He had been punished for his want of manners. 162 c. The Turtle and the Eruresso Bird 109, w. A woman had a daughter with whom Turtle and Eruresso were anxious to go courting, and, not knowing which to choose for son-in-law, she bade each cut a field. Though the bird left at daybreak, Turtle would be up and away long before, and hence found greater favor with the old woman who, more than satisfied with his perseverance and industry, would supply him each morning with Beltiri. She did not trouble herself about Eruresso. The old mother at last talked to both of them, telling them that she proposed taking a walk the following morning to their respective fields to see what progress they were making. Following Turtle, she watched him rolling here and there, thus pressing down and smoothing the undergrowth on a large area where the trees, old and decayed, had fallen helter-skelter for ages past, as a matter of fact he had never felled a single tree. It was by starting away so long before daybreak each morning that he fooled the old woman into thinking that he must necessarily be working hard. She therefore went after the bird to see what he was about, and found him in a nicely cleared space, I. E. His playing ground. Well, said she, you shall be my son-in-law, and I won't bother about Turtle any more. Turning to the latter, she added, yes. You shall always remain like that, rooting about decayed leaves and dead logs, and it is in such places that Indians will come and hunt for you. On the other hand, addressing herself to the bird, your nation will always be cutting fields, ever obtaining cassava, and making drink and singing songs. 162d. Sisters Bush Cow, Taper, and Water Cow, Manati, W. 110. There was once a lovely big plum tree, and two sisters would come regularly and pick the fruit. One day while thus busily engaged, a bush cow, taper, came along, so they squeezed some of the fruit into a manacle palm spada and offered it to him to drink. He drank it. Next day the same thing happened, and so on day by day, until in a very short time he became so tame that all the girls had to do when they reached the tree was just to give a little whistle, when he would put in an appearance immediately. Their two brothers, however, became suspicious of the young women's frequent absences from home, and setting a watch, saw them whistle for and then feed the creature with squeezed plums. What does this mean? Why tame a wild cow? Realizing something to be wrong, they made up their minds to kill the beast. The opportunity was not long in coming, and, leaving their sisters in the house one morning, they made straight for the tree, squeezed some of the fruit, and, imitating their sister's whistle, called the taper. So soon as he came near, they shot him, cut up the meat, and brought it home. The sisters were glad to see their brothers return with so much meat, and all had their share in eating it. By and by, the girls repaired as usual to the plum tree, squeezed some of the fruit into a spada, and gave the customary whistle, but no bush cow came. They then went home and began to cry, but they wouldn't say what they were crying for. At last the brothers said, Come, dry up your tears and eat. There's plenty of meat in the house. But they refused to be comforted and declined to eat, having now realized what had happened. That is our pet whom you have killed, they said. With this, they left the house, crying and continuing to cry all the way until they reached a river bank, over which the younger sister attempted to jump into the water. But the elder seized her by the waist and begged her not to leave, 
because she would then have to grieve alone. The younger managed, however, to slip into the water, and coming to the surface, exclaimed, People will henceforth call me water cow. Then, diving three times, she came up finally entirely in the shape of that creature. Point one eleven. The elder sister thereupon rushed into the bush, and changed herself into a bush cow. Bush cow and water cow often meet nowadays at the waterside and have a chat. Of course they understand each other, haven't they both the same talk, i.e. grunt. 10. The spirits of the bush, associated with particular plants. Derivation of man from plants, and vice versa, 163-163a. Association of bush spirits with silk cotton tree, 164, cassava, 165 to 166, maize, 167, kofa, 168, snake bush, 168a, the whistling caladium, canima, blow tube grass and dakini tree, 168b, it and mora, 168c. And possibly with the tree of life, the devil doer, silver valley, darina, hyri, and bamboo, 169. The belief in binas may be but a development of this association of bush spirits with plant life, 170. 163. So far as mankind is concerned, their original derivation from trees, trunks, and fruits is accepted by many of the tribes, sect. 57. As to the converse idea, the transformation of human beings, or their spirits, into plants, sect. 59. I can find only two traces of it, one, in an Arawak legend relative to the discovery of the whip used in the Macquarie dance, sect. 75, and the other, in the Yauna story of the Jurupuri ceremony, sect. 163a. The first, Macquarie, whips, a. There was a family of two sisters and two brothers. Going out one day to cut firewood, the former proceeded to the forest and cut the timber, on splitting a log, they found inside a pretty little whip. After closely examining it, each girl proceeded to make another exactly like it. Then they proceeded to their provision field, put up a little bannock, and hung inside it the three whips. When they reached home they made some drink, two jugs full altogether, one for their two brothers, and one for themselves, they took their portion to the bannock, where they left it. On three occasions they did this, i.e. They made drinks and took their own share to the field. The brothers, suspecting that something was wrong, and being unable as brothers to talk with their sisters on so delicate a matter, sent the little hummingbird to make inquiries. While the girls were working in the field, the bird flew into the banab, saw the jug of drink there, and the three whips hanging up, and reported accordingly. The brothers thereupon asked the sisters to explain what they had been doing in the banab, and when the latter said, nothing, they reproached them for not having mentioned anything about the whips. The possession of which they were then forced to admit. The brothers then asked to have a trial of the whips, but this the sisters refused, they would not deliver their charge over to anyone. So the brothers said, well, if you won't let us touch them, you can at all events let us look at you when you are sporting with them. No exception was taken to this, and the girls, making some drink, enlarged the banab and widened the pathway leading up to it. At the entrance to the pathway they placed the jug of drink. The brothers came, stopped to refresh themselves with its contents, began to sing, and then proceeded to the banab, where, addressing their sisters, they asked them to take down the whips and show their manner of play. This the women did, but it was soon evident that they knew neither how to sing, to dance, nor to whip properly with them. Admitting this, they were finally constrained, after repeated entreaties, to hand the whips over to their brothers, who now showed them how the real thing ought to be done. Furthermore, they called their sisters Kasarobana, equals Kurawa plate, and Korobatoro, equals it fiber, the elder and younger, respectively, that is, they transformed them into Kurawa, Bromelia, thread and it fiber. The two materials out of which the Arawak have ever since made their Makwari whips. 163a in the origin of the Jurupuri festival according to the Yauna Indians of the river Apaporis there is also a conversio of a human being into a plant. This is their story, KG, 2, 293. A long time ago, from out of the great waterhouse, 
the house of the sun, came a little boy Milamaki, who sang so beautifully that everyone came from far and near to hear him. But when they reached their settlements again, all died. Their relatives thereupon came and burned him on a large pyre, but he continued singing until he died. Thus was his body destroyed, but his spirit went up to heaven. From the ashes grew a long green leaf, which visibly became greater and greater and turned into the first Paxuba palm, Iriardia exoriza, a timber used for all kinds of weapons and articles. The people made big flutes of this tree, which produced the same melodies that Milamaki had sung. To honor Milamaki the men dance and blow on these flutes nowadays when the various fruits, as Inga, Pupunya, Gilielma speciosa, Castania, Omari, are ripe, because it was he who created them all. The women and children must not see these flutes, the former would die, and the latter would eat earth, become sick, and die. 164. Several examples are to be met with of bush spirits being associated with particular plants or trees. Perhaps the most interesting is that of the silk cotton tree, Bombax sp, the superstitions concerning which have been incorrectly surmised, BR 369, as communicated from the Negroes to the Indians. The earliest reference in this connection that I have been able thus far to find for it, in the Guianas, is by Stedman, ST 2, 261, in Suriname, perceiving that it was their, Negroes, custom to bring their offerings to the wild cotton tree. Under this tree our gadaman or priest delivers his lectures, and for this reason our common people have so much veneration for it, that they will not cut it down on any account whatever. It would be interesting to learn whether the so-called fromager of the French Ivory Coast is identical with our tree. Certain it is that the records are abundant as to both Indians and Negroes, A.R., 45, refusing to cut one down. As a matter of fact, however, the superstitions of the Bombax were cherished in Middle America long before the arrival of the Negroes, the Mayas of Yucatan spoke of it as the tree of creation, etc., under whose shade the spirits of mortals reposed. I know Arawaks who firmly believe that this tree moves within a circuit at midnight and returns to its proper place again. Dance, 57, states that its guardian spirit walks round the tree at midday, and at midnight. Brett, 377, 398, informs us of an Arawak tradition that men and other living creatures were originally made out of its bark and timber, sect. 57, women have told me that the Atacuhuha, in the form of a large bird, lives on the buds, i.e. picks out the cotton to build its nest with, that the shedding of the leaves is a sign that the spirit has taken its departure, and that when the foliage is resumed, the spirit has returned. Considering that there are some four or five other deciduous trees known to the Arawaks, it would not appear that their superstitious regard for it can be due to the periodic shedding of the leaves. From the fact of the silk cotton tree being credited with the power of moving within a circuit, sect. 8. A separate sentient existence may have been claimed for it. But such a property might equally be due to the particular medicine man or bush spirit, sect. 167. Happening to occupy its trunk or branches. 165. The cassava plant affords a very good illustration where the associated spirit remains distinct, and is given a separate existence, so much so that it may be attacked by evil spirits to prevent it distributing its favors. Or may be thanked and honored for the benefits bestowed by it upon mankind. The Arawaks, even at the present time in the Pomeroon district, with the building of a house, or rather at its completion, give a party, when all the guests are arrived, some of the Kassiri, before its distribution among the guests, is thrown by the house mistress on the uprights. She also places pieces of cassava at the four corners under the eaves. This is supposed to feed the Yawahos, or spirits of the bush, who, unless thus treated, would not permit the spirit of the cassava to furnish the next crop. The Warao Indians of the Maruka River had also a special festival, or thank offering to the cassava spirit for the bountiful harvest which it had supplied them with. Such festival taking the usual form of a drinking bout and a dance, they called it the Aruhoho, lit. Cassava Festival. 166. So also, the first baking of cassava bread from a new field formerly was attended by unusual ceremony. The cassava, 
which on ordinary occasions is scraped and washed, at the preparation for the first baking, was scraped but not washed. The juice extracted from the grated cassava by means of the matapi, and which otherwise would be boiled into kasarip, is, on this occasion, poured out on the ground as a libation for this, its first fruits, de, 102, at Berbis. This is still done on the Maruka River, the Arawaks here making the juice from the first cassava collected off the new field, sprinkling it a few days later here and there over the center of the field. The Indians say that this is a gift, a sort of thanks, to the spirit of the cassava. On the upper Amazon a purely Indian festival is celebrated the first week of February, which is called the Feast of Fruits, several kinds of wild fruit becoming ripe at that time, HWB. 280 This may have a meaning similar to that ascribed to the ceremony in connection with the cassava. 167 Another curious sort of spirit, that of, the rot, is associated with buckcorn, maize. Here is an account of it. The spirit of the rot saves the young woman, c. Two girls were left in charge while the remainder of the household went to a drink party. The former had been told by their parents to accept the invitation, but had preferred staying at home. About sunset a Eurocon emerged from a neighboring silk cotton tree, he had an arrow and with it he shot a parrot. He brought the bird to the young women and asked them to cook it, and they, not knowing that he was a bush spirit, were only too ready to oblige him. After they had eaten the bird and he had slung his hammock, into which he threw himself, Eurocon called on the younger sister to join him, but she, not feeling so inclined, sent her sister instead. Later, when all was still and dark, the younger sister heard extraordinary noises and growling proceeding from their visitor's hammock, Credens eos copulari, she paid no further attention to them. After a while, however, the clamor was even worse than before, so, blowing up the fire, she went over to Eurocon's hammock, whence she saw blood trickling to the ground. Looking inside, there was her sister lying dead. Eurocon intravitim. She now recognized the tribe to which the man belonged, and hastened to save herself from a similar fate. She had a stack of buckcorn, which had all become mildewed and rotten, and in this corn she hid herself. To make assurance doubly sure, she further warned the spirit of the rot that if he allowed the Eurocon to come and catch her, she would never supply him with any more corn. By very early dawn, Eurocon had completed his work of destruction with the elder sister, and now asked the spirit of the rot whether he had not seen another woman about, but this spirit refused to answer the question. Being so busily engaged in eating the corn, Eurocon therefore walked all about, looking everywhere for the younger sister, but could not find her, and now that the day was just breaking, he had to hurry back to his home in the silk cotton tree. All this time the poor woman was crouching in her hiding place, and it was not until midday when the sun was shining brightly, that she dared emerge. Directly she did so, she rushed down the pathway to meet her people, who were returning from the drinking party, and, as soon as she saw them, she fell exhausted, and commenced hallowing and crying. What's wrong? asked the mother. The Kamaka, silk cotton tree, Eurocon has killed my poor sister, was the reply. This made the mother say, you ought to have come with us to the party, as you were told, instead of staying behind by yourselves. When at last they reached home, the parents picked all the peppers around, gathering twenty baskets full of them. They then made a ring of fire right round the Kamaka tree, which the surviving daughter had no difficulty in pointing out to them, and as soon as the flames began to blaze, threw peppers into them. There must have been a big family of Eurocons in that silk cotton tree, because as the irritating, pestiferous smoke arose, down came a lot of small baboons of which the fire made short shrift. They threw on more peppers, and down fell a number of bigger baboons, and they soon shared the same fate, sect. 242. The parents now threw in the last of the peppers, and down scrambled the very Eurocon who had killed their elder daughter, they clubbed him to death, and the father said, I am killing you in payment for my daughter. They then opened the corpse's belly, in which they found woman's flesh. The younger sister obeyed her parents from that time onward. 168. Another tree which, according to Arawak beliefs, 
has intimate association with the spirit world, is the Clusia grandiflora, an epiphyte, which throws down straight aerial roots that finally fix themselves in the ground below. Indian belief explains this peculiarity by the statement that the bunya bird roosts on the host, whence it drops its castings, sect. 350, which are nothing more than the aerial roots in question. The Arawak speak of this epiphyte as the kofa. 168a, space must be found here also for mention of the Pomeroon Arawak belief in some intimate relationship between certain plants, known as snake bush to the creoles, and venomous serpents, the poisonous effects of which they can avert. A similar idea prevailed among the same tribe on the Demerara River. The Indians advised that when the snakes, a bushmaster and a labaria that had been killed and buried, were supposed to be decomposed, they should be dug up the bones burned and carefully replaced, and the spot of ground fenced in. From the ground manured with the burned bones of the snakes, would grow up, they said, snake bushes that could be used as antidotes to the virulence of snake bites. Some plants called snake bush resemble a group of small snakes flattened laterally, standing upright, from 12 to 20 inches, with their tails planted in the ground. Duh, 324. 168b Among the Caribs, the Masiemo, i.e. Canima, Caladium, would seem at first sight to possess qualities almost distinctive, it is a large leaf species which I have seen cultivated at Carib settlement on Manawaran Creek. Its peculiarity lies in its supposed power of uttering a long low whistle, and shaking the sleeper's hammock with the object of rousing him from slumber to a sense of his danger on the near approach of the human and animal Canima. Or Blood Avenger, Sect. 320. The plant from which the blow tube is derived commonly grows in wet places, as wide stagnant marshes, and superstition has stationed an evil spirit to defend it. Whence the Indians have the apprehension that some ill must befall him who ventures in to procure the reed, PNK, I, 488. In especially bad cases of sickness among the Suriname Caribs, the chief remedy is the sap of the Dakini tree. To obtain this, the P.I. has to get the permission of the spirit of the tree. And only after many a parleying will he cut an opening to obtain it, a.k. 193. 168c The Ite Palm and the Mora Tree, W. In the days of long ago there was always to be found growing a mora near an ite, wherever one was to be seen, there sure enough, close by, would be found the other. The baboon would forage on the ite and eat of her fruit, and this is just what made the Mora jealous. In those times the trees, like the animals, would converse with one another just as people do. And these two trees must have been women, for did they not each bear seed? At any rate the Ite said she would leave the Mora and travel eastward, but the Mora followed her, she wanted the baboon to come and stay with her. She was very jealous. As they both traveled on and on toward the east, they left some of their seeds behind, on and on they went, farther and farther east. As the ground of course gradually changed from dry bush to swamp, the baboon more and more preferred to feed on the mora, whose branches were always well above the water surface, and so finally left the ite altogether. The mora now at last satisfied, and was no further cause for jealousy, remained where she was, while the ite traveled still farther eastward, stopping only when she came to the heavy swamps of the Orinoco. And here was too much water for the baboon to follow her. Hence it happens that the baboon is never met with nowadays on the ite palms, but always on the topmost branches of the mora. All the ite palms that you see here and there more or less isolated in this district are stragglers from the original palm which traveled to the Orinoco. It is only on that mighty stream where you see the real ite palms. There they yield starch and fruit and drink in plenty. The stragglers left behind here are so miserable and poor that it is not worth our while to cut them down. 169. Among remaining plants which may, perhaps, be regarded as associated more or less intimately with spirits and the like, are the Tree of Life, the Devil Doer, the Silver Valley, the Darina, the Hyeri, the Kanima, Sect. 168b, and perhaps the Bamboo. A leaf of the plant of the Tree of Life, Bryophyllum calicinum, the Kakuhuata of the Arawaks, is sometimes suspended in the house, both on the Demerara and the Pomeroon, when one of the inmates is ill. 
Should the leaf germinate, as is its nature to do under ordinary circumstances, it is accepted as a sign that the sick man will recover. But if it wither, that is an indication he will die. The devil doer, the uses of which have apparently been taught by the Indians to the blacks, is a bush rope, called by the latter, the fighting stick, or devil doha, debrit war, or zebrit war. It is said to have the effect when dried, pulverized, and smoked with tobacco, of rendering all within the influence of the smoke pugnacious, and a row is certain, it is used to stimulate virility, and excite veneri, the, 286. So again, the Indians are of opinion that the scent of the burning chips of the silver valley, Nectandra Pisai, makes people quarrelsome, Ibid. At a certain season, the Darina has every appearance of being dead. But having shed its bark it begins to revive, the new bark becomes red like the bloodwood and thickens, new leaves spring forth. And the tree resumes its beauty. At midnight the Arawak Indians hear the chants of the medicine man emanating from the tree, Ibid. The Hyeri, Hiri, a large tree with thick leaves, which bears a small seed, is probably the Ayuk of the Akaways. The gum, or the inner bark, scraped, mixed with water, and given to the sick will cause the spirit of the tree to appear to him, and point out the person who inflicted his illness upon him, thrown into the fire. It stupefies all who inhale its fumes, the, 285. The smoke of the wood when burning is fatal to all kinds of animals, bowl, 258. The Pomeroon Arawaks believe that if the leaves fall into the river from an overhanging tree, sickness will fall upon the people farther down the stream. The same folk believe that the bamboo flowers and seeds only during the night, which certainly accounts for the fructification not being seen. If for nothing else, any alleged Indian superstition concerning this palm must be counteracted of course by the fact that it is an introduced plant. The ability of the house posts to talk, sect. 16, may be traces of a spirit originally associated with the timber. 170. I am very strongly inclined to regard all the, vegetal, attraction charms, or binas, used in hunting, sect. 233 or love-making, sect. 237, and otherwise, as survivals of an original belief in plants possessing associated spirits. While the presence of the originally associated spirit has been lost sight of, and more or less forgotten, its attributes, properties, and powers have been retained. It will be remembered that all such binas have an exceptional source of origin, the calcined bones of a snake, sect. 235, and in this connection it is no less interesting to note that the Hyari root, Loncocarpus sp. Fish poison, which can equally be regarded as an attraction charm, should also possess animal, with its contained spirit, relationships, in that it has been quickened in human blood. I here paraphrase the legend of the Hyari root, given by Brett. An old fisherman noticed that when his boy accompanied him, and swam about in the river, there the fishes would die, and yet were quite good to eat. So he made a point of making the lad bathe every day. But the fish were determined upon putting an end to this. Accordingly one day when the lad, after a swim, was lying basking in the sun, those fish which were possessed of spines, and especially the stingray, sprang quickly up at him and pricked him. The lad died of his wounds, but before dying told his father to watch for the strange plants that would spring up from the ground in those spots where his blood had fallen. The father did so, and found the Hayari. 11. The Spirits of the Mountain Their presence due mainly to, peculiarities in geological conformation, markings, etc., 171, for example, in Legend of Kaider Fall, 172, Rock Engravings, 173. Actual transformation of sentient beings into rocks and stones, 174, site of some long past remarkable occurrence, 175 to 176. 171. The belief on the part of the Indians in the presence of mountain spirits in certain localities would seem to have been due in large measure to one or another of three sets of causes, peculiarities in conformation, marking, position and other features of the rocks, on the principle of suiting a picture to the frame. The supposed transformation of the person or animal into stone, 
or the association of the locality with some remarkable event that took place in the long ago. There are an endless number and variety of spirits connected with mountains, precipices, rocks, cataracts, etc., cf. sect. 58. South of the Takuta River is a mountain chain taking its name from a hill resembling a crescent in the distance, whence the Wapazianas have compared it to the moon, Kaira in their language, and designating it in consequence Kaiirite. Or Mountains of the Moon, SCT, 48. Now all this country in Skomberg's time was terra incognita to both Brazilians and Indians, and hence, as might have been expected, and as he tells us, the Indian banishes all evil spirits to this region. While the Brazilian considers it the abode of wild Indians who massacre any person foolhardy enough to come within their precincts. So extraordinarily has nature molded her mountain forms in different parts of the Guianas, that there are seldom wanting resemblances, comparatively striking, to common everyday objects. I can quite sympathize with Skomberg when he so much regretted that the little knowledge which he possessed of the Makusi language did not permit him to understand some of the many wonderful stories the Indians had to tell him of every stone they met on the road that was of more than ordinary size or fantastically shaped by nature, S.C.F. 199. Along the valley of the Unamara, a very good example is Mara Achiba, the highest mountain, where the bulging out in the middle of this mass of rock has been identified with the Maraca. Another is Mount Kanuyepiapa, lit. Guava tree stump, while a third is Mount Pure Piapa, headless tree, SCF, 197. Elsewhere, there is Mount Pakaraima, a singular isolated mountain which from its figure, has been called the Pakara or Pakal, meaning a basket, SCF, 221. Mount Sororiang, the Swallow's Nest, an object of much dread to the superstitious, is another good instance, BW, 177. The Takwiari offset of the Twasinki Mountains, Essequibo, derives its Carib name from a remarkable pile of large granite boulders so placed as to resemble a water jar, called Kamuti by the Arawak Indians. And by this name they are more commonly known, SCR, I, 328. Iankana Mountain can be seen in the distance from the upper Mazaruni, forming a most singular picture. The word means, lice searchers, this disagreeable name being bestowed on account of a row of huge pointed rocks on the crest, which are sharply defined against the sky, and to the Indian eye resemble a row of women seated one behind the other. Searching each other's head for vermin, a custom very prevalent among all Guiana tribes, bro, 390. It must be admitted that such fancied resemblances are not always too clear to European eyes. Clear or not, however, once the resemblance admitted, then follow the explanation and the padding, the pointing of the so-called moral to adorn the tale. Waikapiapa Mountain, northwest of Roraima, is the felled tree which, as the Indians say, the spirit Makanema cut down during his journey through these parts. On the Mazaruni, near Masanasa village, relates Bottom Wetham, we passed a peculiar rock in the middle of the river somewhat resembling a human figure, the Indians thought it was a river god watching for Pakyu, BW, 179. On some granite blocks, above the Warapita Rapids, Essequibo River, I found, says Skomberg, two impressions of a man's foot, as if he had sprung from one rock to the other. The imprint of each foot, even to that of the five toes, was really striking. The Indians told us that these were the tracks which the Great Spirit had left behind when he took his departure along this route from among their forefathers with whom he used to live, SCR, I, 326. In passing the Karawaring, branch of the Upper Mazaruni, the guide informed us that when high it is navigable for canoes for half a day's journey up, to the foot of a high fall, at which there is a large sand beach. Marked with mysterious footprints resembling those made by the human foot. The sand also is thrown up as if children had been playing there. If the Indians who visit the spot trample down these heaps, and go away for a short time, on their return they find them there again as before. The Indians believe that wild men live near the spot, but have never succeeded seeing them. Bro, 385. The torrential streams which so suddenly gush down from the heights of Roraima are but the sorrowful tears of the mother of Pia and Makanema, she who had been left behind on top of this mountain by the former, de, 
342. At least that is what the Makusis affirm. Some people say that over the tops of Roraima and Kukanam are spread seas filled with all kinds of fish, especially dolphins, and continually circled by gigantic white eagles, which act as perpetual watchmen, SCR, 2, 265. 172. Another example of this series of cases is the legend relative to the calibrated Kaider Fall, PL. 4, which I give here in the words of Barrington Brown, bro, 214, the discoverer of this wonder spot. Once upon a time there was a large village above the fall, situated on the little savanna, amongst the inhabitants of which was an old Indian. Who had arrived at that period of human existence, when his life had become a burden to himself and a trouble to his relatives. Amongst other duties, there devolved upon his near relations the tedious one of extracting the jiggers from his toes which there accumulated day by day. These duties becoming irksome at last, it was arranged that the old man should be assisted on his way to his long home, that spirit land lying two days' journey beyond the setting sun. He was accordingly transferred, with his peg all of worldly goods, from his house to a wood skin on the river above the head of the great fall, and launched forth upon the stream. The silent flood bore him to its brink, where the rushing waters received him in their deadly grasp, bearing his enfeebled body down to its watery grave in the basin below. Not long after, strange to relate, his wood skin appeared in the form of a pointed rock, which to this day is seen not far from our lower barometer station. While on the sloping mass of talus to the west of the basin, a huge square rock is said to be his petrified pegal or canister. Thus has the fall been named Kaider in memory of the victim of this tragic event. 173. The remarkable petroglyphs, scattered through the Guianas, to which so many travelers have drawn attention, are in the same way credited with a supernatural origin. Thus Scomberg relates, when at the Warapita Rapids, I was most anxious to carry away part of one of the rocks. And neither threats nor promises could induce any of our Indians to strike a blow against these monuments of their ancestors' skill and superiority. They ascribed them to the Great Spirit, and their existence was known to all the tribes met with. The greatest uneasiness was depicted upon the faces of our poor crew, in the very abode of the spirits, they momentarily expected to see fire descend to punish our temerity, SCG, 275. The Piapocos of the lower Guavia River ascribe such rock gravings to their Mamminimus, or water spirits, CR, 525, 529. The amount of intelligence displayed by the expression of such a belief was however, within comparatively recent times, paralleled by that of a European power, for on the Montaigne d'Argent on the coast between Cayenne and the river Oyapoc. The rock carvings were claimed by the Portuguese to represent the coat of arms of Charles V when they had a dispute with the French over their boundary line, CR, 145. 174, the existence has been shown, sect. 58, of a belief in the origin of human and animal life from rocks or stones and in the transformation of such sentient beings into the inorganic material similar to that from which they have sprung. This transformation is regarded not only as a natural departure from the normal course of events, but also in the light of a punishment, sect. 67. At Aramaica, a settlement on the Mazaruni, close to Karamang River, the cliffs of Marabayacra become visible to the height of about 1,000 feet, with perpendicular faces on the north. A remarkable detached peaked rock on the western face of the cliffs is called the Carabas. The legend says it is a man of that nation turned into stone for attempting to scale the cliff, Hia, 32. The nation of stone adzes, where all the people are really stones, has been mentioned, sect. 158. But however produced, these inorganic objects with human instincts, powers, and ideas, so to speak, all play a more or less important part on the world stage. Thus, a rugged rock, a real good friend, comes and quells the fountain which threatens to overwhelm the nation. In those cases in which the transformation is the result of punishment it might only be expected that the propensities of such rocks and stones would be directed into channels other than good. Perhaps it was some idea similar to this which led to the loss of Skomberg's geological specimens, one of the Indian carriers said he had lost my geological specimens, 
my brother had previously warned me of this, the Indian thinks it something evil. And will secretly throw it away, SCR, 433. The same may possibly be said of the following, above the cataracts of the river Demerary are abundance of red and white agates, which remain untouched by the natives, who avoid them from a principle of superstitious veneration. As they are dedicated to the service of their magical invocations, Ba, 21. Probably some idea of this nature may form the basis of the practice noted by Brown, in the Katinga district, in connection with certain small artificial stone heaps on the sides of the paths over the Savannah Mountains. These were three or four feet in height. The Indians with him, in passing, had added to the heaps by dropping on them stones picked up nearby, he could never learn their object in so doing, for when questioned about it, they only laughed, bro, 276. In the Gran Chaco, the Indians, on going over a pass, will place a stone on the ground, so that they will not get tired on the way, nor, 12, dot. 175. Again, just as in the old world, the scene of some tragedy, apparition, or of any untoward event, real or imaginary, may ultimately assume by the addition of tale and fable a halo of reputed sanctity. So may many a local feature of natural scenery in the Guianas constitute the landmark as it were of some notable occurrence, a death, a bloody feud. The appearance perhaps of some extraordinary animal, with the result that such a spot becomes weird and eerie, and all kinds of fanciful stories are told in connection with its immediate neighborhood. The Indians have a tradition that the cliffs, hillocks, and other places, about a mile from Kiowa on the Corentine are inhabited by a large snake, which from time to time goes to drink the water of the river. And that its passage thither has deprived the cliffs of vegetation, SCC, 289. On a low hill above the Wakewa River, a branch of the Katinga, Barrington Brown, observed a huge artificial mound of earth and small stones, which the guide said was the grave of Makunema's brother. It would seem that the Great Spirit is a dweller in this region, for an isolated rocky mountain, seen from the Katinga lower down, at the head of the Motsi River, is called Makunema Auda, which me ans the Great Spirit's house, bro, 276. In the Pacaraima Mountains there is a singular rock called by the Makusis to Panago, from its resemblance to a hand. The Indians make it the seat of a demon and pass it under fear and trembling, SCG, 256. At the Marum Escarpment, Upper Mazaruni, says Brown, the Indians begged my men not to roast salt fish on the embers, fearing thereby to rouse the ire of a large eagle and kamudi snake, which they said lived on the mountainside. And would show their displeasure by causing more rain to fall, bro, 399. According to the tale told by a medicine man, Mount Roraima was guarded by an enormous kamudi, which could entwine a hundred people in its folds. He himself had once approached its den and had seen demons running about as numerous as quails, B.W., 225. Another Indian in the same neighborhood objected to camping near what he believed to be the cave of a celebrated water mama, near which it was dangerous to sleep, B.W., 210. 176. Sometimes the facts of the original occurrence have been lost sight of and only a memory remains, but this memory is grafted on the minds of the Indians apparently in the form of a spirit. If we are to judge by the procedures adopted on their visiting such localities, these must neither be approached too closely, nor pointed to and sometimes not even looked at, or spoken of. Although it is permissible to single out a person by a nod with the head, to point the finger at a fellow creature is to offer him as serious an affront as it would be to step over him when he is lying on the ground, sect. 72. In the latter case he would tell you that he is not dead yet, and that you must wait until he is. To point the finger at a spirit must necessarily be a much more serious matter. We have the old man's rock in the Essequibo, which a murdered Bakin continually haunts, and at which it is dangerous to point the finger, a, I, 93. So also, there is a large bare rock, the Negro Cap, standing with its head about six feet above the water, close to the Three Brothers Islands, in the same river, concerning which the natives entertain a most curious superstition. They believe that if any individual points at this rock a heavy storm will immediately overtake him for his audacity, STC, 2, 
37. The dangers consequent upon talking about spirits have already been dealt with, sect. 124, hence the following allusion from Imthern is of interest, in very dry seasons, when the water in the rivers is low, the rocks in their beds are seen to have a curious glazed, vitrified and black appearance. Due probably to deposits of iron and manganese. Whenever I questioned the Indians about these rocks, I was at once silenced by the assertion that any allusion to their appearance would vex these rocks and cause them to send misfortune, it. 354. The most curious, however, of all the procedures indicative of a spirit's presence somewhere in the immediate neighborhood is that which concerns the sense of sight. Several examples of this temporary occlusion of vision are recorded elsewhere, sect. 252. 12. The Spirits of the Water. Names and General Appearance, Anthropomorphic, 177, Partly Human, Partly Animal, 178, Zoomorphic, As Porpoise, Manati, Macaw, 179, Snake, 180, Big Fish, Omar, 181 to 182, Derived from Men or Animals, 183. Kindly disposed on the whole, they gave man his water jug and potato, 184, the rattle and tobacco, 185, of an amorous disposition, 186 to 187, with strong likings for menstruating women, 188 to 189. Share, with bush spirits, the responsibility for sickness, accident, and death, 190, responsible also for the tidal wave, 191, they object to mention of their names and antecedents, 192. To a pot spoon being washed outside the traveling boat, 193, and woe betide the voyager if he dares to utter certain forbidden words, 194. 177. The water spirits, whether anthropomorphic or zoomorphic, are known as Oriyu or Orei, Arawak, Hoorani, Warau, Okoyuma, Carib, etc. The Waraus, especially a swamp inhabiting tribe, seem to have made several distinctions in their spirits, they had their Ahuba, Hoinara or Hoorani, and Nabarau or Nabarani. The Ahuba is the fish mama, the chief of all the fish, one male and one female. The two live in underground water. Their heads are like those of people, but their bodies resemble those of fish though they are provided with all the different kinds of feet belonging to land animals. They work evil on mankind, when shipwreck takes place they eat the bodies. The Hoinara and Nabarau represent the water spirits of the sea and the rivers, respectively, they are sometimes like people, sometimes like fish, and were once good and kind, but the Waraus have made them bad. Indeed, there was a time when these water people used to live in amity and friendship with the land people. There are two reasons for the termination of this ideal state of existence. The Waraus used to exchange wives with them in those days, that is, a wife would be taken as required alternately from the one and the other tribe, see sect. 190. The Warau supply ran short, however, and the water spirits accordingly became vexed and angered with them. The second alleged reason is that the Waraus insisted on the isolation of the women at their menstrual periods, a practice to which the water spirits were unaccustomed and strongly objected, sect. 190. Though some of the water spirits have been repeatedly described by certain authors as the water mama, they have nothing whatever to do with the African Creole superstition represented under that designation. Still less have they necessarily any connection with the water cow or Manati, the Cuyamoro of the Arawaks, or with the water Camudi, the Madre del Agua of the old Spanish authors. Except of course in the possibility that the physical attributes and peculiarities of these and other huge creatures have had to be accounted for in the Indian cosmogony. The natives of the Amazon's country have their Maidiagoa, mother or spirit of the water, the shape of a water serpent said to be many score fathoms in length. A monster doubtless suggested by the occasional appearance of the anaconda, Unex murinus, which assumes a great variety forms, HWB, 236. One of the many mysterious tales told of the Buddha, as the large dolphin of the Amazons is called, was to the effect that a Buddha once had the habit of assuming the shape of a beautiful woman, with hair hanging loose to her heels. 
and walking ashore at night in the streets of EGA to entice the young men down to the water. If anyone was so much smitten as to follow her to the waterside, she grasped her victim round the waist and plunged beneath the waves with a triumphant cry, HWB, 309. The accounts of these water folk vary a great deal, but I believe the following represents the consensus of Arawak opinion. The Aureus always live in the water and one at least accompanies every choreal. If an accident takes place the spirit is blamed for it. These spirits may appear in human shape, impersonating both sexes. The female sometimes can be seen bathing on the banks of a stream, or combing her long hair with a silver comb, which she occasionally forgets and leaves behind in her hurry to return to the water when suddenly surprised. 178. Oriyu sometimes splashes and tramples the water like a horse where horses are known not to exist. Brett even goes so far as to tell us that, she sometimes presents herself above the water with the head of a horse or other animal as it may suit her fancy, or the object she has in view, br. 367. On the other hand, I have often heard her or him described by Warows as having a fish's head. Brett as a matter of fact always speaks of Oriyu as a female. Of remaining water people those mentioned by M. Thurn as the Huroni, cf. The Warow term Horani, water spirits in general, a tribe of Indians living beyond the Pakarima, mountains, who are men by night, but fish by day, etc., it. 384, will doubtless remind the reader strongly of the Huri fish story, sect. 152. People may actually be transformed into fish, sect. 115. The Piapokos of the Lower Guavir, a branch of the Orinoco, have a belief in evil spirits who live by day at the bottom of the water, but emerge at night, when they walk about, screaming like little children they call these spirits Mominimus. And consider that the various rock carvings are their handiwork, cr. 525, 529. Endowed with somewhat similar habits there must be included here the water people mentioned by Brown, bro, 247, who apparently received his information from the Taromas of the Upper Essequibo. And by Cravo, 274, who derived his from the Indians of the Upper Peru, in the far eastern Guianas. The former tells us that the Tunahayanas, or water people, are said to live more to the south, near the headwaters of the Trombetish River, in Brazil. These have ponds encircled by stockades, to which they retire for the night, sleeping with their bodies submerged. The latter authority states that, on a march of four days to the westward, we would meet some very bad Indians whom it would be impossible to take by surprise because they plunged in a stream called by the same name, Peru as that which we were now on. Let us note in passing that Tuna signifies water not only amongst the Taruma, but also in the language of the Trios, Rokoyens, Apolli, Carijonas, the Caribs of the Antilles call water tone. Perhaps these water people were undergoing a gradual transformation before reaching the final change with advancing European civilization, after the style of the Partamonas at Waipa village on the Irang who stated that it was currently reported among the surrounding inhabitants that now that a white man had come among them, their country would sink under water, bro, 283. 179, when zoomorphic the water spirit may take on the form of a porpoise, Manati, sect. 183, macaw, snake, or fish. Thus, the Pomeroon Arawaks believe in the Kasikuhuha, a white or a black variety of porpoise, the latter will hunt and injure a person who happens to fall into the water. Whereas the white species will save one from drowning and carry him to shore. All that one has to do is to jump on the spirit's back, it will do the rest and will always help anyone who is not afraid of it. Karokia, on the Demerara River, is a place avoided by the Indians, water mamas in this place take the form of huge scarlet macaws, which rise out of the river and drag them beneath the water, wood skins and all, Key, 179. On the Maruka River an old Warao Pi friend of mine told me that it is the macaw who tells the Hoarani to come and upset the canoe, as well as to destroy the occupants, the bird itself may also assist directly in the work of destruction. 180. The Caribs talk of their Okoyumo being like a Kamudi snake, but much bigger, it lives in underground water, in habitat, 
it corresponds closely to the variety of water spirit which the Waraos call a huba. In cases of snake bite among certain tribes, in addition to any other treatment the bitten person must neither drink water, bathe, nor come into the neighborhood of water, during the period immediately following the accident, cf sect. 317, the same prohibition, for a similar period, is incumbent on his children, his parents, and his brothers and sisters so long as they reside in the same settlement. His wife alone is free from the taboo, SCR, 2, 130. The freedom of the woman from such an inconvenience is interesting when regarded in conjunction with the belief in human milk as an efficacious antidote for snake poison. 181. Of water spirits in the form of fish I must note the omars, of which, so far as the name is concerned, the only record I can find is given by Anthurn. These are beings. With bodies variously described as like those of exaggerated crabs and fish, who live under water in the rapids, and often drag down the boats of the Indians as they shoot these places. A story was told me at Uropakari Fall on the Essequibo. This Omar used to feed on rotten wood, and he dragged down many boats merely in mistake for floating logs, but all the same the Indians were drowned. So one day an Akawoy Piamon carefully wrapped up two pieces of the wood with which fire is rubbed, so that no water could make them damp. Then he dived down into the middle of the falls, and got into the belly of the Omar. There he found whole stores of rotten wood. So he set fire to this. Then the Omar, in great pain, rose to the surface, belched out the Piamon and died. IT, 385 I do not know whether this author was aware that Omar is the Arawak term for that terrible little fish, the Pyrae, whose peculiarly destructive powers would constitute a capital groundwork on which to weave fabulous embellishment. Though there is a suspicion that the word is but a play on the word Jonah, the exploits of these extraordinary individuals being so closely parallel. 182, I obtained a somewhat similar story from the Waraos of the Maruka River. The PIAI in the water spirit's belly, W. Plenty of men would go fishing down the river, but every now and again one of their number would disappear, a Hoarani, one of the water spirits, caught him. It caused the son of the local PI to exclaim, Whatever can be the matter with the stream? Friends of mine go regularly to fish, and just as regularly does one of them disappear. Traveling to the particular spot where the alleged accident always took place, he himself was caught and taken away by Hoarani. It was now the turn of the P.I. to say, I will go to the place where my son disappeared, and wise in his generation he carried with him, in his corial, banner posts, firewood, and fire. Before taking his departure he warned his wife that perhaps Hoarani would swallow him also, but that if not, she might expect him to return within a month. He traveled down the stream, and turning a point, his boat was suddenly engulfed within the open jaws of the water spirit there lying in wait, boat, posts, firewood, and fire were all swallowed with him. When at last the P.I. caught himself, i.e. came to his senses, he was in complete darkness, so after lighting his fire, he began to make himself comfortable and set up his banab, by sticking the half-dozen rods in regular sequence deep into the water spirit's belly. Hoarani naturally experienced acute pain and went to consult a P.I. friend of his who, however, could give him no relief, but advised him to go elsewhere. The sufferer therefore visited another medicine man, who told him practically the same thing, I cannot help you. It is just what you can expect for treating people of my profession in the way you do. As a last resource he went to a third doctor, of even greater renown than the others, but by this time the P.I. within was making the pains ten times worse, with the heaping up of the firewood on the lighted fire, and the sticking in of the posts around. All the consolation he got was, there's nothing to cure you. It is all your own fault and you must die. Hoarani accordingly considered it time to retrace his journey and make haste homeward. The pains becoming so strong, he raised himself out of the water just as a fish does when he becomes poisoned with the hyari root and, rising to the surface, gasps for breath. The P.I. inside kept a sharp lookout, and when Hoarani gasped, he recognized an immense sheet of water which showed that they were still far away out at sea. 
In a little while the water spirit gasped again, and the P.I. could just see a small bush in the far, far distance. On the third occasion he recognized clearly the trees, and taking the next opportunity of Hoorani rising to the surface, he shoved himself and his coriol out of the creature's jaws and hastened home. When he saw his wife, all he could say was, I am come only to show myself, for what with all the heat, my hair is dropping off and I must die. And he did die soon. Several of the water spirits used to be bad, like the one we have just been talking about, but fortunately for us present warhouse, our ancestors killed most of them, and this is the reason they are so scarce now. 183. Some of these water spirits have been derived from human mortals as well as from animals. In connection with the following story see sect. 162d. Sisters Porpoise and Essiecau, Menatus. A. Once there were two sisters who had a bush cow, Taper, for a sweetheart, he used to live with both of them. They had a habit of regularly going to their field, collecting the plums, hobu, of which their lover was so fond, and making drink from them, when it was ready they whistled for him to come. They whistled by putting their fingers into their mouths and blowing. They did this every day. Their brother in the meantime had his suspicions as to what was going on, so one day he followed them, and without being himself seen watched everything that took place. He said nothing, but returned home. Soon afterward the two girls went to a field other than that which they hitherto had been in the habit of visiting, in order to dig cassava. The brother seized the opportunity of visiting the place where the Maipuri lived and where the plums were. Having arrived there, he whistled as the girls used to do, and as soon as the creature put in an appearance, he shot him with his arrow, he then cut the body into pieces, which he scattered. Next morning the girls went as before to the old place to make the plum drink, and when it was ready, they whistled. But no Maipuri came. They whistled again, and still their lover came not. Tired of whistling, they commenced a search in order to disover what had happened to him. It was not long before they found the place where the slaughter had taken place, and soon they came upon the mangled remains. They both began to cry and determined upon throwing themselves into the water. This they did. One sister turned into a manati, and the other into a porpoise. Others again may claim genealogical relations with a totally different beast. On the left bank of the Pomeroon, just above the mouth of Wakapoa Creek, is a place where the water used to be generally on the bubble, this is believed to be the spot where some gigantic salapentas, lizards, after being vanquished by the Indians threw themselves into the river and became Aureus. 184. Certain of the water spirits are of a kindly nature, in the sense of having conferred gifts and blessings on mankind, sect. 185. In saving men from drowning, sect. 179. And in other ways. The Fulshermen's Water Jug and Potato, A. There was once a fisherman who went fishing daily, and whose catch was invariably large. One day, when out in his coriol something pulled at his line but he missed it, three or four bites followed, yet he caught nothing. Once more he tried. Something tugged at the hook. He hauled in the line, and what should he drag up to the surface but Oriyu herself. There she was, the real spirit of the water, with all her beautiful hair entangled in the line. It was but the work of a minute to get her into his boat, and she was indeed beautiful to look upon. So beautiful was she that he carried her home to his mother, and made her his wife, the only condition that Oriyu stipulated being that neither her prospective husband nor her mother-in-law should ever divulge her origin. Being so accustomed to the water, Oriyu proved an excellent helpmate, out she would go with her husband, in his boat, and look into the depths for fish. These she could see when no one else could, and she would advise him not to throw his line in here, but over there, and so on. And thus day after day they returned home, always bringing the old mother-in-law plenty of fish. As you can well imagine, this happiness did not last very long, it came to an end through the old woman, when in liquor, loosening her tongue and letting out the secret of Oriyu's origin. Oriyu said nothing at this time, so grieved she was, but she waited her opportunity to take her husband with her to her former home under the waters. 
So on the next occasion that the crabs began to march from out the ocean to the shore, the family made up a large party, and all took their places, with their quakes, in a big choriel. As they were coming down the river, Oriyu all of a sudden told her companions that she and her husband were about to pay a visit to her people below, but that they would not be gone long. And that in the meantime she would send up something for them to eat and drink, but they must share everything fairly. Without more ado she and her man dived into the water. After a while up came a large jar of kasiri, and a lot of potatoes, a very welcome addition to the few provisions they had on board. When they had each had their fill of the kasiri, and had eaten the potatoes, they threw the jug and the useless skins back into the water. Where the oriyu turned the former into the giant lolo, salurus, and the latter into the squatty little emiri, siadaicthes. This is why we old Arawaks always speak of the Lolo as the fisherman's water jug, and of the Amiri as his potatoes. 185. Brett mentioned certain other good qualities of the Aureus. Out on one of the islands all the men, women, and children were struck down with sickness. Arawanali, C.F. Hariwali, sect. 3. The island chieftain, begged Oriyu for some charm to withstand the evil spirit's power which had made his people sick. She gave him the branch of an Ida tree, which she told him to go and plant, and to bring back to her the first fruit that should fall from it. This turned out to be a calabash, crescentia, with which he did what he was told. Having emptied the rind through certain holes cut in in it, she provided him with the feathered handle, and dived into the sea whence she brought the shining white stones to put into it, with these she thereupon showed him how to invoke the spirits. Thus was the first maraca, rattle, formed. Besides this, she taught Arawanali the use of tobacco, till then unknown to man. 186. Like the spirits of the forest, the Aureus have strong sexual predilections. Every night, in their anthropomorphic form, both males and females may come after Indians of the opposite sex respectively, and no disastrous result follows the intimacy. 112. But the Indians who happen to have such dealings must keep the fact absolutely secret if divulged, either they will not live long, or they will never be visited again by their spirit friends. Furthermore, those Indians who foster such friendships must on no account have similar dealing with their own people. 113 Perhaps it is as a result of these sexual weaknesses of the spirits that some of the Arawaks believe in the possibility of an Oriyu introducing into the womb a full-term fetus, provided the woman really wants to be pregnant, sect. 284a a real water baby. 187. How the water spirit got the man's wife from him, W. A man took his wife with him on a fishing expedition. He built a banab on an island in midstream and as night came on told his wife to remain there, while he went to fish. She was very anxious to accompany him in the choriel, but he insisted on her remaining and of course she had to obey. Being very tired, she soon afterward fell asleep, and about midnight the water spirit paid her a visit. Half dazed, she woke up, and asked him whether he had done anything to her, and when he told her that he had, recognizing a stranger's voice in place of her husband's, she felt very much ashamed. However, the water spirit told her who he was, of his great love for her, and that he would now take her to wife, all she had to do was to tell her previous husband that it was entirely his fault that she had been left alone and taken advantage of and that henceforth she declined to share his hearth and home. So when the latter returned next morning from his fishing, the wife made a clean breast of everything, for which she blamed him, as he had refused to let her accompany him in the choreo. And she told him further that she intended living with him no more. They started now on their way home, and getting into the boat, they paddled a short distance, when the wife said, After today you will not see me. You must tell all my family to meet me tomorrow at a spot that I will show you. As they traveled along, she showed him the very spot and at the same moment the boat stopped, just as if someone were holding it. She got out, the water coming up to her knees, and the choriel continued on its journey. After a while the husband turned around to have a look, and saw his wife with another man, the water spirit, just stepping ashore, as he turned the point, the couple were walking together along the river bank. Now, when he reached home without his wife, all her people wanted to know what had become of her. 
The mother especially was angry, but became somewhat mollified when he assured her that next day he would take her to the very place where her daughter had left him. He also gave her a message from his late wife that she was to bring the silver nose ornament and the bead bracelets and necklets which the latter had left behind. So on the following morning he took the mother down to the river bank, and there sure enough they saw the guilty couple, the daughter and the water spirit, behaving in a very friendly manner. As they got quite close, the spirit suddenly disappeared, leaving the woman by herself. The mother then handed over the beads and ornaments, while her daughter murmured, your son-in-law caused this trouble, he would not let me come into the choreo with him, and so when I was fast asleep the water spirit took advantage of me. Mother and daughter sobbed, and the latter said, you will see me sometimes, but never distinctly, directly you think you see me clearly, I will disappear. No one knew at the time that the water spirit had taken advantage of the man also, but it was this spirit who had made the husband refuse to let his wife keep him company in the choreo, so as the better to carry out his wicked design. 187a. How the water woman secured a landsman for husband, w. A choreo full of men were paddling down the river to catch crabs. They reached the sea, and while hunting in and among the bushes one of the party heard a noise behind him, and turning around was much surprised to see a young woman there, and still more so when he heard her say, Brother. I am come. 114 My father sent me to you to give me a quake of crabs. Having handed them over to her, she paid him with the loan of her body. Before taking her departure she told him that, while the boat containing him and his friends would be passing up the creek on the way home, it would suddenly stop of itself in a certain spot, he was then to jump into the water and join her. And she would bring him to his own home later on. This is exactly what did occur. When the man and his friends had filled their quakes and boarded the choreo, he told them that he had acted in an evil way to a girl among the crab bushes, and that when the boat suddenly stopped of its own accord, he would have to jump out. But that he would join them later on. After a while the choreal suddenly came to a standstill, our friend jumped out, and his friends left him standing in the water where the girl was holding him up. They reached home at last, and on arrival at the landing place their women were waiting to carry the crabs up to the house. The one who was disappointed at not seeing her husband asked what had become of him. They told her that he had acted wrongly with a girl, and that they had left him behind. In the meantime the erring spouse was taken by the Hoorani girl, sect. 177, to her people below, and her father told him that he had been sent for because his daughter wanted him. But he added, you can go home to your own people this very day, and enjoy the feast of crabs that you and your friends have been gathering. I make only this one condition. If there is any disturbance or fighting at the sport, you must come back here at once, otherwise, you may remain with your own people, and we will not trouble you further. I am sending both my daughters with you. And so it came to pass that the two girls took him to his own landing place, and when they got near, they told him to shut his eyes. As soon as he opened them again he found himself on land, close to his house. He entered, and telling everyone, how day, sat down, his wife brought him food and drink. But as the evening progressed, the people all began to be quarrelsome in their cups, with the result that his brothers-in-law, sisters-in-law, and wife all threatened to beat him for sporting with the strange girl. This was quite enough for him. He rushed out of the place right back to the landing, where the two water women were awaiting him, and who asked why he was not enjoying himself at the party. But when he told them how his people had commenced to interfere, and had threatened to beat him, they took him back into the water, where the old Hoorani father said, Take my two daughters to wife. 188. These water people have great liking for women at the menstrual period, so much so that, at such a time, no Carib, Akawai, Warao, or Arawak woman will travel by boat or even cross water. The moon sick girl and the water spirit, c. A young girl had reached the age when she was developing certain signs indicative of approaching womanhood. Her mother went as usual to work in the field, but on her return was much surprised to see neither daughter nor house, and in place of the latter a large sheet of water. She said that Okoyumo must have carried her girl away, and began to weep. When her husband later on came back from the chase, she told him that Okoyumo had swallowed her daughter, 
and this news upset him much. I do not want to live without my girl, he cried. Okoyumo must swallow me also, and so saying, he jumped into the flood. The spirit of the water, however, did not want to punish him, and so would not let him drown, but just made him float level with the surface. He of course could not be sick in the same way as the girl. It is the scent of a woman's sickness when in that condition that makes her so attractive to Okoyumo. 189. The Moon Sick Girl and the Water Spirit, W. There was once a little girl by the riverside catching fish with a cassava sifter. She caught one little fish entirely different from anything she had ever seen. It was so pretty, with beautiful eyes, and a slim body, covered with red spots. What a pretty fish you are, she exclaimed, I must really keep you all for myself. So she put it alive in water in her calabash and took it home, where she dug a little hole near the house. Into this hole she poured water, and there she placed the fish. Then she tended it, and strange to say the water never dried up. The fish gradually grew bigger and bigger, and when it had arrived at a good size, its guardian, who had already entered womanhood, took it down to the waterside just where she used to bathe. There she set it free. As soon as she got into the water, it would approach and nestle quite close to her. The mother often saw it swimming about there, and would often warn her daughter that it was not a real fish, but something else, and when it got very big, she recognized it as the Hoarani, or the water spirit. Then she warned her girl especially to keep out of the stream when she was moonsick. Don't go anywhere near the water until so many days are past, the mother repeated. But her advice was not heeded, and the young woman, although sick, insisted next day on bathing. As soon as she touched the fish, as had hitherto been her wont, it became much excited, and instead of coddling up to her, swam zigzag around her. This was repeated three times, the fish meant to tell her that she must return at once to shore, but she evidently did not understand, because she touched it a fourth time. But on this occasion the water spirit swallowed her. The father was sorely grieved at this, and came and asked the Hoarani why he had treated his daughter in that shameful manner. But the latter defended himself by saying that she had insisted on bathing herself too soon after she had been moonsick, and that he had already warned her three times. So saying, the water spirit withdrew. When he was gone, the father exclaimed, As Hoarani has eaten my daughter, he must eat me too, I cannot rest until he does. Being a P.I., he knew where to find the water spirit, so collecting his relatives around him, he told them what he proposed doing, and that when they heard him blow his shell they must dig at the very spot indicated. With this, he dived into the water, right down below the river bank under an overhanging hill, straight into the underground cavern of the water spirit. And there Hoarani killed him, but before he died, he blew his shell. His friends heard him, and digging quickly, soon unearthed the pair. They killed the water spirit, and left his bones to rot. Some fifteen years ago, when I was so high, indicating his size, I saw the bones rotting on Wakapoa Creek, above where the mission now stands. Why was the P.I. killed? Because he ought not to have gone alone. When people start on such expeditions they should always have company. 190. Like the bush spirits, the denizens of the deep are in large measure responsible for the disease and sickness existent in the world, the Carib medicine man still invokes them, sect. 309. How Sickness and Death Came Into the World, W. 115. A man went fishing, and wished for a wife from among the water people, the Hoaranis. Every time he went to the water his heart yearned to see a water spirit, and one day, while fishing, one put in an appearance waist high above the surface, and came quite close. Would you like to take me home with you? Was the first question she asked him, and when he told her, yes, she clambered into his coriel, and he took her home. When they reached there she told him not to roast the moricot fish, my ladies, which he had caught, but to boil it, and impressed him that for the future he must never bring fish for her to eat, but only animals and birds. The next day she went with him in the coriel while he fished, and after a time got into the water and went deep down. After a while she came up to the surface again, with a message from her father, 
who said he would be very glad to welcome him below. The man was afraid to go, but the woman told him to have no fear as nothing would happen to him. Just to show that there was no danger she stood straight up in the water, which came to the level of her hips. Come along. Don't be frightened, she repeated, and so he jumped in close by her side. Saying that she was going to tie the boat up with a rope, she bent down and seizing the head of a big water kamudi, clamped its jaws on the gunwale. She now took the man's hand, and led the way below, as he sank below the surface he shut his eyes and opening them almost immediately afterward, found himself in the house of his father-in-law. The latter gave him a bench to sit on, which was really a large live alligator. This is how it has come to pass that we warows always use a bench carved in the likeness of that creature. When he had sat on it some time the old man said, I sent you my daughter for your wife, you must live a good life, and must now send down your sister for my son. This was all agreed to, and the man's hoarani wife brought him dry boiled meat and cassava, the eating done, she gave him to drink. When all was finished, she led him up to the surface again, they got into the coriol and reached his home once more. She then said to him, Remember, when I am moonsick you must not send me away to the Nibwomenoko, 116 but you must let me remain in the hut with you. In fact, if you insist on my going there I shall die, and if I die, my father will have a spite against you, and send you sickness and death. Now the Warau people were strongly averse to such a defiance of their long-established custom, and when the man's wife did at last become moonsick, the women insisted on her going into the Nibwomenoko. But they found her lying dead there the following morning. Placing her body in a hollowed-out piece of the palm, they put it on a sort of babbercoat under a banab, as the Warau's of the Orinoco treat the bodies of their dead. After a few days the widower went back to his usual fishing place, wishing he could see his wife again, but being unable to see her anywhere, he became exasperated and flung himself into the water. Sinking down in just the same spot as on the previous occasion. He reached the house, and there on the farther side lay his poor wife. She looked ill, indeed, she was quite dead. Her old father turned to him and said, Why didn't you listen to my daughter? Why didn't you do what she told you? You see how you have killed her. From now on sickness, accident, and death will come among your people from mine, and what is more, if any of your womenfolk travel on water while they are moonsick, sex. 188, 189, my people will draw their shadows. Sect. 253, 117 the man was much grieved to hear all this, and returned to his own home by the way that he had come. By and by he arranged with his friends and relatives to go to sea, never thinking of the warning which the water people had given him. They started in two big canoes and got out into deep water. So deep that to the Hoaranis at the bottom the corials looked like two parrots flying in the skies. Nevertheless, these water people shot at them with their round knobbed arrows, hit them, and both boats sank. When they got to the bottom, the water people put one of the canoes on each side of the old man's home and unchained their sharks, for these people keep sharks as we keep dogs, which tore to pieces the bodies of the already dead occupants of the two canoes. Before that time Warows never had accidents or death, they had only moon sickness. It was in this manner that the water people punished the Warows. 191. Not only are many of the troubles afflicting mankind, as just recorded in the legend, ascribable to the machinations of Oriyu, but he, or she, is held responsible for more than one natural phenomenon. The tidal wave, or bore, known as Apapuru, an Arawak term, on the Burbis and other streams, in certain of this colony's rivers is a case in point. Among the natives the popular explanation is that when this river becomes inconveniently low for the bad things of the deep, they show their uneasiness by moving furiously about, and thus agitate the river, the, 21. The several tribes on the coast, we learn from Dr. Hancock, usually give it some name, signifying, head of waters, or, mother of waters, and in connection with this have many strange stories to tell of the Lokakuhuha, people's spirit, mermaid. Or, watery mama, as they translate it, SCC, 288. Again, Waylakparu, a creek on the right bank of the Potaro, is so called from a part of the human body. And is believed to be the home of Oriyu, 
the turbulence of the water as it runs into the potaro is caused by water issuing from the body of that spirit. 192. The water spirits must not be talked about, nor may their names be mentioned. Amana and her talkative husband, C. Heated with the fumes and liquor of a big Paiwari feast, an Indian succeeded in making his way to the pond where he intended bathing his skin and getting cool. On arrival there, he was met by Amana, one of the Okoyumo nation, a very pleasant spoken woman, who asked him to join her in the water. He demurred at first, but what with her repeated requests coupled with the attractiveness of her physical charms, he ultimately consented. Even at the last moment, he said he felt sure that he would be drowned. But she promised to look after him and see that no harm befell. When they got below the surface, he saw a number of houses, plenty of people, and many young women, he felt quite content now, especially when the latter offered him drink. But Amana would have none of this, and took him straight away to her old father, who gave him welcome and instructed his daughter to look after him properly. And this she did. In the meantime the man's mother had missed him from the convivial gathering, and following his tracks, traced them to the water's edge, and there the tracks disappeared. My poor son, must have been drowned, she murmured, and proceeded to look for his floating body, but of course it was nowhere to be seen, and she mourned him a long time as dead. Thus, time slipped on, and the desire came on him to see his mother. So he visited her. After she had asked him where he had been in the meanwhile, he told her that he had been for a walkabout. This made the old woman say, Well, you must not go away again, because I am aged now and starving. I cannot depend on your little brother to support me, and you know I have no other children. But the man had a bad mind, and went back that very afternoon to his water spirit wife, and on this occasion remained with her even longer than he had done before. When at last he returned after his second absence, he found his mother and little brother drinking paiwari. The latter questioned him point-blank as to whether he was living with the Okoyumo people. This naturally made him extremely angry and, with a, how dare you ask me such a question, he hurried back to the water, where he remained a still longer period than that of his second absence. In the meantime Amana had borne him three children, and leaving the latter behind, he told his wife to accompany him on a visit to his mother. The couple on arrival found the old mother and her younger son again at a drinking party, but this time the son was absolutely drunk, and nothing would do but he must ask his elder brother as before whether he was living with the Okoyumo people. Yes, I am, replied the exasperated man, and this is my wife, Amana, one of that nation. Directly the woman heard this, she made all haste to the waterside, and jumped into the water, her husband in close pursuit. As soon as he got below her friends and relatives set on him and killed him for having mentioned her name and telling people who she was. 193. Besides their dislike to hearing mention of their names and antecedents, as well as their passion for menstruating women. It is interesting to note the strong objection of the water spirits to a pot spoon being washed outside of the traveling boat in either river or sea, sects. 214, 219. 194. The surest way of offending the water spirits, however, and thereby getting caught in a storm, and being capsized, wrecked, or drowned by way of punishment, is to utter certain words strictly forbidden under the circumstances. Thus, among the Arawaks of the Pomeroon and Morocco rivers, there are certain terms which must never be employed when on a boat, they have to be paraphrased. The majority of these tabooed words are evidently of foreign, mostly Spanish, origin, a few are certainly indigenous. Thus, the occupants of a corial will never be heard to use the term arcabuza, gun, but they will speak of a gun as cataroro, foot, referring to the stock, they talk of carrero, the one with the teeth, instead of pero, span, dog. Of conicarashiro, load on the head, the cock's comb, instead of gaiaina, span, galena, fowl, of aquadoacotiro, round foot, instead of kawaiyo, span, caballo, horse, of kakwaro, horn, instead of baka, span, vaca, cow. Of tataro, something hard, instead of serari, grindstone, or saw, probably from span sierra, of majariki, the untrimmed one, referring to the hair, instead of hoe, monkey. Of ahidoa, frothing, 
brimming over, in reference to its snarling or growling, instead of Aroa, tiger, of Katao Chi, the one with wisdom, instead of Semishishi, Meklesen man, etc. The Warhouse, it seems, had also various words strictly taboo when traveling by boat. The same holds good for Kayan, where the superstitious Indians take care not to speak of several things by their right names, thus, if one has to speak of a rock, it must be described as, that which is hard. If it is a lizard, they must similarly paraphrase by saying, that which has a long tail. It is dangerous also to name the streams and little islands that they pass en route. Even the medicine men may not be mentioned as such, infringement of this rule will cause at least rain to fall, without reckoning that one is exposed to shipwreck, together with the likelihood of some frightful monster rising from out the deep. And swallowing the whole lot, PBA, 184. Records have been left to us of similar practices by the Carib Islanders. When they have to cross the sea, upon approaching land, this must not be named or pointed out, but it can be noticed by shouting like a. It is there. BBR, 245. 13. The Spirits of the Sky. The sun, male, greeted of a morning, 195, eclipsed, 196, origin of his warmth and heat, 197. The moon, also male, cause of the th spots, 198, beliefs concerning the new moon, 199. When eclipsed, a transformation of animals occurs, 200, causes of eclipse, 201 to 202. Comets, 203. Stars, morning and evening, etc., 204, the Milky Way, 205, Southern Cross, 206, Babricote and Kamudi, 207. Pleiades, their story told by Arawaks, 208, Akaways, 209, Warhouse, 210, Caribs, 211, Orion's Belt, 211A. Other sky spirits derived from man, 212. The Woman of the Dawn, 212A. Rain, can be made as required, 213. Punishment for infringement of taboo, 214, can be stopped. 215, Rainbow, 216. Weather Forecasting, 217. Thunder and Thunderbolts, 218. Storms Generally, 219. 195, The Sun seems to have been regarded invariably as a male, sect. 29, The Salibas of the Orinoco, certainly a section of the tribe, claimed to be his children, g. i. 113. At Enemuda village, on a branch of the Irang, it would appear to be the usual practice for the Indians to issue simultaneously from their houses at daylight and greet the morn with cries and loud shouts, bro, 129. It was customary for the Otomacs to bewail the dead as a matter of daily routine. Thus, as soon as the cocks crow, about three o'clock in the morning, the air is rent with a sad and confused sound of cries and lamentations, mixed with tears and other appearances of grief. They mourn not by way of ceremony, but in very truth. When day breaks, the wailing ceases and joy reigns, g. i. 167. So also on the Vichava, a branch of the Orinoco, the Guahibos at sunrise come out with a panpipe and make the round of the village while playing on this instrument, but their purpose in doing so is not made clear, cr. 554. Among the Wapazianas of the upper Rio Branco, the first to awake strikes a drum until all jump out of their hammocks, and, in the meantime, with a quick step, he will promenade around the maloka with his barbarous music, Ku, 2, 268. With the island caribs the flute is ordinarily played in the morning when they rise, R.O.P., 509. 196. It is said by M. Thurn that on one occasion, during an eclipse of the sun, the Arawak men among whom he happened to be rushed from their houses with loud shouts and yells, they explained that a fight was going on between the sun and the moon. And they shouted to frighten and so part the combatants, I.T. 364. Brett speaks of Oroan 118 the great demon of darkness, who causes eclipses, he seizes the sun and strives to quench the fire, till scorched and blackened, he retires, only to return another time, BRB, 189. 
In Cayenne, eclipses of the sun and moon upset the Indians a good deal, they think some frightful monster has come to devour these heavenly bodies. If the eclipse is total or of short duration, they consider it a fatal thing for them, they make a terrible noise, and shoot a volley of arrows into the air to chase away the monster, PBA, 232. Island Caribs attribute the eclipses to Maboya, the devil, who tries to kill sun and moon, they say that this wicked seducer cuts their hair by surprise, and makes them drink the blood of a child, and that, when they are totally eclipsed. It is because the stars, being no longer warmed by the sun's rays and light, are very ill, t. 1886, p. 227. 197, The Story of Okeoche, W. 119. Wyamari was the name of a young fellow staying at the house of his uncle. One day he went down to the waterside to bathe. When in the water, he heard someone running down the pathway and then a splash. This made him look around, and, recognizing his uncle's young wife, he commenced swimming to a distance. But she chased him. The girl wanted him very much, and as she got close to the spot where he was, whispered, Don't you want me? Instead of replying quietly, however, Wyamari loudly upbraided her by shouting Bila. Quahoro. Incest. Shame, and the girl drew back. The uncle, hearing the noise up at the house, called out to his wife, What's the matter? Don't trouble the boy, because he thought that she must be at fault, and not his nephew. At any rate the couple got out of the water, and came up to the house, which the aunt entered, the boy passing on to go to stay with his elder uncle, Okohi, at whose place he slept that night. Now, the very fact of not going home as usual with his aunt made Wyamari guilty in the eyes of her husband, who followed his nephew next morning to Okohi's place. When he reached there, he reproached his nephew for having attempted improper conduct with his wife, a charge which was indignantly denied. At any rate, they started fighting and the uncle was thrown down. They fought again and the uncle was thrown a second time. Okohi now interfered, and said, Boy. That will do, and so stopped the contention between his brother and nephew. Indeed, to save further strife, Okohi thought it best to take Wyamari away with him on his journey, and told the youngster to prepare the wager, canoe, as he proposed leaving next morning. So Wyamari went down to the waterside and painted the sign of the sun on the bows of the boat, while at the stern he painted a man and a moon. One twenty next morning the two got away, the nephew paddling in the bow and the uncle steering, it was a big sea that they were crossing, and as the paddle blade swept along one could hear the water singing wow you. Wow you. Wow you. One twenty one at last they crossed this big sea and reached the opposite shore, where they landed, and then they went up to a house nearby, where they met a pretty woman, Asawako. 122 After greeting Okohi, and telling him to be seated, she asked him to let his nephew accompany her to the field, and, this permission being granted, the young couple started off. When they reached there Asawako told Wyamri to rest himself while she gathered something for him to eat. She brought him yellow plantains and pines, a whole bundle of sugar cane, some watermelons and peppers. He ate the lot and spent a very happy time with her. On the way back, she asked him whether he was a good hunter, he said never a word but stepped aside into the bush, and soon rejoined her with a quakeful of armadillo flesh. She was indeed proud of him, and resumed her place behind point 123 just before reaching home, she said, we are going to have drink when we get in. Can you play the Cahabasa, 124, yes, I can play it a little, was the reply. When they got back to her place Asawako gave him a whole jugful of drink all for himself, and this primed him for playing the music, and he played beautifully, making the Kahabasa sing Waru Hiru Ti. 1.25 they sported all night, and next morning Okohi made ready to leave. Of course poor Asawako wanted Wyamari to remain with her, but he said, No. I cannot leave my uncle. He has been good to me, and he is an old man now. So she began crying, and between her sobs told him how sad she felt at his going away. This made him feel very sorry also, and he consoled her by saying, Let us weep together with the Kahabasa. And there and then he sang Haruharu, etc. 
on the instrument, and thus comforted her before he left. Now when at last uncle and nephew got back to their own country, old Okohi bathed his skin, and after seating himself in his hammock, gathered all his family around and spoke to them as follows, when I was young. I could stand traveling day after day, as I have just done, but I am old now, and this is my last journey. So saying, his head burst, and out of it there came the sun's warmth and heat. 198. The moon also is clothed with male attributes, and among the tribes here dealt with, as is the case with many another savage race, is held responsible for certain conditions met with during the childbearing period of woman's life. I have heard the following tradition among both Arawaks and Waraos. How the moon got his dirty face. Long ago a brother and his sister were living by themselves. Every night after dark someone used to come and fondle and caress the sister, attentions which she was very far from being averse to, but she was very curious to discover who her unseen visitor was. She could never find out. She therefore blackened her hands one day with the soot from the bottom of the pepper pot, and when her lover came that evening, she smeared her hands over his face. 126 When day dawned she thus came learn that it was her own brother who had taken advantage of her. She was extremely angry, abused him roundly, and told the neighbors, who in turn spread the story of his conduct far and wide. The result was that everybody shunned him and he became at last so thoroughly ashamed of himself that he declared he would keep away from everyone, and live by himself. He is now the moon, and the marks which can still be recognized on his face are those which his sister imprinted with the soot, or blue paint, years ago. Even to this day women do not trust him, and no matter whether he is new, full, or on the wane. There will always be found somewhere a female who is in such a physiological condition as will preclude all possibility of the moon wishing to pay her a visit. 127. 199. A peculiar custom among the Makusis, practiced as soon as the new moon is visible, sect. 227. Is that of all the men standing before the doors of their huts, and drawing their arms backward and forward in its direction at short intervals, by this means they are strengthened for the chase. SCR, 2, 328. As soon as the new moon appears, they all run out of their huts and cry look at the moon. They take certain leaves, and after rolling them in the shape of a small funnel, they pass some drops of water through it into the eye, while looking at the moon. This is very good for the sight, BBR, 228. The first night of the incoming moon was considered the proper occasion for obtaining clay for the manufacture of pots and other utensils which, it was believed, would not speedily be broken, sect. 258. 200. With regard to the explanations given as to the nature of the eclipse of the moon, I have obtained the following at first hand from the Pulmaroon Arawaks. The phenomenon is due to its traveling along the sun's path, falling asleep, and so not being able to get out of the way quickly enough. With the object of awakening the moon members of this tribe strike drums, blow shells, and make a big noise generally, whenever the eclipse takes place. They must also keep themselves lively and active, and during the whole night must eat absolutely nothing, were they to break the fast, they would change into whatever animal or plant they might be eating, sect. 248. Indeed, it is a common belief among these people that, at the time of an eclipse, there is a constant change or transformation scene taking place on nature's stage, in both animal and vegetable kingdoms, owing to this cause. The transformation is not necessarily sudden but may take time. I can call to mind an old Arawak story of a hunter who had gone to visit one of the streams away back from the Maruka River, on the first occasion he sees a huge land kamudi. On the second, at the time of an eclipse, he finds the snake changed into a taper, and on the third he sees it swimming in the water as a manati. 201. As to the Orinoco Indian tribes, Camilla has left us some very interesting records concerning the eclipse of the moon. Some of these nations believed that it was about to die, others that it was angry with them, and that it would give them no more light. The Lolaka and Atabaca Indians held to the death theory, g. 2, 274, and were under the conviction that if the moon were indeed to die, all exposed fires would be extinguished. Their women, crying and yelling, an outburst in which the men joined, 
accordingly would each seize a glowing ember and hide it either in the sand or underground. Moved by their tears and entreaties, the moon however recovers, and the hidden fires are extinguished, but were he indeed to die, the concealed embers would remain alight. The Salivas had different views, g. 2, 277. All the warriors stand up in rows facing the moon, offering him their prowess and strength and entreating him not to leave them. The young men, of fifteen to twenty years of age, stand in two rows apart while certain old men roughly thrash them in turn with whips. Finally, the women, in a sea of tears bewail the moon's projected departure and fatal absence. The idea would seem to be that the moon has enemies whom, through fear, he is anxious to avoid, and he is therefore desirous of giving the benefit of his light to other nations. It is only the promises of these Indian warriors to fight in his favor which allay his fears, and hence there is no necessity for him really to take himself off. As soon as the Guayanas, g. 2, 278, recognize an eclipse of the moon, they take up the implements used in cultivating their fields. With much talk and gesticulation, some cut the undergrowth, others clear it, and others again dig up the ground, all of them loudly proclaiming that the moon has cause for being annoyed, and particularly good reason for forsaking them. Considering that they had never made a field for him. They accordingly beg him not to go, because they are now providing him with a field, in which they propose planting maize, cassava, and plantains. With these promises and entreaties they continue at their task, working on it with vigor so long as the eclipse lasts, and as soon as it is over, they return to their houses overjoyed. But there is no more working on the field in the moon's behalf until the next eclipse takes place. Among the Otomacs, g. 2, 279, when the event occurs, the husbands aimlessly take up their weapons, skip about, and yell beyond measure, stretch the arrow on the bow in sign of anger, and ask, beg, and implore the moon not to die. While they continue in their grief, the moon goes on diminishing and languishing. Recognizing from this that their actions are not understood, they run back to their houses, where they bitterly reproach their wives for not grieving over and bewailing the moon's sickness. The latter make not the slightest sign that they understand what is expected of them, and answer never a word. The men then change their tactics and start begging and beseeching their wives to cry and weep, so that the moon may revive and not die. Still the women act as if they do not understand what is besought of them. So the men give them presents, glass beads, monkey tooth necklaces, jewelry, and the like. The women now understand in truth, and saying many prayers soon make the moon shine as bright and clear as before, for doing which they earn their husband's gratitude. According to their idea it is the female voices that move the moon to take compassion on them, and save them from extinction. 202 the Yuxx River, Rio Negro, Indians believe that at an eclipse, Jurupuri, sect. 101, is killing the moon. They make all the noise they can to frighten him away, ARW, 348. So again, the island Caribs say that Maboya, sect. 84, is eating the moon on such an occasion, they dance all night, and rattle their calabashes with little pebbles inside, ROP, 461. Skomberg points out the curious fact that the Taruma word for a moon eclipse is Piwatoto, the literal translation of which is, Moon Earth, SCR, 2, 469. 203, any reference to comets in the Indian literature is extremely scarce. With regard to the one that was seen by Skomberg in the early forties, the Arakunas and Makusis regarded it as a sign of pestilence, famine, and disaster. One night they all emerged from their huts. Men, women, and children extended their arms expressive of supplication and beseeched it to leave the heavens, so that they should not come to grief under its influence. The Makusis called it Siepa Saima, fire cloud, or Wayanapsa, sun that throws its rays behind, the Arakunas gave it the name of Watema, and the Wapazianas Kapish, both terms signifying, spirit of the stars, SCR, 2, 308. The Pomeroon Arawaks speak of the present years, 1910, Halley's, Comet, simply as Waiwakihikoro, lit. Star tail with, but have no information to furnish concerning it. Among the island Caribs, Limakani is a comet sent by Koalina, 
the boss of the Kameens, i.e., familiar spirits, to cause evil when he is vexed, BBR, 231. 203a, in the Makusi legend of Murapayang, lit. Bat Mountain, one of the Pakarima range, the phenomenon is ascribed to an old woman carrying a fire stick under somewhat pathetic circumstances, Scombert tells the story. The Legend of Bat Mountain A long, long while ago, an immense bat lived on the mountain and spread fear and terror among the Makusis. As soon as the sun had sunk in the west, the huge creature left its unknown dwelling, swept down upon the happy homes, and, swift as an arrow, Pounced upon and carried off anyone whom it found out of doors, it carried the individual in its powerful claws up to its unknown nest and there devoured him. Fear reigned of an evening throughout the settlements and in the huts, and lamentation filled the air of a morning when often two, sometimes three, persons would be missing. Not a night passed without an abduction, the tribe daily numbered less, and its entire annihilation seemed at hand. The medicine man exorcised the spirit. It returned again, the men went to discover the residence of the cursed murderer, but they did not find it, Makinema was not with them. To prevent the total destruction of her tribe an old woman arose and declared herself ready to sacrifice herself for the good of her nation. When night fell, she stationed herself, with a covered fire stick, in the middle of the village while the remainder of the people crouched in terror within their houses. The fluttering of the wings is heard, and the heroine, seized in the creature's frightful claws, is carried aloft to the charnel house. She now uncovers the fire stick, which like the sun throwing its rays backward, the comet, shows by the streak of light thus produced the direction that the people must follow to find the mortuary house of their brethren. The high flames of fire from the burning nest upon this very mountain showed the folk next morning where to go, they succeeded in killing the creature. History does not say whether the old woman lost her life in this heroic deed. But even now immense heaps of bleached bones are to be found there. SCR, 2, 189. 204. Arawaks, Waraus, in fact all the Indian tribes of whom we have reliable accounts, possess myths and legends indicative of more or less animistic conception of the stars and constellations. Dance, 270 says that Yuwa, or Hiwa, Arawak, and Koyanuk, Akawai, are the names of the morning and evening stars interchangeably, these tribes supposing that they are one and the same. Brett, Br. 107, on the other hand, gives the Arawak name for Venus as Warakoma, Warakoma, and that generally used for Jupiter as Waiwa Calamero, i.e. the star of brightness. The Warau's here on the Pomeroon called the morning star Okonakara. She it was who stuck in the hole when her people first came down from above the skies to populate the earth, sect. 51. The Makusi speak of the evening star as Kaiwono, wife of the moon, because she is to be seen in his near neighborhood, and also on account of her shining more brightly than all the other stars, SCR, 2, 328. According to Father Gilly, the Indians of the Kasikyara believed that the dew which falls by night was the spittle of the stars, AR, 207, a belief similar to that reported of the Makusis. The Caribs ascribed it to the urination of the stars, SCR, 429. The Makusis speak of shooting stars as Waitema, SCR, 2, 328. The island Caribs regarded all the heavenly bodies as Carib. Father de la Borde mentions some five or six stars in their cosmogony, but unfortunately has apparently not identified them. Rakumon was one of the first caribs made by Lu Kuo, he was transformed into a large snake with the head of a man. He was always seated on a cabatas, a hard and high tree, he lived on its fruit, which resembles a large plum or small apple, and which he gave sometimes to those who passed, he is now changed into a star. Savaku was also a carib. He was changed into a large bird, he is the captain of the storms and thunders, he has caused the heavy rains, and is also a star now. A kinan, a carib, at present a star, causes light rain and strong winds. Kuruman, a carib, also a star, causes the heavy sea waves, and upsets canoes, he is also the cause of flood and ebb. BBR, 229. 205. 
Arawak speak of the Milky Way under two names, one of which signifies the path of the Maipuri, Taper, and the other is the path of the bearers of Y.E., a species of white clay of which their vessels are made. The nebulous spots are supposed to be the tracks of spirits whose feet were smeared with that material, Br. 107. On equally reliable authority we are told that the three nebulae within the Milky Way represent a taper being chased by a dog, followed by a jaguar, who is not particular in choice, so that he take either the dog or the taper. Another legend is that the nebulae were formed by celestial wild hogs rooting up the white clay, the 296. The Makusis call the Milky Way Piranha, a term which they apply also to the sea. 206. With regard to the Southern Cross, Dance talks of it as being the Great White Crane, and gives a legend relative to it, the 296. Arawaks and Waraus, however, have told me that this represents the Poes, Cracks SP. The nearer, pointer, to it being the Indian just about to let fly his arrow, the farther one indicating his companion with a fire stick running up behind. This constellation serves also as an indication for the hunting of the bird, Skomberg recording, SCT, 23, how, when the cross stands erect, the poes commences its low moan, sect. 98. The Makusis apparently regard the Southern Cross as the home of the spirit of this bird. 207. There are two groups of stars described by the Arawaks and certain of the Waraus, as the Babarcoat and the Kamudi, for bright stars, Pegasus, with four imaginary connecting lines constitute the square frame of the former. Another thick cluster, Scorpio, representing the snake. This is the Arawak story. The Babarcoat and Kamudi, a. There was a man living with his wife and mother-in-law in the same house, the wife's father had been dead a long time. The man was always going out hunting, but, although he started early, and returned late, luck never seemed to attend his efforts. This made the mother-in-law very angry, and one day she said to him, You are a worthless son-in-law. Day after day, you go out hunting, and you bring back nothing. Day after day, you go out fishing, and bring back nothing. The man made no reply to all this, but just laid himself quietly down in his hammock where he remained until next morning. Next morning he called his wife and told her to pack the hammocks with sufficient cassava for two or three days, as he intended taking her out hunting with him. After they had traveled a long way, he killed her, cut her into pieces, and dried the flesh on a babbercoat. Next day he returned home with his victim's liver, and handing it to his mother-in-law said, Here's the liver of a taper for you. The wife is laden with the flesh and is slowly coming on behind. The old woman, who was so hungry, spared no time in eating it, and when finished got into her hammock quite satisfied, anxiously looking down the pathway for her daughter. After watching for some hours in vain, she began to think that the alleged taper's liver must really have been her daughter's. Turning to her son-in-law, she charged him with having killed her daughter, because it was then very late and still she had not returned. He denied it and swore that she would soon be coming, but the woman would not believe him. She continued watching until late in the night, and then she knew that the liver she had eaten was indeed her own daughter's. Of course she slept but little, and early next morning crept quietly out of the house, and made her way to her brother, the large Kamudi, that lived at the head of the neighboring creek. She told him how her son-in-law had killed her child, and given her the liver to eat. She told him also that she would send the culprit along that very creek, and that as soon as he got within reach he was to catch and swallow him. When she reached home again the old woman said nothing, but next day told her son-in-law that she was feeling very hungry, that he must go out hunting, and that if he went up to the head of the creek, he would find plenty of game to shoot. The son-in-law suspected something, so he went to a younger brother of his and told him to put in a day's hunting at the head of that very same creek, while he took good care to take his bow and arrows in exactly the opposite direction. That same evening, instead of returning to his own place, he came back to his younger brother's house. No brother returned that night, nor the next day. Indeed, he never came back, because he had been killed and swallowed by the Kamudi, who had mistaken his man. The son-in-law, after waiting there a few days, then knew what had happened, and made his way to another settlement, far, 
far from the nagging old woman. On a clear night you can still see the babricote where he barbecued his wife, and close to its side you can just make out the kamudi with its swollen belly, due to the younger brother being inside. 208. The Pleiades, the seven stars, bore a very important role in the daily life of the Guiana Indians in that, among several other reasons. Their rising from the east marked the commencement of their new year, this measurement of time was adopted from the Orinoco to Cayenne. All the legends relating to the constellations Taurus and Orion have something in common in the detail of an amputated arm or leg. Dance speaks of the stars forming the belt and sword sheath of the constellation Orion, the 343, as Mabukuli, Arawak, or Ibapugn, Akawai. Now the word Mabukuli signifies, without leg, and the corresponding little story which he relates, the 296, will not prove out of place here, a huntsman being unsuccessful in the chase one day. And being loath to return without flesh for his stepmother, whom he loved, cut off one of his own legs, and wrapping it up in leaves, presented it to her as veritable game. And then ascended into the heavens as Mabukuli, Ibapagn, or one-legged. 209. The legend of the Tumong, or seven stars, as told by Dance, 296, apparently from Akawai sources, is this. The Legend of the Seven Stars A man having lustful inclination toward his brother's wife killed his brother while hunting in his company. And cutting off an arm of the murdered man, presented it to the widow as a proof of her husband's death. He then took her as his own wife. But the spirit of the murdered man haunted a tree nearby his brother's house, and filled the air at nights with his laments, so that the widow, discovering the treachery of her new husband, became disconsolate. The fratricide, from vexation, decided to rid himself of her, and of her little child. For this purpose he took her ostensibly to hunt with him, and observing a hole at the root of a large tree, he desired her to stoop and search therein for a suspected akuri. While she looked in, he pushed her in completely, and also her child after her, and then stopped up the hole. On that night the spirit of the murdered man appeared to his brother and informed him that he knew of his deed of violence, and was not angry. For his wife had been transformed into an Akuri, and his child to an Aduri, so that his unnatural malice, save by the infliction of death, could not any more affect them. For himself, he would not cease to render the murderer's life miserable so long as his own mangled body remained unburied. But if the wicked brother would disembowel the body and scatter the entrails, after interring the other remains, not only would the dead cease to be a terror, but at that season every year an abundance of fish would gather in the river. The wretched brother then went to the place of the bloody deed, and did what he was told, when the scattered entrails of the murdered man floated upward to the skies, and assumed the appearance of the seven stars. And truly, as was predicted, on the annual appearance of those stars, the Yaramac, Pamelidus Maculatus, Tibicuri, Procilidus rubrotiniatus, Caburesi, Calcius tiniatus, and several other excellent fishes are abundant in the rivers. 210. The Story of Nohiabasi, W. 128. There were once two brothers, the elder, a celebrated hunter, was called Nohiabasi, I do not know the name of the younger one. Every day Nohiabasi went farther and farther afield in the pursuit of game, and at length he reached a creek, where he climbed a tree, watching for the animals to come and quench their thirst. While wading among the branches, he saw a woman wading up the creek toward the tree and noticed that every time she put her hand into the water she drew out two fish, one of these fish she put into her mouth, the other she put into her basket. She was a very big woman, Nahakaboni by name.129 she was carrying a calabash upside down, like a cap, upon her head, and would every now and again toss it into the water. As she jerked it in, she made it swirl round and round like a top, and there she would stand a few minutes watching it spinning on the surface. Then she would proceed on her way, put her hand into the water, draw out two fish again, devour one, and place the other in her quake. And so she proceeded on her way, past the tree where Nohiabasi was in hiding, and still catching two fish at a time, went on her way to the creek head. Night caught the hunter, and so he had to sleep up the tree. Next morning he reached home, and told his brother what he had seen. The latter said, 
I should like to see such a woman, who can catch so many fish, and can eat them as well. But no Hiabasi answered him, no. I don't care to take you with me to show her to you, you are always laughing at everything, and you might laugh at her. And it was only when his brother faithfully promised not to laugh at anything that he might show him, that Nohiabasi agreed to take him. So they started on their journey and reached the creek where the adventure with the big woman had taken place the day before. Nohiabasi climbed the identical tree whence he had originally seen Nahakaboni, this tree being situated a few yards away from the creek bank. His brother, however, who wanted to get a good look at the wonderful woman, insisted upon climbing a tree close to the water's edge, and made his way up and along a branch which overhung the stream. Both brothers sat quiet, and by and by Nahakaboni came along as before, doing just the same thing, spinning her calabash, putting her hand into the water, drawing out two fish at a time, one of which she put into her mouth. The other into her basket. At length she came along right underneath where the younger brother was in hiding, and recognized his shadow in the water. This shadow she tried again and again to catch. She put her hand in quickly, first this side and then that, but of course she did not succeed. And what with all her queer gesticulations and funny capers made so ridiculous an appearance that the brother up above could not resist laughing at her vain attempts to seize the substance for the shadow. He laughed again and again and could not stop laughing. Unfortunately for him, Nahakaboni, hearing the sound and looking up, recognized not only him who was just over her head, but also Nohiabasi, who was on the other tree some few yards distant. Furious at being ridiculed, C. Sex. 59, 125, she ordered the former to come down, but he would not. So she sent the Yakman ants, Esaton sp, up the tree. And when they reached him, they bit him, and stung him so hard that he had to pitch himself into the water, where she caught and ate him. She then ordered Nohiabasi to come down, but he would not either, and so she played him the same trick by sending the Yakman ants again in pursuit. These forced him to come down, and so soon as he reached the ground Nahakaboni caught him, put him into her basket, which she tied up tight, and carried him home. Arrived there, she placed the quake in a corner of her house, covering it with leaves and bushes, at the same time giving her two daughters strict injunctions that they were under no pretext whatever to touch it during her absence. Directly her back was turned however, and it was not very long before she remembered that she had to go to her field to pull cassava, the two girls wanted to see what their mother had been at such pains to hide from them. They said, why did mother tell us not to trouble the basket, and, promptly removing the bushes and leaves, cut open the quake and found a real live man inside. They took him out to have a good look, and the younger sister could not help exclaiming, Oh! What a fine fellow he is, isn't he? They then asked him if he was a good hunter, and he answered them that he was and would always bring them plenty of game. Both girls therefore fell in love with him, and the younger made him hide in her hammock. Now, when old Nahakaboni returned with her cassava, she busied herself grating it, and it was not until everything else was prepared for the feast that she went to the quake to kill Nohiabesai with a view to eating him. Judge of her surprise when she found it empty. When asked about it, the girls admitted that they had been to the basket and let the captive free, the younger one adding, and as he said he was a good hunter, I took him for my husband. The old mother was quite satisfied with this arrangement, and said, All right. You can have him for your man, so long as he regularly brings me something to eat, but remember, on the very first occasion that he returns home with nothing, I shall eat him. From next day on, Nohiabasi started going down to the sea regularly to catch Quereman, Mugil Brasiliensis, for her. No matter the size of the load of fish he procured, old Nahakaboni would eat the whole lot, except two. Fishing like this day after day soon had its effect upon poor Nohiabasi, who got heartily sick of the task of having to procure so much food for his mother-in-law. His girl fell in with these views and consented to release him from so thankless a task by running away with him. So on the last trip he intended making in the way of bringing home fish, he left his coriel, with the catch in it, a little farther out from the bank than had hitherto been customary with him. Indeed, he anchored it in deep water and told a shark to lurk underneath. 
When Nohiabasi reached home he told his wife as usual to inform her mother that he had brought home a load of fish in the coriel, and that she must go down to the waterside for it. One thirty so old Nahakaboni went down the pathway, reached the creek, and went into the water to haul in the coriel with the load of fish, but as soon as she reached the deep part of the stream, the shark seized and devoured her. 131 In the meantime, our hero and the younger daughter made preparation for their journey, but the elder one, beginning to feel anxious about her mother staying away so long, went down to the waterside to seek the cause. Which she was not long in discovering. She returned in haste, and could hardly speak for passion. She sharpened her cutlass and slashed a tree with it, the cut reached only half through. She sharpened it again, and slashed another tree trunk, the blade cut it clear through. When Nohiabasi saw what she was doing, he recognized that his sin had been discovered, and without further loss of time made all speed with his wife to run away. Now, although they had a good start, Nohiabasi soon recognized that his sister-in-law was quickly gaining on them. He therefore made for the nearest tree and, telling his wife to climb quickly, helped her up with an occasional push behind, he following closely at her heels. He had just made his third step up when his sister-in-law reached him with the cutlass, and making a slash, managed to cut off a portion of his leg, which stuck upon one of the branches. This leg makes a noise like the thman, it is in fact the mother or spirit of the man, Tinamus sp. Sect. 98, and when people are out shooting this bird, it is this same leg which occasionally falls down and kills the hunters. We can still see Nohiabasi's wife climbing the tree, she is what we call Kara Mokumoku, lit. Stars little, i.e. the Pleiades. Behind her is Nohiabasi himself, the Hyades, and farther back is his cut-off leg, Orion's belt. 211. Brett's account, BRB, 191, is of interest in comparison with the Warau story, and I accordingly adapt it here from the metrical version. Before doing so, however, I can but express the probability that the idea of making Eldebrin, the bullseye in our constellation Taurus, the organ of vision for the taper, making, in fact, the taper correspond with the bull, is the result of contact with African or European influences. Brett calls the myth the legend of Syracoi, and from internal evidence, cf sect. 38, I am inclined to think that he must have received it from Carib sources. Sirikio is the Carib name for a star, Walia for a watchman, and Wawa, cf. Waweya, for a sister or a wife, on the other hand, Satai is the Akawai name for an axe. The Legend of Serikoi Waweya, the lately made bride of Serikoi, was one day off to her cassava field, when she met a taper. He said his name was Walia, that he liked her, and for the same reason had assumed that form so as to have the chance of coming near her. He came the next day, and the next, and every day while Waweya was on her way to the field, and she became fonder and fonder of him. He finally tempted her, and promised her that if she followed him to the eastward, until earth and sky met, he would resume his human shape and take her to wife. But she refused. So he charmed her axe, and assured her that if she did what he told her to do, she would be safe with him. Soon after, Sarakoi asked Waweya to come with him and gather avocado pears, per se gratissima, which were now ripe, so that while he climbed the trees, she might collect firewood. She did so, and while her husband was up a tree, she went to grind her axe, but every time it touched the stone it called out, I must cut. I must wound. Satai. She asked her husband whether he could hear it talking, and he said, yes, that it always spoke like that when being sharpened there, but she must not worry over it. However, while Sarakoi was descending the tree she cut his leg clear through and took to flight. Though exhausted by loss of blood, Sarakoi plucked an eyelash, and blew it into the air, where it became a beautiful little bird. Which he told to fly away to his mother's place and call his name. When the latter heard her son's name, she did not know what the bird meant, and so sent the bird back again to find out. On its return, she immediately rushed off and nursed her son so tenderly that he recovered of his wound. Sarakoi now managed to walk about with a crutch, and took up the search to find his wife, 
but all traces of Waweya had then disappeared. What with the lapse of time and the heavy rains? Nothing daunted, however, he traveled on and on, until at last he discovered a sprout of avocado pear. A little farther on he saw another, which revived his hope of finding her. Because he now knew that she who had taken the pears must have eaten them on the road, and cast the seeds by the wayside. Traveling on and on, always to the eastward, he saw at last Waweya's and Waelia's footprints. And a little farther on saw them conversing right ahead of him. He thereupon shot the taper and, cutting off its head, implored his wife to return, saying that if she refused he would follow her forever. She did refuse, now ever. And hurried on with her lover's spirit still after her, and her husband behind them both. Still rushing headlong, the husband reached the earth's steep edge, where Waweya threw herself into the deep blue sky. If you watch on a clear night, you can still see Waweya, the Pleiades, with the taper's head, the Hyades, the red eye is Aldebaran, close behind, and Sarakoi, Orion, with Rigel indicating the upper part of the sound limb, farther back, all three in pursuit. 211a, Orion's belt is part of the leg of a woman, sect. 98, of Mabukili, sect. 208, of Nohiabasi, sect. 210, of Makinema, sect. 38, and the arm of the murdered husband, sect. 209. 212. As has been already mentioned, the spirits of people departed may wander upward to join other spirits in Skyland, sect. 81. Some of these may pass their existence happily, and harm no one, or in the course of their transformation, sect. 69. They may become changed into birds, perhaps into birds of ill omen sometimes, and so have their place in the heavens. Again, the spirits of good medicine men travel upward to cloudland, and may be invoked by their surviving professional brethren with the aid of the rattle and tobacco, sect. 309. There are a few other spirits of the sky who are essentially bad-minded in the sense of bringing sickness into the world, these also are referred to elsewhere, sect. 309. 212a. The Woman of the Dawn, W. Plenty of people went out to hunt, but on the way back, four of them were caught by nightfall when far away from home. These four comprised a man, his wife, and two daughters. And a long, long way behind them was yet another man. This last man shouted out to the four others, Hi! Stop! Wait for me! Wait for me, to which they replied, Come along quick, and follow us. But as he could never reach them, he kept on singing Mawakakotu, lit. For me, wait. He is the little night owl, who still sings like this. The darkness was now so thick that the four could get no farther. They had to remain where they were, and though they waited and waited, no daylight came. In the meantime they made a fire from ite palm leaves, but it burned away too quickly, it was no good. They then rolled some wax in a leaf, but this also burned away too quickly, it too was no good. The parents, seeing a little dawn a long distance away in the bush, sent the elder daughter to go and bring it. She went on and on, but zigzag and crossways just like a drunken man, a token that she would never obtain the daylight. She walked in a crooked way because she had already had dealings with a man. Finally she reached the spot where the daylight was, and there she came across an old man and his wife. She asked for his son, but as he was out at work, the old man bade her to wait. When at last the old man's son did reach home, the mother said, A friend has come to see you. She has waited long. You had better ask her what she wants, and when he asked her what she wanted, she told him how her father had sent her to fetch some daylight. Extra hen sum clavum, in sepit arcum in rare, but the key would not fit, the lock 132 having been tampered with, and he therefore sent her home again. When she got back, empty-handed the younger sister said, I will try to get some daylight, and although her father told her she was too young to go, she insisted, and went. She did not stumble on the road from one side to the other because as yet she had never had anything to do with a man, and she reached the spot without trouble. Like her sister, she had to await the young man's return, 
and when he did arrive, his old mother said, I don't know what is the matter with your friends. They have never come to visit you like this before. There is another young woman come to see you. On learning that she had come to fetch daylight, inserit clavum in Arkham Ias et demonstrabit quo quo modo opportuis uti. He gave her the daylight, which she brought back to her parents and sister. Among the Peresi, Peru, there is a vaginal origin ascribed to both organic and inorganic nature, P.E. 33. 213. Rain can be produced as well as stopped by human, animal, or spirit agency, but at the same time would appear to have an independent existence. To make rain on the pulmaroon, one of the authorized methods consists in plunging into water a length of cassava stalk held at one extremity. Next the stalk must be tied up in the center of a bundle of other cassava stalks, and the whole left to soak in water, rain is sure to fall within 24 hours. Another method practiced here is to wash in water the scrapings from one of an alligator's largest teeth. Arawaks as well as Waraos believe also in the P.I. or any layman burning the carcass of a kamudi as an inducement for the rain to fall. The Oyambis of Cayenne have the same belief in the efficacy of the killing of a snake, C.R. 174. On the Kamwata Creek, in the Maruka River district, there is a half-submerged tree stump, known as a buma, lit. Young woman, in the Warao language, believed to be the site where either an Indian murdered his wife or where she killed herself. In dry weather the tree is exposed, and as the Indians pass it in their corials, they call out, Ibuma, and slash their cutlasses into it, with the avowed purpose of making the woman vexed, and so causing the rain to fall. Rain can also be made to fall in this district by cursing the black kuri kuri bird as mentioned in the story of the medicine man and the carrion crows, sect. 303. On the upper Mazaruni it is a large eagle nakamudi that can cause the rain to fall, bro, 399, frogs are reputed to be able to do the same thing, sect. 46. 214. The infringement of certain taboos can also entail a downpour of rain. For instance, when traveling on the sea or any other large sheet of water, as a big river, the Indians, Arawaks, Waraos, etc., have to be very careful as to what they do with the pot spoon, the Herero of the Arawaks, sect. 193. After use they must wash it in the traveling boat or wait until they get on land, but never wash it in the river or sea, otherwise, big squalls and storms will arise. Nor must any fresh water be spilt in the traveling boat, sect. 219. Near the Chichi Falls, Upper Mazaruni, on giving the Indians rice to cook that evening, the men told them to wash it first by dipping the earthen pot into water, but to this they demurred. Saying that if they placed their pot in the water the rain would fall more heavily, bro, 397. In the same way a Cayenne Bush Negro, in order to stop the rain, advises his fellow servant not to wash the inside of the pot, CR, 276. 215, conversely, the rain can be stopped. Near Mora village, on the upper Rupununi, there was a hill close by on which, the Indian said, a spirit at the approach of the end of the rainy season, made a noise like the report of a gun to stop the rain, bro, 138. We passed an old man, says Brett, BR, 169, fishing in a canoe on the Manawaran. The clouds threatened rain, and when he perceived it, he began to use extraordinary gesticulations, flourishing his arms, and shouting his incantations to drive it away. It soon cleared up, and the old sorcerer rejoiced at his success, as he deemed it. So again, dance, page 234, on the Potaro, a cloud was gathering windward, and threatened rain. The Indian who had the front paddle in my woodskin commenced to blow away the threatening rain cloud. This he attempted to do by blowing into his fist and dashing his hand upward toward the cloud. Skomberg describes a similar maneuver executed by a Warao, SCR, 186. On the Pomeroon, should rain fall at a time when it is particularly not desired, as when traveling in an exposed corial, one of the occupants will address the boss spirit of the rain somewhat as follows, pass on. We don't want you here. Clear out to the head of the river where you are wanted, 
at the same time pointing with his finger toward the direction he wishes it to take. Another of the occupants will as often as not then get up in the boat on all fours and, pointing his posterior in the direction of the rain, will address it with an obscene remark. The being thus addressed is Uni Shidu, so called by the Arawaks from Uni, the rain, and Shidu, a term applied to any chief or boss. As first recorded by Bancroft, 312, it is noteworthy that if it rains at the time, the medicine man will postpone his incantations. 216. The Arawaks speak of the rainbow as Yawari, Didalfi's SP. The reddish color of its fur bearing some fancied resemblance to the coloration of the bow. These same people, certainly in the Pomeroon district, hold that white people are coming from the direction where they see a rainbow, on inquiry. I learn that the connection between this natural phenomenon and the European lies in the high arched forehead of the latter. The island Caribs more or less personified it as Jaluka. Another form of the word Uricon, sect. 94. The rainbow spirit, which lives on fish, lizards, pigeons, and hummingbirds, and is covered with fine feathers of all colors, especially on the head. He is the rainbow which we see, the clouds prevent us from seeing the rest of the body. He makes the carib ill when it finds nothing to eat above. If this fine iris appears when they are at sea, they take it as a good omen of a prosperous journey. When it appears to them while they are on land, they hide in their homes and think that it is a strange and masterless spirit which seeks to kill somebody, BBR, 231. 217. As will be seen from the following list, weather forecasting must be somewhat easy for the Indians. Unfortunately, I have been unable to discover at first hand, the connection, if any, between the sign and the event, that is, whether it is a case of cause and effect, at the instigation of some spirit, human or animal. On the Maruka River, rain will fall or an accident of some sort will happen to the person hearing the Karasuri, small kingfisher, or the Fikawana, a little bird with red legs and its long tail, whistle notes. So again, certainly on the same river, if when the weather happens to be dry, the Kayakochi, crocodile, barks, late of an afternoon, rain is certain to follow either that night or during the course of the following day. When the river Ibis, or Kuri Kuri, Ibis infuscatus, utters its cries in the evening, the natives of the Kuyuni say it is a sure sign that rain will fall during the night, bro, 21. Gamilla makes the curious statement, g, i, 289, that the Manati is to be seen taking big jumps out of the water a day before rain falls. On the Pomeroon and Maruka, among the Arawaks, when plenty of swallows are seen, or the toucans cry loudly, or various frogs, as the Akura, Tantanli, Kure Kure, Wararara, are heard, or a little insect, the Kudu Kudu, chirps. Or the Yarao fish are found bearing plenty of eggs, wet weather is believed to be approaching. In Cayenne, the Iroquois or Paraqua is the rain bird of the Wajana Indians. A long spell of dry weather may be expected and any large kamudi is found high up on a tree, and a correspondingly short one if the serpent is but a small one and only a few feet from the ground, Arawaks and Waraus, Maruka River. Again, if a Pomeroon Arawak hears the kukui, a hawk somewhat like a carrion crow, he knows the sound presages prolonged dry weather. What is more curious still, he and his people when they hear this sound rush to the pepper trees around the house and shake them with a view to making them bear more peppers. There are two birds that I shall always be glad to hear singing, the warikuma and the dara, bellbird, kasmarinkus, because the Arawaks have taught me that they indicate the coming of plenty of sunshine. Some Indians enjoy the same prospect and they hear the baboon howling. 218. The Cayenne Indians are not so much afraid of thunder as of an eclipse. They believe the former is caused by P.I. who, climbing up into the skies, makes this frightful noise, P.B.A., 233. As soon as they recognize the approaching storm which usually accompanies the thunder, the island caribs at once make for their houses, and stepping into the kitchen, seat themselves on their little stools close to the fire. Here, hiding their faces, and resting their heads upon their hands and knees, they commence to cry, bewailing in their gibberish that Maboya, sect. 84, is much angered with them. They do the same thing when there is a hurricane on, 
ROP, 486. The Yups River Indians blame their corresponding spirit, the Jurupuri, for the thunderstorms, it is at these times that he is angry with them, ARW, 348. The Kobuas believe that a death separation of spirit from body is taking place, KG, 2, 152. Warows believe thunder to be the roar of Black Tiger, sect. 148. The Suriname Negroes regard the old-time Indian stone weapons as thunderbolts, and look on them as talismans with which they part only with reluctance, WJ, 71. Many people. Indians. Spaniards, at Caracas and elsewhere wear them on their necks as amulets for protection against lightning and thunder, AR, 461. 219. With regard to storms generally, the Caribou slanders. When they have to cross over sea to go to another island, like St. Lucie or St. Vincent, no pure water is drunk, and they are very careful not to spill any in the canoe or in the sea, sect. 193 it would cause the sea to swell and make rain and bad weather come. They cannot pass certain places at sea without throwing over food, it is for some Caribs who have perished there, and now have their huts at the bottom of the sea. They could otherwise not pass without the boat capsizing. When a storm cloud is seen, they all blow in the air and drive it away with their hands to turn the rain in another direction. To make the sea calm, and allay a storm, they chew cassava, then spit it in the air and see to appease the Kameen, sect. 89, who is perhaps angry because he is hungry. If they have an unfavorable wind, an old man out of the crowd takes an arrow and hits the hydrant of the canoe, which is supposed to let the canoe go as straight as an arrow, if a gust of wind makes them lose sight of land, they consult the devil. BBR, 245. 14, Omens, Charms, Talismans. Omens, tokens, auguries, etc., dependent on, human beings, 220-221, quadrupeds, 222, birds, 223, insects, 224-225, plants, 226. Ordeals, preparatory charms, for the chase, with, incisions, mutilations, nose stringing, 227, frogs, toads, 228 to 229, caterpillars and ants, 230, perhaps have a physiological basis, 231. Hunting dogs have to undergo similar ordeals, 232. Attraction charms, binas, 1, for hunting, plants, used on hunter, 233, or on his dog, 234, originally obtained from a snake, 235. Animals used on the hunter and on his dog, 236, 2, for sexual purposes, plants, 237, animals, 238. Talismans, repellent, and so protective or defensive, charms, plant, 239, animal, tooth, 240, blood and red paint, 240A, stone, 241. 220, omens, tokens, auguries, etc., are known to the Arawaks as a Dibuahu, to the Waraus as a Sijitayaha. Lucky indeed are those children who are born with a call, Shirboadahu, because they are going to see spirits, Yawahu, and so become more clever. If the husband is away fishing or hunting, and any little child of his, boy or girl, takes up a pot, and puts it on the fire pretending to cook something, leaves, etc. The mother can rest assured that their father is bringing something home with him. If a healthy person is suddenly overcome by a sleepy feeling, or if during sleep he happens to spit, this means that he is about to be visited by someone, Arawaks. During sneezing and yawning, the spirit temporarily leaves the body through nose and mouth, KG, 2, 152. To point the finger at a fellow creature, sect. 263, is to offer him as serious an affront as it would be to step over him when lying on the ground. In the latter case, the recumbent person would rightly say, You can cross me when I am dead. I am not dead yet. Arawaks. Our old chieftain, says Scomberg, had during the morning sprained his foot, while jumping from rock to rock, an accident to which he paid little attention. 
but which showed he was unable to proceed on the journey to Napi. This accident was taken as a bad omen by both the Makusis and Arakunas who, with the exception of those who were bound to us by agreement, all turned back to their settlement on the following morning, SCR, 2, 291. If the occupants of a settlement, Pomeroon Caribs, wish to assure the victory for their warriors on the march, and want to assure themselves at the same time of the issue of the battle, perhaps already fought. They place two boys on a bench and whip them without mercy, especially over the shoulders. If the boys bear the pain without shedding a tear or uttering a groan, victory is certain. One of the boys is then placed in a hammock, from which he has to shoot at a target fixed to one of the roofs, as many arrows as hit the target, so many of the enemy will be killed by the warriors, SCR, 2, 431. If after their descent upon the Arawaks, they are discovered before striking the first blow, or a dog yelps at them, the island caribs take the incident for a bad augury, and return to their boats. They believe that hostilities, begun openly, will not succeed, are okay, 529. 221. As a matter of fact, anything that occurs out of the ordinary is accepted in the light of a token of something evil about to happen. For examples of this, I am taking at random the following extracts from the legends already given. He brought them a turtle, which they put on the hot ashes without killing it, so it promptly crawled out. They pushed it on again, but with the same result. It was the omen betokening their death, sect. 4. And when asked how she knew, that the bush spirits were coming to spoil the drink, she told them that she had received a sign, or token because when she was weeping for her late husband. He suddenly appeared before her and told her to cease to cry, sect. 109. The elder brother then recognized that it, the fact of the younger persistently making a noise while fishing, was a token of something that was about to happen, sect. 113. The wife also met her death shortly after, and they then remembered having noticed the token, she had omitted to bathe after a meal, some days before, sect. 119. Her visitor eating the frogs raw was a sign of something wrong somewhere, causing the girl to become suspicious, sect. 120. It was not long before the brother again put his feet into the fire, a fact which, considering that he was not drunk, led his brother to believe that it was a token of some evil about to befall, sect. 126. When the husband claimed the beast which he had not killed, as his own, the wife realized the token that something unusual was about to happen, sect. 136. While eating the beetle grub out of the Mauritia palm, the elder brother heard it whistle, he knew this to be the sign or token that he was about to die, sect. 139. 221a. The token or augury may be in the nature of an indescribable sort of feeling. The obstinate girl who refused the old man, W. An old man asked a woman to come and live with him. She, however, was young and wanted a younger husband, so she declined him. This made the old man much vexed, and he threatened to punish her badly. By and by the woman took as husband a young man. He was a splendid hunter, and always killed anything and everything, even at night, if he heard a tiger growling anywhere in the neighborhood he would never hesitate to go out into the darkness and slay it. One day he went into the bush to cut out honey, his wife accompanying him. That will do, she said when she thought he had cut enough, but he wanted to cut one more tree. No, don't cut another, she repeated, I feel frightened. I feel strange, as if something were about to happen, 133, but he insisted upon cutting one tree more, and no sooner had he done so than two creatures like tigers rushed out of a neighboring thicket and killed him. They were not exactly hebus, and they were not exactly tigers, they were spirits of some sort whom the old man had sent to revenge himself with. Now the deceased husband had left two brothers behind him, and when they heard of his death, they made inquiry and examined the place in the forest where he had been attacked, but could find no trace of the body. The young widow then wanted to take unto herself one of these brothers-in-law, but he was afraid after what had happened to her first husband. Nevertheless, she loosened her hammock, and slung it next to his. She even brought him food, water, and other things, 
but he refused to handle anything that she offered. Had he done so, she would have said to herself, He loves me, sect. 275. Nevertheless, she persisted in her attentions, and followed him everywhere, where he went, she went. He told her he was going to cut out honey and that she must go back, she refused, so he threw her into the river. She did not mind, but clung to the edge of the coriel, and though he bashed her fingers with the paddle, she refused to let go her hold, well, at last he gave way and let her join him. So they went together to the place where the honey was to be procured, and filled all their goblets. The woman said, Don't cut any more. I feel strange. Something is about to happen. He stopped cutting, and helped to pack the coriol ready for the return journey. While doing so, the two tiger creatures came from out of their hiding place and killed him. And the woman was for the second time a widow. The remaining brother and other members of the family came and visited the spot as before, but there was no trace of the body to be found. It was this remaining brother that the woman next wanted, but after what had happened, he was too much afraid to have anything whatever to do with her. However, she persisted so much, that he was finally forced to consent. They went for the honey as before, the strange feeling came over her, she warned him to stop, they started packing, and the two tiger creatures appeared. On this occasion, the man killed one of his assailants before being himself dispatched by the other. At any rate, the woman was for the third time a widow. Did she then marry the old man who wanted her originally? No, she would not even look at him. 221b How the little boy escaped from the Caribs, W. A party of women and girls went to gather wild pineapple. They traveled in a large coriel, and at last landed. Having roamed the bush and gathered a number of pines, they all sat down in a circle to eat them, and commenced laughing and chattering, as women do. Now there was a little boy among the party, who climbed up all over hanging tree, where the coriel had been tied up at the waterside, in order to keep watch, he was afraid that something was going to happen. 134 After a while he called out that some men were swimming across the stream, but all that the women jokingly said was, All right. Let them come. We will have some sport and fun with them. But the men were really carib cannibals, and as soon as they reached land, they rushed upon the women, slaughtered every one of them, and began cooking the flesh. The boy up the tree was much frightened at seeing all this, but did not dare descend just yet. The Caribs were watching the choreo lest anyone should come and fetch it away, and at irregular intervals would wander backward and forward from the scene of the outrage to the landing place. It was during one of these intervals that the youngster slipped down the tree, and, breaking his arrow, rubbed the pieces over his body to make him brave, sect. 331, he then slipped off into the choreo, and as quickly as possible reached midstream. By this time the Caribs had recognized him and shouted for him to return. Come back. Come back, they screamed, your sister is alive and calls you, but the lad knew better and, paddling strongly, got home safe. He told his father and other relatives all that had happened. These hurried back, only to find that the Caribs had made their escape, and so they received no payment, i.e. they did not get their revenge on them, point 135. 222. With regard to animals, let us see what they or their actions can presage. Serious sickness or death is indicated by either small or large species of armadillo, yesher and monorama, respectively, of the jaguar, burrowing or digging up, for the purpose of covering its excreta. Any portion of the road leading up to the house. Similarly it is a bad omen for any droppings of the buhuri, a bat, to be found on the pathway, Arawaks. There is a frog with a spotted back which jumps well, and is known to the Pomeroon Arawaks as Sarukra. A pregnant woman will tickle it to make it jump, and according as it lands on its back or its belly, so will her child prove to be girl or boy. The island Caribs regarded bats as their guardian kameens or familiar spirits, and believed that whoever killed them would become ill, BBR, 235. When the war de Macaro, Bradipus tridactylus, the smallest kind of sloth, which has a curious habit of always covering its face with its crossed hands, uncovers its face, it is a sure token that someone is going to die, Arawaks. 
223. Birds of ill omen are present in plenty. Chief among these is the goat sucker, Capromolgus. Writing from the Takutu, Skomberg says that the Indians have the greatest superstition with regard to this bird, and would not kill it for any price. They say it keeps communication with the dead, and brings messages to their conjurers. Even the common people on the coast retain in a great measure this superstition, and hold the bird in great awe. Its nocturnal habits, the swiftness and peculiarity of its flight, and its note, which breaks the silence of the night, have no doubt contributed to the fear which Indians and Creoles entertain for the Wakarai or Sumpy bird, SCT, 67. As is the case with even far more civilized nations, owls are of equally evil portent and may indicate sickness, death, the presence of an as yet unborn babe, or a birth. Thus, among the Pomeroon and Maruka Arawaks, the Boku Boku, and the Werobaya or Malatatoro, both of them species of night owl, and among the Demerara River Arawaks. The Hututu, night owl, and Makudi, small owl, are said always to be heard when a person is sick or about to die. In the Pomeroon the Morakodii, night owl, cries when a female in the house is enchant. On the Demerara, when the night owl calls Kuda. 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 Quickly, it is to notify that one in the family is about to give birth to a child. And when that bird mews like a cat, it is the notification of death, the, 269. In French Guiana, on the upper Peru River, at an apple eye vinage, Cravot had a curious experience, arrived in the forest where we proposed camping, we heard the notes of a bird which I have reason to believe is a kind of screech owl. A panic seized my escort, the torches were put out, and men and women saved themselves in the obscurity of the night. We were obliged to return to the village for our night's rest, CR, 300. On the Pomeroon panned elsewhere, probably from their custom, when in large numbers, of flying in pairs, one behind the other, the Baridi hawks are taken as an omen of a funeral. On the lower Amazon, a black eagle, Movego nudicalis, locally known as the Karakarai, is considered a bird of ill omen by the Indians. It often perches on the tops of trees in the neighborhood of their huts and is then said to bring a warning of death to some member of the household. Some say that its whining cry is intended to attract defenseless birds within its reach, HWB, 146. With regard to remaining species of birds, the Pomeroon Arawaks believe that if the Cocobero flies over the house, someone in it will shortly prove pregnant, that or a little baby is about to be taken sick. The voice of the Kwakwara brings an evil message, similar to that of the Boku Boku. The Kario Banahu is a small night bird, so named after its note, Karao. Karao. And a Banahu, the liver, the color of which it resembles. If its note is heard but faintly, some individual must be exceedingly ill, if distinctly, the patient is getting better and stronger. When the Baletica cries, someone is about to be married, hence this token may be both of good and bad omen. Another set of bird tokens may indicate approaching rainfall as well as accident, sect. 217. There is still another class of omens, indicative of either prospective good luck or bad luck. Thus, when on a hunting expedition, one hears the karasuri, a small bird, uttering a kind of laugh, he is sure to kill something, but if it should cry shirai, he will get nothing. According as the bucolora, another bird, turns its back or its breast toward a person, so will fortune or misfortune attend that person's wishes in obtaining whatever food he wants. Furthermore, when walking along the pathway one must not mind if a munarakudi, species of black ant, bites his foot, because this means that he will obtain something very good and satisfying. Some Indians will never turn their back on a trogon, he, the Indian, attributed his safety, from drowning, to the strictness with which the Indians had observed the proper respect due to a trogon that had flown over our heads in the morning, they have a superstition that if on setting out on a journey, they should turn their backs to this species of bird, ill luck will surely follow. B.W. 146, on the Mazaruni, with an Arawak and Akawai crew. The following are some miscellaneous examples of bird omens, on the Pomeroon one must not gaze too long on the great red macaw, unless the individual wishes to become bald. 
presumably in view of the bird having its cheeks so markedly devoid of feathers. The advent of strangers is notified by the warakaba, trumpeter bird, when it is seen playing about near the house, having in its mouth a leaf with which it is believed to be building a banup. On the Orinoco, in token of the father coming to visit them, the cacique said that on the previous day he had seen a bird with peculiar feathers and colors passing over his house, it gave them notice of his approach, g. i. 311. Children are discouraged from picking up certain feathers, as these tend to weaken memory, and the handling of the feathers of a scissor-tail hawk, called by the Aderace Chauna, conduces to insanity, the, 250. 223a. The knight O.W.L. and his bat brothers in law W. Boku Boku, the night owl, married the bat's sister, and often took his brothers with him at night to rob people's houses. One night they came across a house where the people were drying fish on a babbercoat, just to frighten them, they all sang out, Boku. 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 This made the occupants run out into the bush, and so gave the bats their opportunity for stealing the fish. The trio played the same trick at many a settlement, until one day the owl told them he had to travel about for a while, and that during his absence they must behave themselves, and stay indoors at night. As otherwise trouble would be sure to happen. But no sooner had Boku Boku turned his back, than the bats, unable to resist temptation, continued their evil courses, they got to a place one night where the fish were being dried, but having no owl with them on this occasion. They could not shout Boku. 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 As loudly as they did before, hence, the people not being so frightened now, ran away only a little distance, just far enough to be able to watch everything and to see that it was only the bats who were stealing their food. But the bats, remaining undisturbed, thought they could now do what they liked with impunity, and hence returned again upon the following evening, when the people remained just as they were, some seated, some lying in their hammocks. The bats still thought of course that nothing bad could happen them, and were laughing chi. 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 For very joy. But the house master took out his bow and arrow, the latter tipped with a knob of wax, with which he shot one of them on the rump, stunning it. 136 The other bat, escaping into the forest, met Boku Boku, who had just returned from his travels, and to whom he narrated the circumstances of his brother's untimely death. Nothing daunted, the two returned to hunt that night, and on this occasion the noise of their voices, now that it included the owls, created such a stir that the folk ran as before into the bush. While Boku Boku and his brother-in-law stole the fish. But lying on the babbercoat was the dead bat, which they took home with them, and there they soundly smacked him on the spot where he had been struck with the arrow, this brought him round, the fire not having withered him up beyond recovery. And he laughed chi. 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 On awakening. And although Boku Boku was prevented accompanying them the following evening, the two bats insisted on repeating their nocturnal excursion, as before, the folk were not frightened, and again one of the bats got shot in his posterior. Next night, the surviving bat returned with Boku Boku, and they found as before upon the babbercoat, the body of their relative, this they took away with them, but on this occasion, when they smacked the corpse. It never woke, it had been dried too much over the fire. The surviving bat however continues to take his revenge upon people and sucks them and their fowls, as well as doing other damage, while the presence of Boku Boku, his brother-in-law, invariably means mischief, when heard at night. Someone is surely about to sicken and die. 224. There are two bees which indicate the arrival of a stranger. One of these insects, Honorari, comes in the morning early, and in the afternoon late, while the other, Wariro, lives in the ground. When either of these buzzes Arawaks are convinced that people are about to visit them. The Madudu is another bee that flies round somewhere between 4 and 5 a.m. Should a young person hear it buzzing he, or she, must immediately get out of the hammock, on penalty of having pains all over the body. The Arawaks of the Pomeroon believe that if a candle fly, Pyrophorus noctilucus, Coco I, is seen coming into the house, it may mean three things, supposing it falls to the ground, this indicates the near death of one of the inmates. 
If it falls into the fire, this shows that a deer has sent it along to fetch a light for him, but if it settles down under the roof, the arrival of a stranger is to be expected. The bite of a certain ant is lucky, sect. 223. 225. The candlefly saved the lost hunter, c. Five men formed themselves into a hunting party, and went out into the forest. At nightfall they built themselves a bannock, and next morning they all started in different directions to scour the neighborhood. Late in the afternoon they had returned to the resting place, all except one. Three of the four said, Our friend is either lost or a tiger has eaten him, but when they discussed the matter further, they remembered that they had seen no tracks of a tiger throughout the district. The head man was therefore right when he said, No. He must be lost. This was really what had happened to the fifth man, who, penetrating deep into the forest, was overtaken by the darkness, which made him miss the track. He wandered on and on, and laid himself down under a tree. By and by, a Puyu, candlefly, came along and asked him what he was doing all alone there, when it learned that he had lost himself, it offered to show him the way. But the man doubted how such a little thing could help him and it was only when the candlefly told him that it intended warming itself at the very fire which his four friends had made at the bannock that he agreed to follow it. And as the two approached the camping ground, they heard the voices of people talking. Listen, said the little fly, that's where your people are. We are going there. When they at last reached the shed, the candlefly flew in ahead, and told the four men that it was bringing them their lost companion, the latter then came in, and his four friends were right glad to see him. 226. The only example of plant life in connection with omens and auguries so far met with is that recorded by Bernau, marriage is frequently contracted by parents for their children when infants. And trees are planted by the respective parties in witness thereof, it is considered a bad omen if either tree should happen to wither as in that case the party is sure to die, b. 59. 227. The Guiana Indian voluntarily submits to various painful ordeals or preparatory charms, previous to setting out on, and with the object of winning success in, the chase. He believes in priming himself whenever his hunting powers appear to be impaired, and may spend some two or three months or more in the process, during this period he abstains from salt and peppers, also perhaps from sugar. The ordeals apparently consist in the mortification of the flesh, by scarification, etc., and its irritation with various frogs, toads, caterpillars, ants, or by special nose-stringing apparatus. I purposely use the term, apparently, because their real signification, see sect. 231, is evidently not even known to the Indians who practice them. In Suriname, among both the Ojanas, Caribs, and Trios, Caribs, it is customary, go, 21, to slash arms and legs with a knife, and the scars may be rubbed perhaps with Tarala, caladium bulb. An Ojana told the Guj that he cut his arm in order to be able to shoot the Quadra monkey well. A trio slashed his arm and forearm and rubbed earth into it, to become a good hunter, another cut his thigh in order to become a strong mountain climber. Some women also had on the outer side of the thigh scars from wounds inflicted to make themselves strong. With the island caribs, the forehead and nose were flattened artificially, ROP, 437. This was done as soon as the infants were born by exerting pressure in such a way as to cause a slight backward slope of this part of the head. Besides being considered a sign of beauty, this shape was said to be advantageous in shooting arrows from a treetop, in securing a foothold, etc., ROP, 552. Among the Yoruro Indians of the Orinoco, in order to become skillful with the bow and arrow the men submit to a sexual mutilation with a stingray barb, which is made to pierce the prepuce, cr. 570. The Cayenne Caribs never go on a big hunting expedition without drawing a little blood from their arms to prevent them shaking when pulling the bow, to give them greater strength for paddling, the young men scarified themselves on both arms. Similarly, before undertaking a journey on land they never fail to make incisions at the level of the calves, cr. 280. Skomberg reports seeing Indians bleeding each other as a remedy for over-fatigue, scf. 235. 
There is still a no-stringing procedure to be mentioned, in most Indian houses pieces of thick roughly plated fiber or cord, as thick as codline, and a yard in length, are seen hanging up in the roof. These have all been used once. That is, passed up through the nose of the owner of the house, and drawn out by the mouth, for the purpose of giving him good luck in hunting, bro, 302. The string tapers, from a very small point at one end to a considerable thickness at the other end, where the fibers hang loosely in a bunch, the thin end, is passed, up his nostril, employed by Macusis, Aracunas, and Akawoy, IT, 228. The exercising of the limbs at each new moon may perhaps be regarded in the light of a preparatory ordeal, sect. 199. 228. In British Guiana, on the Kaider savanna, a frog is rubbed on the transverse cuts made down either side of the hunter's chest, a different frog being used for different game. In the same district a small live toad is said to be swallowed for the promotion of general success in hunting. 137 Having scratched his wrist with the telson or sting of a scorpion to ensure precision in darting the arrow from the bow, and cut his arms and legs with the flakes of a broken bottle, he rubs the back of the canoa toad over the wounds. The virus of the reptile burns like fire, the 253. In the Pomeroon district, in addition to abstention from salt and peppers, cuts are made on the arms, and the spawn of the Akura frog, sect. 229, is rubbed not only into the incisions, but also into the mouth, nose, eyes, and ears, where it is said to cause acute irritation. It is difficult to understand the relationship, if any, between the frog or toad, and success in the chase, sect. 144, except on a basis of some original belief in the divinity, sect. 46, of these Batrachians, as we know to have existed in other parts of the Guianas, sect. 349, the following is an Arawak story. 229. The wife teaches her husband to hunt, a. Eh? There was a man who though he went off regularly to the forest, never managed to bring home anything, while his brothers-in-law, who seldom went out, always returned with plenty of game. But they gave none of it either to him or to their sister. She, however, determined on asking other people how she could teach her husband to be as lucky as her brothers, and after a long long time she found out what to do. She then took him one day into the bush to hunt for the Akura frog, and when they had found the nest she introduced some of the spawn into his ears, eyes, nose, and mouth. This burned him terribly, and made him vomit, so much so that he was obliged to roll about in the sand to ease the pain. After this, she made him bathe, and then brought him home. She next asked her brothers to make a small bow and some arrows for her, and with these she sent her husband out to shoot small birds only, and not to shoot more than four. While he was away she made pepper pot, using very few peppers and no salt whatsoever. He returned with the four little birds, which she cooked, giving him two, and retaining two for herself. The same procedure was repeated daily for a week. The wife then destroyed the small bow and arrows, and asked her brothers to make bigger ones, and instructed her husband to shoot bigger birds with them, this also continued for a week. She next sent him out with this big bow and arrows to hunt game of all and any description, but with a certain proviso, as each animal or bird would approach him in answer to the call which he would imitate, he was not to shoot. But merely to point his arrow at it. Only when it was time to return home in the afternoon was he to kill one animal, and fetch it to her. At the beginning of the fourth week, she sent him out hunting again with fresh instructions, he was now to shoot and kill everything that he could. He killed and brought home plenty. From that time he and his wife were never in want of food, and they took care to treat her brothers as they had treated them. What they could not eat, they would barbecue, and then hide. The selfish brothers accordingly wondered how their sister's husband now always managed to kill more game THNN they did. They asked their sister, but she refused to tell them. 230. In the Pomeroon district a hairy caterpillar may be rubbed into incisions made on the wrists and thighs. This creature, 
obtained on the Rupununi and brought down here in barter, is said to be soaked in water the whole of the night previous to the solution being applied, by means of cotton wool, to the cuts. I have also seen a Pomeroon Arawak wear one on his neck. I'm Thern, 230, speaks of caterpillars, the hairs of which break off very readily, and have a great power of irritating flesh. These caterpillars he rubs on his chest or thighs, and thus produces a considerable and very painful looking rash. This method employed by Makusis, Arakunas, and Akaways. Or the hunter may mortify his flesh with ants, a practice indulged in by a member of any of these three tribes who takes a small mat, about six or eight inches square, made of narrow parallel strips of the skin of a reed like plant, Ishnasifan, tied together somewhat as are the laths of a Venetian blind. Between each two of these strips he inserts a row of living ants, their heads all one way. The strips are exactly at such distance apart that the ants when once inserted cannot extricate themselves. The huntsman then presses the whole mat, on the side on which are the heads of the ants, against his own chest, and the ants, which are of a large and venomous kind, bite most painfully. IT 229 231 while recovering from the effects of his self-inflicted cuts and other injuries, the Carib and Akawai Nimrod may be waited upon and nursed by some woman, but she must be past the climacteric. He is strictly forbidden to take liberties with any female. Though, at first sight, the inconvenience and suffering entailed by certain of the above procedures might seem to constitute a sort of sacrifice or free gift for favors to come, or at all events expected. I am afraid all the evidence is in the negative. On the other hand these practices may have a physiological basis of fact, and so of reason. The passing of the nose string would certainly tend to clean the nasal mucous membrane, and so render the olfactory organ more keen. The prohibition of women combined with an enforced diet would certainly tend to make the individual more fit and thus get him into better training. The stimulation of all his sense organs with the particular frog slime may possibly hypersensitize them, while the infliction of physical pain within certain limits can reasonably be expected to irritate the nervous system to such an extent as to render it responsive to but the slightest external stimulus, qualities. All of them, advantageous for the hunter to ensure success in the chase. It is perhaps on somewhat similar lines that, with a view to stimulating the child quickly to learn to walk, the Arawak mother will get a tibby tibby lizard and encourage it to bite the infant's feet and knees. The child is also incited to activity by putting a small stinging ant on him, the 250. But it is certainly difficult to understand how the artificial flattening of the children's foreheads by the Carib Island mothers can be vindicated in the belief that it helps the victims in years to come the better to fly their arrows from the treetops by securing firm foothold for them, ROP. 552. 232. Hunting dogs are also made to undergo similar ordeals, but whether as part and parcel, or independent, of their general training, sect. 234. It is difficult to say. On the pomeroon in addition to, or in lieu of, the rubbing of a leaf, sect. 233. The animal's snout may be rubbed with a certain tree bark peculiar in that, when squeezed in the hands, a sort of frothiness exudes. A species of inga. Or again. The Pomeroon Indian will gash the snout with a stingray barb and pour on the raw surface a few drops of a solution made as follows, some of the hot test kind of peppers are squeezed into a swab of cotton already moistened with a little water. A sugarloaf funnel is then made of a suitable leaf, the cotton swab expressed into it, and a few drops allowed to trickle down through the funnel on the incisions. It is said that in two or three days' time the animal is ready to hunt, and when on the chase will keep his nose close to the ground, this action allowing of all grass and undergrowth being well turned over and scoured. Ants are also sometimes made to bite the creature's snout, or the same hairy caterpillar previously mentioned, sect. 230, is rubbed into it. There is reported, however, an equally painful method as practiced by the Makusi, Arakunas, and Akaweos. Two holes are dug in the ground, and by pushing a stick from one to the other of these, and then withdrawing this, a tunnel or covered passage is made between the two holes. 
A fire in which pairings of the hoofs of tapers and other animal substances are burned, is then kindled in one hole, ants and wasps are also put into this hole, and it is then covered over with sticks and earth. The smoke passes through the tunnel into the second hole. The poor dog is then caught, and its head is held down in the second hole, until the animal sometimes drops senseless from pain. IT 228 233 Binas are charms, plant or animal, which affect their purpose by enticing or attracting the particular object or desire yearned for, whatever it may be, from the capture of an animal to the gratification of a wish. The real source of the term bina is from the Arawak bia bina, meaning, to entice, attract, etc., and so comes to be applied to all those things, plant or animal, which act on those lines. I have found nothing of this nature in the inorganic world, unless the quartz pebbles within the P.I.'s rattle are to be considered such. As against this view, it might be urged that the medicine man's tobacco smoke constitutes the real or at least co-equal attraction for the spirits, sect. 170. I'm Thurn is certainly incorrect in speaking of the word being of Carib origin. As a matter of fact, the Carib term is Turilari, for example, the Caribs speak of the bushhog Bina as Panjo Turilari. The Warao word is Ibihai, for instance, Toma Ibihai means the Bina for meat, in general. As a rule there is but one Bina for each special object or thing, but not necessarily. I know of one that is employed for small hog, deer, and akuri. And with very few exceptions, the plants employed as Binas are the different varieties of Caladium. Indian huntsmen place great value on the use of the Caladia, each variety being a bina or charm to assist in the taking of a particular kind of game. Not only do these plants grow spontaneously in old fields, but the Indians carefully remove and plant in the immediate neighborhood of their dwellings the most valued kinds, as the binas for taper, wild hogs, deer, labba, turtle, and those for the various kinds of fish, duh, 253. As a rule, women are supposed neither to see nor to handle such plants thus cultivated. Even in so comparatively civilized a district as the Pomeroon and Maruka, I have collected more than a score of such plants. The respective leaves of which in the majority of cases bear some real or fancied resemblance to the animal for which they are reputed to have so peculiar an affinity. Thus the bushhog bina has a leaf easily recognizable by the small secondary leaf on its under surface, representing the animal's scent gland, though some Indians say that it indicates the tip of the nostril. The deer bina shows the horns, in its general contour, and the coloration of the fur in its venation, the armadillo bina typifies the shape of the small projecting ears. The Lucanani bina bears a variety of colors resembling those around the fish's gills, the gillbacker bina develops the same yellowish color as the fish which it attracts, the laba bina has the typical white markings. The poas bina bears the identical shape of that bird's wing feather, and so on for turtle, huri, etc. Some of these binas seemingly must be of comparatively widespread use. Thus, that for the bushhog is known in the Makusi country, those for the turtle, and armadillo, in Suriname, J. Rodway, etc. The hunter puts the particular plant to use by taking off a young as yet unopened shoot, and placing it, in the rough, in his powder flask, or rubbing it up into the paint, with which he smears his face and body, but especially all the main joints. Or, on the other hand, he may employ only the leaf, which he rubs on his arrow, his fish hook, his gun barrel, or on his dog. In Cayenne, these binas, the herbs enchantresses, are said to have been hung up on the trees, lap, 2, 221. 234. In Cayenne, the dog was also rubbed with simples, for which procedure Patu gives the negative reason, so that the game should not take itself off on its approach, lap, 2, 220. The Rukoyens, a Carib nation of the same colony, quitivate in their clearings the Hibiscus abomascus, from which they make a musk scented infusion for washing their dogs before taking them to hunt jaguar, CR. 330 This, however, has nothing to do with the binas, the object of its application being to prevent the tiger biting the dog, owing to the pungency of the smell. Hunting dogs are also rubbed over with ruku, bixa or alana, 
both by Indians, Trios, Ojanas, and others, and Bush Negroes, go, three in British Guiana the practice said to keep off certain ticks, key, 184. The methods adopted by the Quarantine Arawaks for training, sect. 232, their dogs to hunt may be included here. While the procedure may be correctly given, the statements relative to the naming of the particular leaf after the animal which feeds on it and the alleged odor are of course imaginative. These Arawaks first choose the dogs for hunting various animals, according to strength, having each one broken for hunting a different species of game, taking the largest for the wild hog, and the smaller ones for the smaller animals. When about six months old they are taken to the hunt with their sires, having previously gone through the process of being washed and rubbed over with a particular leaf named after the animal which feeds on it, and which the dog is intended to hunt. And it is curious that these leaves should partake of the odor of the animal. The game being discovered, the young dog is taken forward, and set on him, but he generally turns tail for the few first times, as this breed is naturally without spirit. He is then taken up, and again goes through the same process of washing and rubbing with the leaf. And at length he is treated to a piece of the animal's flesh, which makes him more keen and ravenous. In this manner, exerting patience, of which these Indians have a most abundant stock, and seldom correcting the animal, it becomes in time a reliable and valuable dog, STC, I, 315. The method sometimes used by the Zaporo Indians of the Napo River, Upper Amazon, in training their celebrated hunting dogs consists in putting a dose of tobacco down the animal's throat, his nose and mouth being then also stuffed full of it. Until he nearly chokes. This is to clear his scent and sharpen his perceptions, A.S. 169. 235. Old Caribs, Waraus, and Arawaks of the Pomeroon and Morocco rivers agree in telling me that they originally obtained their hunting binas, they are not so sure about the binas employed for other purposes, from certain very large snakes. Which are invariably to be met with only in localities so far distant from the source of information as to preclude the possibility of my ever obtaining specimens. The Caribs refer me to two snakes, the Oropuri, sect. 3 and the Aramari. The former lives on the ground, beyond the Waini and the Barima. The latter, which is much the bigger, lives in the tops of trees and catches its prey by pouncing upon it from above, it is also the more dangerous because from it can be obtained binas which, in addition to attracting all kinds of game, can attract thunder, lightning, and rain. The Warows admit that almost all they know about the binas has been taught them by the Akaways and Caribs. The Arawak serpent is known as Orally, sect. 363, or, on account of its rate of progression, Colacanaro, the slow walker. The traditions of all three tribes agree in that, after having been killed, the snake was carefully burnt, and that from the ashes there subsequently arose all the different plants, mostly, but not all of them, caladiums. Which are now employed as binas, sect. 168a. The Arawaks say that. A long time ago people noticed how every now and again one of their friends would leave his house, go into the forest, and never be seen more, they accordingly made up a big party. And tracked the latest victim to two immense silk cotton trees, and there was the huge serpent stretched across, somewhat like a bridge, from the summit of one tree to the other. They found out that from this serpentine bridge, Pieces of the flesh would fall to the ground where they took on the form of dry firewood, which the innocent folk passing by would gather up in mistake, that immediately upon just touching this dead timber the awful snake pounced down and seized its human prey. It was accordingly agreed that Orly must be killed, a deed which they succeeded in effecting by means of blowpipes and poisoned arrows. The carcass was then covered with bushes and saplings, and set fire to. As already mentioned the binas all grew out of the ashes. How the special efficacy of each bina was originally discovered has been explained to me somewhat on the following lines, trial would daily be made of one plant after the other. Taking, for instance, plant number one, on the first day, the hunter might come across a tiger. A plant that enticed or attracted such an animal would certainly be of no use to him, and would accordingly be discarded. Another day, he might try plant no. 
too, and run across a snake, that plant also could be cast aside. If on the other hand, with plant no. 3 he were to fall in with some scrub turkey or similar game, he would reserve that plant for future use, and so on with each animal or bird of economic value. But of course nowadays since they know of and cultivate these different plants around their houses, such trials are not necessary, they are quite aware what particular plant will specially attract some particular animal. 236. Corresponding animal benes for attracting game must be somewhat scarce, I have succeeded in obtaining only the following examples. When Arawaks on the Pomeroon kill a bush hog which happens to contain young, they bury the latter under the house in a spot below the place where the cassava is usually graded. The idea being that other bush hogs may come near the house to the spot whither the young are calling them. So among the Yups River Indians, when they kill a bush hog they bury the head at the spot where they first met the band, so that the latter may not stray away but return there. Coup, 2, 171. If a fisherman, Pomeroon Arawaks, has been unlucky, and finally catches any little fish, he will take it off the hook and, blowing into its mouth, say, I will let you go again, if you tell your friends, the bigger fish, to come. Of course it tells them, and the fisherman's luck is rewarded. But the little fish is not given its liberty again as promised, for the Indians say that if they returned it to the water, it would tell its friends not to bite at the hook. There are three such fish that are thus supposed to act as benas, the Weesher, Crenicicla saxatilis, Sunifaris H, the Shibali, Akara, Putwa, and the Huridiro. Eigenmania lineatus, a fish 12 to 14 inches long, but of which the long thin tall constitutes a good third. Similar ideas underlie a procedure reported from Caracas, when an Indian slays a wild beast, he opens its mouth, and pours down its throat some intoxicating liquor. In order that its soul, spirit, may inform others of a similar species of the kind reception it received, and that they may be encouraged to come and share the same favor, FD, 52. Game, however, can be attracted to the hunting dog. There is a certain ant, Kudu Kudu Barilia of the Arawaks, which, after being roasted, is put inside a piece of cassava, and given to a dog to make it a good hunter of any animal. The dog is simultaneously trained to go into wood holes and earth holes by having its food placed inside a cassava squeezer. 237. The next class of binas deals with phases of the sexual question, conjugal rights, mutual love and affection, and babies. Where plants take the tidal roles, these are again mostly caladia. Arawak, Warao, Akawai, and Carib women all have their own binas for managing the opposite sex. The Arawak young woman plants her hiero, girl, bina usually in some secluded spot known only to herself. She will bathe with a leaf of it, or carry it about with her, and, provided the opportunity offers, without her being seen, may rub it over her lover's hammock, or she may rub her own hands with it, and then touch his. In any case, the man must be ignorant of what is going on, and, provided the procedure is strictly carried out as described, he will never have any desire to transfer his affections elsewhere. Again, the same woman may employ another plant, not a caladium, called the Kuruabina, apparently a Rajania of the Yam family. She will similarly bathe with the leaf, but retaining the water in which she has thus made her ablutions, will strew it on the path along which her sweetheart is about to travel, telling it to make him return soon. The male Arawak has a corresponding belief as to the Wajili, man, Bina. The leaf of which he generally carries about with the object of brushing over his girl's face or shoulders, he is very intent on going through this performance when he notices that she has a weakness for other men. Other peoples, as the Caribs, have similar practices, I know of three plants that are used by these people on the Pomeroon. Wairu, squeeze and pinch up a leaf or two in water, rub oneself now with the leaf, and throw the water just used in the direction of the person desired, at the same time calling his, or her, name. Wamba, used by the father for an absent elder son, or by the mother for an absent elder daughter, take a leaf with you in your hammock and call the boy's or girl's name. Akami, when a person has come with the object of picking a quarrel, rub the leaf over one's head and face, it will make him quite amicable and friendly. 
So also among the Suriname Kalinas, Caribs, the Guj tells us that to evoke affection, one rubs the hands and face with Tarala, Go, 14, 15 a woman, for instance, can do this when her man is away traveling, so that he may not forget her. When an Arawak or Warao woman is desirous of having a baby, and none happens to appear in the natural course of things, she pounds up in water a certain fungus, and drinks the infusion. As I have shown elsewhere, the absence of a boy is a slur on the Indian's womanhood and entails many opprobrious epithets. The fungus in question, a species of nigillaria, is known to the airwalk as Casadolokonobiabina, lit. Baby plenty charm, or, in its shortened form, as Casalobina, these women here never eat of a double fruit, which would mean twins for them, sect. 284a. 237a. The following is one of the few legends met with that contains reference to the application of Binas. The Bina, the resurrected father, and the bad girl, W. There was once a man with wife, two children. And his brother staying together in the one house. They were all warhouse. Going one morning to their field, husband and wife left the brother-in-law with instructions to go fishing so there might be something to eat on their return. But when they came back, they found he had been lazy, had never even been outside the house, and had eaten even the little that was in it. This made the man angry, and he upbraided his brother-in-law thus, I have to go and cut the field. I have to go into the bush to get game, and down to the water to catch fish. I have all the work to do, while you do nothing but lie idle in your hammock all day. Although I am now tired, I must go and catch fish. Saying this, he took his harpoon 138 and went down to the creek. The brother-in-law thereupon took up his cutlass, and after sharpening it followed him and got into his coriol. They met just as the husband was returning with his boat, bringing a large fish that he had speared with his lance. Hello. Finished already, said the one. Yes, replied the other, I caught a fine fish, and have it here. Well, lend me your lance, said the brother-in-law and I will go and shoot a fine fish also. The two corials thus drew near, and raising his lance, the man put it into his brother-in-law's boat. Just as he did so, the latter struck him with the cutlass and he fell dead after giving his assailant two cuts. The brother-in-law then tried to get rid of the corpse by throwing it into the water. Now it seems that when the sister saw her brother, after sharpening his cutlass, leave the house in a passion, she knew that some evil was about to happen and said to the children, Your uncle is vexed, he has sharpened his cutlass and followed your father. Let us see what he intends doing. So with her children she followed the two men, and came upon them just as her brother was trying to throw over the body. No. Don't do that, brother, she said, since you have killed him, you must take the body back to his house and bury it there. He did what he was told, took the body home, and started felling a tree in which to bury it. In the meantime the woman sent her children to fetch the deceased's brother and his old mother, at the same time sending them a message that they must not be vexed. The mother and brother came, and as they drew near they saw the murderer finish scooping out the trunk and take it to the house, where he commenced digging the grave. The brother was vexed, but his mother said, Don't trouble the man, we will see first of all what the widow intends to do. The latter, holding a cutlass in her hand, was watching the murderer dig, she told him to hurry and finish his task quickly. When the grave was finished, he put the coffin in, and then the corpse, which was properly dressed with paint and ornaments, and with which were placed knife, fish hooks, and other things. 139 As he was filling up the grave with earth, his hands all bleeding from the wounds the deceased had given him, his sister struck him from behind on his neck with her cutlass. After standing a while, he dropped dead and a new grave was dug for him, alongside of the other. They put him into this bear as he was, without dress or ornaments or any of his belongings, this was because they had no pity or sorrow for him. The mother and brother of the dead man returned to the old woman's home that very same day. They prevailed on the widow much against her will to come with them and bring the children. When they reached home the brother took charge of the widow, placed her in his hammock, and turning to his first wife said, I am going to take this woman she can make children, you cannot make them. 
but the two children that she had already did not like staying in their new home, and regularly every morning, after they had had something to eat, they would hurry off to their father's grave and would not return until late. On the third day of their visit to the grave they met a habu, but the children did not recognize him. He said to them, If you want your father you must pick a leaf of a certain tree, which he mentioned, and rub it over the grave, when he will appear to you. But we don't know the leaf, they replied, so the little man gathered some of the leaves for them. He told them to rub the leaves over the ground where the body was buried, directly they reached there on the following morning, and then to come again at midday, when their father would be present. They did exactly as they had been told next morning, and when they returned at midday they saw their father seated on a bench. They approached. He said, Fetch me water to drink. After he had drunk, he said, Where is your mother? And when he learned that she was at their grandmother's he told them to go and fetch her. Now as soon as they reached their mother and told her all these things, she exclaimed, How can this be? How can your father send for me when he is dead? Thus it was, she would not believe all this at first, but when the boys pleaded, Come, mother. It is all true, she went. The boys wished her to bring her hammock along, but she refused. What is the use of it, she said. For she did not believe as yet what they told her. However, she did go, and sure enough when she reached the place, she recognized the very man, her husband, seated there on the bench right in front of her. The first thing he asked her was, Where is your brother? To which she replied, Why? I killed him, and buried him beside you. Well, came the husband's answer, You will never see him again. Now although her husband was very weak with all that he had suffered and passed through, she nursed him carefully and brought him back to health, so that within a week he was quite himself again. 238. There are certain animal binas corresponding in their action with the plant binas just mentioned in connection with sexual matters. Among the Pomeroon Arawaks, when the husband is very jealous and ill-tempered, his wife will cut off the head of a small lizard, Yamoro, burn it, and put the ashes into the water which she gives him to drink. Any man or woman can then make the husband do whatever he or she likes. When one woman wants another's husband she will manage to put marabunta, wasp, eggs into his drink, which will make him leave his own wife and go off with her, the eggs are pounded up and roasted before mixing. On the upper Amazons, the native women, even the white and half-caste inhabitants of the towns, attach superstitious value to the skin and feathers of the papuira. Believing that the relics will have the effect of attracting for the happy possessors a train of lovers and followers, the Indians have noticed these miscellaneous hunting parties of birds. But appeared not to have observed that they are occupied in searching for insects. They have supplied their want of knowledge. By a theory which has degenerated into a myth to the effect that the onward moving bands are led by a little grey bird called the papawira, which fascinates all the rest and leads them a weary dance through the thickets. There is certainly some appearance of truth in this explanation. For sometimes stray birds encountered in the line of march are seen to be drawn into the throng, and purely frugivorous birds are now and then found mixed up with the rest, as though led away by some will of the wisp, H.W.B., 346. Dot. When it is known to her intimate friends and relatives that an Arawak woman wants an infant, they will give her to drink of a mixture, in which, unknown to her, they have placed the roasted and pulverized remains of either a cockroach, maturo, the eggs of a certain spider, or the paw of an opossum, yawari. 239. Talismans, the last group of charms to be dealt with, include those which repel evil, bad luck, and the like. And so have a protective or defensive character, those which endow the Indian with such superior advantages of body and estate as enable him to get the better of his fellow creatures, human and animal. Matters of courage, health and strength, power to withstand sickness and his enemies, craft to excel in the chase, trade and barter, all find a place here. With regard to the chase, the provisions mentioned in sect 243 might very reasonably be regarded as talismanic. Among the trios, caribs, of Suriname, says de Guj. We saw afresh how one of our party rubbed the palms of his hands with Tarala, caladium bulb, on arrival at a village of which they had much dread. 
A young man on a journey through the forest carried Cienti, Tarala, in a little palm leaf box attached to the neck, in order to strengthen his head and shoulders. A child with fever was one afternoon washed by its mother with water into which finely ground Cienti had been placed. As after two days, the fever again appeared, it was streaked with ruka paint, with which the same stuff had been mixed. Go, 14-15 the good states also that when making a purchase, the buyer will take a little tarala between his lips to prevent the seller overreaching him. According to Skomberg, SCF, 215, the Mayankongs used for necklaces a bunch of the slender stems of a cryptogamous plant, a fern called Zinapipo by them, to which they ascribe talismanic property. 240. On the pomeroon one can string the tail rings and claws of a scorpion, and tie it round his little girl's wrist. By and by, when she becomes a woman and makes piwari, the liquor will be strong and biting. 140 tiger teeth, threaded and tied on the child, will also ensure its gaining strength. Arawaks, bushhog teeth will make a good huntsman of him. Aderas and Wapazianas, Ku, 2, 315. Tiger teeth or bushhog teeth will preserve him, when he grows up, from being attacked by wild beasts. Yups River, Ku, 2, 171. Makusi women and children wear round their necks tiger's teeth, to which they ascribe talismanic power, SCT, 61. SCR, 2, 83. On the Burbis the sticks cut down by the Sawyer beetle are given by the Indians to children cutting teeth, to rub their gums with, under the impression that as a result the teeth will grow strong and sharp, the, 15. With the Indians of the upper Napo River, Amazons, Bracelets and armlets of iguana skin are much affected, as in some parts of Central America, with the same association of their imparting bravery and pugnacity to the wearer. A.S. 154. To obtain sharp vision, a Kobua Indian will rub his eyes with those of a certain falcon. K.G. 2. 153. The Caribs and almost all other Indians ascribe talismanic powers to the large teeth of an alligator. S.C.A. 336. West of the Orinoco alligator teeth are employed by the Indians as an ornament for the neck and arms. They are also regarded as an antidote for certain poisons, and as an alexipharmic in general, FD, 151. As an antidote for poison, within the Orinoco area, Camilla speaks of alligator teeth mounted in gold or silver and tied by a small chain on one of the arms or made up into rings worn on the fingers. But this would appear to be a discovery learned from the Negro slaves, g. 2, 225. 240a, the application of red paint was sometimes considered a talisman against sickness and disease. Thus, among the Makusis of the Rupianini the mothers ceremonially rub red, aromatic, paint on the heads of their children, who are then supposed to be protected from illness and the power of evil spirits, scr. i. 366. The men, Guahibos of the Vichada River, Orinoco, then squatted on the little benches, and the women painted them from top to toe with a red paste, this, the women said, would protect them from sicknesses, CR, 548. On the branches of the upper Rio Negro also red paint was considered a prophylactic against disease, KG, I, 158, 2, 85, 150. The application of blood would almost seem to have had an antecedent origin, from which that of the red paint was but a development, and yet, strange to say, the positive evidence now available points rather to the reputed curative than the protective power of the vital fluid. Thus in some cases the father, when the child is weakly, has his own flesh cut in close parallel lines, the blood flowing from the wounds is mixed with water for washing and strengthening the child, the, 250. Among the island Caribs, after the kavad the child's face is smeared with the father's blood to impart courage, rp. 550. On the Orinoco, when the Guama women recognize that any of their children, nurslings or somewhat older ones, are sick, they transfix their own tongues with finely ground bone lancets. The blood gushes forth in torrents and with it they bespatter their youngsters by mouthfuls, while, with their hands, they smear it all over them from head to foot, G. I. 164. In the same area, 
for older people it is one of the duties of the captains of the Guama nation to slash his flesh daily and drain off his blood in order to besmear the breasts of all those under his command who are sick, g. i. 164. Dance, 250, speaks of an old man being washed in turtle's blood. 241, the widespread belief in spirits connected with mountains, rocks, stones, etc will probably help to explain the talismanic virtues ascribed to the green Amazon stones, Lapis nephriticus, the Piedra Hijada of the Spaniards. Out on the islands, they also wear necklaces made out of large crystals and green stones which come from the mainland toward the Amazon River, and have a healing virtue, it is their precious ornament and is only worn at feasts, BBR, 248. Humboldt found them among the Indians of the Rio Negro, where they are carried on the neck as amulets for protection against fever, and the bites of poisonous snakes, AVH, 2, 395, 462. Martius found them on the Rio Negro among the inhabitants of Silves, and Scomberg in Demerara. The last-named authority says. Through the Caribs along the Guiana coast these stones were brought into Demerara where they are known as Maquaba or Calicot stones. On the Orinoco they are called Macagua. They were formerly brought in considerable quantities by the Caribs to Demerara, but now very rarely. As I was told by people, these stones were also formerly brought to Demerara in the form of fishes and other animals, as well as with figures cut into the surfaces. According to Berayer, they were treasured more than gold by the Caribs, such a stone was the price of a slave. Raleigh saw them on the Orinoco, and noticed that every cacique had such a stone which was usually carried by his women, they treasured them more than gold. Lawrence Kimiz says of the Carib and other tribes who dwell on the Arawari, below the Oyapoque, their money is white and green stones. He found the same thing on the Corentin. According to Clavigero they are identical with the green stones of the Mexican Anahuacs, these people could cut all manners of figures out of this stone, and knew also how to cut diamonds. SCR, 2, 330-2. These Amazon stones, as just mentioned, were highly valued by the Galibus of Cayenne, who called them Takaravi, about which Pierre Berayer has left us this account. This stone is of olive color, of a slightly paler green. And close to a pearl gray, presque dun gris de pearls. I have brought all colors from Guiana. The most common shape one gives to this stone is cylindrical, length of 2, 3, up to 4 inches, by 6 or 7 lines in diameter, and drilled their whole length. I have seen some of them that were squared, oval, to which one had given the shape of a crescent and imprinted upon it the figure of a toad, or some other animals. This stone is known by lapidaries under the name of jade. It is highly polished, and so hard, that one can hardly work with it except with diamond powder. One has assured me that it is artificial, that a nation called Tapui who live 150 leagues, or thereabout from Para, busy themselves in making them. PBA, 175. There is another interesting reference to these green and grey jade stones in Suriname. They are stones harder than jasper, susceptible of a fine polish and making fire with a steel, although oily to the sight and touch. They are extremely hard to work. The Indians also set such great store on them that they regard these stones as very precious jewels, with which they decorate themselves when disposed to, show themselves within their fine attire, Fe, 2, 351. I have come across a possible reference to them in a Warao legend, sect. 139. A comparison between these Amazon stones and the drilled stones of quartz imperfectly crystallized, used as neck ornaments and as symbols of authority by the chiefs among the Yupes River Indians, ARW, 191, is well worth consideration. 15. Restrictions on Game and Food, Vision, Arts and Crafts, Nomenclature, Taboos. Restrictions on Game and Food, Must Not Hunt Too Many of One Kind, 242, Spirit of Slain Animal Must Be Prevented Injuring Slayer, 243. Hunter must not himself bring his bag into the house, 244, when animal is killed by arrow or gun trap, meat has to be cooked in special manner, 245, food not eaten after nightfall, 246. 
Food Restrictions on Age, Sex, and Nation, 247 at Moon Eclipse, Puberty, Pregnancy, and Other Periods, in Mourning, Sickness, Traveling, 248, of Totem Animals, 249. Attributes of animals eaten may be transferred by ingestion to the consumer, 250. Dogs also restricted as to food, 251. Restrictions on vision, protective or defensive measure to prevent spirit being attracted toward visitor, 252. Same principle applied to taking of a photograph, etc., 253. Practice may be accompanied with flagellation, 254. A sign of envy, hatred, and malice, 255. Concurrent expression of a wish, 256. At place of entertainment, 257. Restrictions on arts and crafts, manufacture of pottery, 258 to 259, hammocks, canoes, huts, and fieldwork, 260, the uses of the fan, and dress, 261, preparation of karari, warali, poison, 262. Restrictions in nomenclature, personal names, association between individual and name, which must not be mentioned in his presence, 263. Naming of child, 264, change of name, 265. Reasons for giving certain names to dogs, 266. Special words have to suit special circumstances, 266a. 242, if Indians hunt too many of one kind of game, the bush spirit of that particular animal may come and do them harm, sect. 98. The baboon cough, w. There was a party of Indians hunting baboons. They would take their hammocks out into the forest, kill a baboon, dry it, smoke it, catch another, rest themselves there, and start a similar procedure on the morrow. They made a continuous business of baboon hunting, and did nothing else. One day they went away as usual, leaving but one woman behind. After a time she heard a roaring in the distance, just like thunder, and waiting a while she heard a whistling, just like that of a man when he is tired. 141 It was indeed someone coming along, and at last she saw an old man with bent back supporting himself with a stick. He approached the woman and said, How do you do, grandchild? Now, as she was quite an old woman you can imagine how old he must have been. He was really the habu grandfather of all the baboons. She got up, fetched a stool, bade him be seated, and offered him dried meat and cassava. The old man had a good look at the dried meat and started crying, Oh, my poor grandchildren. So that is how I am losing every one of you. He told the woman to take the food away, that he wanted none of it, and he then asked her where all the rest of the people were gone. She told him that they were all out hunting the very same game that he had refused. Very well, said he, let them all remain at home tomorrow, and I will meet them. He then went away. At evening time, the hunting party returned, and the old woman told her husband what had happened, and all about the queer old man, but he would not believe her, saying that she must have been visited by some old sweetheart. So she went and told the rest of the people, and when the head man had listened to her story, he said, Yes, what she says must be true. We will remain with her tomorrow. They therefore stayed with her next day. At the appointed time they heard the roaring followed by a whistle. Now when the old woman, who was still angry with her husband for not having believed her, heard the whistle, she said mockingly, There you are. That's my sweetheart. And a few minutes later the old man put in an appearance. He was given a seat, and having learned that everybody was at home, he told them all to stand up in a line, side by side. One woman, who was in advanced pregnancy, was half ashamed to take so prominent a position, and recognizing that the queer old man's hand was big and sharp like a claw, she became frightened. She felt sure she must be dealing with a habu of some sort, and made her escape. Having thus got all the people into line, the habu quickly passed down the ranks, and, clawing, in the air, so to speak, at each person's head, killed every one of them. This done, he called out twice for his wife to come, and she answered him. She was a very old granny carrying an immense quake, so big that she could cram four or five people into it. And this is just what the old woman did, 
she carried the dead bodies, quakeful by quakeful, over to her own place. In the meantime, the old man Habu examined the roof and under the flooring, he even opened the truly covering of the banab to see if anyone was in hiding. But both he and his wife were being watched by the pregnant woman, who had made her escape. She saw everything, and then reported to her friends at the next settlement. The headman and the others accompanied her to the spot where the Habu's wife had carried all the dead bodies. They came to an immense silk cotton tree, so huge that the cavities of its entire trunk and branches were occupied by members of the Baboon Habu family. The party made a large fire around the tree, and threw peppers into it. 142 This smoked out and killed all the Habu baboons, from the youngest to the oldest, the queer old grandfather Habu being killed last, sect. 167. Of course before giving up the ghost they did a lot of choking and coughing, and in his dying rage the old Habu swore that this choking and coughing would remain with us forever. Indeed, it is this pepper sickness which is causing so much mischief now and killing so many of our children. We wore out Indians have known the sickness for a long time as the baboon cough, but you white people are ignorant of this, and persist in calling it whooping cough. 243. Special precautions have to be taken when any large animal has been slain, to protect the hunter from any harm that might be expected from the spirit of the animal he has just destroyed, sect. 129. Thus, when a big snake or other large animal is killed, arrows are stuck into the ground in the middle of the pathway leading from the place of destruction toward the house. With a view to preventing the spirit of the beast coming to do the slayer or his family any hurt. The peculiar arrangement of the pointed sticks which Barrington Brown described from the Imoi River between Anako and Taipong villages toward the upper Potaro. Probably served a similar purpose, in many places on the path we had to step over arrangements of little sharpened sticks, placed loosely together in a variety of ways. These, the guide said, were put by the Indians using this path for the purpose of keeping the pumas and jaguars from traversing it. These sticks were not meant to injure the animals, in fact they were too loosely stuck up for that, but were merely intended by their artificial appearance to scare off the tigers, bro, 198. The pointed hardwood sticks, stuck into the ground, guarding the pathways leading to the houses of the Akaweos, Ba, 268-9, of the Oyapok River Indians, CR, 169, and others, may have been employed for corresponding reasons. Although other reasons have been given. The same may be said of the following, before leaving a temporary camp in the forest, where they have killed a taper and dried the meat on a babricot, Indians invariably destroy this babricot, saying that should a taper, passing that way, find traces of the slaughter of one of his kind, he would come by night on the next occasion, when Indians slept at that place, and, taking a man, would babricote him in revenge, it. 352. In Cayenne, between the upper Yeri and Peru rivers, Cravo, 252, makes this interesting note, I see ten boucans disposed in a line along the pathway. What puzzles me is that there is no fire beneath. Another thing, instead of being charged with smoked meat, they are covered with several billets of dry wood alternating with stones. I learn that these altars have been made by ten hunters of a neighboring village who started some days ago on a big expedition. Every time the Rukoyens go hunting, shooting with arrows, the Quada monkey, they stop to trim these boucans, 143. 244. An Indian must never himself bring into the house any game that he has caught, but leave it for his wife to carry in if she has been accompanying him. Otherwise he will place it on the pathway, some four roods or so from the house, whence the women folk will fetch it. Patu gives a very interesting example of this from Cayenne, Lap, 2, 220, Ebisik. Similarly, with fish, unless very small, or unless there is only a single one that he can carry on the stick with which he has skewered its gills, he never brings them into the house. But makes his wife go fetch them from the waterside. The reason given for this custom is that were the food to be brought home direct by the man he would have bad luck in fishing or hunting on the next occasion. A similar practice is recorded from Cayenne and from the islands. When the men, Rukuyens, 
return from the chase. They bring the game as far as the edge of the forest, whither the women go to fetch it, cr. 283. Carib Island women go and fetch the venison from the spot where it has fallen, and the fish on the banks of the stream, ROP. For 93, when they have caught anything, they leave it on the spot, and the women were formerly obliged to go and fetch it to the house. 245. Among the Pomeroon Arawaks, when an animal is killed with an arrow trap or a gun trap, its flesh has to be cooked in a pot without a cover, over a fire which is not too large, so as to avoid any water boiling over. Were either of these matters not attended to, there would be no further use either for the arrow or for the gun, as all the game of the same kind as that recently trapped would take its departure to another region. 246. Among the Arawaks it would seem that food in general was not allowed to be eaten after nightfall, any person guilty of this offense being invariably changed into an animal. The story of the man who dined after dark, sect. 114, has reference to this belief. The origin of such a custom it is somewhat difficult to trace. That it cannot be due to any desire to prevent exposure to the enemy through the lights of the fires required for cooking is evident from the fact that fires for purposes of warmth, protection from jaguars, and other beasts of prey may be kept burning all night. It may be due to some such superstition as is met with among the Javaros of the Pintuck, the Piojas of the Putumayo, Upper Amazon, and others, who argue that all food which remains in the stomach overnight is unwholesome and undigested and should therefore be removed. Accordingly they have the habit of inducing vomiting every morning by the use of a feather, A.S. 93. 247. On the Amazons, the children, more particularly the females, are restricted to a particular food, they are not allowed to eat the meat of any kind of game, nor of fish, except the very small bony kinds. Their food principally consisting of mandioca cake and fruits, A.R.W., 345. We must accept with caution the opinion implied or expressed by various authorities that each nation as such differs from the others with respect to the indigenous foods from the use of which the people abstain. A certain food may be taboo to any one or more individuals, independently of membership in a certain tribe, at the instigation of a medicine man as a part of the treatment for illness, on account of his wife's condition, or for other reasons. While we have the definite assurance of Scomberg that the Caribs never eat monkeys, SCR, 2, for 34, Gamilla says that each nation is fond of one kind of monkey but loathes the others. The Achaguas are very fond of the yellow ones, which they call Arabata, the Tenevos like the black ones, while the Jararas, Ericos, Betoyes, and other nations prefer the white ones, g. i. 260. The present-day Pomeroon Caribs will eat neither armadillo, alligator, kamudi, nor monkey, but no reasons for such restrictions are obtainable. Kapler speaks of the Suriname Indians refusing to eat snakes and large sea turtles, a.k. 188. All tribes agree in refusing to eat the flesh of such animals as are not indigenous to their country but were introduced from abroad, such as oxen, sheep, pigs, goats, and fowls. It must, however, be added that, under great pressure of circumstances, such as utter want of other food, these meats are occasionally rendered eatable by the simple ceremony of getting a PM on. Or even occasionally an old woman, who may play the role of PI, to blow a certain number of times on them. Apparently on the principle that the spirit of the animal about to be eaten is thus expelled, IT, 368. Skomberg tells us how the aversion to European pork was never so strongly met with as among the Wapazianas. At Watadakaba village the indisposition of a little girl was considered due to the circumstance that his cook, who had helped the child carry wood and water, had given her some to eat, SCR, 2, 389. In Cayenne, they do not eat fowls, pools, and other birds though they be delicious. They imagine that out of spite these animals would cut their stomachs to pieces, gnaw their intestines, and cause frightful colic with the beak and spurs, although only the meat portion should be eaten, PBA, 231. The bush negroes at Apicalo's village, Suriname, said that all the trio's Indians would die because the Europeans had partaken of the same food as they had, Go, 22. 
All the old PAs that I have met still persist in their refusal to partake of European food, sect. 286. 248. Food may be restricted or taboo only under special circumstances, as at an eclipse of the moon, sect. 200. In Cayenne, apparently men and women religiously abstain during the period of mourning from eating certain meats, or from cutting large timber, and several other practices of this nature, PBA, 229. The whole family may be restricted in the way of food, when a member of it happens to be ill, sect. 317. The taboos of various foods at the physiological periods of a man's or a woman's life are noted elsewhere, sex, 267 to 284. Among the Makusis, during the time that the natural colors of the feathers are being artificially altered the owner of the bird eats very sparingly and chiefly of certain kinds of food, t. 1882, page 28. The island caribs eat flesh only when there are strangers at table. Otherwise, they hunt but for lizards and fish, it is only on those special occasions when they want to entertain their European friends or for purposes of trade and barter, that they hunt anything else, ROP, 506. When they have to cross over sea to go to another island like St. Lucie, or St. Vincent, they eat no crabs or lizards, because these animals live in holes, consequently this would prevent them getting to another land, BBR, 245. An Indian does not eat an animal that he may have domesticated and tamed. 249. Unlike what might have been expected from a consideration of other savage races, even so near as those of North America, there seems to be no record of the taboo of the so-called totem animal, but I cannot assume for this reason that such taboo is. Or was, non-existent. As a matter of fact, during the whole course of my annotation of all available literature relative to the Guiana Indians, I can find but one statement bearing on the question and that in the negative. This is from Craveau, 523. On the Guavier, a branch of the Orinoco, he found an Indian who, although a Piapoco, i.e. toucan, had no qualms about killing the bird after which his tribe was named. All the other references are of doubtful totemic significance. 250. Certain indigenous animals are not to be eaten, apparently for no assignable cause. On the Maruca, the Arawaks do not use the flesh of the Palamedia cornuta lin, although they employ the tail feathers for arrow barbs, SCR, 2, 457. While the Makusis touch the flesh of the ant bear only when forced by want, the Caribs regard it as the greatest delicacy, SCR, 2, 434. So also the Yups Indians do not eat the large wild pig, Dicotyles labiatus, the anta, Tapyrus americanus, or the white rumped mutant, Crax globicera. ARW, 337. In the Pomeroon, when men kill a bush hog or any other animal that happens to contain young, there are always to be found Indians who will not touch the flesh. Other animals will be avoided for more or less defined reasons. Thus, the savanna peewit, Vanellus canensis, is never eaten by Indians, as they say that partaking of its flesh produces deafness, bro, 104. At Caracana, near River Meta, Orinoco, the Pieroas said that the people of their tribe infallibly die when they eat of the Manati, AVH, 2, 492. In Suriname, an old trio informed the Guj that he would never eat the head of a quad monkey, because his mother had told him that he would get gray hair like it, and women consider gray hair hateful, go, 22. Though hog and turtle were abundant on the islands, the caribs there eat neither, for the assigned reasons that their eyes might become small like the former animal, that they might participate in the clumsiness and stupidity of the latter, ROP. 465. The attributes of the animal eaten could be transferred by ingestion not only to the person eating, Compare ingestion of human flesh to obtain attributes of the deceased, insect. 77, but even to the child of such person, sect.279. The Zaporo Indians of the Napo River, Upper Amazon, are very particular in their diet, unless from necessity, they will, in most cases, not eat any heavy meats such as tapir and peccary, but confine themselves to birds, monkeys, deer, fish, etc principally because they argue that the heavier meats make them also unwieldy, 
like the animals who supply the flesh, impeding their agility and unfitting them for the chase, A.S. 168. On the upper Amazon the flesh of the male turtle, much less numerous than the female, is considered unwholesome, especially to sick people having external signs of inflammation, H.W.B., 309. 251. Dogs also are precluded from eating certain foods. In Kayan Cravo noticed that his Ruko Yen cooks through the beaks of the Kenoro's birds, Ara Kanga, into the river, in the belief that were their dogs to eat them, they, the dogs, would be poisoned, CR, 284. Here, on the Pomeroon, in many an Indian house you will often find stuck under the eaves of the overhanging trulli roof or slung up in a basket, the wings and breast bones of certain birds and often the bones of a laba or an akuri. It was a long time before I learned that they were placed there for a purpose other than ornament or decoration. If a dog were to eat either of those particular bird bones or any bones whatever of a laba or an akuri that it had not itself hunted, such dog would never catch any of these animals again. Point 144. 252. The temporary occlusion of vision, as with tobacco and peppers, on the occasion of visiting, for the first time any strikingly peculiar landmark of natural scenery, especially in the way of mountains, or even on entering a new region, would seem to have been a custom very prevalent among the Indians. From the examples which I propose here submitting it will be seen that the procedure specially concerns the particular spirit with which such landmark or region is connected. Its object, partly perhaps to placate this spirit, and so turn aside the sickness or any other evil it might otherwise choose to send, is mainly to prevent the visiting individual attracting it toward himself. The procedure is protective or defensive in the sense of thwarting evil. On first gaining sight of the Arisaro Hills, Essequibo River, the Caribbean Indians, who had never ascended the river so far, had to undergo an initiatory sight, which consisted in squeezing tobacco juice into their eyes, SCG, 229. So again, at the Twasinki or Kumadi Mountains, much superstition, as usual, was attached to them, and those who had never seen them before were obliged to drink lime juice and to have tobacco water squeezed into their eyes to avert the evil spirit, SCG, 231. I'm Thern, 368, speaks of peppers, capsicum, being employed for a similar purpose, and says, once, when neither peppers nor limes were at hand, a piece of blue indigo dyed cloth was carefully soaked and the dye was then rubbed into the eyes. While on the Quiwini, writes Barrington Brown, we passed a place one afternoon where the river was studded with high granite rocks two of which rose ten feet or so above the level of the highest floods. Our guide, Edward, turned his head away and would not look at them, Iruma, one of our caribs, took some tobacco, and dipping it into the water, leaned back and squeezed the juice into his eyes, and as soon as the tears thus produced had subsided. He calmly gazed upon the rocks, bro, thirty. Near the mouth of the Quiwini River, Upper Essequibo, to quote the same author, were some large granite rocks in passing which our carib turned away his face in an opposite direction. Upon questioning him as to his reason for so doing, I learned that if he looked at them, he would get fever, bro, 244. Another interesting extract is from Gen Man, 23. We met on the savannah about a hundred Indians of all ages and both sexes, resting on their way down to the hill to the landing at Tukiat, going down to the mission. It was the first time they had passed the Kayatuk, Kaiter, as they called it, though they were careful to keep almost beyond the sound of its roar and far out of sight of it. Each one, from the newly born baby in arms, to the oldest man and woman, had pepper juice applied to the balls of the eyes, carefully inserted within the lids. With a small loop made of a finely twisted piece of tibisiri, Mauritia fiber, to avert any evil which might otherwise befall them from having come near the fall and into a new part of the country. Its application appeared to give acute pain for a short time, and brought a copious flow of tears. Some courageously just kept the eyelids open without touching them, others, with less nerve, had to hold theirs open. The pepper juice was applied by one man, a middle-aged person. The present-day Arawaks when visiting any new place for the first time, whether now connected with spirits or not, put creek water or river water into their eyes, 
they tell me here that it is with the object of placating any spirits that may be lurking in the vicinity, for should they neglect the custom, the Yawahos might not only send them sore eyes, but many other sicknesses. One woman maintained that, independently of any evil spirits, the very novelty of the scene might give her sore eyes, in the absence of the usual precaution. 253 Warows assure me that on looking at a mountain for the first time the eyes are shut to prevent the person attracting or drawing the shadow of the spirit toward him, sect. 190. When one person looks at another, the former draws or drags the latter's shadow, sect. 68. Toward him, a principle on which these Indians explain the taking of a photograph. The island carib corpse is laid out with two weights on the eyes, that he may not see his parents thus making them ill, sect. 80. Catlin gives an amusing instance among the conobos of the Amazon, of the local medicine man preventing him painting any more portraits by exhorting the tribesmen as follows, these things are a great mystery, but there you are, my friends. With your eyes open all night, they never shut, this is all wrong and you are very foolish to allow it. You never will be happy afterwards if you allow these things to be always awake in the night. My friends, this is only a cunning way this man has to get your skins. And the next thing they will have glass eyes, and be placed among the skins of the wild beasts and birds and snakes. The medicine man had been to Para or some other place where he had seen the stuffed skins in a museum. GC, 321-323 for a pregnant woman to look at the face of a corpse will draw trouble on her unborn child, sect. 279. It is possible that, perhaps on principles analogous to some of the preceding, most European races have adopted the practice of closing the eyes when in the attitude of prayer. It is therefore not so very remarkable that I found the aboriginal communicants of a certain mission speaking of prayer generally by a term which, literally translated, means, to shut the eyes. 254. But this temporary occlusion of the eyes may be accompanied with another procedure, that of whipping. Thus, at the Karata Rocks, head of Wenema River, a branch of the Kuyuni, the Indians who had never been here before, gave themselves up to the wildest orgies. Several calabashes were placed on the rocks, before which two old Arakunas, with faces turned toward the north, squatted, and murmured unintelligible words, while an equally old P.I. rubbed powdered capsicum into the eyes of each of the novices. When the first pains were over, they broke twigs off from the nearest bushes, and whipped one another on the legs and feet, until blood was drawn, S.C.R., 2, 346. In the last group of cases, it is not the body, but the rock or other natural feature that is whipped. And so it happens that while Bottom Wetham admits that they will never point at certain rocks with a finger, although one's attention may be drawn to them by an inclination of the head, other rocks, they beat with green boughs, B.W., 182. That along the slopes of the surround mountains, Mazaruni River, under some of the enormous masses of conglomerate rock, were flowers and green branches that had been offered to the rock spirits by the superstitious natives, B.W., 190. But as this author may have obtained his information concerning the very same place, Surround River Valley, from Brown's work, published a couple of years before. I quote from the latter as well, on the way we passed a very large isolated rock of diorite which had formed part of one of the great layers of this rock, horizontally bedded in the sandstone, upon which were lying the bruised remains of a small tree branch with many more around its base. These were offerings left by Indian travelers at the shrine of the spirit of this rock who believe that if they did not perform the rite of breaking off a green bough and beating it on the rock, evil would assuredly befall them, Br. 78. 255. In a sense analogous to the idea of thwarting or avoiding evil may probably be regarded the closing of the eyes as a sign of envy, hatred, and malice. Thus, among Warows and Arawaks, as between man with man or woman with woman, the angered one will look at the other, suddenly shut the eyes, keep them closed a few seconds, and then turn away. The person thus treated will know that he or she must be prepared for the coming storm. So also the following occurrence reported from the Peru River in Cayenne may find place here, in a retired spot, I surprise a little girl who, like the ostrich, 
hides her face in a hole, leaving her body entirely exposed, cr. 273. It is possible that the peppering of the witch's eyes before clubbing her was intended to prevent the poor wretch attracting toward herself the spirits of those people she might otherwise have looked at, sect. 319. Compare also the binding of the girl's eyes in the puberty ceremony, sect. 271. 256. The closing of the eyes and the concurrent expression of a wish I am unable to obtain explanations for, except on the hypothesis of some spirit being supplicated, and deal with the practice here only as a matter of convenience. Mention is made of the custom in the Carib story of Shut your eyes and wish. C. There were two brothers, and each had set a spring trap to catch my puri, taper, but it had proved too smart for them. One day the younger came home and said, I have caught a bush cow. This made the elder one jealous, and hence his remark, If you have fooled me, I will kill you. So they went together into the bush, and sure enough there was the taper caught by the leg in the trap. The elder brother thereupon killed the beast, cut up the meat, and took it all for himself, leaving only the entrails for the younger. The latter returned home, and telling his mother how greedy her firstborn had been, prevailed upon her to leave the place with him. When they had travelled a great distance, they reached a hill, and the son said, Mother! Shut your eyes, and say, I want a field here, with plantains and potatoes, together with a house right in its very centre. The old woman did what she had been told, and lo, and behold! There she had exactly what she had asked for. The two of them remained there for a long period, quite happy and content, but the mother was getting old now. So the son said, Mother! Shut your eyes, and say, I want to be a young girl again. This she did, and her wish was immediately granted, she becoming so very sweet and attractive that her son became quite proud of her and wanted other people to see her also. Indeed, this made him say, Mother! Shut your eyes, and say, I wish my big son would come see me. No sooner said than done, and the elder brother put in his appearance. Now that they had a visitor, they must of course have Paiwari, so the younger brother told his mother as before to shut her eyes and wish for drinks, and accordingly they had a big jar of Paiwari. All three of them drank, and the big brother became beastly intoxicated, so much so that he commenced trying to take liberties with the pretty young woman. How dare you, expostulated the younger one. Don't you know that she is your mother? No. I don't, replied the elder, and what is more, I don't believe it, and as he insisted upon attempting to carry out his wicked designs, the two men fought. When the elder brother finally awoke from his drunken brawl, he found himself all alone in a strange broken-down old hut, and so he returned home disconsolate. The Makusis also would seem to have had similar ideas about wishing. For in their legend of Pia and Makinema the former tells his mother that whatever of good she desired she would obtain if she would bow her head and cover her face with her hands while she expressed her wish, sect. 41. 257. It was a superstition of the Indians in Kayan that the first person to see the dancers arrive at the actual place of entertainment would die during the course of the year or meet with other misfortune. Hence, directly the dancers left the public meeting house, carpet, to go to a retired spot for the purpose of decorating themselves, the audience took good care to go into hiding, and to return in a body, shouting and screaming like madmen. When the performers put in their appearance, PBA, 201. Lap, 2, 242. 258, the following are examples of what might be called restrictions in arts, crafts, and manufactures. On the left bank of the mouth of the Kuyuni is a small hill whither Indians come from long distances to obtain clay, which is believed to be especially desirable. Skomberg tells of a certain superstition which accounts for such large numbers of people congregating there. The Indians believe, for instance, that only during the first night of the incoming full moon, sect. 199, dare they carry on their business. Hence, numbers of people congregate at these times, as Bernal vouches for, and at break of day start for home laden with a large quantity. 
The Indians cling fast to the superstition that if the clay is obtained at any other times, the vessels acquire an evil peculiarity not only for becoming speedily broken, but also for bringing numerous diseases to him who eats out of them. 259. Such vessels could be even more intimately associated with spirit life, as witness the following story of The Lucky Pot, W. On his way home from the bush one day a man came across a bannock. With no human occupants but with a pot simmering on the fire. The pot addressed him, asking if he were hungry, and having received an affirmative reply, said, All right. I will cook bird for you, and began to boil. When ready, the man ate of the contents, and went home. His wife put fish before him, but he said, I do not want it. I am satisfied. By and by her husband made an excuse to leave the house, and having arrived at the bannock, said to the pot, I am hungry. You must cook meat now. So the pot boiled away and supplied him with pure bush hog. When he got home his wife put some cassava before him, but he said, I do not want it, my belly is full. After remaining at home two days and refusing the food which his wife regularly brought him, he paid another visit to the lucky pot, gorged himself with both bird and meat, and returned home again, where, as before, he assured his wife that he was satisfied and wanted for nothing. Now the two sons looked at him and at one another and then whispered to themselves, What does this mean? Our father stays at home two whole days, and is not hungry. He goes into the bush and even when he returns will not eat. Whence does he procure his food? So they watched his movements, and next day, following him at a distance, saw him talk to the pot and help himself. On his return home, he still refused to eat what his wife continued to offer him. As they were getting short of food for the household, he went away to shoot Morakot, Miletes, the sons in the meanwhile going to the banab, asking pot to cook bird and meat for them. After eating they washed the vessel, clean, clean, so as not to leave even the trace of a smell in it. By and by the father came home from his fishing excursion, handed over to his wife the morikot which he had caught, but refused as usual to eat any himself. I do not want it. I am satisfied, was all he said. He then slipped away to his lucky pot, and told it to cook for him, but it would not boil any more for him or for anyone else, so perfectly had it been cleaned out. Point 145 He then commenced to cry, but the pot reminded him, You were greedy. You gave the bird and meat neither to your wife nor to your children. You ate it all yourself. 260. Among the island Caribs, when the women make hammocks they place at each end a small parcel of ashes. Unless this ceremony were observed the hammock would not last. Should they eat figs when in possession of a new hammock, they think it would become rotten. They take great care also not to eat of certain fish with sharp teeth. For this would cause the hammock to be soon torn. The men erect the houses, except the roofs, which are made by the women, and canoes, BBR, 242. With the same people, during the course of manufacture of a canoe, while being burnt out, sticks are placed across, so as to enlarge it. If a woman did but touch it with her fingers, they believe it would split, BBR, 243. Father Gamilla, the missionary of the Orinoco, evidently commiserating the unhappy lot of the weaker sex, and recognizing the hardships to which they were exposed in carrying on their field work, made the attempt to get the men to lend assistance. His exhortation with its fruitless results is given here in his own words, Brethren, said I to them, why don't you help your poor women to plant? They are tired with the heat, working with their babies at the breast. Don't you see that it is making both them and your children sick? Father, they replied, you don't understand these things, which accordingly worry you. You have yet to learn that women know how to bring forth, and we don't, if they plant, the maize stalk gives two or three ears of corn, the cassava bush yields two or three baskets full of roots, and similarly everything is multiplied, g. 2, 237. 261. A woman must preserve her fan for the uses for which it is intended, namely, for blowing up the fire, should she use it on herself, she would become thin, at least this is what the Pomeroon Arawaks tell me. Among the nations bordering on the Amazon the Indians are entirely nude. 
They regard it as an almost certain sign that he who would cover what shame obliges civilized man to hide would soon be unfortunate, or would die in the course of the year, pba, 121-2. It might be pardonable perhaps to mention here the reproof which the island Caribs gave their European visitors when the latter, regarding them too closely, laughed at their nudity, friends. You should look only at our faces. ROP, 461. 262. Waterton has recorded the following beliefs in connection with the manufacture of karari, wurali, poison. The women and young girls are not allowed to be present. The shed under which it has been boiled is pronounced polluted and abandoned ever after. He who makes the poison must eat nothing that morning and must continue fasting as long as the operation lasts. The pot in which it is boiled must be a new one, and must never have held anything before, otherwise the poison would be deficient in strength. Add to this that the operator must take particular care not to expose himself to the vapor which arises from it while on the fire. Still the Indians think that it affects the health. And the operator either is, or what is more probable, supposes himself to be sick, for some days later and it would seem that they imagine it affects others as well as him who boils it. For an Indian agreed one evening to make some for me, but the next morning he declined having anything to do with it, alleging that his wife was with child. W. 93-4. Skomberg more or less confirms these restrictions when he says that before and during the making of the poison the operator must submit to a strict fast, and that during the cooking, no woman, especially a pregnant woman or maid may come near the house. Furthermore his own wife must not be pregnant. In the particular instance cited the distinguished traveler was asked not to eat sugar cane or sugar during the manufacture of the poison, S.C., R.I., 455-7. Thus the greater the abstention from food on the part of the P.I. men, the greater the virulence of the Urali, its action being supposed to be deadly in correspondence with the degree of hunger of the maker, J. J. Quelch, T. 1895, page 262. Imthern supplies the following, water was fetched especially for the poison making from a stream nearly a quarter of a mile distant, and care was taken in carrying this to the house, to rest it on the ground every few yards. For, say the Indians, a bird wounded by a poison dart will fly only as far as the water, with which the poison was made, was carried without rest, it. 311. 263. There would appear to be some intimate relationship between an individual and his personal name, cf. sex, 124, 125, of such nature that the very mention of it in his presence would be fraught with serious consequences. Neither, as in the case of spirits, sect. 172, may he be pointed at, or trodden over, sect. 220. The name is deemed to be part and parcel of the individual, and the mention of it under those circumstances would put him in the power, as it were, of the person speaking. This rule held good for both mainland, K.G., I., 184. 2. 147, and island Indians. According to age and sex, one will address another as brother, sister, father, mother, son or daughter, etc. Or will speak of him or her as the father or mother, etc., of such an one. Or, to specialize, they will speak half the name, e.g. Mala instead of saying Malakali, and Hiba for Hibalaman, R.O.P., 451, K.G., 2, 147. This fact will thus render the following statements of de Guj and Kirk more intelligible, some trios have two names, one reserved for friends, the other for strangers, Cravo says that the Ojanas might have two names. One for addressing the person and the other for referring to him when absent, go, 26. It is a curious thing that you can never discover an Indian's real name, he never divulges it, nor is he ever called by it. He is always known by some nickname or name of distinction for his prowess in war, hunting, or fishing, key, 120. So also when dead, the name of the deceased must not be mentioned. 263a Honey Bee and the Sweet Drinks, W. There were two sisters looking after their brother, for whom they were always making kasiri, but try their best, the drink had no taste. It was never good and palatable, so the brother did not enjoy it. 
He was forever complaining, saying he wished he could find someone who would make him a real sweet drink, something like honey. His sisters sympathized, and said they would be only too glad if he could find the right woman, who would make good liquor. One day while wandering through the bush he expressed aloud his wishes as to finding some woman who could manufacture a drink as sweet as the honey bee makes it. No sooner had he expressed his wish than he heard footsteps behind, and, turning round, saw a female approach. What is it? Where are you going? You called Kohora, my name, Lit, Honey Bee, and here I am. He told her about his own and his sister's wishes, and when she asked him whether he thought his people would like her, he said he was quite sure they would. Kohora accordingly went home with him, and when his parents asked her how he had met her, she said that she had come because their son had called her. She then made the drink. And the way she made it. All she had to do was to put her little finger into the water, stir it up, and the drink was ready. It tasted sweet. 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 And never before had it tasted so good. From that time onward they always had sweet drinks. On every occasion that Koora brought her husband water she would dip her little finger in and so make it sweet. But at last the man got tired of all this sweet drink, and began to quarrel with Koora. Well, that is funny, she said. You wanted sweet drinks, you called me to get them for you. I came and made them, and yet you are not satisfied. You can get them for yourself now. With this, she flew away and ever since then, people have been punished by being put to all the trouble of climbing up, and cutting the honey out of, the tree, and having to clean it before they can use it for sweetening purposes. 264. Among the Pomeroon Arawaks the mother always gives the name first to her child, independently of the P.I., who bestows one subsequently. It is said that friends, brothers, and sisters may call them by these names, which stick to them throughout life, but it should be borne in mind that these Arawaks have been in closer contact with Europeans than any of the other tribes. The following are some of the names given by the mother at birth. Girls' names. Satu equals darling. Kakushika equals big eyes. Koroyaro equals baby girl. Kainasaro equals big buttocks. Sadobara equals pretty hair. Kuroshiro equals brown hair. Kabararo equals plenty of hair. Kakurashiri equals curly hair. Irihibaro equals dark hair. Ilihiro equals dark girl. Natakoro equals SP. Of pretty flower. Kayari equals toucan. Durakwaro equals bird, Odantophorus. Boys' names. Koralayali equals baby boy. Kainasali equals big buttocks. Sakibara equals pretty hair. Kurashali equals brown hair. Kabarali equals plenty of hair. Kakarashili equals curly hair. Irihibali equals dark hair. Ilihili equals dark boy. Dirinko equals SP. Of parrot. Wishur equals SP of little fish. The name bestowed subsequently in this tribe by the P.I. takes place about the period when the child begins to creep, he asks the spirit in the maraca, rattle, to give the name. An offering of considerable value is necessary on this occasion, as, according to the fee given to propitiate the P.M.N. Is the virtue of the incantations pronounced, an unnamed Indian is thought to be the certain victim of the first sickness or misfortune that he may encounter, accordingly, only the very poorest of them are without names, Hick, 229. At the present time, it would seem that the P.I. gives a name only if he has been called in to attend a child when sick. Under such circumstances he will say that he has dreamed that the child requires a name, and the parents accordingly ask him to give one. Such names are given with regard to the personal appearance, to birds or other animals, to tobacco, e.g. Yuri Nero, Yuri Takoro equals tobacco flower, after the P.I.'s kickshaws, etc., e.g. Sherbari, stone, Kalikoyang, crystal, Waramaraka, a name derived from his rattle, or, after some quality or title. With the Makusis it was either the grandmother or grandfather, who, on the conclusion of the Kavad, gave the infant one of the names customary in the family, S.C.R., 2, 
315. Among the Tucanos it is the father, under similar circumstances, who gives the name, generally that of an animal, kg, i, 313. So also on the islands the Caribs do not bestow names immediately after birth, but wait for twelve or fifteen days when they call in a man and woman who take the place of sponsors, and pierce the child's underlip and nostril. The majority of the names which the Caribs impose on their children are taken from their ancestors or from various trees which grow on the islands, or from something that has happened to the father at the time of his wife's pregnancy. Or during her lying in, ROP, 552-3. A convalescent patient may start life afresh with a new name, sect. 305. 265. The circumstances vary under which the name already given may be changed. As already mentioned, sect. 264. This was the case with the Arawaks on recovery from prolonged sickness. On the Carib Islands the names given to the male children shortly after birth were not retained throughout life. They changed them when old enough to be received into the rank of warriors, or if they had borne themselves bravely in battle and had killed an Arawak chief, they took his name as a mark of honor, ROP, 552-3. Both on the islands and on the mainland names were exchanged in testimony of great affection and inviolable friendship, ROP, 513, when they want to make friends, they ask for our names and give us theirs. To show affection and friendship they want us to exchange names, BBR, 237-8. In Puerto Rico, Juan Ponce de Leon, in fact, was received into the bosom of the family, and the cacique exchanged names with him, which is the Indian Pledge of Perpetual Amity, WI, 778. With the present-day Arawaks and Waraus, among members of the same sex it is of common occurrence as proof of friendship and affection not to exchange names, but for the younger to adopt the name of the older one, sect. 120. The island Caribs have also in their drinking bouts or on occasions of public rejoicing, someone appointed to give them a new name, whom they address after having drunk well. I wish to be named. Name me. One will say, whereupon the other immediately satisfies him and is rewarded with a present, a quartz crystal, or other article, R.O.P. 552-3. 266. With a view to their becoming good hunting dogs, the Waraus name their canine friends after those animals which are known to hunt well, as certain ants and bees which catch plenty of other prey, after Warabizi, sect. 88. A big wasp that lays its eggs in the ground and brings various worms from the bush for its young, when hatched, to feed on, after Sakaro and Buruma, two crabs which run quickly and hunt well. After the giant anteater, the shark, and the small wild dog, Karasiri, all of these possessing undoubtedly good hunting qualities. 266a, special words, or paraphrases, have to be used under particular circumstances. Thus, in traveling over water, river or sea, the use of certain names otherwise employed in ordinary everyday conversation, is absolutely forbidden, sect. 194. On the Irie River, Rio Negro, the villages have secret names which are not mentioned except under pressure, KG, I, 184. There are some few words which may be employed only according to the sex speaking or spoken to. Thus, among the Arawaks, to express the word surely or certainly, a man will say Tashi to a woman, but Te to a man, whereas a woman will use the term Tara when conversing with one of her own sex, but Tashi when talking to one of the opposite. Oh, yes. So you say, is similarly expressed by three words, babui between woman and woman, or woman and man, but dadai when a man addresses a woman, and dado when he is talking to another man. The signification of this distinction I have not been able to discover, it is not connected, of course, with the use of different languages by the opposite sexes, as was the case in the Lesser Antilles with the Carib warriors and their Arawak wives. And, finally, with the mainland Arawaks a particular plaintive intonation is used in inquiries after the health or welfare of those who are ill or unfortunate. And the tone is always suited to the circumstances and situation of the party addressed, Hick, 248.